What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Friday, March 15th, 20 and 24, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours. On today's show, can Texas football go undefeated in 2024? We will ask the question. Texas basketball awaits its bracketology predictions. We'll give you the latest from Joe Lenardi and try to figure out where the Longhorns will end up on Selection Sunday. Texas baseball back in action this weekend at the Dish. We've got a lot of NFL free agency we need to talk about. The rich get richer in Kansas City, a big wide receiver trade, and the Texans giving out a big contract to one of their newest <laughs> members. We've got uh, some funny videos to get into. We've got some of the most devastating news I've heard in a long time to get into. We'll talk some PGA Tour as well. We are jam-packed on a Friday, and a very happy Friday to everybody tuned in this morning. Absolutely. We appreciate y'all checking us out, and a happy Friday to you, my friend. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, BK, and yourself. And by the way, can I get my crown back from DD? DD, give me back my crown. That's right. Give Buck back his crown. Friday rain? Yes, indeed. Thursday rain? Not so much. What are you, Texas football? You win one game, and all of a sudden you're back? Of course I'm back. I told you people to get out there and get things done yesterday. You weren't gonna get you weren't gonna get rained on. But I said today, yes, although it's early rain. I don't know. It's I think it may have stopped already by now, but a call is a call. And I'm here to back up that call for Friday morning rain, as I told you last week it was gonna happen. As Dee Dee, who's out on spring break, not for doing her forecasting job like I'm doing, but I'm working at it because I'm a weatherer. You know what I'm saying? Weatherer man gets it done. Hey. Weatherer lady goes on spring break. I don't know what happened to DD. There you go, BK. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear some thoughts of what happened to DD. I hope she's okay, first okay. and foremost. Uh, maybe she entered the listener portal and has decided to go somewhere else for her sports talk and entertainment, which if that's the case, that's the worst decision she's ever made in her entire life. This is not one of those respect your decision moves, DD. If you've left us, we do not respect your decision. Okay. There you go, for sure. I will I, give you credit. You were right. You did say it was going to rain today, and it has already rained today, and there's a chance it rains even more later today. But here's where we're at right now. I can't sit here and give you back your title as the official weatherer of Texas Sports Unfiltered. You don't get your throne back. You don't get the king's crown yet. What? Because you've been struggling a little bit. Now, hey, here's where we're at. You're like Texas football. You just went on the road in week two and beat Alabama. That's a huge win. Yes. Right? Yes, it is. You got to finish the year. You got to go win the conference title. You got to make it to the college football playoff. And if that happens, you'll what? be back. You'll be the man in charge once again. I'm Tyrese Hunter. That's who I am. That's who I play like. That's not good. <laughs> no. I had a game. That means you're going to miss your next five predictions. Oh, no, I had so you, a game. You've got I, to get a few right in a row. If you do that, you can reclaim the title. But as of right now, just getting one in a row right, that's not a streak. That doesn't give me or the people the confidence that you are officially back. You're on your way. Time. But the people must speak. You can't speak. You don't. You're not. You were never a believer anyway. The people need to speak. I know how they feel. They went out and got things done yesterday. They were they were on spring break at places in this state. You know what they were doing? Getting it done because they knew they've got to stay in and watch golf today because of the rain. Although I'm telling you, I think that rain is done. PK, <laughs> it's probably drying up and sunny right now all over the place. But boy. I brought the thunder, I brought the lightning, and I brought it early this morning, too, by the way. Yeah, got some overnight towards yes. the Sunset Valley Oak Hill area that I live in, and I think uh, most of the Austin area got a little something-something over the last few hours. We need, so, it. We need it for the gardening. Let me ask we you this, Buck. Yes. Is the rain done for the weekend? Hey, remember, I don't tell you when it's done. I just tell you when it's coming. Okay, are we getting any more rain this weekend? Is it coming again at some point this weekend? It's going to come a little bit Sunday night. That's Maybe it. A little bit Sunday night, yes. 
No prediction for rain tomorrow. Not messing with it. I'm sleeping in. I w- I'm, I'm hoping that it rains in the morning, but because I'm sleeping in to at least seven o'clock. And I know people are going, that's sleeping in. Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> for me, it is. When you're an old and you start, you start to move around here at 5.30, 5.15, sleeping in the seven is a big deal. No soccer game, no grandkids soccer game, no orange slices tomorrow. I'm mm-hmm. sleeping in. I'm going till seven o'clock. I'm not even budging till seven. I'm not taking my fourth pee break until seven o'clock. That is sleeping in? Yes, that so, is. God, I wake up at seven o'clock every morning for this show. <laughs> no, I'm sleeping in till seven. And that's an early morning for me. Wow. I don't know how people do that. I just uh. been like I've been like that since college, actually. I've been an early riser. When I was in college, I never I was never the dude, you know, when there was no classes, still in bed at 10 o'clock. Can't do it. Mm. I always figured there's something out there in the world for me to see, which around here, there's nothing to do at 7 a.m. No. Stores don't open up. People don't go to work till 10 o'clock on the weekends. Stores don't open up until 10. What happened to stores that used to open up at 9 o'clock? I mean, they are banks. Hey, we're open at 9. You can't get up to a bank on a Saturday before like 10, and there's only like two of them open. People like sleeping in, and for most no, people, that no. means sleeping past 7 o'clock. No, people like don't like to work. That's well, what that, Yeah, we've known that for a while. Everyone wow. used COVID as an excuse for that, but nobody likes to running work. running around the COVID excuses. Oh, no, we don't have enough workers. Yeah. People just don't want to work. No, yeah. people don't want to work. That's why we do this. This isn't a real job. What? We don't want to work. You don't think talk. forecasting weather is a real job? A weatherer know. is very important to the people. All right, Michael C. is holding your feet to the fire right now. Because Austin FC is a home match tomorrow night. And Michael C is big time Austin FC fan. He goes to every game, so he'll be at Q2 tomorrow. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine tomorrow. And I'm looking at my trusty weather app, and I'm seeing a 60% chance of precipitation tomorrow. And you're coming on the year this morning trying to restake your claim as the official weather guesser of TSU. And you're saying it's not going to rain. So I don't like doing that. I don't like doubling up like that on Saturday. I've called for it on Friday. You know, the residuals from Friday can't be my fault on a Saturday. Okay, now you're turning into DD. What, you get one prediction right and you're leaving? You're done? You're abandoning your post? The people need you. What's going to happen this weekend? Yeah, that's all you care about is the weekend weather. That's of it. Of course. Yeah, okay. Enjoy the game. You don't have to worry about the rain. You'll be just fine. Oh, all right. Good morning, just, by the way, good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cabasas, Texas. The, sto- the soldiers in the state of Texas and all those that fight for us. Come rain, come shine. We do appreciate what you do to you and your families. And do be safe out there, please. Yeah, well, tell the soldiers, Buck, who are relying on you for their weather forecast. Is it going don't to rain do, tomorrow? Don't do that. Don't put Uh-oh. me on that level. Those, those soldiers in this state, don't care. It can be raining, hail, snow. They're going to be there. 115 degrees. They're going to be there for us. They don't care about the weather. They go to work anyway, right? They do, but they would like to know what the weather is. They want to know if they need ponchos or not. Yeah. That's just wrong. That's wrong to put me on that. Give that to Dee Dee. She's the weather lady. Oh. Give it to her. You had all that faith in her. We just need her to show up. Don't know what happened She's- to Dee Dee. She used to say good morning to us. Now, I don't know. Kind of embarrassing after that. No rain yesterday call. She just retired on top. She's already retired. She's done. She hung him up. Hey, how about an update from your court run-in yesterday? You said you were going to the Lakeway Magistrate to pay off your $274 speeding ticket. Did you make it happen? I got it deferred. What does that mean? That means I can't get a ticket in, in the municipality of Lakeway for eight, 80 days or 90 days. Okay. Uh, and if you, if you do get a ticket in that time frame, Paying the whole nine yards. You know how, when you know how much I had to pay? I think 220 still though. I mean, yes, 220 I had to pay. And deferred means I get to save like 45 bucks. That's it? Yeah, I was almost like, here, take the 270. I'm going to come flying through here like 70 miles an hour down the main drag. Doing the Tom Herman double bird, too. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, and, you know, I thought all these tickets they had, they'd have a finally have a new building there. 
there's in the old, same old shitty building they've always been in. When I used to live in the ghettos of Sale Master down there, the same building. They didn't dip, they didn't give the, the people that collect the ticket money a new building. They gave the police department a new building. Oh, they got the new one. But the but the ones that are in the cruddy offices over there, like the judge, the late night judge, night court people, they still in the same crappy ass building that I had to go up a flight of stairs, like 18 steps. Well, you're paying for their new building with that ticket. So thank no, you very much. That's know. that's why they gave you that ticket. They need money for their new building out there. Simple as 15, that. 15 years, 15 years ago when I lived out that way, it was the same building I used to have to go to if I left my garbage can out three hours more than it's supposed to be. After it was emptied, if I didn't bring the, the can into the garage, like four hours after they emptied it and it was still on the street, they would stick a note on there, see you at night court, mister. Now nah, they're still in the same building. But the police department, Officer Peacock's in a new building. Yeah. Ooh. All the scooters where they put all the scooters and stuff. They got the new the new building from all the tickets they, they've been passing out. Officer Harry so Zach. But you know what? After, <laughs> after all that stuff and the, the papers that they had to give me after that for the deferred deal, I wish I'd just gone in there and threw down the $274 check and just moved move along here but this doesn't go on your record this way if i can keep clean out of the municipality over there for 90 days i told her i said i don't come through here that often anyway mm -hmm. she said well this is the way to go it doesn't affect anything okay so if but you're clean for like, 90 days you get like scolding me like can you behave for for 90 days I'm like what did i come on lady I didn't rob anybody oh you had a lady judge but her she wasn't a judge she was a clerk they call them clerks at that part. They probably have a sophisticated name for them in the new building where the police are. But mm -hmm. where I was, they were clerk. By the way, at the old building, they've got metal detector. Of course, I went off with my keys in my pocket. And then I backed up again. And I, and I took it out of my pocket. And I just jingled them as I went through. And there's nobody there at the desk. And then there's a bunch of seats. So you go over to the seats. It's like going to get your driver's license. You know, they have those little windows. Sure. It goes, Oh no, just sit there. We'll call for you. I'm like, you mean me and myself and no nobody else, 25 seats here. And then there's like six of you behind the behind the glass. And I'm gonna have to wait 10 minutes before you guys quit talking and just say, hey, come over here so we can get this done. So I waited for about five minutes. They call me over. And she said, No, this is the way to go. She was nice enough to say that. She was she said, can you, can you stay out of trouble for 80 days? I'm yeah. like, I'm like. Lady, I wasn't in trouble. It was Peacock. It wasn't me. I don't think I didn't drop that guy's name 25 times. Peacock? Yeah. I'm that like, his real me. name? Yeah, yeah, yes. I didn't make that up. That's what? Officer Peacock. Yes. I thought, that, I, I thought that was a bit the entire time. No, that was his name, Officer Peacock. You're just saying he's got a small Johnson. No. It looks like a P. Dude's name is Peacock. Oh. John Wagner Peacock. Wow. So now everybody knows exactly who he is. Yes. They've known it from the get go when I've been saying that. Uh, if I ever get pulled over by that guy uh, on his scooter, hiding behind trees. Yeah. On that little segue that he pulled you over <laughs> on, mall <Yeah>. cop. <laughs> he was not. I'll he was tell you not what. Behind, you really want to piss off scooter. a cop. You call him a mall cop. That's, no, that's the worst way you can tick off a cop and that is the quickest way you're asking getting the handcuffs no dude i was so scared going through the municipality i was wondering to see if i was going to see the judge with the white hair i was so i was dude i was going under the speed limit through there yesterday hmm. yeah it's smart gotta be yeah, smart over these next 80 to 90 days i'm not going through that place and i'm trying to figure out you know b cave cops i don't want to get under their skin because they're everywhere they have jurisdiction over the whole state of Texas. I've never seen a group that has the jurisdiction, no matter where they can go. You can go downtown Austin and a B cave cop can pull you over and bring you out to B cave. They're everywhere. Cause so I think they must have jurisdiction over Lakeway too. There must be a little boundary line. Cause I see them in Lakeway prop. How about this Lakeway proper? Mm. Okay. And then the municipality, they, they control everything. They control everywhere on, on 71 to uh Spicewood B caves cops, okay. but I don't mess with them. Because all they do is pull people over. They don't have anything else to do. Nobody robs anything. Nobody breaks any laws. Nobody shoplifts at the Galleria. All they do is pull people over for traffic citations. So 
I need to leave them alone. There you go. Their, their, their jurisdiction is far too wide for me to mess with. We've got live audio of Bucky responding to the clerk at the court yesterday. Shut up, bitch. I was, no, I was on my best behavior yesterday because I was letting her know that I used to live over in the ghettos of Sailmaster there. In the Yes, I lived right there in the ghetto area of Lakeway. Uh, you were trying to sweet talk her a little bit. You were oh, trying was, to convince her to maybe sure. drop the ticket price down. Clerk has no clerk has no power. They're just a clerk. The well, clock. then get out of there. Why am I talking to you? Let me talk to somebody who can actually do something about it. There's the this. judge with the white hair. Should I have yeah. called for that? Give me the oh, wooden man. teeth, white haired, powdered wig guy. <laughs> no, I just wanted to pay. And I, like I said, if, if I could have started this over yesterday, I would have said, here's 274. Leave me alone. No, I'm not coming back in 80. I got to bring something back 12 days before the 80 or 12 days before the 90 days sign mm -hmm. that I've made it this far. And then that's it. Well, good luck. I've got to go back into that place. I'm glad you got 50 bucks shaved off. Dude, how about an elevator or two around this place? Yeah, that feels illegal. Don't you have to have handicap? No. There, uh, by the way, why are we talking to them about, no, you got to go on the second floor. There's no elevator to the second floor. Maybe service elevator around the back for people that are handicapped. That's how they treat you people there in that you municipality. People. What, the Jews? <laughs> no, so I guarantee over at the new police office they have elevators. Oh, I bet they do. Gosh, that they was just make you slide down the pole like at the fire station. I don't know why I felt bad going over there. I just I felt weird, you know. That was in my old neighborhood over that place. I was gonna go by my old house, my old I'm sorry, um duplex, where at one time one of my great Pyrenees, I put him in the garage because he kept escaping. He like climbed the fence and jump over. So I, I went to the so the station. Oh, when I was pulled over at three thirty in the or three thirty in the morning for driving while being black in Lakeway. Can't do that. Two times in a row, two days in a row, different officers pulled me over. Yeah, well, you no should you should have known better. Don't do that next time. I know, especially driving an old Beamer. Is yeah. this your car? Yes, I'm black. It's my car. Here's my license. Why are you pulling me over? I uh, just wanted to know where you're going. I'm going to work. Yeah, like you. That's where I'm going. And then the next day, another cop pulls me over. I'm just wondering what you what you were up to. Oh, I'm not robbing homes. I'm going to work, sir. Yeah, I stole this car and I'm going to <laughs> loot at a store now. Let me go. Sure. <laughs> Let me go, you jerk. And so, no, I just, I went in there and I, I did my service yesterday. And you know what? That's fine. It's all, it's all forgotten about. There Until I get another ticket before the 80 days. Yeah. <laughs> then you're going to jail. See you later. 25 Dude, I, to life with those cops. I was driving the Subaru through there yesterday going like right below the speed limit, just looking around, just waiting. I thought Peacock was going to jump because I went down the same road where I got the ticket. You know that I had to, since I was yeah. going that way. Yeah. I was doing like 24, 25 going down the hill. And the cops were looking at you. Oh, there's that sweet little lesbian going 25. <laughs> And there's Subaru. She's trying to get home to her wife tonight. That is oh, so Oh, see, sweet. that's so wrong. That's so wrong. That's not a lesbian car. We don't no. do we don't do that. Specify what is lesbian or homosexual cars, do we? I don't make the rules, man. Dude, dude should not be driving that little Mini Cooper. I just know that. That's not oh, that, that's where you draw the line. Dude should not be driving Mini Coopers. Although those babies get up, those are BMWs. They can fly. Drove one of those to Dallas, got behind one of those 18 wheelers and in, in the on the on the the high side over there. I mean, yeah. I was sucked, almost got sucked through the through the tunnel there. I was gonna say that wind will blow you off wow. the highway. That'll move that car, that's for sure. And one of those things. Okay, so Subarus are fine, but Mini Coopers are homosexual. Dude, no, I'm not just I'm just saying, dude shouldn't be in a in a Mini Cooper. That's that's not you. Just go ahead and get yourself a beamer. If you're a couple thousand off, somebody will pick up the tab. There's a, pretty, there's a pretty big price difference between a Mini Cooper and a BMW, I think. We're going to have to look that up. I guarantee okay. you they're up there. They're pricey. I think if anybody has the choice between a Beamer and a Mini Cooper, they're they're taking the Beamer, but cost comes into play there. Anyways. Over car. Don't be getting those Beamers. Those things are in the shop like every other week. Yeah. Uh, the Beamers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, you pay for it when you purchase, and you also pay for it yes. over the duration of the life of the car, for sure. How about a little screen share here, Buck? All right. 
We got some bracketology to get into. Of course, Selection Sunday is two days from now. This Sunday. St. Patty's Day. St. Patrick's Day. The official men's and women's NCAA tournament brackets will be revealed. Uh, the men's selection show starts at 5 o'clock. The women's selection show, I believe, gets going at 7 o'clock. So we'll know where the Texas men are headed. We'll know where the Texas women are headed the next time we talk to the people after the weekend is over. But here's the latest Joe Lenardi bracketology <laughs> prediction for Texas. And you can take a look at the top right portion of your screen. I'll do, whoa, that's a much bigger zoom in than I wanted there. Okay, well, I just I just completely effed that up. So bear with me here. Sorry about that. Yeah, Aggie's looking to get in there too. Yeah, the Aggies are uh, Joe Lenardi's last team in the tournament as of right now, which if they do get in, that means they would have to open up their play in Dayton in the first four. All right, well, I tried to zoom in and it, completely effed up the layout of the page so we're not zooming in. over there top right you see texas as a nine seed according to joe lenardi in the east region and their first round opponent according to joey brackets is nebraska old school big 12 matchup fred hoiberg longtime iowa state coach is the current coach at nebraska they've had a very very good year they really have yeah if texas gets by the big red the number one seed in the East region. Whoa. The defending national champion, UConn Huskies, who they're just, not getting by that group. He just dominated Xavier in the Big East tournament yesterday. Now that was their first game of that tournament. They haven't won the Big East Conference tournament yet, but they did win the Big East regular season title. And yeah, like we said, they won the national title last year and they did it in resounding fashion. Uh, we were all hopeful for a Texas UConn game in the Final Four last year. The refs in the Elite Eight game against Miami had other ideas, but we could potentially be seeing a Texas UConn game this year. And yeah, Buck, you sound a little terrified of that uh, proposition. Wow, that is, they got too many big dudes, big mean dudes. Plus, they got a fantastic guard play. Their guards will be on. We'll be wondering about Tyrese Hunter if he's going to play or not. I know what UConn will do, and I know what they'll do inside too. That team is loaded. Yes. And everybody remembers how good UConn was in the tournament last year. They won all six of their games by double digits. They're the first oh. national champion to ever do that. So it was a ridiculous run they went on last March. They were a four seed last year in the tournament. They did not win the Big East regular season title. Nope. They did not win the Big East tournament title. They just got hot at the rightest time, and once again, they just dominated everybody in the actual dance. This year's team is even better. They're going to be a one seed. They could be the number one overall seed. Now, Lenardi has Purdue as his number one overall seed in this bracketology, but UConn is in that mix. So is Houston to be the overall number one seed in the tournament. So, yeah, this team, regular season-wise, even better. Despite what they lost from the championship team, they have yeah. been running through everybody all season long. And, yeah, that would be a pretty scary round two matchup for Texas if they even get by a team like Nebraska. Yeah, that's a powerhouse group right there. Now. Now, you're right, if they can get by Nebraska. Can I give you the good news? What's the good news? So, Florida is the last school to repeat as a national champion, right? And it's only happened twice in like the last 40 years. Duke did it in the early 90s, and Florida did it in the aughts of the 2000s. Only two of the last 15 defending champs have reached the Sweet 16. Let me say that again. Only two of the last 15 defending champs have even reached the Sweet 16. In the past... Six tournaments, the defending champ lost in the first weekend, including last year. Kansas won it all two years ago. They lost in the round of 32 to Arkansas last season. So recent history would no. be on Texas's side Dude, in, the, in round two. Lose to my long wood. Oh, I didn't say long wood, but... First or second round. It usually happens in the second round. It's only happened twice where a one has ever lost to a 16. Okay, well, UConn's not going to lose to my Longhorns either. 
Mm. Year Long Wood. I don't think that's <laughs> that's the name their name, isn't it? It is Long Wood. I don't oh, see it's not you. my in front of that. No, I don't see a my or a your in front of that. <laughs> I don't see a he, him, a she, her. I don't see any pronouns in front of Long Wood. But what? What an absurd college name that is. I'm glad you brought that up. Longwood? <laughs> yeah, really. What are we doing here? I mean, how do you go around telling people you graduated from Longwood with a straight face? You can't. You can't. I mean, what's what's their mascot? I don't even know what state that I'm I'm seriously, I I've never heard of the University of Longwood. Longwood Johnsons? Is that what they are? <laughs> I, I can't. Where is it? Okay, I'm gonna take a guess where it's located in. I'm gonna say it's in. Massachusetts. Hey, or, no, New York, New York. New York is the call? Yeah, New York, because okay. there's enough weirdness in New York. Okay, Longwood University. They're called the Phallics. What? No, not. Long, I wish. Longwood University is a public university in Farmville, Virginia. And their wow. mascot is the Lancers. The Longwood Lancers. The Lancers, huh? Yes, indeed. Wow. Hey, good luck to them. Farmville, isn't that that? There's no way you ever played Farmville on Facebook like 15 years ago, but that was some yeah. shitty game that everybody used to play on their computer. When I was Farmville? In Farmville, yeah. You were like running a farm. Children of the corn? I know Nebraska's in there. Might as well have been children of the corn there. Yeah, as Tanner says, better than Shortwood. Yeah, I guess you'd rather be playing Longwood than Shortwood. I guess so, yes. Although it depends on the sport. I don't know. There are some sports where I'm not sure I want to deal with any Longwood. UConn has got that bracket. I mean, that's talking about running through a group. I'm telling you, like everyone would pick UConn to probably win this entire region, but especially to take care of business in the top half of this region. But once again, I like it bears repeating. I always look up these random nuggets. ESPN posts this article, and for some reason, it doesn't get as much pub as I think it should. But I look you at like these streaks of teams that have these weird streaks where it just doesn't happen, or the yeah. NFC you don't repeat yourself in the East. Nobody Never. has nobody has any idea how to fill out a bracket. All right, it's it's so much luck, and like you could do as much research as you want, but you're just going to drive yourself insane. And it feels like the years I do the most research are the years I have the worst brackets. So a lot of it is just like, all right, you pick and you hope, right? But there are historical trends. That's what I do. I watch a ton of college basketball over the year, but I don't study the matchups too much when I'm filling out my bracket. I study the trends, like what usually happens in the tournament when it yep. comes to, you know, stuff like defending champs, when it comes to seed lines, when it comes to conferences, when it comes to this and that, that's usually what I focus on. Fuck, every year since they expanded the field from 64 to 68, I think every year except for one, there has been at least one team that played in the first four that has won an actual game in the NCAA tournament. Mm. So, like, I always try to pick one of those teams that plays in Dayton to win at least one game in the actual tournament. Like, stuff like that is what I look at. And last year, I didn't have Kansas losing to Arkansas. Well, because I thought Kansas was going to have Bill Self, and he had a minor heart attack, and he had to miss that game. But I did have Kansas losing to, to UConn because, like, defending national champs never make deep runs in the tournament. It's so yep. rare where it happens. So, like, with UConn this year, I don't know. It's going to be scary to pick against them, and a shit ton of people are going to have them winning the whole thing. But, like, recent history would tell you that it's more that's likely your, that they that you're going to take UConn. That's what you're going to do. Well, no, recent history tells you it's more likely that they lose in the round of 32 than that they even make it to the final four. Wow. Just telling you. It's a scary, once again, it's a scary thought to have them bowing out that early. Because if you go bold and you miss, then your bracket is in trouble. But it might not be the worst thing in the world to be placed in UConn's region. That's all I'm saying. Man. I'd rather be in Tennessee's region so I can get Rick Barnes in the tournament. Let me put that on the record. And that bracket there down there, that last one down below there to the right, which St. Mary, St. John's, Duke, and Vermont. There's the bottom half of this bracket, by the way. Iowa State is the two seed in this one. Uh, Duke is the three seed. I'll have plenty of these stats next week if you if you want help. By the way, we're going to do a TSU bracket contest. We're going to give away a ton of cool shit. So Here you go. Just get ready for that. We'll uh, obviously announce that officially on Monday when the bracket comes out. But, but, yeah, there you go, right there. So, just saying, there's the latest bracketology from Joey Brackets. Texas as a nine seed, 
I still think they're going to be an eight, but once again, the the only difference between an eight and a nine is the color jersey that you wear. Yeah, I in, just don't want them in that, that region. That region is going to yeah, – now, that UConn, Texas can't beat UConn. I don't know. I mean, look, if you're asking me who I would pick between UConn and Texas, oh. I would pick UConn. They already played this year, and, well, Texas did not have Dylan DeSue. It wasn't a blowout. Like, Texas held its own despite not having its best player. It was a game at the Garden, which they called it neutral site. But anybody who knows, you play UConn at the Garden. That's a that's a yes. road game that you're playing in. Um, so, yeah, look, uh, the Texas would be a eight-point yeah. dog. Yeah, they're big. They're better. they're better at the end of the year. Texas is just kind of. I know some would say they think they're better. I just think they're, 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 they're what they are from game to game. That's all I can say about this group. And the sad thing is, we're at the end of the season, and I don't know what they are. Yeah, you're right. Like it's it's a game to game deal with this Texas team, but you just don't know what you're going to get in those games, and that's why this has been an infuriating team to support here in 2024. And Nebraska's not bad, by the way. No, Nebraska's not bad at all. They got uh, this kid, Tomi Naga, this little Asian guy with the headband. Oh, yeah. He looks, he looks like some guy you'd be hooping at Gregory Gym, but this dude can absolutely ball, man. Like, he is a problem for Nebraska. And Fred Hoiberg's a great coach. Like, it took him a yes. long time to get things going in Lincoln, but I think most Big 12 fans remember what he did at Iowa State for a number of years. I mean, they were – uh, they were a top three, four seed that felt like every yes, single year in the tournament. And they, they lost earlier in March uh, more often than they would have liked. But now Freddie Hoiberg, the mayor, as they used to call him, that guy knows yep. how to coach. And, um, yeah, that's that's far from a guaranteed win. I, I would pick Texas to beat Nebraska if that was the matchup. I, I'll be honest. I'm going to pick Texas to beat any 8-9 seed because this team, I just think, has more talent than any of the 8-9 seeds that uh, they could run up against, but Greens, like you said, lose. yeah, you just don't know what you're getting. Exactly, like they could, they could easily lose. I'll pick them to win, but would I be shocked if they no. did lose to the eight nine that they get to play? No, of course not. That's that's Texas basketball. Nobody should be surprised by really anything that you see from this bunch right. But they're now. getting their rest now. They are so, getting their rest. Yes, and I would have preferred a, a a win in the Big Twelve tournament, and then maybe a win against Iowa State yesterday or at least a close loss to Iowa State yesterday and then you get your rest get your rest but uh now time for Dylan the Sioux to get healthy of course the next yep. game will be either Thursday or Friday because that's when the first round of the NCAA tournament officially begins so we'll know for sure on Sunday but always fun to prognosticate and the ultimate prognosticator Joe Lenardi has Texas as a nine in the east region right now. so we are out and about next week and starting on Sundays, starting on St. Patty's Day. Yeah, we've got a lot going on. Uh, wow. This Sunday, rain or shine, we will be at Crown and Anchor, our Selection Sunday special, 4 to 6. So the bracket gets released at 5, so we'll be there at 4, starting to preview what things could look like, and then we'll give you the immediate reaction of the actual bracket itself. And we'll start to talk about Very Texas' first-round matchup. Uh, Zay and I will be out at Crown and Anchor. Right there in North Campus. The Buck might stop by for a little bit. Kevin Dunn might stop by for a little bit. And, uh, yeah, they're going to be doing fun stuff for St. Patty's Day all day long. Also, a portion of the proceeds at Crown and Anchor on Sunday will go to the Austin Humane Society. So, nice. you come by, have a few pints, hang out with us, talk some college basketball. And, uh, yeah, look, you'll get to enjoy some great beer and also help contribute to the Austin Humane Society. As like Humane Society. Is that the dog? Should I bring my dog to give away? Oh, I guess I don't. I don't know if you can do that. I'll bring my shot collar with me and watch him. Watch me give that dog the, the buzzer. Watch him dance. There you go. I haven't put that on him yet. You know, we've got that thing which is like over two hundred bills. I haven't had. We haven't put it on him yet, though. This weekend is going to be his weekend. And would I do something that to shock him for something he did before? Yes, I would. I do have a memory. When it comes to the things the dog has done, somebody said, you don't just shock them just for the hell of it. And I'm like, what the hell is it for? You, you do shock it. them when they do something wrong. That's what it's for. Or what about remembering something that happened like a week ago? No, hey, then they're not going to know you shock them. So they learn what they you know, need to do and know, not do. My old man used to whip my ass. He would come out of nowhere and get told something I did like three weeks before and yank me out of bed and whip my ass. So. Are you kidding me? 
a little different. That wasn't right. Was that right? No, that wasn't right. Uh -huh. Your brain. Not about. He never forgot. Somebody reminded him of what I did a couple of weeks before that, and I would still get it. You know what I mean? Well, believe it or not, your brain is bigger than a dog's brain. So you had the ability to think back and be like, oh, shoot, that was for something I did a few weeks ago. I should never do that again. The dog can't think that far back. The dog's like, Wait what a did I just do wrong? Why? I was just sitting believe here. in science or something now? What are you, a scientist? That's not science. That's life. <laughs> That's, you believe in life now? Yeah, Come on, of course man. I believe in life. What do you mean, do I believe in life? I'm alive. I got to believe in life. All right. Yeah, so the dog is like, <laughs> I'm just sitting here and I'm getting shocked. Does that mean he doesn't want me to sit here? Does that mean I got to no, move? It's just just a little something I forgot to get you with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, good luck explaining that one to your idiot dog. As he's rolling around with the shock collar on. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, God. Pints for Pups. That's what they're doing. Benefiting the pints Austin Humane yeah. Society. They got a raffle, too. They'll be giving away some cool prizes. You can buy some raffle tickets to help nice. support the Humane Society. And also... You can walk away with uh, some pretty cool stuff. They got their own randomizer cool. there. They got their own, I guess so. They don't have the official randomizer. Only we have the yes. official randomizer. That's what we do here on TSU. But, uh, yes, come out and see us. And then next Tuesday, we'll be out at Circuit of the Americas because boogity boogity. Yeah, boogity boogity, let's go racing. Yes, I'm excited. I'm, I'm telling you, last time I was out at Circuit of the America, I couldn't remember how to get home. Oh God, I forgot about that. Yeah, let's not forget that part. Let's uh well you you forgot a lot that day. So yes, I did. Let's not forget. But I'm yeah. back. Yes, indeed. Yep. Tuesday morning. We'll be out there. Chaos Theory will be out there as well, setting the stage for NASCAR coming to Coda. That's right. Next weekend. You'll have two races, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. You can get tickets right now at sentextickets.com, of course. But uh yeah, looking forward to that show. And then I think Friday. Rodney and Wags will be back out there doing a little pre, pre race show, getting you set for the weekend. So, yeah, we've got a few remote broadcasts coming up over the next few days. Uh, Coda might be tough. I don't know if that one's going to be open to the public, but obviously. I don't think he's just going rolling up there, but we're going to do some other stuff at some places here during the spring. You know, we're getting ready for the Masters, a lot of stuff with golf. We have tons of things to do. The, the You know, uh, of course, Texas spring game. There's yep. a lot going on here in the next couple months. Oh, it's a great time to live in Austin. Not that yep. there's really ever a bad time to live in this city, but we've got a ton of cool stuff going on and yeah, a lot of sports too. March is one of the best sports months of the year and it kind of translates into April now here in Austin as well. So a lot of fun happenings coming our way and we're excited to be a part of it. And we hope to see all of you people out there for with sure. us. All right, before we, uh, we can get into some golf. We got some Texas football to talk about. We got some NFL free agency to get into. But uh, before all of that, Buck, how about some sponsor shout outs? Let me tell you about our friends at Texas Orthopedics. If you're seeking that specialized patient focused orthopedic care, contact our friends and experts at Texas Orthopedics. Their physicians offer surgical and non surgical, once again, non surgical treatment for you and orthopedic care for children and adults, spinal care, sports medicine, trauma care, joint replacement, rheumatology, and even more. Dr. Christopher Daney and, of course, Chris Stockton are dedicated orthopedic surgeons there. And their goal is to get you right back into the good health and the great quality of life that you deserve. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. For more information, folks, go to TXOrtho.com. Yes, absolutely. Love our friends at Texas Orthopedics. And also a shout out to Altstad Beer, the best beer that you can find. Whatever you're doing this weekend, it might be raining this weekend. You might just want to post up on your couch, watch basketball, watch golf, watch whatever. Well, get you some Altstadt beer. Or, hey, maybe you're going out, doing some South by stuff. Get you some Altstadt beer. I'm telling you, whatever you have going on, the good times are made better with the greatness of Altstadt beer. It's easy to find. H-E-B, Specs, Twin Liquors, Total Wine, 34 Wine and Spirits. Wherever you go to get your beer, you can find Altstadt. And, uh, yeah, it's popping up more and more at your favorite bars and restaurants as well. You've been through a lot this week. You've been through a lot in this life. Reward your taste buds with Altstat beer. And Altstat is brewed without preservatives or additives or unnecessary filler ingredients. So you can feel good about what you're putting into your system. You're going to taste the difference when you're drinking Altstat. You're going to feel the difference the next day as well. I'm telling you, Altstat 
is Eat Elite. It's the best beer that you can find. Please drink it responsibly. Whatever you're doing this weekend, plan a sober ride home. But it is the official beer of BK, and it should be the official beer of you as well. It's Altstadt beer. No impurities, no regrets. Quick shout out to Academy Sports and Outdoors. I want to thank them for their dedication to this show and the 23rd annual Mullet Open. Appreciate that. Of course, Sue Patrick, Jay Willems, since 1975, that incredible selection of Texas Longhorn Apparel, men's and women's, of course, collectibles, accessories, and even more. They offer free shipping on their online uh, service that they have. If you order over $49 worth, they're going to ship it to you absolutely free. Plenty of parking. They're located at 5222 Burnett Road. Say hi to Sue. When she when you're over there, she'll be reading that hard copy of the Austin American Statesman out back there, which, of course, I do. She and I have that together. We are readers of the Austin American Statesman hard copy. And maybe you should be, too. Go to suepatrick.com for more information. Once again, 5222 Burnett Road. You know, I went up to Sue the other day when we were doing our show there. And here's what I said That's to her. Why I don't read the newspaper. Because it's garbage. <laughs> what? She's got her paper all sprawled out there on the couch. I love it. I go and sit down, talk to her, get the Metro section. I get the obituaries and see who died around the area. Oh, no surprise. The Metro guy is reading the Metro oh, section. Oh, yeah. So that's right. Seeing what's uh, happening in the Austin municipalities. Can I park downtown now? Are they are they ticketing anybody south by southwest? Do they give a rat's ass to give you a ticket there? Unlike the municipality of Lakeway, where they're giving handing out tickets like candy. I don't think they care downtown Austin right now, right? Plus, you can't even get in there. There are no parking spaces. Yeah, it's a nightmare. I was thinking about getting some Gus's fried chicken last night for dinner, and I was like, oh, shit, that's downtown. I'm not doing that. No, thank you. That's for visitors, right? Downtown this time of the year is for visitors. Yeah, yeah don't mess. From around here. I mean, if you're from around here and you want to do South By, then you got to go downtown. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I, I, my, my South By, most of my South By days are behind me. Like, I, I don't like dealing with crowds and lines and – traffic and i hate looking for parking oh my god nobody likes looking for parking of course but that's when i'm at my worst is when i can't find a place to park and i'm just driving around for 10 minutes aimlessly figuring out where to go i don't want any part of that stuff at all. You, you know besides going to cohen and sons there i mean one of my favorite places was to to get down to ruth's chris steakhouse i i mean that place was always one of my favorite places to dine there you and go they have a magnificent steak there it really is. You don't have to worry about parking. Pull up front, you know, dude oh, they comes got, out, they, takes they got the, the car. Oh, the yeah. Valet, the valet parking for you? I love the valet parking. That's wonderful. Yes, Always indeed. a wonderful spot, man. All right. Love all of our great sponsors. By the way, uh, the Cabo Bob's giveaway has returned this weekend. So if either Texas baseball or Texas softball wins its weekend series, uh, we're going to be giving away a $50 Cabo Bob's gift card next week. Sweet. And if both teams win their weekend series, Texas baseball hosts Washington starting tonight and Texas softball. Well, they actually started their weekend series last night. They beat BYU. They got two more against the Cougar Mormons or Mormon Cougars, whatever I'm supposed to call them. Uh, we'll be giving away two $50 Cabo Bob's gift cards next week. No game on Sunday for them, right? Oh, that's why. Yep. For BYU. Got to get the series in early because uh, they do not play on Sundays. But they don't do the St. Patty's Day thing. No uh, drinking. Get, no drinking of the green beer. Uh, we'll see about that. I don't know. Yeah, you're probably right. I, I don't think no, be they, don't, they can't. They can't celebrate. They don't mess with the green beer. They may <laughs> celebrate it. They may have some um, shepherd's pie, but I don't think they they delve into the alcohol part of it. And uh, this is a very insensitive and naive question by me, but are Mormons allowed to drink alcohol? No. Okay. So or they can't even have caffeine. Not a lot of coffee. No, they can't. They can't. Really? Not, not a lot of Irish Mormons out there, I guess. They can't have a little Irish misc in their coffee? No? I don't think so. Wow. So, yeah. I, so, the, so the caffeine thing like soda, not Olipop, but soda, they can't do the Coca-Colas and stuff like that? You got to ask Sark because he went to BYU, played his college football there. Maybe he knows. And you can't get any action if you're on campus, right? Unless you're married. Unless you're married. Yeah. What if you're engaged? You can do a little soaking. <laughs> if you're engaged, you can soak. Yeah. But you can't engage in activity, sexual yeah. activity, like real sexual activity. Just put like a sheet 
in between there. And then do the, do the deed. Yeah, I don't think so. Wow. No coffee. That would get me. Forget. I don't drink the alcohol anyway. I, I beat that, but I got to have the ca The caffeine has me. Really, I can't have a cup. Of, I'm, I'm on the coaching staff there. I can't stroll into the staff meeting with a cup of coffee. What kind of shit is that? Ah, the coaches probably can't just don't get caught. Keep it in your bag, and then you get into the football building, and then you can bring, bring out my the thermos. Coffee. Bring my thermos to work. Yeah, yeah. Just say it's, it's water. The soup or something. I'll tell them it's Olipop. How's that? There, there it is. Uh -huh. All the great ingredients that Olipop has. Like, why would I drink caffeine when I can drink Olipop? Fools. That's a good question. That's a good I question. wouldn't. I wouldn't. That's I need some Olipop this week because I'm going to be laid up on this couch watching Scotty Shelfer catch Rory McIlroy in the players this week. I don't think anybody else is coming out of. Uh, except for that guy, that hotel dude, that Wyndham yeah. Clark dude. Well, right on cue, I've got uh, the Players' Championship scoreboard on my phone in front of me. That's why I keep looking down. And Scotty Scheffler is on the course early this morning. He was one of the last guys to tee off yesterday, so he's one of the first guys to tee off today. He's actually starting on the back nine. He threw four holes today, already two under. Wow. Means he's at seven under for the championship. He is one shot behind. The aforementioned Wyndham Hotels and Resorts Clark. <laughs> that guy, is, that dude, Wyndham Clark, is on fire, man, over the last two years. He is hot. He's a good player. Yeah, well, I don't know if he's that good looking, but he is a good player. He is a uh, good player. Nothing, nothing, he just plays. Nothing bugs him. Yeah, after round one, there was a three-way tie atop the leaderboard. It was Wyndham Clark, it was Rory McIlroy, and Xander Shoffley. They all shot seven under yesterday. You know Shoffley will fold his tent eventually. Yeah, Scotty Scheffler was two shots back at five under, but once again, he's already two under today. So he's tied for second. Wyndham Clark is on the course. He is one under today, so he's in sole possession of the lead at eight under for the tournament. Shoffley and McElroy don't tee off until a little bit later. But, yeah, a lot of big names there, and it's shaping up to be a pretty fun weekend. Yeah, this is, what, this is what the golf has wanted. This is what the real tour has wanted to see. The top guys just rise to the top. Not some of these flunkies that you got playing in your 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 golf league. The, the real golf. tour. The real tour is off this weekend. Oh, they are. They took off. They're taking the weekend off. Yep. Practicing are any of those a little guys bit. In the players were they allowed to play in the players? I don't think so. Huh. I don't know if they wanted to play in the players. Yeah, they they play those gimmicky courses. They got island greens, island island everything, island tea boxes, island, island music. Music, yes. Whatever that shit you hear in the back, nobody knows what they're playing. They've got all kinds of. They got the choir singing in the background. What a joke of a tour! Oh man, still working on that live golf sponsorship. So be careful with what you say. You're going to ruin it for us. No, you serious. I'm, I'm, and I'm, the Saudis are going to come murder you. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. My hands being hacked off. Yeah, so be careful with what you say about the real. Golf tour. You think the Saudis would be upset that I'm driving that lesbian car? They wouldn't be down with that, would they? I don't think so. They wouldn't want me in a Subaru? No. No. I don't even know what they drive. What do they drive? They must be driving Rolls Royces. That's what they drive with all that cash. Yeah, they they, they come out looking like a Thomas J. Henry commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Go from their Rolls Royce to their PJ and then come on, man. fly across the world to the next live event, wherever it may be. Wow, what a group. Yep, so now nah, it looks, looks like, uh, once again, a great weekend on tap at the Players' Championship. Your guy, Jordan Spieth, we all we all love Jordan Spieth, of course, but he was your pick yes. to win this tournament. Um, not a great opening round for him. He was two over. That's it, just two? He's tied for 108th place, so as of right now, okay. he's – He's still in the tourney. He needs to do make a move today. I was gonna say, yeah, he's not gonna make the cut if he's tied for 108th place after today. Nah, he'll be about four. He'll be about three under. That'll be okay. That'll get him. That'll get him well. He tees off at 11:40. Dude, what this happened to that dude? You got married, you had a kid, and it just went. That's not. Well, I mean, it, it happens in spurts like that for golfers. Things change. Life changes. You know, you have a child. You know, some guys get better, but some guys just – I don't know. I, I mean, he came onto the scene gangbusters so quickly, you know? Yeah, only they, they, she ruined his life. His wife ruined his life. What? And the kid ruined his life. They just – I mean, he was going smooth, wasn't he? Yep. 
And then it Just all saying, went downhill after that. And somebody said, you need to have a family. What, uh, what's the Rocky line? Women weak in legs? <laughs> yes. I think that's what happened to our guy, Jordan Spieth. If women weak in legs, then children weak in minds. Children weak in wallets. That's what they do. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know if he's going to make that comeback. I, I, he needs to get it going this week. He needs I've to given, make some move here today. I've given up on Jordan Spieth. Like, I don't think Career he's going. I don't think he's going to win another major, dude. I don't think he has it in him. Wow. It's just crazy because he won three so early. <laughs> it's like everyone's looking for the next Tiger, and it's like, oh, could this be the next Tiger? And since then, he hasn't won anything. I don't like. I, he's going to win another tournament, I think. But I just. What do you have, Tiger like, winning a major before he does now? No, I don't have Tiger winning anything at all except for a class except for a the trophy Grand on Slam how not to how not to drive the Grand tiger. Slam at denny's yeah tiger can get the denny's discount there <laughs> if he wants but uh no no tiger woods i think is is done winning stuff but i said that before and then tiger woods went on to win the masters and one of no, the most shocking done. golf events ever no. we're not gonna have another shocker from tiger it's not on the good side, no. Last, uh, we'll be, last. We'll be hearing about his son before we hear about him in golf. Yeah. Jordan Spieth won the Open in 2017. That was his third of three majors, and he's only won two tournaments since then. He won the Texas Open one year in 2021, and he won the RBC Heritage in 2022. So he's won two golf tournaments in the last six seasons, and obviously none of them majors. No. Yeah, Longhorn Bear might be on it ever since the triple bogey in Amon's quarter when he was on his way to winning a second Masters and completely fell apart. And he hasn't been the same. I don't know if it's that that got in his head. I don't know if it's the family or, I, you know, who knows? But it it just it hasn't worked for Jordan Spieth, unfortunately. He still, he still shows flashes of greatness. Yes. He'll, put, he'll put rounds together where it's like, yeah, there's the old Jordan Spieth, but he just hasn't been able to do that four days in a row. Well, he, what he does is he makes these incredible shots, but the basic shot yeah. of golf where he would just, you know, hone in, you know, on, on the on the greens, he's not getting those. Things are wayward to the right, wayward to the left. You know, open green just there for him. He doesn't make those the regular shots anymore. He yeah. still can come out of the trap and make some unbelievable, spectacular bunker plays, you know, some great chips. But that's all – I mean, that's – obviously it can't be physical with him. Obviously it's, it's all mental. He's got all the physical tools. He's a young guy, you know, it just, I don't know, golf is golf is strange like that. You know, I'm not the same in golf as I was a few years ago. I feel like that's more physical for you at your age. Oh, you do? Yeah, I feel like 20 years ago you could have hit the driver more than 130. Never been a long driver, seriously. I hit irons as far as I hit, I, I hit woods back in the day. Really? When, yeah, when I used to play the old, what it was, it's Gray Rock Circle C now. I mean, number nine there. I used to drive the green with a three iron at the par four. Yeah, a little bit downhill. I could drive that green with a three iron. I can't even get halfway there with a driver now. Hmm. I just don't hit I just never have hit woods very far. So I've seen you hit driver out of the rough before. Oh, I'll I'll do that. But <laughs> I don't now that I got these these new tailor-made drivers, stealth drivers and stuff, you can't do that stuff. They're can't hit them off the deck. Those no. things don't get hit off. The, oh, no. They make you go buy a rogue three wood. Now you go buy one for $600 that just gets you, for me, 140 yards, 150 yards. I just don't hit the ball any long, that long anymore. You know why? Because uh, uh, I'm working on my job. I'm working on my riding for the Kentucky <laughs> Derby. <laughs> <Right there. laughs> uh, that scarecrow has become the jockey. Yes, yes. I'm working from big man to scarecrow to jockey in a week's yeah. time. Absolutely. Goodness. All right. Who's your pick to win this this weekend? It's not going to be Jordan Spieth. I think that's obvious. I'm picking, uh, I'm picking Scotty. We're going Scotty, the big favorite. Yes. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go that way. Okay. I mean, his his shot making is just still play putty well again yesterday. Yeah. You know, he just a little. Rory was on fire yesterday. Yeah, Roy was fantastic yesterday. You're right. There was that weird controversy with his group. It was him, Hovland, and Spieth about where Rory could drop, and that that looked a little weird. But 
he got over that pretty quickly. And yeah, he had a tremendous opening round at the players. Now the guy who's fallen off the map now in a year is Victor Hovland. I mean, he's going and starting to change stuff. Why? Everybody's asking the question, why are you changing up your swing now? I mean, you for the last two years, you've been the one of the best players besides uh, Scheffler on, on the PGA Tour, and you're making some changes, and it's jacking with you. You know, some of the basic stuff he's having problems with right now, Victor Hovland. Mm, he I wants mean, to make – I want to make a change. Like in the world? What is he, Dr. King? Yeah, I mean, come on. He's not making a change. Stop yeah. doing that to yourself. Starting with the man in the mirror, I guess. Michael Jackson. Absolutely. That's weird. All right, there's some golf conversation for y'all on a Friday here on Texas. Getting close to the Masters, too. We're making our way to the Masters. We are making our way to the Masters, yes. And then some of your guys can come play then. You're a guy like John Rahm. Yeah. Your, your commies can come over and play in our tour now. Well, the real yeah. golfers, they, they wait for the real tournaments. They play in the live ones. Those are real, and then they play in the majors. That's the only real stuff the PGA Tour has to offer these days. Yeah. So, Coming soon. Looking forward to it. Okay, we'll get into some NFL free agency here momentarily. But first, how about another shout out to another great TSU sponsor? Feeling good today. Thanks to my friends over at Relax the Back, folks. I've been having back problems for a long, long time, but now I feel the comfort of my wonderful chair that I'm sitting in. Not my roadie that's sitting in the garage, but my chair, chair right here. Look at this baby. This thing feels comfortable. My thoracic back feels great. My lumbar area. God, I have no problems. My shoulders, it helps me with my shoulders and my neck. And folks, you can too. Zero gravity recliners there. They've got all the Tempur-Pedic pillows and mattresses that await you there at Relax the Back. They've got all kinds of gadgets. You know, they have that vibrating deal. You know, you see golfers using this deal before they go out. Not me, because I like to just jump out of the car and start swinging. Stiff as a board, like a scarecrow. But my buddies have the little the vibrating deal that they got from Relax the Back for their necks and their shoulders and their backs and that stuff. BK, you see people using it on their hamstrings, players, football players. They're using it on the football field, the basketball courts. Or you can get those at, of course, Relax the Back. You can get anything that you need. I said chairs, pillows, mattresses. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to help out that. And it's not the aging body. It's young folks that are having problems, too, with some of these things. Two locations, and BK's at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods. And, of course, in North Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. Live pain-free like the scarecrow at Relax the Back. <laughs> yes, indeed. And make sure you stop by 7-Eleven this weekend. Load up for the weekend. Get you your beer. Get you your snacks for whatever you have going on. They've got everything you need at 7-Eleven. It's the best convenience store in the world. Locations all over the place. It might be lunch today. I might give me a few 7-Eleven rollers. Yeah, baby. Start off the weekend. They've got all stat beer. They've got the Olipop. They're about to start getting the big hat cocktails, too, at some 7-Eleven nice. locations. They've got everything. We love our guy, Ashish. We love our gal, Wendy. They own and operate a few different 7-Eleven locations here in Austin. But there are 7-Elevens all over the great state of Texas. Y'all know all about 7-Eleven. But make sure you download that 7-Eleven app to cash in on the 7 Rewards program. You're going to get great deals and even some free stuff from time to time simply by having an app on your phone. It's completely free. It's easy to sign up and it's going to save you buku amounts of money. 7-Eleven. Check them out. All right, Buck. Cowboys fans are not going to like this. Uh-oh. No, the Dallas Cowboys have had a very underwhelming free agency period to this point. Very much so. Realistically, there's nothing that can change at this point that is going to change Cowboys fans' opinion on the way this offseason has gone. But Stephen Jones has been busy, okay? He has not had the requisite time to go out and negotiate these contracts with these free agents across the league. He's got other stuff on his plate. Here's Stephen Jones yesterday. While other teams are working out deals with free agents, making trades, you know, trying to figure out ways to improve their team, You've got Stephen Jones, the EVP and GM of the Cowboys, hanging out with, is that Kid Rock? Oh, yeah, it is Kid Rock. There it is. Promoting a professional bull riding event coming to AT&T Stadium later this year. So while every other executive in the NFL is, once again, 
trying to find ways to improve their team, you know, do their job. You got Steven Jones apparently negotiating a deal for Kid Rock to play safety for the Cowboys next year. <laughs> That's great. Bring his ass out there. He probably hit harder than the guys that they have. I mean, how bad of a look is this, dude? It's rodeo time. Come on, in the state of Texas. This guy, remember, it's Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, and the circus is in town. So the rodeo's coming to town. Stephen Jones and his dad have to be a part of the circus, don't they? This event comes to AT&T Stadium in Arlington in May. So this thing happens two months from now. Wow. Yet it is it, Jerry Jones is in charge of this because this is at his place. He scheduled this promotional event for the actual event right now during free agency. Nice look there, guy. And that proves your point that it's just a circus in Dallas right now. Nobody actually cares about winning. All they care about is making money and being talked about. And this is exhibit one billion of that being the case. Kid Rock and the gang. How about that? Kid Rock hanging out with Steven Jones during NFL free agency. That is just infuriating. Now, if this happened after the Cowboys had signed like four or five great players, then nobody oh, cares. No. Ah, enjoy yourself, Steven. You've done a great job this week. You deserve a couple of hours or maybe even a day to take off and relax and do the other things that you like to do and look like a total jabroni wearing a bunch of denim in this picture. That's fine. Do your thing. But because the Cowboys have done jack, you know what, this offseason, adding this on top of that. Stephen Jones has that's all first worn denim, too. You know, it's not something that you've you've cleaned up, you've had it on before, you press it and you put it on. He just got that from the store that that lat the night before. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? His personal it's shopper all, went out there yeah. that morning to pick it up for us. <laughs> yes. And just He's like, give me some Western wear, please. And that's what yeah. they. Anything but, a, anything but a hat on this huge head of mine. They don't have hats to fit this head. No, they don't. And he's got that collar popped too. <laughs> I mean, he looks ridiculous here. Next to Kid Rock. Kid Rock still kicking it in 2024. Absolutely. Oh, my God. He's got so, his gear on. That, that stuff is really worn. Yeah, indeed. So there's that. The Cowboys did re-sign cornerback Jordan Lewis yesterday. Okay. One they need deal. Jordan Lewis. Yeah, I mean, they still need another corner, I think. Jordan Lewis was yep. having a pretty good year before he went down with injury. I think he only played he eight, down. Games. Yeah, eight games last year for the Cowboys. But he's been an up-and-down player. I think he's gotten better over the course of his Cowboys career. Dallas drafted him out of Michigan a few years ago. He's been fine. Uh, but once again, he was he was off to a good start in 2023 before his season came to an end. It's a good pickup, a good slot corner. If he can come back and be the same guy he was, then uh, that will help the Dallas secondary. But they still need a hell of a lot more. Let me ask you this: What do they what do they do with the old man from New England? Is he still got another year? Gilmore does he have? Is he what is he gone? He's a free agent, hasn't signed anywhere yet. I would love for the Cowboys to bring him back. He's obviously not as fast as he used to be, but yeah, he was but he's still good. very good last yes, year. Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. Now, look, when he he's got paired good. up against some of the fastest receivers in football, he, he got burned a couple of times. But well, the Cowboys, they thought they had Trayvon Diggs, and they will have Trayvon Diggs again this season. So Diggs is your number one. He goes yep. up against the Justin Jefferson's, Jamar Chases of the world because he's got the speed to run with those guys. And then Stephon Gilmore can – hang with the number twos. So, yes, yeah, I mean, the Cowboys need another corner. I would be perfectly comfortable with Stephon Gilmore returning to Dallas. Yes. He, he showed me enough uh, last season to where, yeah, I'd like to have Yeah, I think I just I, – I mean, I watched him a lot of times, like you said, when he was locked on teams number one. He just didn't have the speed to keep up. It wasn't like he wasn't around the area. He looked like a lot of Texas secondary guys in trail mode behind him by two steps. I mean, they eventually got to him. But after the guy had caught the ball for 20 or 15 yards, you know, he's not he's, he can't keep his hands on him, but he can he 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 understands the trail mode pretty good. Yeah. And there, there are games where he could when he covers the number two, number three receivers, he's just fine. And the Cowboys also re-signed special teams ace CJ Goodwin to a one year deal. So don't question whether or not the Cowboys are all in, all right? They're they're giving out one year three million dollar deals left and right here, okay? Yeah, but they're making sure the Bull Riders are happy. They're making sure Kid Rock and the Bull Riders are happy for something that's happening in late May. May. 
Way to go, Cowboys. All right. Uh, other teams are actually making moves across the NFL, Buck. The Texans, they, of course, traded for Joe Mixon a couple of days ago. They gave Joe Mixon a new contract yesterday. Three years, $27 million. I, I don't love this. Like, I was glad that they traded for Joe Mixon. I think that was a good move at a position of need. But a three-year, $27 million deal for nine a year a running back who is i believe 27 right now nine nine million a year for that dude and he turns 28 before the season even starts so they're going to be paying him into his age 30 season nixon is, is still a good player last year was not a spectacular year for him well, it didn't help that his quarterback was hurt the whole year either. Agreed. Now I liked the trade once again, but I, I don't know if the Texans needed to do that for Joe Mixon. No, I, I, it's a little much. I, I, it's a little too much. But I mean, if it, it it'll bring in some dividends this the next two years, I believe he's still pretty good. He's still a pretty good power runner, pass catcher, pass protector. They need that. They've got to have that. They can't go in there with just your guy, your backup from last year. You know, they're putting a lot. That, that's a lot. He's coming in as the starter, I got to believe, right? Joe Mixon? Yes. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Oh, I mean, even when he was traded, without that new contract, he was going to be the starter. But now you give him that type of deal, then yes, absolutely. Right. He will be the starter. Damian Pierce will be the backup. Of course, Devin Singletary signed with the Giants uh, earlier this week. So, yeah, it's weird because, like, the Texans, they, they've had a great offseason for the most part. I like a lot of the moves that they made. Obviously, Daniil Hunter, the stud pass rusher coming over from Minnesota, great move by them. But they did make a couple of weird trades, and it was just to clear up a little bit of cap. And I'm like, okay, why are they clearing up all this cap? And it apparently was to give Joe Mixon this big money long-term deal. Yeah. And it's like, I, I wish I wish y'all would have kept Sheldon Rankins instead of traded him for a seventh-round pick instead of giving Joe Mixon all of this money for three years. I, I, I didn't think that was a great move. So Casario, I thought, had an amazing start to free agency, but that, uh, yeah, it, it all kind of spins around this contract and some of the moves that they had to make to mm -hmm. free up that money to pay. Excuse me, it was Malik Collins who got traded uh, to the 49ers. I beg your pardon. They traded him. Rankin's left in free agency. Um I can't quite figure out why the Texans did that, but still a strong week for them, I think. You're telling us about some wide receivers that are made some moves, which some of them are uh, some of them are good moves. But both of the the two main ones are really good moves, Keenan Allen and uh, uh, Hollywood Brown. That those are for both those teams. That's good. Yeah. It so really Keenan Allen got traded to the Bears late last night for a fourth round pick. Yes. The Bears the Bears have some skill position players now. I mean, they've they've done a good job accumulating talents. Going back to well, last year, twelve season. tight ends, yes. Well, yeah, they traded for DJ Moore as a part of that uh, Bryce Young trade a season ago, and obviously that trade netted them the number one overall pick this year. But they've got DJ Moore, they've got Keenan Allen now. That's a really good one-two punch. That's one of the best one-two punches in the league at wide receiver. <laughs> when Keenan Allen stays healthy, he's fantastic. He was pretty healthy. He had a lot of catches last year. Yeah, yeah, he did. And they've got Cole Komet at tight end. They've got 14 other tight ends, like you said. Other ones, yes. Of course, Rojo is there. They went out and signed DeAndre Swift to be the starting running back. Like that, there's some skill position talent on the Bears right now. They've got to figure out quarterback. And at this point, it feels like it's set in stone that they're going to trade Justin Fields and draft Caleb Williams. I think the okay. city will go crazy if they weren't to, to take um, Caleb Williams. I mean, oh, it's I, just in the cards, right? That's what I they got to do. I, I honestly think, and look, this is based on social media, and it's always scary to base any opinion on what you see on Twitter. But I think most Bears fans want Justin Fields back. I think most Bears fans are like, yeah. draft Marvin Harrison Jr. Or maybe trade down a couple of spots to a team that wants Caleb Williams, add even more draft capital, and then huh. take Marvin Harrison Jr. And see and what that, they have in Justin Fields. They think he's just good enough. Yeah, and it's like, well, now he now he finally has enough talent around him to where it's like, okay. yeah, he might actually work. So that uh, let me ask you this: if if you're the Bears, if you're in charge of Chicago right now, you've got those two options. You can either take Caleb Williams at one one, and he's your guy, or you can trade down a couple of spots, pick up some second, third round picks in the future, and draft Marvin Harrison. What would you do? 
I would probably stay with Justin Fields and get more players on my team. I need more players on my team. It's not okay. just that position. I need more players. I got to help that guy out. Then they, they never did from the minute he got there. So this is now they can if he's if he sucks now you can really say he's no good. But if you put players around him and they have a a better season and they're going to have a better season with the type of players that they're having, then you can say we can just keep building with this guy. This guy's good enough to get us where we need to. Or you can take a, a, a flyer on Caleb Williams. What if he's what the Bears always get? You know what they turn out to be once they get to Chicago, and you haven't surrounded him with enough players. That's that's oh, not good because you're not because their quarterback's not going. Justin Fields, where's he going? They'll, they'll trade him somewhere. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe Minnesota. Maybe I don't know. It feels like most of the teams have done something. Yeah, they're running out. Teams are running out of a place to spots for quarterbacks. Yeah, somebody will trade for Justin Fields. They're not going to give up a first or a second to go get him. Oh no, you give up a third or a fourth. Yeah, likely a fourth. I'm trying to say who else needs a quarterback right now. By the way, we have a draft trade that just went down that we will we'll get to here in a second. Have the, have the Saints figured out what they're actually going to do? What about Denver? Saints are going to run it back with Derek Carr at quarterback. They need a future option, but I, I don't think they would make a trade to go get Justin Fields. I think if somebody trades for Justin Fields, they they expect him to play this year or at least compete yes. for a starting job this year, right? Yeah, I don't know. Denver, Denver hadn't made that move yet either. No, they haven't. They obviously got rid of Russell Wilson. Everyone assumes they're going to draft somebody, but they could uh, – they could – hypothetically trade for Justin Fields, but I got a hunch Sean Payton is not a big Justin Fields fan. I see where the commanders took Sam Howell and got rid of him. They did to the Seahawks. Yeah, yeah they really believed in him, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah he was yeah. going to turn out to be okay. That no, took two gonna, years. They're going to take a quarterback with the number two overall pick. Uh, if I'm the Bears, by the way, I'm I'm drafting a quarterback at 1-1. I've seen enough from Justin Fields. So um, I'm drafting a quarterback, and hey, he's got – once again, Keenan Allen and DJ Moore as his wide receivers and DeAndre Swift and Rojo as his running backs and Cole Komet as a tight end. Like, that's yeah. that's enough talent. If a quarterback can play, he'll make those guys look good. Yes. If Justin Fields was better. I think he would have made what the Bears had last year look better. But I just three years, if you're still asking, if you have your guy three years into his career, you don't have your guy. That's no. the way I operate. Now, there have been instances over the course of the league where yeah, – Ask the Green Bay Packers how, Packers how that works out for them. Takes – yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, different different scenario, though. Like, Jordan Love wasn't playing his first three years. We've seen Justin Fields play, so there, there's no unknown yes. with Justin Fields. Like, we, we know right. what he is. At times, he looks great, but at times, he doesn't look good. And I would move on from him if I were Chicago. But whatever they do will be wrong because the Bears well, – the Jets going to need yeah. a quarterback because their quarterback is going to be running for vice president, it looks like. You going to vote for him? No. No, no, you're not voting for John Kennedy, JFK's hologram and Aaron Rodgers. He's not his. This isn't his uncle, Uncle John. This is that's that's the kid. That's the, the kid of the brother. No, that's oh, his nephew. Yeah, no, no, thanks. Okay, And not with Aaron Rodgers on the other end of that ticket. Get Aaron Rodgers out of football. Oh, he'll be out of football anyway. He's I told you he wasn't playing football. This year, he's playing. That's about to come true. That dude is going to be in the government now. Thanks. Hey, we're all, you know, I know it's shoddy as it is, but it's about to get shoddier with that egghead in there. He's not actually going to be in government. If he does get offered the vice presidential nom with RFK Jr. and accept it, he's not going to win. They're not you know, going to win. That dude but... would be the dude with the white hair at the municipality. Aaron Rogers? Rogers? Oh, yeah. Giving out speeding tickets in Lakeway <laughs> with a pipe filled with weed. <laughs> oh my God. Come on, man. What a fall from grace that would be. No, he, dude, please. He's hanging please, out with bro. you at night court in Lakeway. <laughs> that would be great. Jesus. Please, dude, run for office. You're not going to quarterback. We all knew that was just a farce anyway. He'll run for office, but he won't win. He'll have he an just, office somewhere. He just, wants, he just wants people talking about him, man. That's all it is. He doesn't actually want to do politics, but if he's no. running for VP of the country, people are going to be talking about him. That's why he's doing this. He loves to be talked about. And you know what he's probably going to do? 
he'll turn down the offer. He might not even get offered. He'll just release a statement saying that he ah, turned I, it, I, turned I care too much about the Jets. I made a commitment to the Jets. This is what I'm going to do. And that will be a headline that people talk about. So, hey, Aaron Rodgers gets discussed again. Congrats. But he's taking off and he's going to smoke some Hiawatha. So, everything will be good. Pocahontas, as you like to call it. <laughs> yeah, whatever he's smoking. Goodness gracious. That, um, and the other receiver move, by the way, you did talk about this. How about Hollywood Brown going to the Chiefs? Love that. One-year contract, a free agency deal for the former Oklahoma Sooner. He can still fly. Yeah, he's coming off of a bad year. Now, he was in Arizona, and Arizona yes. didn't have quarterback play because Kyler Murray missed the majority of the season. Uh, career low, 574 yards in 14 games. They but, got you fly, though. Yeah, he's had uh, he's, he had a 1,000-yard season in 2021. Hasn't lived up to the first-round billing out of college, but he's been a solid receiver. And, yeah, he's only 27, so I, I still think he's got that speed that obviously made him a monster at Oklahoma and made him a first-round pick a few seasons ago. So he's better than what the Chiefs had last year, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I still Jordan think – He's all over the place. Boy, I still, he'll, I, he'll be uh, the next guy that Patrick Mahomes will be throwing their helmets on the sideline because he has some – he used to have some catching problems. He got better. No, he still does have some drops issues. Ugh. So I still think the Chiefs are going to draft a receiver with that last pick in the first round. And oh yeah, you, you've seen a ton of mock drafts with Xavier Worthy ending up there. So I don't think this uh, signing takes Kansas City out of the mix for a wide receiver. But this this helps. I mean, they. You think Adnan Mitchell be gone before that? I don't know. I think there's a chance Mitchell's there. Um, yeah, uh, Mitchell and Worthy, like they could go anywhere from 20 to 40, if we're being honest with you. I wouldn't be surprised by them going anywhere in that There's range. There's a lot of wide receivers coming out this year. Yeah. Once again, you've got those three top guys with Harrison Jr., a.k.a. Maserati Marv, as Gus Johnson likes to call him, uh, Roman Dunze and Malik Neighbors. Those guys are probably going in the top 10. And then after that, yeah, the, the, the group from like 4 to 12, it's almost like, uh, you know, choose your character type of situation, flavor of the month type of deal. Yep. Like just whatever teams are looking for, the two Texas guys are in there. Brian Thomas from LSU is in there. Keon Coleman from Florida State is in there. Lad McConkey, the white guy from Georgia's in that conversation too. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, once again, I, I think Worthy or Mitchell would be a great fit in Kansas City, don't you? Yeah, I, I do. I you know, I, I think the kid from Florida State would be a, a nice fit for him, too, because that guy can catch, and he makes unusual catches. I mean, ridiculous catches. Yeah. Big and body dude, yeah. super strong. Not very yeah. fast. I think ran a 4-6 you know, at the combine. Yeah, you know, he, he almost runs like tight end speed. You know what I mean? He, that's that's, But but he makes the catches. He can catch it in the crowd because he's so big. Yeah. He looks more like a tight end than a wide receiver. He's a big dude. That speed's telling you at four six, he is more like a tight end. You know, he'll be a slot guy that can do a lot of things, but his his ball catching radius is ridiculous. He's a monster of a big dude. So, I mean, I, I like. I mean, what I saw of him last year, I thought he was a consistent catcher of easy balls, but I thought he made the tough catches look pretty easy too. He's like Mitchell. He can he he'll get to the ball for you. He's and he'll big. sacrifice his body. He got a lot of body to give up. You know. Yeah. 6'3", 213 at the combine. Yeah. Uh, obviously bigger than Worthy, a little bit bigger than Mitchell, who was, I think, 6'2", 205. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, once again, it just depends on what teams are looking for. All those guys, I think, have talent. I think all those dudes have a chance to be really, really good Sunday players. Yeah, I think Mitchell has probably peaked out. He's been around football for a while. He's not going to be a guy that ends up 215. He's He is where he is right now. His body-wise, you know what I'm saying, 6'2", 205. I don't expect him to have a couple pizzas and be 220 something as a wide receiver. I expect his body is where it, where it should be now. Yeah. He's not he's an older guy and, and 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 going out and has played some real good football at a high level. So, I expect he understands what he needs to be and what what weight he needs to be at. You know, some guys go in at 205, all of a sudden become 2 218 or 220 and you're going, he's not quite the same guy anymore. You know, he doesn't have that explosive yeah. look. Yeah, so, I don't I don't know why AD Mitchell would change anything, right? No, there's nothing for him to change. He's been a really, Four, really three. good player. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ridiculous speed and athleticism. And obviously the tape matches the traits. And right. 
probably a first round pick because of all of that. So yeah, if I'm a team drafting AD Mitchell, I'm not asking him to put on weight. I'm telling yeah. him to just do what you do. I'm not uh, asking him to be a slot. You can just, just be a receiver. We'll put you anywhere. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. A draft day trade to talk about already. Our first draft trade. Nice. Of, of the draft season. We're still more than a month away from the NFL draft and we already have moves being made and it involves the Houston Texans. The Texans no longer have a first round pick. What? The Texans have made a deal with Minnesota. All right. I hope it's a guy who just got to Minnesota because you don't want any leftovers there. Your Minnesota Vikings. The Texans have traded the 23rd overall pick and the 232nd overall pick in this year's draft to Minnesota in exchange for pick 42, okay. pick 188, and a 2025 second round pick. Yeah, they are build they're building around their quarterback and and of course that defense. They're they're looking to get some guys in those ladder rounds for on on defense. I like it. So the Texans no longer have a first round pick. They now have two second round picks this year. Right. Let me pull up their selections. So they'll they'll be at 42 and 59. 42 is Minnesota's pick. 59 is their own pick. And then they pick up an extra second uh next year as well. As a part of the receiver, deal. you can get the receiver you want this year or next year. Another right. receiver, as you said, BK. I don't I don't know if I like this move. I haven't I haven't done the research yet, and I haven't checked the uh, draft value charts to see if this trade makes sense and if the Texans got a good deal in the eyes of the analytics out there. But I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe it is a good move. I just don't like trading first round picks for not first round picks. So now the Texans no longer have a first round pick. For two second rounders, right? Well, two one next year and one a year after. Yeah, well, they have two this year, and then they picked up one next year as well. Okay. So they'll have two next season, too. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll see what the draft value charts say once again with this deal. Maybe it'll sway in favor of the Texans. like those first-round picks, though, because you get that fifth-year option with the player that you select in round one. Basically, though, Minnesota moves up, in the de- uh, moves up into the first round. They get another pick in round one. And the Texans, like you said, they get a surplus of picks. Yes. And I, they're building, they're building, as I said, for the future. You know, Minnesota's why are the Texans building for the future? They should build for right now. Well, I mean, they're building, they're building on both sides of the ball more so than the future. They're building on both sides of the ball. They're getting picks that they can use on both sides because as I said, the head coach is always going to take care of that defense. That's going to be his thing, but equally as important as that quarterback. So I, I, it's it's either another offensive lineman they can use on a second round pick or another wide receiver. You think they should still go wide receiver, right? Uh, I think at some point they need a receiver, whether it's in free agency or in the draft. I would like them to bring in a third wide receiver. And they've Lots got of receivers any- out there for the second round. I mean, there's a lot sure. of tons. Of them. Yeah, that that they're might good. be their move, right? Yeah, they're, like, they're good. Yeah, and the Texans have done a great job in free agency plugging a lot of holes that they had on their roster. Sure. So they, they don't have any major, major needs at this moment in time because of what they've done. So, yeah, they're trading back. They're adding more picks in the hopes of adding more players. And now for Minnesota, I think they're the more intriguing team as a part of this deal because well, they've got two first-round picks now. They've got 11 and they've got 23. Are they going to try to use both of those to move up into the top five to draft a quarterback? Well, we got to have a QB, so... And they went and got Sam Darnold. I don't I don't think that's their long-term plan. No, we know he'll start the first two games and that'll be it for him. So what do you uh, think? They could hang back and get JJ. I don't know if they can. I don't know if JJ's gonna make it to eleven. That's the thing. They might feel like they have to trade up to go get JJ. Oh. Which I mean, if you're trading up for one of the top three guys, then that might be a little easier to stomach. You're going to have to give yes. up both of those firsts and maybe a future first to move into the top three to get Williams, May, or Daniels. But 
Uh, I guess there's a chance it is for JJ. I'd give up the two, give up the two for Daniels. It's going to be more than that. Would you give up three first for Daniels? No, I'd give up two. And then you're not getting Daniels. You can't. I don't think they'll be allowed to move Drake May into the top. Th- I, I don't. I think it will cost more than that too. I think to move from eleven to the top three in this year's quarterback class, where it feels like there's three really good ones. Mm-hmm. I think. I think it's three firsts. If not three firsts, it's two firsts and a lot of other stuff going back yeah. to the other team. So that's um, what I think Minnesota's doing, though. That'd be my guess. They are loading up to to get some sort of quarterback this year in a trade up. So I think their work is just beginning and the Texans are stockpiling draft picks and uh, for this year and for next year. Yeah. They're, like I said, they stock. I know that the future is now for them, but they're stockpiling where they need players. They can plug them in. They can get them and get them in that, you know, those picks in the draft and they're going to be good players. Those second round players, as you say, are players. Mm-hmm. They come in and play for it. offensive linemen, you know, linebackers, you know, we know what the coach knows about the with the linebackers. It's the wide receivers that if they the, that whole group that's so good this year, as you said, there's there's a number one tier that holds about three guys. There's a number two tier that holds about six guys, probably at wide receivers. You can really get a good wide receiver now in the second round. Yeah, they can. really good receiver. I'm with you. Yeah, that pick 42 is uh, yeah. going to be an interesting one for Houston. Now, do they go O line? Do they go D line? Do they go wide receiver? Uh, once again, they've done a really good job. That roster was one of the worst in football yes. uh, at this time two years ago. And, hell, at this time last year, people thought it was one of the worst rosters in the NFL. And, well, it helps when you get the coach right. really helps when you get the quarterback right. Yes. A g- great draft overall last year. And, uh, yeah, with the money they've spent in free agency, they don't have any glaring needs at the moment. So Probably got a young secondary wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've uh, they've turned it around. Give Nick Casario some credit. And I'm I'm looking at Twitter right now, looking at the uh, the draft value trade chart, and this actually looks like a good deal for the Texans. Most of the uh, the value charts are saying the Texans actually got the better end of this mm-hmm. trade. So even though they gave up a first round pick because of what they're getting in return, that extra second in 2025, yep. uh, the analytics out there say that the Texans won on this I'm deal. Part of that analytics. You're an analytics guy? Yeah, I'm an anal guy. Oh, you're an anal guy. An anal, anal guy, something like that. Yeah. You're both. You're an anal guy and an anal guy. <laughs> I'm all I'm all of it. I'd like to know what an anal I is. like guys I like when you have more picks. I, I I just do anything from that, and especially if you can get them in the second round. Now, if you give me a bunch of guys in the fourth round and fifth round, you can have that stuff. No, thank you. Mm-hmm. I'll go find a guy who can run down there for, for kickoffs. And I don't I, I like I like the ones that are going to come in in that third round and that second round and be players for me, and they can take the spots of a guy who may miss a week or two. You know, and that second round pick next year might be pretty high. Like I don't know if Minnesota is going to be that good next season, especially if they're taking a rookie quarterback. Right. Like, they, they might have some bumps and bruises, and you know they could be a bad team, which means that second round pick in twenty twenty five could right. be in the thirties or early forties. You're right. So broke back Bucky loves the anal. Or yeah, anal. I don't think I don't think Minnesota is just going to flip that switch. Well, I mean, they've got an offensive guy at head coach, and I know they've gone through so many injuries with the quarterbacks, and then bringing in substitute quarterbacks. But they're they're y'all going they're going they're going all in for a quarterback, and it's the long haul. Either this coach or somebody else. We got time out. Look who's here. DD has entered the building. Good morning. Can't be on my phone as much anymore. Restroom break. Miss you guys. Oh, so she's been on the phone a lot. The bosses say, hey, get off the phone and get back to weatherizing. Wow. Dee Dee, we thought you entered the listener portal. We thought we had lost you. And Bucky's trying to take your weather title back. What do you mean take my take hers? It's hers. She it's has re- the title. It's a return to the kingdom. Sorry about that Thursday call there, DD. She's got the belt right now, all right? I know you're on spring break, doing all kinds of stuff with the kids, enjoying vacation, but as a weatherer, we do not have vacation. We work 24-7. You know, we work 365. We don't we don't take off to go on vacation. We're always there for the people, or at least I'm always there for the people. You work two hours a day on this show. 
365. Come no, on. The rest of the time I'm out doing weather things. Weather things. Yes. And like like anal. <laughs> and getting tickets. <laughs> and getting tickets. DD, we need a forecast for the weekend. The Bucks. A little afraid since I, I call for rain this morning and today, since I'm right already. All right, weatherman Buck, we got another listener question for you from one of our TSU agents. Shout out to all of our TSU agents out there. Thank you for supporting what we do here. More info in the description if you're watching on YouTube. Texas baseball plays tonight, the first of three against Washington at the dish. Is the game going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen. I gave you the rain this morning. It was it was like Dee Dee's call of that rain last week. Thunder, lightning, early in the morning, and then no more rain. You're good. Today's going to be good. Sun will be out. You know, you may get some scattered, as I call them, scattered showers, or us weatherers call it scattered showers. But you're fine for tonight. It's going to be a nice evening for a baseball game, just like it's going to be nice, nice in the midday here today. I see the sun. I can see the sun through my shades over here right now. Must be sunny. Can you see out your back patio, that magnificent patio of yours, BK? That's yeah, giant. What would you call it yesterday? What? The, uh, I don't know. You used a veranda? fancy Yeah, veranda. There it are is. You, are, are you, do you have a plan out there on the veranda right now? I got a plan on the veranda, and I got my old pair picking up my kids from school. There you go. Good job. How's your plant doing? I think it's alive. Well, it's been one day. I hope it's alive. I hope it's alive. I watered it the first day. You said I didn't need to water it. Uh, no, you don't need any more. It's did it get a little rain? Probably got a little some some mist in there. It's good. Okay. My wife said don't let it get too much water on the roots. Those desert roses don't like the roots to get too soaked. Okay, but water it, but don't too much water it. Yeah, don't go like I told you. Water it one week and then wait a couple of weeks. Okay, all right, that's. But, but you know what? If you want to go with nature, it close enough that the rain will get on it, you'll be fine because that's the real natural water, not that stuff you bring out of your spigot that everybody else has been spitting in in your apartment building and stuff. Don't, that water, no, you only want to use so much of that. That's rain. And, or, or, or listen, why don't you just find out from Dee Dee when it's going to rain and watch that thing dry out there at your house. Yeah, we need Dee Dee to be taking a deuce right now so she has time to tell us what the weather's going to be. How about that? She can't even take you out to be a weatherer. No, she's, uh, she's busy, man. She's got stuff to do right now, so... Once a weatherer, always a weatherer. Not, no matter people, people can't pull you from this direction or that direction. You got to stay right in the middle as a weatherer. Yeah, DD always the people. DD was just a one-time weatherer, I guess. Wow, might be all we Went down pretty hard on DD today. Ah, we just we need her back, man. The people need the weather. It's as simple as that. And I'm not sure you're the guy who can give it to them. So that's my concern right here. That is my concern. Are you saying I didn't call for rain and we did not get rain today on a Friday? I'm saying you are giving me that credit. You really, that's hard for you to give me that. I gave you that credit right at the start of the show. I'm just saying you've got one in a row, right? And you're sitting here talking like you're Tom Brady of weather guessing. <laughs> I am the goat. <laughs> no, yes, not I even am. close. Oh, God, you're, you're, you're the Dan Orlovsky of weather guessing. Right Thank you very now. much there. Goodness gracious. All right. Quick uh, sponsor shout-outs. We got some fun videos to get into. Got some Texas Longhorn football conversation to have as well. But first, Buck, how about uh, another sponsor shout-out? Our good friends over at Leaf Landscaping and Supply Service, Monterey Oaks and 290 South and Pond, Pond Springs Road there, and that is up north. And, folks, they have everything that you need. We're talking plants, talking about shrubs, talking about roses, talking about grass. They've got it all there. And BK still needs to go out south there in Monterey Oaks and grab him another plant out there. He's going to have a regular little jungle on his veranda. And you can get all of that, all the different types of plants, all the different types of fertilizers they have. They have people right there on site. See Jeff once you're out south. See Brad once you're up north. And ask them about your yard. Ask them about landscaping. Tell them that you want to become a landscaper yourself. Give them the layout of, the, of your property. They'll tell you what fits the area of your property and the, and the soils of your property. And they'll tell you which side, north side, south side, east side, west side, what grows best, and especially in this, uh, the kind of land that we have here in Texas. The, the grass and the ground is pretty hard out here. Lots of caliche. By the way, things grow okay in the caliche. Certain plants, caliche will hold a lot of moisture. I know you don't know about the word the caliche. You know that stone that kind of breaks up, got it all over the place? Well, it does hold a lot of moisture. So there's things that you can actually plant in caliche. 
I've done a pretty good job of that being a landscaper myself. So, but uh, if you want to know from the real pros, go to leaf landscaping and supply services.com. Find out more information on what you need to grow. You need to go over there and get some, some plant food for your plant that you have. Food. I thought you just said water. You gotta, you gotta feed it. Feed it you know, water. like it, it needs some plant food too. What it's a desert. Like soil. No, not soil. There's some little beads that you put in. Osmocote. Osmocote. I'll tell you about this stuff. Osmocote. Three months. You know, it's a slow fertilizer that you can use. Put it in once, BK, just a little spoonful, and it's good for three months. You don't have to fertilize it again. It's a lot. It's like having a baby without a mama there with you. You're asking okay. me every three months to do something? That's such a big time commitment, dude. Every three months? Yeah. And it's not like you have to be on time. It's not like the 90 days that I have to be good in the municipality of Lakeway or I'll be I'll be paying the full ride of my ticket. No, man. Different. Mm. You can be two days late on fertilizing. You'll be okay. I plan to get water and water only. And wow. If you can't make it, tough scene. Survival of the fittest plant. <laughs> then get yourself some cactus and just stick out there. Hey, you pay rent and then I'll get you food. All right. There you, you go. You go out there and get your own food plant. Still not changing light bulbs in your in your apartment? No, I get the maintenance guys to do it for me. Why would I pay for the light? I already pay this place enough. Why would I pay for the bulb? Then I'm going to do the labor on my own? They have bulbs at 7-Eleven. Just grab a couple and then call them to come and put it in. Tell them you'll pay for the bulb. No, I ain't paying for Jack. You know what? I got <laughs> golf to watch and basketball to go. watch. I don't have time there to change go. light bulbs. Shout out to Leaf Landscape Supply. Also, how about a word from our great friends out at Covert BK? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes indeed. Sir. Love the Coverts. Love all of our great sponsors here on TSU. Also, a quick shout out to our friends at Woods Comfort Systems. Oh. Make sure your AC unit is working the way that it's supposed to work. And you're going to know if it's not working. Believe me, sure. you'll know. Right away. And uh, the first people and the only people you're going to need to call. Woods Comfort Systems. Almost eight years. I got to say, almost 70 years in business here in Austin, Texas, USA, America. The best HVAC and plumbing services that you can find. You always see those blue and yellow trucks rolling around Austin with good reason. Uh, they know what they're doing. They've got a ton of satisfied customers from their 68 years here in Central Texas. And uh, yeah, if you've got a plumbing issue or if you have an HVAC problem, there is nobody else you need to call besides woods comfort systems 512-842-5066 or check them out online at woodscomfortsystems.com woods comfort systems where comfort is our middle name let's say hello to our guy brandon mars over at top gun see if his store out south how, how they're doing there i'm going to give him a call today i haven't talked to him in a while so I need to give him a shout out see how both the stores are doing and i know what's going on up north because that place is the center of it all his place up there so you can get everything you need for your landscaping uh, needs. If you want to do your own garden, you can go up there. And, and Brandon's got everything that you need. He's got tillers there, all sizes. You know, the big man can handle big tiller, you know, get through the ground. Well, they got small sizes, too, for you for you little, little car drivers. You know, you can get there and just kind of go. But he's got that. He's got the, all, the, all the rakes, all the shovels. If you're trying to trim your own trees, he's got that for you, too. He's got pole saws there. He's got chainsaws there. He's got it all. If you need to get yourself a little bobcat, you need to rent a bobcat, Brandon has that also. So give them a shout for sure. Love Brandon Mars and Top Gun. Topgun.net is the website. Top Gun, they will shoot you straight. Um, quick video for you, Buck. Okay. This is a tough scene here. We've got a woman who... Looks like she's trying to take a step onto a boat, right? She's like going from a dock onto a boat. You know how sometimes there's a little bit of a gap in between. Oh, no, BK. I always have a, I go to fish camp and I'm always horrified 
about when I get ready to go out in the morning. Mm -hmm. if there's that little space in between. I'm thinking I can't fit in there. So I'm going to go and then my head's going to get large and my feet are going to be in the water. <laughs> and my head and my jaw are sticking up there. But I always feel like I'm going to fall in that thing because, you know, with my balance, it's not real good. So when you're down at fish camp, things are moving. You know, you're out in the boat. You're sure. on the dock. You got, you're trying to put stuff into the boat. I always, and the guys are all, I'm going to tell you what, when I go with, with the dudes, with my buddies, the Texas cheaters, they're always good about let's not give that to Buck to try to hand over and all that stuff. And they always put a hand out, you know, like, like the lady getting on the cruise ship. Come here, honey. Let me take your hand, get you on the boat. They're very good at that because I get a little nervous trying to jump from the dock onto the boat. Well, that's a perfect preface for this yes. video we're about to show you because oh, no, no. Uh, it's a large group of people. And you know, are, they round like are you saying large, large people? No, no, they're not fat. Well, but fat, that's a bad word. I'm just making sure I know oh. what you're talking about. Are you talking about like, like, Big shoulders, like they're super muscular. Are you talking about fat? You get stuck in between. Yeah. Okay. No, it's just a big group of people. Got you. Okay. Got you. Big, big group of people. And it looks like, I don't know, maybe a grandmother or an elderly mom decides to hop on this boat first. Oh, no. And she did not really mind the gap. Take a look at this. Oh, <laughs> no. That's my fear. That's it, right? Boom! Down oh. she goes. She just she didn't. She, goes, she disappears into the water. And that's an obvious one. There's so much space in between the land and the boat here. Come on, Grandma, and, get yourself some glasses. You need to know you got to step up. Well, look. There, it looks like there are two guys right there on each side of her, and it almost looks like she's expecting them to lift her up. Lift her up, you, or you think that step is up. Like they're gonna pick her up and bring her up there. Look, she kind of sticks her hands out and she grabs one of the guy's hands. And I think, yeah, she's expecting that, like, the, all she has to do is step and the guys are going to basically carry her and pick her up and put her on the ship. And they don't. The guys they didn't stop. do that. Dude, and then they, oh, you know, and then her, you know, her back hits that back part. Oh, that would have been it for me. That was yeah. it. Sorry, I'm not going boating today, y'all. Yeah, she probably got soaked. Hotel, man. Yeah, nobody's going boating today after that. Y'all, y'all let that happen. Y'all let me go first, and you let me eat shit into the water. <laughs> She's down there with the shrimp in the shrimp bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Oh, here, yeah. Grandma, I have some shrimp. I mean, oh, look at that. Oh. oh, she hit her back. Oh, yeah. I can't but... help you in fall school there. I can't tell. That's one of those mid-air things where somebody semi got your hand too. Like, Hey, it's better off if you let me go and let me just go underwater here and I'll come up on the other side. But if you're half holding me, I'm going to slam into the dock there, hit my old ass head, need stitches. The party's all screwed up for the day. I'm suing the company. Wow. Mm. So down she goes. Yeah, I think, uh, look, it's it's her fault for assuming, but the guys, they got to help her there. That's their job. That's why they're standing there. Why put your hand out there if you're not going to lift the old lady up some? Exactly. By the way, the you know, obviously she's right, right hand or right footed. She lets the left foot almost go over the thing first. Look, she doesn't look, watch the left foot. Right where the left foot's going down. <laughs> Grandma, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, my was, God. It was, yeah, you're right. Even before she tries to take that big step onto the boat. One of the feet has to be stable. They both can't be going down, Grandma. Yeah, she, she almost uh, fell in on her own there. I'm not yeah. trusting two young dudes on a ship. Well, I those guys, Isaac, those guys both Isaac. lost their jobs. I need Julie and Isaac from the love boat to get me up on one of those deals. I'm not trusting two, two, two jabronis are doing from high school that have a weekend job. Uh-uh. Um, if I stick my hand out and I don't get a firm grip, I'm not taking that next step. I'll look at the guy and go, hey, are you going to hold this hand or are you going to kiss it? What am, what am I, the, 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 the queen or something? Hey, grab my hand, lift me up. Don't just hold hands with me. They didn't do either. No. They just let her go. And then as she was falling, it's like they tried to grab her wrist. So not only. Oh, they're going to break her wrist and break and dislocate her shoulder going in there? Yep. Do we have a result of that that action right there at all? I don't think so. Uh -uh. Can we find out? Can we make a call? Uh, let's get the grandma on the show. There is no doubt that we need. I would like to definitely interview her. Let's find out who that lady is, and let's get an interview with her. 
Okay. So she can bitch out that crew. We'll see if we can make that happen. Let's make that happen because that is, that's 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 not good work by those two. No, horrible work. It, it's bad by her, but it's awful by the two guys who are literally there to make sure that that doesn't happen. I don't want to say she's too old to be aboard the ship, but she's that's not a fist. I mean, that thing had a little step. She that, was a big, that was a big gap, too. It's not like the airplane, right? When you go from the tarmac to the airplane. Yeah, and by the way, at fish camp, the gap is not that big either. I mean, you know, you just step over in the boat. You can get one leg on the boat. I can generally get one leg on yeah. ground, one leg onto the boat, and then just grab my other leg with my two hands and pull that back with me and get yeah. onto the boat. That right there. It's a big gap. You're it's like saying a manhole. It's like falling in a manhole cover. She's got a Come big on. gap. That's what you're saying? No, I'm just saying that's too much of a gap if you got old people doing that. If yeah. you're if your two dudes aren't going to totally lift her off the ground. And by the way, she needs to understand, Grandma, left foot, stable. Oh, no, the left foot and the right foot go down. You have to have one of those feet has to be the stabilizer. That's one thing from fall camp. I'll give her that. You mm. have to have a stabilizer. So you can't have both feet in the air. You know what I'm saying? Right. I didn't I can't believe that the left foot gave way like that down to into the into the hole there. <laughs> you, think she was, you think she got wet? Yeah, I would hope there's water there. It would have hurt way more if there wasn't. Oh man. What is they stopped, who stopped running camera up there? That's one where the camera needs to continue the I know, I'm with you. Yeah. Whoever was running the camera just freaked out and that grandma ain't that old either. She's yeah. she's in her sixties. Yeah, I think so. Not a true granny over 75. You know what I'm saying? That's the She'll age. be able to make that step up. She doesn't need those guys' help. Come on now. Go true see granny. Texas. Go see Texas Orthopedics. Get yourself a new knee and let's go. Yep. Go you know? see audio visual consultations. Get you a new TV. <laughs> then you can watch videos of boats on TV instead of ever getting on a <laughs> boat right. again, lady. Oh. I- 512-255-8678, the phone number for AV consultations. Get your home TV set up done the way you want it done. Yeah, if I I'm the granddad know. there, I go and slug those two guys in the mouth. Yeah, yeah. Someone's got to be like, dude, what the hell was that? She stuck her hand out. You grabbed her hand and you let her fall. Yeah, right. Dingus. <laughs> yeah, they're done. Those guys need a new high school job. Oh, that's she, that's it's like my ex-wife when I was at the uh, in uh, for the for the Memphis for the bowl there that the worst bowl trip in America that's in Memphis there. Yeah. And uh, when she was coming out, this is after I had danced with Miss America that night. Oh, she was pregnant. She wasn't even supposed to make that trip. She was like eight months pregnant, ready to go. And it was icy outside. And I told her to take I took her hand. And she went down on her ass, which was extra big because she was nine months pregnant. And she she never held my hand again from that point on. She said I was the one who made her fall. Hmm. Like I was the one who knocked her up, too. You know what I'm saying? So it was all my fault. It was all my fault. She went down. You dropped your woman after you were dancing with another woman earlier that night. Williams. You danced with a supermodel looking woman. And... You didn't drop icy. her. You didn't drop her, did you? Well, hell no. But you dropped your I had a wife. Tight grip. I had a tight grip on all that. And you just dropped your wife. I didn't drop her. I just asked her, here, Give me, give me, let me have your hand. I didn't pull. I didn't yank. You she pushed. went down sort of like Granny did, like down. And she went right, boom, right on her ass. Boy, yeah, she, she grabbed your hand expecting that you were going to keep her up. And you didn't. You failed. I failed. I was scarecrow at that time. Sorry. Oh. She went down. Glad she didn't yeah. hit her belly or we'd be missing a son. AJ did wouldn't you, be around. But she help? went down on her ass and it bounced. It went boom, 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 boom. It wasn't like hitting stick. It was boom, 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 and sliding down. She Worst fell down trip. the stairs? No, no. She it was the sidewalk. Worst bowl trip in America. Coldest bowl trip, worst bowl trip. Goodness gracious. Yeah, did, you, did you help her up or you're just like, you fell, oh, you get up? No, 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 no. She didn't let me. She's like, get away from me. Wow. In front of the crowd, like, no, no, no. I'm not giving you my hand now. Don't put your hands underneath my shoulders and try to lift me either. Yeah, go back and dance with Miss America. <laughs> I see you looking at her anyways. Right oh, now. man. That was something. That was. I can't believe they let that granny go through there. You, yeah. you can't do that. You can't, you can't touch flesh and not hold her up. 
can't touch flesh and not hold her up. And then, Granny, you can't fall through that gap. I know it's a pretty large gap. It's the one step up. One foot has to be the plant foot, okay? Like making a cut. You have to plant off that left foot to get the right one up. If the guys are just holding you lightly, you can get that right foot up after you go to, you know, get that knee replaced, put it up there, and then drag that other one up there. The other kid can then lift you up a little bit. But you can't fall through the gap there with both feet in the air. She's almost <laughs> like she tried to jump through there. I mean, she didn't even try to get on that boat. She didn't even no. like what she was took it? like was a she... regular sized step to try to dive. Are you going diving? That was grandma's shark. Good grief. Grandma shark. Do 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 to do. There's there's dinner. Baby shark, baby shitty, baby shark. You did not have baby that stuff when you were a kid, right? What? Where did you hear all this baby shark stuff? Do, 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 do. My grandson used to listen to that stuff. I heard it when it came out a couple of years ago. It wasn't around. It's a new, newer song. It took the place of like the Teletubbies. I'm sure the Teletubbies are still there. No, they're gone. Ba baby shark song. First created in the early 80s, but 2016 is when it became popular. Wow, baby shark. <laughs> That's the YouTube video. First YouTube video ever to reach 10 billion views. Did you realize that I was trying to get in touch with the people from Baby Shark to come to the Mullet Open to have a deal out there at the hotel on a, on Friday night? And that, it's the hardest thing to get to those people. You know what I mean? That place would be sold out, and every other hotel in the city would have been sold out back then when I was trying to do that. You're trying to do what now? Bring the Baby Shark, that whole crew, you know, to come and entertain the kids. What? At the yes. That would have... That would have been it open. Yes, afterwards. Why? It's all adults who play in that thing. Yeah, but you know how many kids are at that hotel. You know what it would have done for a fundraiser to have that group out there. I don't know. I would have every left. Hotel, somebody said every hotel in the city would have been booked with kids to come out there for that. They're that big of a deal. They're huge. How much did they charge? I don't did know. You, did you even get to that point? I didn't get to that point. I just thought it would be a great idea. For, you know, to have the adult event and then have those kids have that group come out. I mean, they were huge. I mean, they like having albums and I mean, it's just a bunch of goofballs in a shark outfit. That's what it is. Yeah. Not talking about the Katy Perry halftime performance of the Super Bowl <laughs> oh, a few years ago. Oh, with that shark, that was great. And they had the left shark and right shark. That was that was up. cool. That was great. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, grandma. Dude, she hit her back. That's not good for a grandma. No, no, it's not good for anybody to fall like that. Oh, I can boy, now at fish camp, I'm going to roll over to, into the boat now. You I'm better be careful. Them, get something where they can roll me into the boat. Let me just roll down it and boom. And then here's the, uh, here's the still shot of her actually falling in. No. There it is. Look at the grips by those guys. I can't believe they couldn't lift her up from that. I can't believe they couldn't beat gravity there. No, there's a lot of gravity going down in that hole, and that would have dislocated those shoulders, and we can't have dislocations. No, yeah, she's done at this point. It is over, and she knows it too. <laughs> you think she's thinking about it on the way down? Wild this that they couldn't the, save her. The last day of my life, I'm going between the ship Am I going to get crushed by the boat now with these yeah, two cows on the ends of me? How do you get her out of there? You got to move I, I the dropped, boat? I dropped the hand there. I dropped the hand and let her bounce off the bottom. I let her become the anchor of the boat. God, just leave her down there. Why is she on that boat? Why does she want to go fishing anyway? It doesn't look a like a fishing boat. She's not wearing fishing gear. It looks like a, a mini yacht or something, just a little cruise ship where she's just going to go for a Three-hour tour? Cruise. going on a three-hour tour? Something like that. Yeah, okay there, Ginger and Marianne. Sorry, yeah, Skipper. Make, make her clean barnacles while she's down there. Do something <laughs> useful. <laughs> now, Isaac would have – love boat Isaac would have never let her do that. They understand how you're supposed to get – you're supposed to have a ramp, not a step up. Ay, what a mess. Where the hell All did right. you come up with that one from? Uh, they found me. I don't find the stories. The stories find yes. me. Uh, I'm in trouble this weekend, Buck. Uh-oh. One of my favorite activities <laughs> every weekend is well, yeah. to, watch, to watch some films. 
that are geared towards adults. Okay. And I'm going to have a harder time, no pun intended, doing that this weekend because of new legislation in the state of Texas. Now, if you try to go to an adult film site, I'm not sure how often you frequent those, Buck. Never. Well, here's what you'll see if you try to log on to the hub right now. All of the main adult film websites are no longer accessible here in the great state of Texas because of a new law that was passed in the state of Texas that is geared towards preventing children from being able to stumble upon these websites. Requires age verification to get to websites like the hub and the other tube and browsers and, you know, just to yeah, name it. It's basically and send all you perverts back to, to, to the megaplexes and places like that and picking up videos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the adult films, DWs. Oh, you got to make the stop off now and get your two day rental. Now you're back a, to that. You got to get a DVD player again. Yeah, that's right. Go to, Hey, go to Goodwill. You can get those. I go back to my magazine collection here. No. You still have that uh, bunch of magazines of at the two. old place? Two deals. That's it. I mean, what are we doing here? Like, this is a nightmare. I'm trying to get you people back to being straight with the world. The, well, you straight. can watch you can watch straight porn if you want. <laughs> they got all sorts of stuff on there. It doesn't matter. No, that's fine. Don't let the kids get to that stuff. Thank you. The kids have to learn. There's valuable life lessons. No, you got to know what they're doing. That's what their mamas and daddies are for. Oh, let them, yeah, let they're them. gonna show you what to do. You're gonna watch. No, Bro. let them let them talk to you. Let them talk to you about the birds and the bees. They you don't gotta need to see. see we gotta see. No, how this works. No. Go back to the adult megaplex or whatever. That's how I it. learned. No, I learned it from older guys and older different classes. Oh, you, had, oh, you were watching them. They were inviting you over to no, what, what you were. They were telling me what I needed. There? They were telling me what I needed to do. I didn't need to watch it. I didn't need to see it. They need to, they taught you and talk to you about it. You it wasn't the greatest it. places to get it from, but I had to get it from somewhere. I didn't want to hit my computer and pow, there it is. Well, your first time was probably not great then. I mean, even if you do kind of know what you're supposed to do, the first time's never going to be the best, but. Read, read about it. That's why they make Cosmopolitan. <laughs> yeah. That's not, not going to help you there. Sure. Read about it. We are robbing our kids here. No, about all the book actual book. problems we have in this country and in this state. Get the anatomy book, my body, myself, that all the nurses have to get. They got and pictures read in book. there. They got visuals yeah, they got, in there. They got pics. They have pics. Pics could help, but man, what is going on here? This you is our big it. issues. Can't look at that at the Sears and Robot catalog. They don't make those anymore with the bra section. So that's gone. Yeah. That's not going to do it for me, but I'm glad that does it for you. Uh, yeah, look, the, the good news is Twitter is, oh, my God, Twitter's become a factory for this type of stuff now. Really? They do it on Twitter now? Dude, it's all over the place on Twitter. It's insane. So we still have access to that here in the great state of Texas, for better or for worse, but no hub. So I got, I got a lot more time on my hands this weekend, that's for sure. A lot more hands on your time. Yeah, for sure. No, I don't. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know wow. what I'm going to do. It's a tragedy. So there you go. There's your uh, final Maybe that was, that's what Granny was thinking about as she took that step. She was thinking I about Pornhub? I was got something else on my mind, but wow. Uh, you think she was Didn't thinking about the hub as she was taking Born. that step? That's why she wasn't paying attention? Dude, she wasn't paying attention to anything with that step. That one baby step. Oh, my gosh. Take All a right, before, before we get out of here, by the way, Stu Myrick, the great Super Bowl Stu, a.k.a. Yes. Speedway Stu, is going to be in for WAX today. So it'll be Stu and Double R. Uh, I probably should have started the show with this, uh, and I hate ending the show on a kind of a, a sad story. But you know, earlier this week, Buck, you uh, you gave some love to David Anderson, a longtime yes. radio man here in Austin, Texas, and a guy who meant a lot to you, a guy you had yeah. a good relationship with. and. I heard Kevin talking about Dave yesterday. Trey was talking about him a little bit. And our paths never crossed, but I know he's uh, somebody who meant uh, a lot to a lot of folks in, yes, in our did. line of work here in this city. Uh, unfortunately, I've got I've got one of those myself to talk about today. Um, a guy by the name of Fred Fowler, 
who was a big time sports radio host in Houston. He worked at the ESPN station for over a decade. He also wrote in the sports section of the Chronicle uh, for a number of years down there. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly yesterday. Man, sorry and, to hear that. Those people are like, fam, that's like family. Yeah. I mean, this guy, like, th- this guy's a big part of why I got the job in Houston. The first ever radio shows. I was actually doing a tryout. I never told anyone at the horn because I didn't want to get in trouble. But as part of the application. You got in trouble there? Do you think you would have got in trouble for doing that? Probably not. They were, they they were pretty understood. desperate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I, I did tryouts in Houston. Like, the first ever radio shows I did in Houston were with this guy. And, He's a huge part of why I got that job, which uh, that was my dream job. Like I always wanted to be a major market radio host and uh, I don't get that opportunity if it wasn't for Fred Fowler. So uh, I don't know how many folks listening or watching us right now have any idea who that is. Maybe some of our Houston listeners do. Maybe some people who followed me from Houston do, Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, he meant a lot to a lot of people down there was a a big time figure in the sports radio scene down in H town for a long time. And uh, yeah, passed away yesterday. So uh, we say it all the time, and yep. even though we do, we don't say it enough. Check in on your peoples and make sure you tell them that you love them because uh, absolutely, you just never know in this world, man. I was very short, man. Very, very life, short. Life is very short. So I'm sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, thoughts and prayers with his family. He's got kids and uh, you know siblings and a mom, and I know they're they're hurting today. So that one uh, that one shook me pretty good last night, and it shook uh, the city of Houston too. So drink a couple all stat to him this weekend. I'm sure I you will. will. Indeed. I will indeed. So uh, yeah, sad way to end the show. I feel bad. I got to bring on Double R and Stu after talking about death. That's not fun. <laughs> but these guys will lighten the mood. What's up, gentlemen? What's up, boys? What's well, up, I, fellas? I, I, I think the thing is bringing Stu and I on at the same time after what you're talking about right there, BK, Stu and I are, are we've kind of fallen into this the same way with, with following guys like David Anderson and, and following, I mean, we, we've just kind of made relationships to where these people are so important to you. Um, you know, Stu came over and did the the last revved up show that we did at the horn. And, and man, that was a, that was a grueling day for, for both of us. I mean, I mean, it was, uh, it's tough, man. Uh, it, you know, the, the radio dial, it, it, it does a lot, man. It does a lot. It grows you in a lot of different ways. Well, yeah. and, and that's, that's the thing, uh, kind of like with Bucky, I've known, I knew David Anderson for years yep. and years and years. Uh, he was, he was one of the guys at the very beginning that encouraged me to get behind a microphone and he and I did a couple of Longhorn post game shows back in the day there at Schultz garden. And, um, uh, I remember David doing a show with John Madani and Hugh Lewis here in oh, this yeah. town. Uh, and that, I always thought that was the, that was the gold standard, uh, back in the day for, for sports radio in Austin. And, um, David was always kind with, you know, kind words and encouragement and, uh, you know, always had that smile on his face, kind of that mischievous. Oh, he's up to something. You know, know, he, you, uh, you'd ask him how he's doing and he, you know, his first words were, why would you hear, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. I, I, I I mean, there's a lot of great ones that have, you know, that, that are, that have come before us. And, uh, I still remember the, the day that, you know, I made the, the decision that I wasn't going to drink again. And Sammy Allred said to me, he said, Bucky, you can do this. And this was coming from a guy who had demons upon demons. I mean, oh, yeah. that guy lived in Demonville. And yeah. he said to me, I said, Sammy, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to go sober. And he said, you can do this. He said, it's not going to be that difficult for you. And that was a guy who had more demons than you could shake a stick at. Mm-hmm. But I remember him saying that in the seriousness by which he said that to me, I'm like, if that guy, that guy is so serious right now talking to me about, about, you know, you're an alcoholic, you can really fight this, you can do it. It's going to take, you know, it's going to take a lot for you to do it, but you can do it. I mean, I appreciate that more than, I mean, those words he said to me, as crazy as Sammy was, that was the most thoughtful thing somebody has probably ever said to me that I can do this because in my lifetime, I said, dude, you're not going to be able to do this. This is going to take you 15 tries. It's not, it's going to be very hard. Sammy said, do it. You can do it. And so we, we, we pass by these people all the time, you know, we, yeah. whether they've been uh, radio hosts or they've been in the managerial areas that we do. And we kind of think of them as like family, you know, that was like a big brother. That was like, that was like, you know, as it was like my dad telling me something or, or my uncle saying, you can do this. It's going to happen. Just get it done. Quit the bullshit and get it done and go along and have a good life. 
And I'll, I'll never forget that. You know, 23 years later, I'm still sober. But that first day was probably just like everything else, the hardest day. Quit smoking, quit drinking, quit screwing. I mean, the whole thing, that first day is the hardest day, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. and it was. And, and he made sure to tell me, it's going to get easier. It's going to get better, and you can do it. So I'll never forget that from that yeah, guy. Yeah, you know, I, I've always said, you know, with this, I mean, this has always been a dream for me to get to do something like this, and and I think the the biggest part of it for me is, I mean, not not so much getting to do it, but getting to meet people like we're talking mm -hmm. about, like David, like like Sammy. I mean, Bob Cole. I mean, well, fucking you are you are somebody that I hold in such high esteem just because of what you were just talking about. And BK, you were such a talent. I mean, to see you come in here and, and do what you're doing. I mean, it's all about relationships and all about building uh, an army because that's what we do. I mean, we're a team um, in this business, and man, it, it's just been and it's tough when you lose one of those um, yes. one of those icons, man. It sucks because you lose them yeah. forever. They're gone. They're not. They're yeah. not coming on another station. You're not going to hear them again. You know, the, you're not going to hear people talk about. Well, he's doing okay. You know, he's struggling a little bit, but he's doing okay. It's gone. That's it. Yeah. So you have to have that memory of those people, and you have to hold those memories and hold them dear to your heart. You can't let them just like disappear. And those things will always be remembered. As young as BK is, he's like an old soul. I mean, oh, you're going to yeah. remember him forever. It doesn't matter if he stays in this business or goes to another business. You're going to remember the things he did in this particular business, but you can't let them go away. You know, that's yeah. the part. Don't let them die. Absolutely yeah. right. Y'all have a good one. Yeah, yeah. Hey, DK, I, I do want to tell you, uh, by the way, you you kind of mentioned there about the hub, and I think we broke that yesterday on, on our show, you know, when, when all that happened. But I do want to let you know, oh, oh, shit. There oh, are man. other sites that are still available. Okay. Well, please send me a list of those. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about VPNs uh, uh, there you go. in wow. the last yeah. 12 hours. Absolutely. Go to the Instagram, my man. Go to the Instagram. All that stuff is there. Okay. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Love you guys. Y'all have a great show. All, All right, right, BK. There he is, Brad Kellner. Chaos Theory. Obviously, we talked about WAGs yesterday uh, being on vacation. So, man, I, I made the, the first call every time when it's like, okay, I got to get someone in so we can chop it up. It is definitely my man, Stu Myrick, checking in here on Chaos Theory. We're going 10 to 11. Uh, it's only an hour coming up uh, with Jeff and Jordan in just a little bit. And, uh, man, we've got a lot to talk about, Stu. NFL free agency, the Big 12 tournament coming up as we get uh, set for March Madness. Um, I know it's not wrestling, but I'd love your thoughts on Mike Tyson uh, with what he's about to dive into and whatever you folks want to talk about right here on the code of text line, 222-9328. You guys feel free to check in. Stu, how you doing, man? This this is always so much fun for me. You know, it, uh, A, I always love chopping it up with you, Rodney. And it's Friday. It You know, we got, we had that early morning storm, which, good Lord, that, uh, that woke me up this morning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know it's nice right now. I think we're supposed to get a little more, a little more rain this afternoon, maybe tomorrow. But uh, you know, hey, still it's the weekend, and love doing this with you, man. I, I'm glad you're a part of it. I, I'm glad you're a part of it. Like I said, you were always the first call um, when that happens. Glenn checking in right there. I met Stu at the old Cap City Comedy Club watching Mick Foley stand up. <laughs> oh dear Lord, that was years. Yeah, that's years ago. I've got a picture. I actually got a picture on my wall here in in the quote studio. That's with right. Me and Justin Simmons, who yep. used to do the sports guys talking wrestling with me and with Mick Foley, and we uh, actually got an interview with him after his uh, his routine. He was doing it was basically retelling stories from his first book, and uh, it was it was fantastic. And I was, so I've had and I've had a couple opportunities to interact with mick over the years so yeah yeah and just kind of what we were talking about right there and and i know that 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 was hard for for bk but like we were talking about with david i mean mm -hmm. i think you and i you and i have both kind of been i mean we're radio fans is the whole thing oh, yeah. I, I think that's really what it comes down to and uh man you get you get so tied into people and it's just like voices mm -hmm. and you know then then you get to meet them you get to be a part of doing some of the things that they're doing you know it's like i remember when I was first the first time I remote teched anything for Bob Cole I'm like wow this is like Bob Cole sitting next to me or something like that you know I mean I mean even with Aaron you know I know Aaron is doing his thing but you know getting to do stuff like that I mean that, that this is what um 
it's like in racing, Stu, we say that this stuff gets in your blood and you can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You really can't get rid of this stuff. And no. I was just, I was just talking to John Molise about this earlier via text. Right. I, I'm like, dude, you can't get rid of this. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. We, you know, we, and that's the thing you and I, you know, we've taken every opportunity to be in front of the, in front of the mics and, and, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it was on the horn or here, or our, our, you know, respective podcasts and, uh, you know, everything we love doing it. Just it's, it's fun. It's, it's a, it's an escape from a day-to-day -day life and, and the people you get to meet and work with, uh, you know, they become like, you know, like we've talked about it, they become, they become as close as anybody. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I've, you know, I've been lucky enough, worked with practically every guy that's done sports radio in this town and, um, and even a few that do other radio, you know, so yeah. it's, it's fun. No, it's a great thing. Of course, that Coda text line that I was talking about, uh, Longhorn fan from Denton, um, coming coming into Austin next weekend for Coda, and that's something else we can talk about as well. Circuit of the Americas. You'll have the uh, the, the uh, Echo Park Grand Prix coming up on Sunday, and if you missed that earlier, uh, VK was talking about we've got a Tuesday uh, live remote out there, and then it looks like there'll be something on Friday as well. So, Stu, I need to check your logistics on what you may have going on uh, for some of that because of course you and i have been uh integral in uh doing a lot of broadcasts out there and we've got a lot of great connections so we can work on that um don't know if we'll have nascar tickets to give away i mean that gets uh, that gets a little tough when it comes to stuff like that especially with coda with the coda race because you're actually dealing with not only circuit of the americas but smi so there's different yeah. things right there to try to tie all of that together uh but that's something if if we're going to be doing that. You will certainly know it um, just as soon as we do. So, Stu, I mean, you you have covered the Dallas Cowboys in depth for a lot of years. Um, I don't know if that's your team or not, um, but 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 I can tell you. Um, I would love your thoughts on, on the free agency moves. I know a lot of folks are up in their shit because not a lot's happening. But I think the more that I study this, and I was all into the A.J. Dillon thing with Jonathan Brooks yesterday, but it looks like A.J. Dillon now is going to sign back with the Packers. But I, I would love your thoughts on this because I think a lot of what we're seeing, the inactivity with the Cowboys, is the fact that they're looking forward because they got a lot of big ticket items that they're going to have to take care of. Well, and that's the thing. You know, they're they're – I think that's part of why we are not seeing much uh, from the Cowboys on, you know, on the free agency front. Uh, they signed, they re-signed Jordan Lewis, mm -hmm. who was out with an injury for a while. They re-signed him. Um, Tony Pollard is now off. I forget. I, the Titans. I think, yeah, yeah, it was the Titans. And it's yeah. kind of ironic because I think there was talk before Derrick Henry signed with the Ravens, I think. Yeah. That the Cowboys were looking at Derrick Henry. Um there and and that that prospect kind of excited me, but it also kind of worried me just because Derrick Henry is one of those bruising running backs, you know. And you know, we saw I, I mean, I'll go all the way back to Earl Campbell, Tyler mm -hmm. Rose, you know, and he was great at that, but the the punishment that he took on his body we see it now and i do it does make me think about derrick henry and how what his status is and how long he, how much longer he can go with the style of play he has so um I, you know I, i'm i'm i do wonder about the cowboys yeah they got some cap stuff to take care of they're trying to re-sign dak prescott um and I suspect that maybe we see him a little more active in the draft coming up, you know, next month. Uh, but yeah, I think they're kind of, it's kind of a wait and see. And so I'm kind of taking a wait and see approach just because I think that if they, if they insert the right pieces, then yeah, they can contend again. Now look, and I and I am a lifelong Cowboys fan, but I'm also a realist, and I get it. Cowboys find a way to shoot themselves in the foot 
every stinking year. That's why we have not seen them even, you know, even taste playoff success in almost 30 years. Yeah, so, so, yeah. You, you got to know, Stu, that they're going to find a way to shit the bed. I mean, even even when it looks like everything is is really going in the Cowboys' favor, that there's going to be, and and you know you can go back to and 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 I totally get. I mean, a lot of people go back to Jerry Jones as being the GM, and and you need to fix that to make a change. But the one thing that the Cowboys have done well, and this is where we can kind of go back to, but just talking about some of the guys where I'm looking forward to where it it does make some sense to why they're kind of maybe not making some of these moves is you got to so sign through 24 through this year you've got Dak you got to figure out what you're going to do with that cap hit right there are you going to extend him you're going to make him play this thing out I mean I don't know what you do there McCarthy that's a whole different question right there you got to do something with CD Lamb you got to do something with Zach Martin Demarcus Lawrence and Brandon Cooks that's all through 2024 and oh by the way in 2025 you got Micah Parsons so you 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 have to figure out where all of that money's going to go but you know Dallas has I mean they really have the one thing that they have done well is that they have been able to build those homegrown players that I talk about through the draft to where they go and they find draft picks and they're able to do stuff and that's why I was so big on maybe the Jonathan Brooks thing but you know if you let AJ Dillon get away I mean at this point uh, I think the only running back that you have signed is Deuce Vaughn and I love that dude I've called a lot of his games but it's um I just, you know, it, it's the same old Dallas. It, it's like it, it's like a dryer, you know, when you're drying clothes, Stu. It's just the same Dallas Cowboys circle over and over and over. Call it a circle jerk. Call it whatever you want. That's just what Dallas does. You're right. And, you know, the, the, the sad fact of the matter, or at least a notion, is that, look, they may, they could have a great draft. Uh, they might get a, uh, you know, might get a star free agent, but there, there is not much that I see that makes me think, okay, hit, this is it. This is it. You know, I'm, I think they could have a winning season. They might even contend for the division if they can get past Philly, but yeah, that's, that's about as good as I'm thinking. So. Well, and Stu, that's where you, because of course, a lot of this is on, is magnified because Jerry Jones says uh, this. And it will be going all in on different people than you've done in the past. Okay. We'll be going all in. We've seen some things uh, uh, out of some of the players that we want to be all in on. And uh, yes, I would say that you will see us uh, 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 this coming year not building for the future. It's the best way I don't say it. And that's where I maybe go back to the whole scenario to where it's like, okay, you, you've got to take care of those dudes that we're talking about right there. I mean, cause that's, I mean, structurally, that's going to be your, that's going to be your future. But what is concerning is though you've lost. I mean, I was talking about this yesterday, Stu, to where it's like a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, oh yeah, let Tony Pollard go, let him go shop the market and see where the hell he ends up, you know, whatever. Maybe he'll take a hometown friendly deal. Now I'm like, shit, damn. I wish we had Tony Pollard b yeah. because uh, you, you've got a hole there. You got a hole on the offensive line. You don't have interior rushers. You've got, well, you did make the signing with the linebacker, but it's um, look, Philadelphia with the addition of Saquon Barkley that, and, and, and I knew that was going to happen. Something just told me that was going to happen. And that right there, I know there's some locker room issues possibly in Philadelphia, but man, let me tell you suplex do with them guys adding that guy. Holy shit, that is scary. Very scary. It is. And you know, I think when when they when they let Zeke Elliott go uh before last season, mm -hmm. you know, they were thinking Tony Pollard could pick up the the you know, he could pick up the the you know, whatever the you know, pick up the pace and, and be that you know, uh, first string running back that they'd seen because they had seen him come off the bench and be productive. I think while Pollard had a decent season, I don't think it was to the level that they were hoping. Um, I think that in, you know, as crazy as it sounds, they did miss Zeke. 
and unfortunately they didn't have, they don't have anybody, you know, they didn't have anybody after Tony. So, you know, I could see where running back could be a, could be a need they look at in this draft. Now, you know, I mean, this philosophy has always been don't go to running back in the first round. Yeah. Just because average lifespan in a running back for NFL is what, three to five years. So, you know, get him, get him in the second or third round. I, you know, I think I saw they've got, I think they've got eight or nine picks coming up in in next month's draft. Yeah. Uh, with the compensatory picks. Yeah. So I would, you know, I would be, you know, I would look at the, those second, especially third round. I think they've got multiple picks in the third round. So I definitely look, you know, late second, third round. That's probably where I would, you know, maybe take a look at a running back. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's where you can, and, and I'm, I know I'm leaning heavy on Jonathan Brooks and it's, um, I had some folks reach out on X and it's like, oh, you're being a homer with the, with the longhorn pick. And it's like, no, I just happen to think that that's a good running back. That'll, that would make that fit. And, and it, and it, it, that's a great point that you make there, Stu, that, that I have kind of talked about in the past is to where, when you had, when you had Zeke and you had Pollard, I mean, you really did have a nice attack right there. It was very effective. It was very effective. When you go back and you look at that, I mean, it was Pollard that was going to come in and bring the sizzle when, you know, when you needed the big player, when you needed to pull him out of the backfield and kind of hit him out in the flat, whatever the case was going to be. And, and, and it worked great. I think what happened with, with when you make the change, when you let Elliot get away, is that you assume that you can still do that. But what you're not assuming is the fact that you have lost kind of the, the, the boom the boom, the kick you in the ass right up the line of scrimmage that Zeke Elliott provides. And and I really think, I was talking about this yesterday here on the show, Texas Sports Unfiltered Chaos Theory, Stu Myrick, Rodney Rodriguez, is that, look, now bring Zeke back, <laughs> bring him back, and, 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 and go draft Jonathan Brooks or somebody else, anybody, and, and, and kind of try to find that again with everything that you have on the outside and figure out who your wide receiver three is going to be if you get rid of Michael Gallup. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, you know, Dak's got to have multiple weapons, and that's and that's kind of been the story of the Cowboys over the history. Is you know that's that's why they were so successful back in the '90s. It's because Troy Aikman had so many weapons at his disposal uh, that you know he could he could spread that ball around and makes you know and still have have some incredible offensive output. That's what Dak needs today. And that's what the Cowboys need today. So we'll see what they do. You know, the rest of free agency and in the, in the draft. Um, and I, it's like I said, I'm, I guess somewhat cautiously optimistic, but, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yet ready to declare them Super Bowl 59 champion yet. It's, it's one of those things and the stat that we always throw out or have been throwing out is nobody repeats in this division. Um, and, and the other part of that, I mean, I can talk about the Eagles getting better, but Minnesota's getting better. Chicago's getting better. Everybody T Tampa Bay is solidifying what they're doing. Hell the, the damn commanders are getting better. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's what could, green Bay. I mean, green Bay's making moves right there to where Dallas is kind of, you know, I, I don't think Stu that they're at the, at the point where they could bottom out, but this is, this is going to be a very competitive NFC because AFC, I mean, I think you, it, it's like an arms race that I talk about all the time. It's everybody making moves. It's like, you know, Kansas city, you know, that, that now they sign Hollywood, Hollywood Brown. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I mean, there's maybe we're, we're worthy. He's not going to get picked up by, by Kansas city. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like a three or four horse race over there in the AFC, but the NFC, dude, it is seriously a thoroughbred race because you've got 10, 12 teams that could be making noise. Atlanta, what do you think of the Kirk Cousins deal? Um, Cousins is one of those guys that I kind of lump in with Dak, but it's like, man, that's a big-time money deal. That is a big-time money deal. Um, I, You know, I want I want to think Atlanta is trying to do well. You know, B. John Robinson, of course, they're – in the running back position, oh, it's, yeah, they've got it. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm not sold on Cousins, Dude, quite honestly. Me too. Me too. It's it, he's he's not he's not that consistent, and 
I don't want to say Atlanta overpaid for him, but they overpaid for him. They overpaid, for him. yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I'm, uh, I don't have high hopes for him. Yeah, I mean, li- listen to this. Listen to this, too. This, this is from Twitter, from X, and and I. Th- this is a valid source that is throwing up these numbers. Tom Brady, all those Super Bowls, career earnings. Of course, this isn't endorsements or any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Career earnings as an NFL quarterback, $317.6 million career earnings for the body of work that Tom Brady has done. Kirk Cousins, with one playoff win, over $400 million worth of career contracts, $411.6 million. It's unbelievable, right? That, that is unbelievable. Now, you know, uh, you know, Tom Brady, you know, you look at the beginning of his NFL career, he's a six round draft pick. So yeah, he's not going to get the big contracts in the beginning. And in fact, it didn't really, didn't really start coming until he and Belichick starting to put together those Super Bowl, you know, those, those seasons where they're hitting multiple Super Bowls. And even then, you know, he, he still, you know, it took him a while before he was the highest paid quarterback in the league. So mm-hmm. it does it doesn't shock me too much that that Kirk Cousins is getting more money. I think I just think, like I said, I think there's been there's a there's a lot of style, but there's not a whole lot of substance when it comes to yeah. This. That that that's kind of my thing. It's kind of back to the DAC thing to where it's like Give me something. I mean, you remember the jokes about prime time. I mean, I made them all the time. It's like the dude's not going to win in prime time. Um, if he's got a nooner, bet your ass they're going to win that one. But uh, when you start getting into those prime time games or Sunday night games or Monday night games, that's where you're going to have problems with Kirk Cousins. But he's got a lot of pieces around him. I happen to think Justin Fields would have been a better fit in that place. Um, and, and before Stu, before I get your thoughts, uh, because I do want to, I do want to get your thoughts on Caleb Williams, because I am like the naysayer of Caleb Williams when it comes to folks on Texas Sports Unfiltered. But before that, speaking of Tom Brady, if you want to get rewarded for listening to Texas Sports Unfiltered, which if you're going to listen in from eight to five every day, like you should, because we're live, we're local, we talk Texas sports, we talk NFL, NHL, MLB, NBA, NASCAR, we talk it all. Our friends at Autograph co-founded by Tom Brady, the man that we were just talking about, Senator Tom Brady, as I like to call him, are redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for the acts of fandom, which is like listening to us. So uh, that's super cool right there. The Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content all in one place and offers rewards like tickets, exclusive merchandise, and more Hey, guys, you're already listening and watching Texas Sports Unfiltered. Now you can earn points for doing it. Head over to the App Store and search Autograph or in Google Play. You know, if you're on the on the Android side, if you're on the smart side, on the Android side, go, go, go check it out there and use the referral code TSU, as in Texas Sports Unfiltered. TSU is your referral code. A link can also be found right there in the YouTube description as well. So, Stu, we're, we're, we're down here. I mean, draft end of April and, and the big, I guess, the place to fall. Now that we're getting all these, I mean, all the signings, I mean, Ridley to the Titans and, and you know, what, whatever the case. So the big question is, how is that piece going to fall for the Bears? Are they going to keep Justin Fields? I happen to think that they should. I know the knock where people are like, you're full of shit. I mean, he's about to have to be paid. You go get Caleb Williams. Man, I'm just not a Caleb Williams dude. Uh, a Caleb Williams guy, dude. I, I don't. I just, I don't get it. He's great. He's good. I just don't think that he's this mesmerizing. I, I, I think you may have another Lawrence situation here to where it's not quite what we think he could be. You know, I, it, it feels like kind of a lateral. So why not stick with what you got? Develop the teamwork, develop the, the relationships and, you know, and do, and do all that. Um, you know, uh, you know, get what you can get or, or stick with Justin Fields and, you know, ride that a little bit. Cause like I said, I don't think it's not like you're going to, it's not like you're going to boost your offensive output by bringing in Caleb, because I, again, I think it's, it's a lateral move. I think it's kind of, you know, two sides of the same coin there. And this is where I think it's, it's, 
it just gets it just gets even cloudier and even more interesting now because Chicago went out and got Keenan Allen from San Diego. I mean, from the L.A. Chargers, whatever they call, it. and all they had to give up was a fourth round pick. So, so they're adding all these pieces in. I mean, you, you've already got DJ Moore. I mean, you did lose Mooney, but I mean, you it, and you've got you've got two good running backs. I mean, Rojo's back there. I mean, you know, with the signing that they made, you know, with DeAndre Swift coming over from Philadelphia, it's like sitting here watching the Chicago Bears. It's like, man, it, it's so confusing as to what they're going to do. Code of text line uh, checking in. And you guys don't forget if you and if it, I always ask you guys to do this, if you happen to put your handle in there, put it in when I ask you to do it so I can change it. Uh, this is a uh, 512 number 8969. Uh, last four digits. I'm a Bears fan. I'm with you on Kayla Williams. I, I just. Uh, you know, and I go back to this. I mentioned this earlier, Stu, and, and I'd love, you know, feel free to disagree if you want. I mean, that's why we're doing this. But it was like last year you saw when he went to USC, obviously he didn't have he didn't have everything around him that he needed and he struggled. And I think I mean, if he goes to the Bears there, this is where I always thought that the better fit for him was going to be to go to Atlanta. Because I think that that would have behooved him better in that situation, but Chicago's putting pieces in place, so so I can only assume that they're going to take him at this point. Yeah, I got I got think I think with you, um, it's yeah, you know, and I get it. The, the Bears, you know, they're they're another one of those teams where just feels a little like they're you know they're kind of running in sand. You, you know, they they try to get as much as possible, but they're just not they're not progressing. Uh, yeah. and I, I, you know, I've got, I've got friends that are bears fans and, and they're frustrated. So I get the frustration. Well, and that's the other part of it. Like we're talking about with the Cowboys and the NFC East. And uh, I mean, a lot of these divisions, uh, I mean, Chicago is bolstering what they're doing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Minnesota, obviously green Bay, uh, and Detroit is still sitting there as well. So it, it, it it's going to be fun to watch the NFC. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch the NFC. And uh, we still have uh, free agent signings, I'm sure, that will be coming today. Um, I love the great point right there, talking about where Brady would always take money. Pat Mahomes going right down that same road. Do you see that, Stu? He's going to he's going to take a he's going to take a little bit of a pay cut. He'll free up twenty one point six million dollars on the cap that uh, what's that going to do? Probably get them another Super Bowl win. Yeah, uh, it's look, it's it. You know, it's and what's funny is we used to see Tor Troy Aikman do this back. Yep. You know, he would he would take cuts on years. You know, put it on the back end of the contract so that it would free up cap money. Uh, and I think that's what Patrick Mahomes is doing right now, which, quite honestly, doesn't surprise me too much. Look, uh, you know, I, I I got to I got to talk to Patrick when he was coming out of Texas Tech. Uh, I met his, you know, met his folks. I, in fact, went to high school with his stepmom. So nice. Um, you know, it was, it was. Look, he's he's a he's a good East Texas kid coming out of White House. Uh, they're right right near Tyler. Uh, and from every from what everything you hear, he doesn't he doesn't live like extravagantly i mean he lives of course he's a he's a you know absolute of course our yeah. nfl quarterback and i you know he is successful but it's not like you know he's not you know uh, using gold plated china or whatever he's a he's still a good old kid from east texas and, and i think that's where that mindset goes. It helps that his father, you know, played played in the major leagues, played pay, played baseball. So I'm sure he's probably gotten a little bit of wisdom from Pat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that doesn't that doesn't surprise me at all that he would, you know, take a cut, free up some money to ensure, you know, and and give the Chiefs a even better chance to three peat coming up. Yeah. And, and just like that, like I said, Hollywood Brown is signed by the Chiefs. So uh, there, there's a uh, there's little help over on the outside after you lose uh, Valdez Scantling. And we'll check in the draft. I mean, that that's a good problem that you have when you're the Kansas City Chiefs is your, your fucking needs are very few and far between. So um, a, a very good. 
excuse me, problem to have right there. Stu, right quick before, and I would like to, uh, um, as you know, we kind of wind down here, bottom of the hour, kind of moving forward. I do want, I do want to talk a little wrestling with you when I have you, because that's, uh, that's always good stuff and we can talk racing as well. Uh, but just quick, uh, your thoughts. I don't know if you've been honed in watching this Texas basketball team. Um, obviously they get knocked out uh, by KSU in round one of the big 12 tournament the other night. Uh, probably going to be a nine seed is what I'm seeing from Lenardi taking on Nebraska, get through that. And then, and then you get to go play UConn um, just kind of uh, allegedly as long as UConn wins. But um, if you've watched any of that, I mean, your thoughts on, on Texas basketball, I, I say it every day. They're extremely good at being inconsistently inconsistent. It seems like that's, consistently that's, inconsistent. I think. Yeah, and I mean. that's the best way to put it. Look, it's, you know they got talent on the team with this who uh Rodney Terry's a fantastic coach. This just this is gonna be one of those years where uh if if by some miracle they make it out of the first weekend, I think that's huge. Yeah. Um I think right now I'm just I'm I'm hoping for at least a first round win. That's that's my thought. It's like, look, I mean, I think if it ends up being Nebraska uh, in the east over on the on the right side of the bracket, which is what Joe Lenardi is now uh, throwing at us, look, hey, I'll take it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think expectations were set a little too high, as they are so, Stu, as long as you and I have been around here, that's always the case, it seems like. Expectations are way up here where realistically everything is right here. And I definitely think that's what happened with this basketball program this year. I agree, and and look, I if it is Nebraska, I hope they can, you know, maybe they can glean some of the some of the luck from, you know, of what you know the success Texas had against the Cornhuskers in football, especially back in the early you know mid two thousands and such. You know, when it seemed like no matter what Texas would find a way to beat Nebraska, I'm hoping they can glean a little bit of that if if, if they do end up facing the Cornhuskers in the first round yeah absolutely Stu. we uh here on the show we've got a bunch of great drops on here i mean it's usually bk that that is that is popping all these things in here and depending on the scenario we start doing different drops and you know crazy videos and and all of these different things and i'm trying to find one here that uh i'm sure i'll not be able to find it i had it all queued up here uh just a minute ago but i'll, I'll dig it up um i'll ask you about it and then i'll continue to try to find it here on uh chaos theory i, I would love your thoughts on on the current status shift over to wrestling okay um the, the the current status i mean what one of the things that i think is so cool about you is you're you're a territory wrestling guy i'm a short track racing guy yeah. we are roots guys i think that kind of goes back to the conversation we had at the beginning of the show but um just with everything happening with the uh with world wrestling entertainment with wwe man mm -hmm. right now man it is just a lot of um i don't really think you should be surprised that these things happen look at Dak prescott we've got stuff that's coming out on Dak prescott but uh just kind of your thoughts on, on the mcmahons and everything that's kind of transpired here with wwe oh man um you know and that's funny so on my my show sports guys talking wrestling i have i'll be honest i've i have purposely kind of avoided talking about because there is so much ick to that yeah uh and I, you're referencing the janelle grant lawsuit against vince mcmahon and john laurinaitis who were you know vince of course owned wwe john laurinaitis was basically his right hand man uh for those you if you think of wrestling back in the late 80s early 90s johnny ace back that's in the right 80s, johnny ace WCW, that's who's that WWE days. yeah brother of the late great joe laurinitis aka one half of the greatest tag team ever to lace up a pair of boots animal from the road warriors that's right um look it's uh i in kind of what you said look as as much as i hate to say it this stuff probably went on a whole lot more than we sh than we know you and again going back to the territories going back in the 70s and 80s uh, there were a lot of things that, you know, today would just be abhorrent. Uh, and this is abhorrent now that WWE is now owned by TKO group who also owns UFC, Ari Emanuel and those folks, 
look, Vince is out. He's even he's sold off like 25% of his stock. Uh, and Ari Emanuel has has said Vince is gone. He's not coming back. So Vince is, you know, he's off. And I don't know what he's doing. You know, 70, 78 years old, 79 years old. I have no idea what he's doing. Um, mm-hmm. which I for one am glad because right now WWE is as hot as can be in in the wrestling world. They're getting ready for WrestleMania 40. Can Cody Rhodes finally finish his story and defeat Roman Reigns? Plus, you got The Rock. You got the night one main event with Rock and Roman Reigns against Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. Uh, so I am glad that Vince is gone. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this lawsuit progresses. It no. would not shock me in the least if they figure out they come up with you know decided to settle so yeah we'll see uh i yeah. think we are in the still in the early stages of this and, and i think that it's that it's really weird to me when when i saw all of this coming down and, and again i don't follow it near as close as, as as i did in the past but when I, when i saw all of this i mean for for folks that that um that have followed professional wrestling that that kind of know some of the ins and outs of of professional wrestling i mean th- this is a uh, man, this is a brutal business. Um, because, um, when you look at, you know, the lives that have been lost outside of the ring, obviously, but I mean, what this does to you, I mean, the travel, the pressure, the, uh, just everything. I mean, it's a life where people live and, um, you wonder, you wonder how they're able to function. I mean, because I don't give a damn what people say, man, you go take a bump. Your ass ain't getting up. If you're just a regular Joe Schmo, you're right. You're at, and that's, I always joke, so I am I'm the lead commentator for the Rhodes Wrestling Academy, you know, owned and head coached by the great the natural Dustin Rhodes. Mm-hmm. And Dustin and I always joke about, you know, why don't you go take a bump? I'm going, no. <laughs> I belong behind a microphone. I don't even get inside a wrestling ring unless I'm a ring announcer or something. Um otherwise I stay out of the wrestling ring. I don't take bumps, uh, just because I know I won't get up. And you're right. It is it is a hard life. These folks, especially and especially on the independent scene, these folks are traveling almost constantly on the weekends. Good lord, they uh-huh. are racking up some miles. A lot of times by car. You know, you you don't really see too many of them flying unless they have reached a, a level of success. Um, so it's a it is a it is a brutal lifestyle. And it's been said a lot of times, you have to love it in order to be in it. Yeah, no doubt. And the, the thing about it is like, like with the Indies, I mean, I, I'm sure it's still the case because I know it was, you know, back with, with world-class and Southwest and Mid-South and you, you know, you, you insert the territory. It's like on the weekend. I, I mean, you're wrestling two to three times. I, I mean, you've got two to three shows that you may be doing, man. And it's, uh, you're not exactly getting, you know, $500,000 a match. I mean, it's very much for the love of what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's a life that, uh, man, it, like you said, I said some. I popped off on Facebook one time and said something about something that I saw in wrestling and Rudy Gonzalez, who, you know, uh, messaged me and he said, why don't you come take a bump over here at my wrestling Academy? I'm like, okay, I'll take it back. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. It's, you know, um, I mentioned WrestleMania. It's coming up. WrestleMania is also WrestleMania weekend is also a showcase for independent wrestling in whatever city it is in this year it's in Philadelphia. There are going to be, you know, a myriad of independent shows in and around Philadelphia on WrestleMania weekend. I know, and I have several friends that are independent wrestlers. I know for a fact, quite a few of them will have six, six to seven appearances booked just for that Saturday and Sunday. Wow. And if they get there earlier, the you know, if they get there earlier in the week, add a few more oh, because the, you know, you'll start seeing independent shows as early as Thursday of that weekend. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it, man. It is a, uh, it is a different world. It is a different world. Uh, and, and I'll tell you it, uh, it's something, um, if, uh, if you're not thick skinned, if you don't have balls, uh, you're not going to be able to do it. 
because it's yeah. uh it's uh very few and far between before we go any further how about a quick word wag's not here today but if you're looking for that ultimate theater system if you're looking for the really cool stuff whether it's a sono sound system whatever it is you got to talk to our man tom mckay at audiovisual consultations avconsultations.com how about a word from tom himself <laughs> Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big do you have a dream for your home entertainment let us know we can make it come true and we are always there to help after the job is done we cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family no not those family members i'm talking about the ones you actually like so relax hug your kids make love to your wife and smile then when you have a moment give us a call at 255-8678 it's 512-255-8678 or online at avconsultations.com avconsultations.com check out our man tom mckay and of course can't have chaos theory from 10 to 11 right here on texas sports unfiltered and without a word from our great friends over at covert b cave guys i know it's friday i know it's gloomy but still please be nice to hayden hi i'm dan covert with my wife hayden welcome to covert b cave our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Sorry about that. I think I was muted. So I was, uh, what I was saying is TGIF, but still please uh, be nice to Hayden. All right, Stu, um, let's talk about Austin FC, uh, the mat- match coming up tomorrow and, uh, a blown opportunity. It-, it seemed like, uh, for them this past weekend, but, um, here we go. Obviously, you know, that it's going to be, it's going to be jacked in there. I mean, people come to Q2 and they just want to have a good time. I mean, it's one of those things to where it's like shit, win or lose, it's going to be a party at Q2. Um, weather permitting, uh, I know we had DD checking in, we had Bucky. And then of course I'm the third general reporter meteorologist. I get sent out to cover all the other shit while they cover the weather, uh, Philadelphia coming in, but, uh, not been the start that, uh, I think the Verde fans were, uh, hoping for seems like so far for Austin FC. Yeah. Um, you know, they made some moves in the off season. The new sporting director, Rodolfo, uh, Burrell is he's, he's got a, he has a vision in his mind of what he wants this club to look like. And I think that the, I think that vision is, it's not coming in it's not coming into clarity as fast as fans would like to see. And, it, and we're seeing it in this early, the, the early, you know, portion of this season, uh, Austin FC, no wins, one loss and two draws. Yeah. Um, like you said, they are, they're playing Philadelphia this, this coming weekend. Um, and look, Q2 stadium, has been lauded as a it, that's a place that that teams are not as enthusiastic about going to because of the atmosphere, the supporter section, you know, singing and and, and everything from from you know the from minute one till minute ninety and into you know stoppage time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that it's I think it's gonna be this is gonna be a year where. It's it. We're going to see we're the successes on the pitch are going to be interspersed with some disappointments. Uh, I do, look Austin FC is not, they're not taking on the cup this year. I can, I can say that with some certainty. Um, I hope that maybe the progress of the club can outperform what is what is you know what they're seeing right now but 
and again, it's early. We've had three matches. So, yeah. you know, hope, hope, like I said, we have to see what happens with, you know, and we got to get some guys back. I think Valencia is still on loan uh, to his national team, uh, a couple of others. So I think it's going to be a matter of, you know, do the best you can with what you got. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And of course, now, uh, you know, and it's I'm glad you mentioned that because it's one of those it's one of those responses to where it's like uh, the, this stuff happens. And it really seems like sometimes uh, e even the uh, even the Verde fans are kind of uh, having that Texas Longhorn um, mindset as well to where it's like I know with baseball, Washington coming in, you, you know, this weekend for some games over at Dish. But like, and I mean, hell, I'm I'm guilty of it as well. I mean, I, I've been sitting here, uh, you know, bitching about Texas baseball, but it's like immediately, it's like so. So what happens with Josh Wolf? I mean, now I think there's a lot of focus coming in on him. Um, you mentioned the change up with with top brass. I mean, that, that's always when that stuff starts happening. And you don't see the results on the pitch in this case. That's where, I mean, Wolf is going to be. I mean, he's going to be, his seat is going to get hot. I mean, the longer that this goes on, I mean, it, it, it's going to get pretty warm for, for, for coach Wolf here, uh, the next coming weeks. Yeah. And I like Josh, um, yeah. you know, but you're right. And I, I said this last year, um, look, I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of those that know a whole lot more about soccer than I do, they will say the 2022 season, Austin FC outperformed. Mm -hmm. They they overperformed. We're we're seeing them kind of come back down to earth. Um, I think if Josh can put a good product on the field, utilize the the players that he has. You know, for for instance, you know, find a way to get Drew C to to you know score again, like mm -hmm. he did. Uh, if they can, if he can do that, I think fans will be a little more patient with him. But you know, if they if they find their way to the to the bottom of the standings. Man, I, I do I do worry a little bit about the future of Josh Wolf with with the Verde. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean that that's obviously going to be the point of concern. Uh, I mean, if if the trend continues, uh, code of text line two 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 nine three two eight. Very active here this morning, uh, Stu. See what you do, man. You get all this stuff started up. Uh, Longhorn fan from Denton once again. You mentioned Dustin. It would be really cool if they had Dustin run in and help Cody, <laughs> not Gold Dust, but Dustin Rhodes. I have heard that a number of times. I would look, I'd love to see it. And I know Dustin will be in Philadelphia, but unfortunately, Dustin is contracted with the other company, All Elite yeah. Wrestling. Yeah. They're not going to do that. Um, we've seen some, you know, the 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 fun phrase, the fun term is forbidden door. We've seen that happen with with AEW and New Japan and TNA and New Japan, Major League Wrestling and AEW and CMLL in Mexico and all this. WWE, while we have started to see some relaxing, they're, they're, they're willing to acknowledge other companies. Yeah. And we even saw Jordan Gray's come out during the Royal Rumble as the TNA Knockouts champion. While they're willing to do something like that, uh, you know, you know, having a AEW contracted wrestler come yeah. out, even if it's his brother, you know, I think that's going to take a little bit, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I, and I am, I'm holding out hope. Hopefully it won't matter. Cause hopefully Cody will finish the story. Yeah, that, that that's a whole thing right there to where it gets to that. I, I mean, it's one thing, it, it's one thing if you're going to try to, uh, you know, have some kind of unbound alliance, but I think that's a little much. Yeah. I think that's a little too much. I mean, there's still, um, there's still company boundaries, I think that are going to be held. And I, I don't think that that and, would happen. And Cody has been, he's been championing the cause to get Dustin into the WWE hall of fame, which mm -hmm. look, he belongs that career that the, you know, what he did as gold dust is, is what helped with that attitude era with the, you know, that, going from the mid nineties into the mid two thousands. 
Uh, Goldust is a is an integral part of that era, and for that very reason, yes, Dustin belongs in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and I'm not saying that just because he's a good friend. He yeah. does belong, but yeah. you know it's going to take a little bit. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, one more time over to the Coda text line, uh, asking me if I'm going to be able to go to Ennis this weekend for the TX2K. Um, not not going to be able to. As a matter of fact, when I'm done here, I am heading to ABIA, and I'm heading to Op Alabama uh, for the Rattler 250 to call that on Racing America. So, uh, unfortunately, I won't uh, be able to make that, but I do plan to get the TMS uh, for some of the dirt shows and and so forth. All right, uh, Stu, I want to show you something here because kind of while, while we're on the topic of wrestling and so forth i know this this isn't wrestling related but um so, so mike tyson yes. mike tyson getting back into the ring um and and this is you know we had wags and i had the conversation is this an exhibition is this a real fight i mean what is this going to be well I, I tell you mike tyson is getting pretty damn active on uh twitter um with some of his uh workout stuff let's uh as i try to share the screen i'm horrible at this let's take a look at tyson yesterday and i'll get the sound here sorry let's play it again day one the fun just begun Your thoughts on that one, Stu. Here we go. Here we oh, go. Oh, boy. Okay. I don't think so, I would want to piss that dude off. Still. Still. Yeah. So Mike Tyson, Jake Paul, whose brother Logan Paul is the current WWE United States champion. Um, is it a, it will, will it be an exhibition or will it be an actual match? I believe that'll be up to the, the governing yes. commission, which... <laughs> All right, full yeah. disclosure, I work for the agency that regulates combat sports in Texas. So um but I I don't work in what that do do? I don't work with <laughs> that program. Yeah. I do know that it it will be up to my agency to say whether it's an exhibition. I don't think it's going to matter. It's going to draw they're uh, they're fighting at AT and T Stadium. Is that right? Yeah, Jerry World. So yep. it will it will sell tickets. It will draw. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a it'll be a fine undercard. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> I I get Jake Paul's kind of the you know he's yeah. the bright and shiny. Yeah. But Tyson, even 20 plus years later, still one of the baddest men on the face of this earth, one of the Absolutely. greatest heavyweight champions in boxing. Yeah. I got to believe he ain't going to drop off that much. And that that fight may not last very long. That's what I'm thinking. I'm not, we're, we're, we're not saying you know, 93 seconds, like what Tyson did with Michael Spinks back in the eighties. Yeah. 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 But it would, it would shock me if it goes more than two rounds. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I mean that, uh, I mean, and just seeing right there, I mean, obviously, I mean, he, I, I know that's a 10 second video. He posted one that I think that was day before yesterday. He posted another one. He's sitting there sparring and yeah, it was, what is he? 56, 50, what, whatever. Um, no, 56, 57 years old. I don't know what Tyson is, mm -hmm. but I mean, that, that, that dude's going to come out and he, he lays one blow. This shit is done. Done. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what even, you know, back in the day, one of the heaviest hitters in boxing. And again, I don't, I got to believe that may still be true today. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt about it. Scary, scary. So lots going on. We talked about Austin FC. Um, the, they'll be on the pitch tomorrow at, um, at Q2. So, I mean, stay tuned for weather. I know that's going to be an issue. I'm, I'm like, I was saying, I'm trying to fly out of here and I think I'm going to have a weather issue on my connecting flight in Houston coming up a little bit later on. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. Texas baseball taking on Washington. I'd love to see, uh, I mean, at least two out of three win the series kind of keep that going right there. Hey, but also Wimby mania hits Austin. You got Wimby playing over at Moody tonight against the world champions. And then again on Sunday, 
San Antonio Spurs. So the, the Spurs, it's like they suck, but damn, they get – that's my team. I mean, that, that that's my team. I, I'm just glad they're fucking going in the right direction finally. Yeah, yeah. It'll be, a, it'll be fun to see the Spurs playing there in the Moody Center, get in the mood, as there Matthew it is. McConaughey likes to say. Um, it'll be fun to see when be there. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to hold my breath for a victory, but Hey, <laughs> it's basketball. They got 82 games in the season. Yeah. So crazier things have happened. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Big 12 basketball, uh, continues, um, Houston with a win tech with a win, um, Iowa state and Baylor. They're all moving on as we play in the big 12 tournament. Of course, don't forget, uh, stay tuned right here to Texas sports unfiltered. We'll have information for you. The guys, I think Zay BK, maybe KD. I'm not sure who all is going to be a part of that, but, uh, over at crown and anchor, you will have a, um, the, 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 Bracket release show is what they're going to be doing. So they'll go in and, and uh, start breaking all that down next week on Tuesday. And then it looks like on Friday, we'll be, we will be out at Circuit of the Americas, as we mentioned earlier, for NASCAR coming into CODA. So, Stu, that's always a good time when the uh, traveling circus that is the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series, Xfinity, and Cup Series come rolling in. Uh, two races on Saturday, a race on Sunday. That's always a good time out there watching the cars and stars out of CODA. Absolutely. You know, a lot of fun watching out there. You and I have been out there multiple times. Uh, it's always a fun race, always an entertaining race, some calamity every once in a while, but Hey, uh, a great atmosphere in, in, in the folks from SMI, Texas, you know, Texas Motor Speedway, they do a fantastic job with that weekend. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, have welcome them back to welcome them back to Coda. Through that first year when they came in, when it rained, I mean, it was, I mean, I, I go back to that. It was so unbelievable. Cause that was one of the first times. I mean, I mean, as long as, uh, I mean, to see NASCAR stock cars racing in mm. the rain was one thing. And, and, and we say rain, people say that that was a rain race. That, that, that was not a rain race. That was a, that was a flood race. Uh, I mean, that, that was horrible. What went on that day? I mean, they should not have been on the racetrack, but it was like, you had to know, I remember sitting in the media center with you guys, and then I kind of went out and braved the elements right there. And I looked around, and the place was jam packed. It's people sitting around watching this stuff. Um, I'm kind of glad this year. I, I don't think, I don't know if Austin FC is here, though. There may, may be some Texas baseball. There's not going to be a golf tournament, I don't think. So nope. um, I think it's going to bode a little well for, for NASCAR at Coda. Yeah. You think about that first year. First year, it's raining on a track that NASCAR hasn't run yet. Ever. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that was nuts. I remember what was it? Was it, uh, uh, um, Oh, what was Truex. it? Her, Truex. Her, 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 her Truex. Yeah. Submarining. Yeah. You, you remember know, that shit? I, yes. <laughs> on the, I think it was on the, it was on yeah. the back straightaway. Yeah. yeah. So I got yeah. a feeling next week, next weekend's going to be much nicer weather. And you're right. You don't have the Dell match play anymore. Uh, might have Texas baseball, but other than that, Hey, should be a great weekend to go out and see some NASCAR racing out at Circuit of the Americas. Yeah, yeah, re really good and great affordable packages. I know when Formula One comes in, it gets really pricey. Not that this is cheap, but it's a hell of a lot more affordable. Go to NASCARcoder.com and you can find uh, information right there, how to get yourself in. The cool thing about that is, I, I think, Stu, is that you see a lot of folks where they do a general admission thing and they're, they're, they're just floating. I mean, they're just walking around, get a beer, go find a different spot, go sit and turn 12, whatever the case. And uh, it's just a good day to go to the racetrack. It really is. And you, and you go up to go up to the grand Plaza, see all the stuff they got, you know, there. And like you said, float around, whether it's turn 12, where you go to the, if you go to that, that grassy bank right there, just past the tower, they're heading into turn 19. Uh, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good vantage points to watch mm -hmm. the race. Yeah. Yep. Not a, not a bad spot to check stuff out. Let's go diving in. It's only an hour and, uh, it looks like it's only an hour today is going to be, uh, the Jeff Howe show, unless you've got, uh, something lined up, Jeff. Uh, well, I tell you, you, you gotta love that last minute, uh, an hour then yeah, it'll be just me by myself. <laughs> I'm laughing because Stu, I can't... <laughs> You'll appreciate this. I got a text from one of my buddies who's a huge wrestling fan. And okay. it just says, it's just random text. It says, random unrelated thought. 
Bischoff forcing Ray Ray to take his mask off and make him a soldier. I only say that because I saw Ray Mysterio's name in the comments on the chat. Yeah. Was the drizzling S's. I don't know. Well, that was, you know, as you know, Jeff, <laughs> that was WCW. I haven't thought about that in a minute. I'm like, wow, that is random. And I haven't thought yeah. about that in about 10 years. But all right. Yeah, it was pretty bad. But he is right. And that was, that was you know, the, the beginning of the end for WCW back in the, you know, 99, 2000. And yet yeah, have, have one of the greatest luchadors in Rey Mysterio take his mask off. Um, he just, that was like, uh, you know, oh, that sat, that sat really bad with me. Double R, you <laughs> missed it, man. They're doing stuff like Viagra on a pole match. Oh, I mean, that, that happened. Shit. Yeah. Did you see, I don't know if, uh, Dark Side of the Ring, the fantastic series on Vice TV, they yep. had their episode this past week was on Buff Bagwell. Mm-hmm. And oh, wow. His story, Bagwell man. on a forklift. Good flip. Lord. That was, <laughs> that was, a, that was really something to watch. That's crazy. That is absolutely yeah. It's a it's a different time, it, it, and I love those Monday Night Wars, man. When you had the Monday Night Wars going on, I mean that that was like you're you're flipping back and forth, and you know, and when you got guys showing up in the same spots, you know, and all this shit, it's like ah, eh, you know, it uh, it's a great time, man. It's it a very good time. High school, the CB. You haven't been around for a few days. Good to see you. I was in high yep. school during the Monday Night Wars, and I knew it. And when I knew it had gone mainstream was when one of my one of the assistant football coaches at my high school who was not a wrestling guy at all stops me on my way into biology one day he goes hey uh triple h won that title last night i went to bed before he <laughs> yeah uh, oh that's uh, fantastic it's yeah, going, now, officially going big now he me. now he's in charge and Shawn michaels is in charge in fact i had so i had talked to Shawn michaels oh about a year ago no it's actually more like six months ago and I asked him, did you ever, you know, could you ever picture a scenario where the two got two main guys of D generation X would now be running basically WWE? He goes, no, not really. But we, we laugh about that. You know, he's, he said he and Hunter laugh about that all the time. So Man. Well, it, it, I, I saw a comment there where somebody said Trish Stratus and I'm like, look, I'm always jealous of Stu because Stu was posting interviews a few years back where he's talking to Lexi Cop- or to Alexa Bliss. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my God, why didn't you, could I have come over for yeah. that? Man, oh, by the way, she, that. she, I think she tweeted out, she's looking to come back. You know, she had it. She had a child with her husband. She's looking to come back, and I think it's it, I think it's a matter of just getting the right creative and and all that good stuff. We may see Alexa Bliss, but back in the ring pretty soon. It, it's funny, Rodney. You know, Stu. I was with Stu and Justin on Sports Guys talking wrestling for a little bit, and then it just became mm-hmm. too the, the time constraints. You have a kid, and this time constraints don't work out anymore to do a wrestling podcast. And uh, but I remember talking to Chad Hastings, our good friend Chad, and he said, "You know what? I realized like Stu taking this to a different level." I'm like, "What?" He's like. He's like, I was backstage with Stu at, I don't even think it was an AEW show, Stu. I think Chad was with you. Wrestle some, Circus. Yeah. He was wrestling with Stu at some show. He's like, Tully Blanchard's there. And Chad's like, oh, my God, like from my childhood, like Tully Blanchard, yeah. Four yeah. Horsemen. And he's like, I'm starstruck. And Tully Blanchard just comes up and goes, hey, Stu, how you doing? And, like, they just chop <laughs> it up like they're just old pals from back in the day. <laughs> yeah, that was that was uh, Wrestle Circus. Uh, Tully's daughter. Tessa Blanchard Tessa. was wrestling there at the time. So Tully and Tully would come to all the shows that where Tessa was wrestling. And so Tully and I just struck up this little, I don't, I wouldn't call a friendship, but we knew each other and yep. we would chit chat about this, that, and the other. And, uh, I was like enough yep. interview Tully a few times. So yep. yeah, that That's was, tough. that was kind of fun. What does stuff. Tully think is the uh, Rodney? I know you got to go. So. Yeah, guys, I, I go to the, uh, uh airport stew. Um, I'll stick can, around for a moment. Okay. Uh Jeff, can you pull him out of the studio? I don't know. Whenever whenever you guys uh, go Stu can just whenever Stu's ready to go, he just he just, oh, he, just he can just make his yeah, way out. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Stu. Uh Jeff, um, have a great show. Have a great weekend. Guys, Chaos Theory, 10 to 11. We are back on Monday. Check us out. We're live local all day long, right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. You guys have fun, man. So all right. safe travels, Rodney. It's only an hour. Uh Jordan is out today, but uh Stu's gonna hang out. So there's there are very uh, there are uh, several iterations of Stu Myrick. You got sideline Stu from his work with Lake Travis, Bucky Gobble, and Mark Honan calling those Lake Travis games. You've also got uh, Suplex Stu, who is all over the professional wrestling circuit, both mainstream and independent. Stu doesn't discriminate. 
Uh, you've got Speedway Stu, who we heard talking to Rodney before, you know, as I came on. Because Stu, if there's something at Coda, I know you're out there. It's F1 or NASCAR, or whatever. You're you're there. You're you're at Coda, representing Coda. And uh, we've also got uh, Super Bowl Stu, who yeah. has he's been, he's been out of commission for a little bit now, right? I uh, I had to miss this year in Ve- for Vegas, but I did nine Super Bowls. Nine nine Super Bowls. I haven't done one, Stu. And are you still going to Cowboys games, Stu? Or is that with the whole? I haven't done Cowboys games. I, I, yeah, don't don't do that. In fact, you know, uh, I think it's I think one hundred two seven is now the Cowboys station. So I thought I saw something about that the other day. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, that was but that was always fun going up to going up to Jerry World and talk to talk to those that you know have covered Cowboys longer than I have. You know get whatever funny reaction from Clarence Hill or whatever. <laughs> uh, and you were a longtime fan of the Cowboys. So I'm, I want to ask you this. Uh, first off, before we get to the Cowboys, I want to, I want to leave the wrestling talk on a good note. Okay. As many times as you talk to Tully, I want to know what Tully Blanchard, cause I've heard, I've heard Arn Anderson talk about this. I've heard JJ Dillon's answer. I've heard Ric Flair's answer. What is Tully's answer on when you ask Tully, Hey, what is the real four horsemen lineup? What does Tully say it is? I have, I'll be honest, I have never asked Tully that. Really? Uh, I think, I think if he were, if, if you did ask him, he would say the original, which would have been Rick, Tully, Arn, and Ole Anderson, who just That's, passed away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the ones that went into the WWE Hall of Fame, it was Barry Windham instead of Ole. Ole, since he left, you know, since he got out of, the active wrestling scene. He has a, he has a very, well, shall we say mixed legacy? Um, yeah, yeah. Kind of bitter. And so, you know, when they decided to put the four horsemen in the WW hall of fame, they brought Barry Windham because honestly, that was, you know, there was the one time and everybody remember if wrestling fans remember the cover of pro wrestling illustrated where you had all four members of the four horsemen, with title belts, you had Rick as the world champion, Barry Windham was the United States champion, and Arn Arn and Tully were the world tag team champions. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, that was one of those, one of those iconic moments where the Four Horsemen basically ran Jim Crockett Promotions, the NWA, back in the Hell day. Oh yeah. So that's why a lot of people, which is kind of ironic, because Barry Windham is about to go into the Hall of Fame again, except this time with Mike Rotunda as the U.S. Express from back, you know, way back in the early mid eighties managed by Captain Lou Albano. Mike Rotunda's, in, Mike Rotunda's in there as, as IRS, right? Yes, he is in as IRS. Uh, so this will be his second one as well. <laughs> I heard, uh, I heard, uh, one time on, uh, I'm a big fan of something to wrestle with the Bruce oh, Pritchard yeah. podcast. Bruce Pritchard. Yeah, and uh, I heard him and Conrad talking one time, and Conrad made a joke in passing. He's like, "What? You guys ever think about putting the Undertaker at IRS have a Death and Taxes tag team?" And Bruce goes, "Hey, remember what I said about sometimes when you tell Vince things, be careful what you say in front of the old man." Like that apparently almost happened, folks. You almost had a tag team called Death and Taxes with the Undertaker and IRS. Would not have surprised me in the least. I'm, I, I'll be honest; I'm almost a little surprised it didn't happen. I know. Hey, Stu, we just got a bombshell dropped on us in the world okay. of pro football. CB alerted me to it. My phone was going crazy, and notifications on the Twitter machine. Aaron Donald just announced his retirement. What? Yeah. Uh, wow. I'll see if I can pull this up from his. I'll just read part of it. Uh, it said, for 10 years, I've been fortunate to play the game of football at the highest level. I'm thankful for the people I've met along the way, the relationships I've built, and the things I've accomplished with my teammates and individually. I would like to thank St. Louis for the love and support during my first two years in the league as a St. Louis Ram. And through my eight years as a Los Angeles Ram, I would like to thank Los Angeles for the love and support throughout my career as well. California has become home to me and my family, and you made it all special. He thanks... Uh, Stan Kroenke and the Kroenke family for being a part of the organization. Uh, I'm trying to find the actual announcement. Let's see. Uh, it just says, as I turn my focus to the, to a new chapter, I don't know what the future holds, but I am excited about the off-field possibilities. Looking forward to spending more time with my wife, Eric, and my kids, Jada, AJ, Eric, and Allie. Uh, the greatest reward of being able to play this game with them by my side, and I can't wait to watch them live out their dreams 
just as they watched me live out mine with a signature on the graphic. And that's it, Stu, one of the greatest defensive tackles that's ever played the game, really, is yeah. is calling it a career. And I'd heard he – there was the con he had a he it feels like every offseason Aaron Donald has some kind of contract dispute with the Rams. And I remember after the Super Bowl year, there was buzz. Well, does he just go ahead and hang it up now? Got a few more years, but now he's decided to call it a career. And there's no question. It, we all knew the minute he decides to hang it up, five years later, Aaron Donald's in Canton. Yeah, start counting now. Start making your plans for Hall of Fame 20 was be uh, I guess it'd be 2029. 20, yeah. Um like you said, one of the greatest ever to play defensive tackle, one of the greatest to ever play for the Rams. Uh, it was, I think a lot of people were thrilled when the Rams won that Super Bowl so that Aaron Donald could get a ring. Um, I wonder if this might, might be a case of, look, I'm still in relatively good health. You're Let me scared. get out while I can still, you know, I can still function while I'm still in decent health. That way, he can enjoy that time with his family. Uh, as far as what he does next, look, uh, he's a great, he's a well-spoken guy. I could easily see him end up on a on a you know commentary team for for one of the outlets that carries NFL football. So that and I think that would be an easy fit. Uh, but I think whatever he decides to do, he will be a success. And yeah. Hall of Fame 2029, I think we're going to see him don that gold jacket. You know, you talk about, we're talking about pro wrestlers. Some some of the toughest people you'll come across in life are pro wrestlers. No different than the guys on the football field. And you talk about two, two tough first ballot Hall of Fame, not just players, but men within about, what, 10 days of each other. Jason Kelsey retires. Aaron Donald retires. The thing, the thing about Aaron Donald, Stu, and I'm glad you're here because as much time as you spend around the Cowboys, if you go back to that draft in 2014, the Johnny Manziel draft, mm -hmm. Aaron Donald is the guy who the Cowboys wanted. Like, he's who they wanted at, at that pick. Where were they at? 14, 15? I forget where they were. Uh, Cowboys were, I think they were, actually, Cowboys were like at 22 because that was, like you said, Manziel was eligible for that draft. Yeah. And he would, I think, he was, they were at 22, and it was that was kind of the notion where, Stephen Jones takes that card out of Jerry's hand, and I think they ended up with was that Travis Martin? That was Zach. That was the Zach Martin. Martin I mean, yeah. So the cow the Cowboys were at sixteen. We it was in the middle. We split the difference with what we both said. Yeah. But I remember the Cowboys had their eyes on a couple different players. Yeah. Uh, the two the three guys they wanted, and actually one of them ended up being a Cowboy for a little bit. They they liked Anthony Barr. He went nine overall to the Vikings. Mm -hmm. They really liked uh, Ryan Shazier, the linebacker from Ohio State, who the Steelers took one pick before their pick. And they really liked Aaron Donald. And it just so happened Aaron Donald's stock kept rising where he was gone. It gets to 16. And you think about it, you think about the Hall of Famers that are going to come out of the, that 2014 draft. You know, Aaron Donald, Hall of Famer. Zach Martin, Hall of Famer. Yep. Uh, Mike Evans. Hall of Famer. There's, you're going to have uh, several Hall of Famers in this first round, a couple of Hall of Famers in this first round. And I think that the Cowboys could have been almost, almost, almost ended up with Johnny Manziel and not just the common sense. Hey, let's just plug it. You talk about a guy five years after he retired is going to Canton. That's going to be Zach Martin, who's yes. multiple years all pro, multiple years Pro Bowl. And it almost ended historically bad head. Depending on what version of the story you get, Stu, Stephen pulled the card out of Jerry's hand. Stephen phone tackled Jerry on his way to the phone. Whatever it is, the Cowboys almost ended up with Johnny Manziel when they really wanted Aaron Donald, Anthony Barr, or Ryan Chazier. Zach Martin wasn't a bad consolation prize. No, I think I think Zach Martin was a fantastic consolation prize because yeah, you know you, you know how Jerry is. He he falls in love with people. Sometimes he falls in love with the wrong people. And look, I covered Johnny Manziel when he was at Kerrville Tivy. I remember Lake Travis playing him a couple times, and he was fantastic then. Of course, went to Texas A and M, had a stellar career, won the Heisman. But look, that was, and I hate to say it about the kid, but he was, he was all sorts. Of, there was a lot of mess with him.
Uh, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, was there lot. was a lot, you know, with his family and, you know, old old, old Tyler old mo- oil money. And, yeah, you know, that was not, not good. I didn't have too many interactions with Johnny Manziel, but one that I remember having very briefly was his senior year at Tyvee. Mm-hmm. Tyvee played Steel week two. Malcolm Brown was a senior at Steel. And Johnny actually had gone with the Tyvee staff to the Steel Madison game, which was actually an ESPN game mm-hmm. to, to open the year. And Johnny wasn't sitting in the stands. He wasn't with the scouts. He was with like the AD and the head football coach and the superintendent, like in like the press box occupying seats. And I'm like, just the the aura that he gave off. I'm like, all right, not only is this guy really talented, but you get the idea that he knows he's really talented. Yeah. He knows he's good. And the stuff yeah. that we've heard since he got away with. I don't want to turn this into the Johnny Manziel show. And I don't know how we got from Tully Blanchard <laughs> to Johnny Manziel, but we did it. But, Stu, you're, you're a longtime Cowboys fan. You've covered the Cowboys, too. I don't know. Help me understand why people are upset that the Cowboys haven't done anything splashing in free agency. Because when's the last time they did? Well, and that's, you know, it's kind of funny. Rodney and I were just talking about that. And I think. Uh, I think that the Cowboys, they've got some holes to plug. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do with Dak Prescott and his, his contract. I think it's, it's a little bit of, they want to wait and see. They got multiple picks. They got what? Eight or nine picks in the draft next month. Yeah. But I think most like, like, five of them are rounds like six and seven okay that's what i was going to, i couldn't remember if it was middle or late i think though they're gonna wait and just see what comes out of the draft and maybe plug a few of those holes with you know some uh, some kids coming out of college and try to make make the best they can i i'm not as i'm not as crazy you know i'm not as up in arms about, you know, the lack of activity in free agency. Uh, they just re-signed Jordan Lewis, who's coming off an injury. There was There's talk of Jonathan Brooks maybe going to the Cowboys, which I'd like. I want to see what how he's doing after his injury. So, look, it's the Cowboys. I'm a lifelong fan. I, I've covered them, love them. They're not going to the Super Bowl this year. No. They're not, you know, no. so I'm, I, I want to, I'm going to play a wait and see and let's, let's just see they're, what they can do. They're in that weird spot where they're kind of, they can restructure deals and, and, you know, get right with the cap and give themselves some room, but they're in that weird position where the team has currently constructed Stu. I don't know what more you can do to raise the ceiling of this group. Like at some point, it's either that that one missing piece just kind of falls into your lap or maybe you accidentally draft it or you kind of at some point have to look at, all right, when do you just detonate this thing and start over? But, you know, the old man's not going to want to do that because at his age, he, he wants he wants to be as close to a Super Bowl as possible. So you just kind of you're going to kind of patchwork it as you go, try to keep your core together. But. As each offseason passes, it's almost like every offseason, they almost get worse every offseason. Yeah. They're, they don't make a move that just screams, all right, that's something, you know, going in a positive direction. It's almost like, hey, you're, you're basic. And, and look, building your organization through the draft is not a bad way to go. I love having homegrown talent, but you, you put all your eggs in it. It's not all safe to put all your eggs in one basket or the other. They're putting all their eggs in a basket of, hey, we're going to live and die based off of what happens with our draft class. Well, and that's the thing. Um, Look, Jerry is, he's never going to be lauded as one of the great general managers of NFL history, but he's going to try to make, you know, some sizzle. Uh, And like you said, you got to have that mix. There's got to be, you know, draft free agency. And I just think, you know, I think, I think that there are, you know, they were looking at Derrick Henry as at a, at running back and, Look, I think Derrick Henry is a beast. I think he's one of the, one of the best running backs in the league today. 
I do wonder how much wear and tear is on Derrick Henry as, as hard as he runs being one of those bruising backs. So like I said, I want, I'm going to take a wait and see approach and, and uh, we'll see how we'll see what the Cowboys put on the field come this September. Derrick Henry's 30, Stu. Yeah. Unless you're Adrian Peterson, those guys don't continue to produce with age. You're right. You're right. Hey, uh, Jeff, I got to make, I got to bolt, uh, take care of some stuff. It always a pleasure sharing the mic with you, my friend. Yeah. I just look, I, I had a chance to, to catch up with you a little bit. And I, I, just, I, appreciate I need it. to get your opinion on wrestling and Cowboys. That's it. You, you covered that portion of the show for us. So well, I appreciate, appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to, thanks to BK and everybody at Texas sports unfiltered for having me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, sports guys talking wrestling available wherever you get your podcasts. Boom. Thanks guys. Stu. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Be safe. All right. It's only an hour. It's only about a half hour from here. So just to kind of wrap up the Cowboys talk, I hear this rumor and innuendo too, of a Zeke Elliott Cowboys reunion. I'm not at all crazy about that, but you know, to Stu's point about, the Cowboys and the compensatory, you know, the draft picks, the compensatory picks came out the other day. They got four compensatory picks uh, for losing seven free agents last year. They got a four, three sixes. Uh, compensatory picks can't be traded. So basically, they, yeah, Michael, it's only Jeff at this point. It's only me. Uh, basically, at this point, the Cowboys got their fourth round pick that they traded to the 49ers in the Trey Lance deal. They're basically getting their fourth round pick back and they're getting a couple of sixes. I think, look, Cowboys fans, I, I know I, I have to be a media member and kind of be a little bit, you know, unbiased on this. We just agree, like, Stu brought up Jordan Lewis, the Cowboys resigned him. Just whatever you do in the draft, probably no more Michigan guys, maybe. Just try not to do that because. Mozzie Smith didn't really work out last year, and we know that uh, when the taco period commenced, it was a failed experiment. So Taco Charlton didn't work out at all. So just as long as you don't draft any Michigan guys, I don't know what the Cowboys are going to do at 24. But, again, you're just kind of living and dying based on what your draft class looks like. And you know, Jordan and I talked about this the other day. <laughs> when you look at some of their free agents, I mean, you got Tyler Biotish, Doran Armstrong, and Dante Fowler Jr. all follow Dan Campbell, uh, Dan Campbell, Dan Quinn to Washington. I don't know why I said Dan Campbell. I had Dan Campbell subconsciously on the brain today. But you got Biotish, Armstrong, and Fowler all going to the Commanders. Neville Gallimore going to the Dolphins. Tony Pollard signs with the Titans, I guess, to be Derrick Henry's replacement. You look at what they've got in terms of their in-house free agents. I mean – other than Tyron Smith, and there's no inclination that Tyron Smith is going to be back. You know, Rico Dowdle, Sean McKeon, Jonathan Hankins, J. Ron Kerr. J. Ron Curse would be nice if you could bring him back. But you look at all those pieces, man, all those pieces are replaceable with either kind of what the Cowboys do, how they build a roster. It's kind of bottom tier free agents, kind of tier three free agents. And then you're rebuilding through the draft. And that's just what they do. So if you're a Cowboys fan and you're all up in arms about what they've done in free agency, the activity or lack thereof, man, that's a you problem at this point. I didn't expect the Cowboys to do anything flashy in free agency. And that included pursuing a running back. Like I said, man, I love Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry's 30 years old. And again, unless you're Adrian Peterson and you're just a freak, guys don't typically produce at the same level or get better after the age of 30 when it goes man it goes and and, and it, it, it's really hard to if not impossible to get it back like running backs and closers in baseball are kind of those two deals where dude once you lose it it doesn't come back and it goes downhill really really fast so that's what's going on with the dallas football cowboys as far as the longhorns go at this time next week, we'll have at least one spring practice viewing window to talk about. We'll have Pro Day to talk about. We'll have a couple of spring practices, and we'll get some intel. You know how we do it at Horns 24-7, whether it's Chip Brown, whether it's anybody else on our team, Eric Henry on that beat. We'll have info, all the intel for you on spring ball on the site. 
Uh, right now, you can go kind of get really our, our last few kind of wringing out the rag, if you will, uh, of of winter intel with the insider piece that came out. Uh, our countdown to spring practice series just look kind of going position by position on that deal. Uh, we got a couple more of those to put out. Safeties came out yesterday. So I think we got corners. Uh, we got specialists and offensive line. And that's it. So it's really coming down to – we're really getting down to, to start looking at this team and what the 2024 Longhorns are going to look like. And, and I'll say that one thing that I hope we see a little bit of once we get to spring football. And again, I mentioned this with Jordan the other day. So if this is if it's just rehash, I apologize. But if you're new to the show, hopefully you, you get something from this. Spring football, the best thing about spring football is if you're going to experiment with position changes, if you're going to experiment with, hey, we want to see what this defensive look looks like, you want to experiment with different personnel groupings, different formations that maybe you haven't run, this is the time to do it. This is the time to experiment, and not that you need to spend an exorbitant amount of time doing it, but, man, if you're Steve Sarkeesian, this is the time where you can kind of throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And if it doesn't, all right, it didn't really cost you anything in terms of game planning because you don't have an opponent to plan for in the next few weeks like you do once you get to camp. I say it all the time. Pretty much once you get past that second camp scrimmage, at that point now you're really looking forward to getting to game one and you're in game plan mode. And for Texas, let's be honest, I don't know how much time they're going to spend on Colorado State. Most of that time is probably going to be spent on getting ready to make that trip to Ann Arbor coming up in early September, but I digress. But spring ball is the time where, man, if you want to tinker with position changes or whatever, this is when you can do it. Things we talked about on the site, things we talked about here at Texas Sports Unfiltered, whether it's been Jordan and I, whether it's been Chip and Zay, whether it's been Trey and BK, BK and Bucky, Trey and everybody in the afternoon, whoever it is, the moves like getting Janae Barron to look at corner, moving guys around on the offensive line, and Jordan still doesn't like the idea of Hayden Connor maybe kicking out to right tackle in the event that either Cam Williams doesn't work out or you figure Nato Mazzulu is one of those guys that has to be in your starting five on the offensive line, so then, but then Hayden Connor, you feel like, is also a part of that mix. So then what do you do? Uh, Jordan doesn't like it. I'm not opposed to it. But if you want to see what this offensive line looks like with Hayden Connor kicked out at right tackle with that first group, this is the time when you can go do that. This is the time when you can look at how many different ways can you use Anthony Hill? How where is he most comfortable? Where where can we put him that maybe we didn't put him last year? I'd like to see them really elaborate on that third down package they had last year defensively. Now you're not going to have Murphy or Sweat, but between Alfred Collins, Vernon Broughton, because you're only playing three down linemen. Jalen Ford's out of the mix now, but you know Mo Blackwell was in that third down package. Anthony Hill was in that third down package whether you're talking about Kendrick Blackshire or David Benda, whoever it is, you've got enough bodies. And with adding a guy like Andrew Makuba out of the portal, getting Jade Barron back, and you've got enough versatility to where you can have a really salty third down defensive package. I think that thing worked so well for Texas last year. And if I remember right, I think the BYU game was the first game where we really saw that third down package that they ended up using the rest of the year. And Texas had one of the best third down defenses in the country last year. You can bring that package back, change some of the pieces, and see which pieces best fit. The time for experimentation is now. So how creative do we hear about Sark getting behind the scenes? Which also leads me to my next point. Man, when you hear about a new kind of formation or a new look or whatever it is, don't take it to the bank that that's something Texas is going to do during the season because, again, this is the time for experimentation. Sark might take want to take a look at something for one practice, for one period, for one whatever it is, and they might shelve it and decide, okay, that didn't work or we didn't like it or whatever, or maybe we'll revisit that later, but that's it. So don't, don't get caught up so much on who's working where and what personnel groups are on the field and who's in what personnel group and all this different kind of stuff. Pay attention – to guys, so I'm saying that that stuff is going to be there. And like I said, I want to hear about some of that stuff. And Coach 420 brings up a guy that could fit into that third down package. I mean, what can you do with a guy like Jelani McDonald? Is he at the point where the coaches decide that between Blake Gideon and PK, if they decide, man, 
He's so good. We 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 got to put him somewhere. We've got to find a home for him. Where is that? Coach, I don't know if that's spinning him down to linebacker right now. But he's a guy that whether it's safety, traditional safety, whether it's in one of your sub packages, can a guy like Jelani McDonald help you win games right now? Can he help you win games in 2024 on defense? That's something else you can figure out during the spring too. And that's the big thing to pay attention to. You can pay attention to those different tweaks and those different shifts and that all that experimentation. You can pay attention to it, but don't just get so consumed with it. I would encourage people following spring ball. Don't get so consumed with it that you lose sight of what you should really be paying attention to in spring practice, which is how are guys developing? Who are the guys that you're hearing about stepping up from a leadership standpoint? I'll give Chip credit. A lot of the stuff he brought up in his insider piece this week, that's at Horns 24-7 right now, is talking about, man, you lost a ton of leadership. Who are the guys that are going to step up and be the leader that Tavondre Sweat was, be the leader that Byron Murphy was, be the leader that Jalen Ford or Jordan Whittington or Christian Jones. Again, you lost some really strong voices in that locker room. Who are going to be those guys that step up as I pause to take a drink really quick? I don't have my Alamo Bowl chalice of mediocrity today, so I apologize. But who are those guys that are going to step up and earn jobs? and keep developing and keep growing. Like I remember last spring, the stuff we were hearing that ended up carrying it over to the season that proved to be, you know, it was kind of prophetic in a way. Started hearing about Byron Murphy's leadership. Started hearing about Tavondre Sweat, taking things a little more seriously. Started hearing about things really coming together for Quinn Ewers. Maybe that floor was getting raised a little bit. Started hearing about A.D. Mitchell was a freak. And could really do a lot to take pressure off of Xavier Worthy as a really reliable wide receiver target. That's the kind of stuff that carries over. I know sometimes people take practice reports and practice intel with a grain of salt. And when it's wrong, you know, those of us that report such intel, you never hear the end of it when it's wrong. But when it's right, when it's right, it can kind of it can go a long way towards painting the picture, forming the identity of what this team is going to be. And I think you look at the 2023 team, a lot of the things that form the identity of that team started in spring practice. You can go back to last spring, go look at the reports, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the insider reports, the VIP reports that we had on the site, the close scrimmage reports, a lot of that stuff wound up carrying over like, Hey man, uh, you know, Jonathan Brooks was slow to come back, but Hey, Look, this running back room looks like it's it 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 might actually be pretty deep. You know, CJ Baxter looks like he's gonna play a role as a true freshman. And hey man, when Jaden Blue gets the football, he he's not too bad. He looks like he's growing and developing. So just keep that in mind. Once the practice reports start to trickle in, just to help everybody. I hope what I said makes sense to help everybody just separate. Okay, what should I shove aside is file it away but don't really kind of dive into it and take it as gospel and what should really be something tangible that you can hold on to as well. Uh, Coach 420, Coach 420, by the way, if you're on, uh, we've got the code of text line, 512-222-9328 is the code of text line. Uh, you can also just the, the best of the, 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 another good way to get in touch with us, get in touch with me right now is to get in uh, on YouTube, get in that chat, just drop a comment. Uh, Coach 420 is owning the chat right now. Uh, he said, I'll say Quinn, Majors, Barron, Hill, and Taff as those voices, Banks and Collins as well. Here's my take on that on leadership. I think Quinn Ewers has to be that guy just because, just by default, because quarterback by default is a leadership position. As far as those other guys, Jake Majors has played more football than just about anybody on your in your program. Same for Jade Barron. You talk about two guys that are premium producers, probably on their way to being premium draft picks in the NFL with Anthony Hill and Kelvin Banks. You know, Michael Taff is a guy that say what you will about him. I, I really believe he's got the respect of everybody in that locker room. You know, when guys talk about Taff, that's what they talk about. They talk about a guy who everybody likes him, but everybody really respects him for what he's done. And then Alfred Collins, dude, I. I just keep with, with Alfred Collins. The thing I keep going back to with him is 
his development, his growth, his trajectory is going to determine where the ceiling is for this defense. Because the, the, the with this defense, obviously when you lose Sweat, you lose Murphy, you lose Jalen Ford, the floor isn't going to be quite as high with this group. Could the ceiling be as high as last year's? I know that's a tall order. But I still look at Alfred Collins and think, man, if he can put everything together, and how long have we been saying that? But if he can put everything together, yeah, your defense can be one of the better defenses in the country. If you've got a legit, bona fide frontline stud at the point of attack, it's going to make things easier on Vernon Broughton. And you could have a really good tip of the spear. Is it going to, could it be as good as it was with Sweat and Murphy? Maybe, maybe not. But Here's something else to think about there, though. You know, Alfred Collins thing, we'll be talking about that until he gets a chance to prove it come August 31st against Colorado State. But when you look at this defense and how does the Texas defense remain elite knowing that you've lost some really key pieces along the way? On our Longhorn Blitz podcast this week, which you can get go to Horns 24-7 get that as well. Uh, you should be subscribed to Texas Sports Unfiltered on all of our platforms, right? Hit that subscribe button right now if you're not subscribed on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You should be subscribed to Texas Sports Unfiltered. You should also be following Horns 24-7 on our multiple platforms. Uh, and that includes our podcasts, The Flagship with Chip and Eric Henry, and then the Longhorn Blitz with myself, Matt Butler, and Rod Babers. But Rod made a really good point. And the more I think about it, I've I've really racked my brain, and I can't think of – a Texas defense that from one year to the next was elite, remained elite the following year, but did so by really changing their identity. And that was the 2000 defense or the 2001 defense. Go back to that 2000 Texas defense. I mean, you had Sean Rogers and Casey Hampton, and I believe it's Texas number one in the country, I think maybe in pass efficiency defense. Uh, they were one of the better defenses in the country because you had two, you know, Casey Hampton was a first round draft pick multiple, you know, he was on the Steelers all time team. By the way, if you haven't checked out the interview that uh, Chip and Zay did recently with Casey Hampton, you owe it to yourself to get over to our video archives on YouTube and check that out or on the podcast and check that out. But they, that Sean Rogers and Casey Hampton were the anchors of that 2000 defense. It was one of the best defenses in the country. The 2001 Texas defense, you could argue, was a better defense, but the identity of that defense was built more on the back seven personnel. Got to remember that 01 team, that was Dwayne Aquinas' first year at Texas as the secondary coach. And he basically had four corners on the field between Rod Babers, Quentin Jammer, Ahmad Brooks, and Nathan Vasher. By the way, all guys have played in the NFL. Oh, yeah, and they returned all three linebackers, but they had this freshman named Derek Johnson who they really felt like, Bull Reese felt like they needed to find a way to get this young guy on the field because he's such a difference maker. That Texas defense was one of the best defenses in the country with Maurice Gordon playing defensive tackle at 260, 265 pounds, whatever Maurice Gordon was back then. You had a young Marcus Tubbs on that interior D-line, but they were able to carry it over from one year to the next being elite by completely changing their identity. I think this defense is going to have to do something similar. And uh, Sticky 12 brings up, says, are, are Phil Samee, Xavier Phil Samee and Derek Williams the starting safeties by midseason, hearing nothing but great things from the true freshmen. That's part of what I'm talking about in terms of the identity being different. Because you bring in Andrew Makuba out of the portal. Derek Williams is a year older. Xavier Filson, he's coming in. He's going to play some type of role for this team. Do you see those guys just take over the position at some point? I don't know, but, you know, kind of going back to the experimentation thing, at this point, I think Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon just have the luxury of looking at their personnel and saying, hey, these guys are versatile enough. Let's just figure out how we can put the five best on the field and, and what configuration does that make sense? Does it make sense to have Jade Barron at corner? Does it make sense to have him at safety? Does it make sense to have Makuba at safety? Or could you put him at the star position if you decide Jade Barron's one of your better one of your better corners if he wins a job at corner? So I guess to answer the question, Sticky 12, are Phil Simi and Derek Williams the starting safeties by midseason? I, I don't know that they are, but 
I don't know that it matters because I, I like we saw with Derek Williams last year, like we saw with Malik Muhammad last year. It, if the growth is there from Phil Simi early on, he'll be playing starter level snaps by that point. And the versatility you have with a guy like Makuba, it would be easier to get Phil Simi on the field at safety as opposed to letting him try to play the star position or whatever. So they could be, yes. They might already be, and Derek Williams, I do believe, is one of your best 11 on defense. They might already be starting caliber players. Are they actually starting? I don't know, but they could be very well be your best safety tandem by the time you get to the middle of the season. Grant, appreciate the shout out. I know we'll, we'll keep talking Texas football. If you guys have Texas football questions, we got about 15 minutes left. I can, I'll, I'll do my best to answer whatever. Grant says, Jeff, how's it going? Where does Jordan Shipley? rank on your top high school players in texas man well grant that's one that i did not plan on doing today putting together that list but jordan shipley what would that list look like for me this is always a fun exercise because Anybody that's heard me spout off my top five or whatever, I feel like it always changes based on just who comes to top of mind that day. But the guys that I don't, he's one of those guys that's in that group of players that I, I can't forget of when you see them. And I, you know, if you want to count like all-star games, you know, when I've been there for a week of practice um, or just seen guys extensively in an all-star game type setting, um, you know, I could throw in Christian McCaffrey. I could throw in Derrick Henry. I could throw in, you know, whoever it is that's, you know, been in, in the All-American Bowl or, or was in that 2015 Under Armour game. But I'm talking about just guys I've seen in the state of Texas in person on a Friday night or in a playoff game. Jordan Shipley's in that group. Jonathan Gray is in that group. Des Bryant, for sure, is in that group. I think Jordan would kill me on Monday if I didn't put Garrett Wilson in that group. But I'll put Garrett Wilson in there. Garrett Wilson passed the test for me of being a guy that you see him, you watch him, and you're like, man, is this a guy that, like, you know, did we miss? A, 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 is he a senior uh, that, that we just missed on an eval? Like, it was this our bad? And then you find out, no, he's a sophomore, and you're like, oh, okay, well, he's going to be one of the top prospects in the country when it comes time for, for him to be a, a rising senior going into his senior year in his recruiting cycle. Uh, I don't know if I'd put Garrett Wilson in that group, but he he's one of the better ones I've seen. But Des Bryant, Jordan Shipley, Jonathan Gray, I, I think in some way, shape, or form, Grant, it, it's going to kind of be those three guys. I mean, it – how do I discount Kyler Murray? You know, Kyler is one of the best that I, I've ever seen. I, I, you know, I didn't see Adrian Peterson in high school. I didn't see Vince Young in high school. But Kyler, Kyler's one that, that would have to be up there for me. Um, yeah, but I think probably just those three. Those three guys uh, would be up there for me. Coach 420 asks, Jeff, FedEx field or Gerald's home field? <sighs> The fact that I even had to pause, BK, to think about that. Did you go to the? You didn't go to the Maryland game in 2018, did you? Thank God I was not there, dude. That was strange. Uh, just kind of one of those deals that, like, you almost like you leave the stadium just asking yourself, dude, did I just like? Did that really happen? Like, did I really just watch Texas lose to Maryland? in that in that way um i'll say this gerald's field once had a a pennis drawn drawn on it with gasoline and then set on fire um which in some way makes it have more redeeming qualities than fedex field yeah and i just my again i'm gonna apologize for my language here i know we all drop s bombs and f bombs but i'm really gonna apologize for my language here. Um, I have higher expectations, BK, for an NFL stadium than to just be a complete and utter shithole. Yeah, I'll never forget. 
I'll never forget, and I agree with you, that uh, Pennis drawing on Gerald's home field is a plus in their direction. <laughs> so good call on that. Um, I'll never forget. I wasn't at that game, but of course I was watching it on TV. And there was that, what, hour plus weather delay? Yeah. And I think Bruce Feldman was doing sidelines for Fox mm -hmm. on that telecast. And there's a video of him, like, he's in one of the tunnels in the stands at FedEx Field. And literally behind him, you can see water just leaking through all of the, like, holes, all of the cracks in the bleachers at FedEx Field. Yeah, and dude. Like, Jesus, man. Like, we knew the field itself sucked, like the actual playing surface, but I didn't realize that translated to the stands in every other part of that stadium, too. You know when you have like a you see like a ditch like here in Texas when we get a nice flash flood and like you see a, a ditch with like looks like a river that if you walked out of the tunnel where the Texas locker room was and you walked onto the field that's what the the area between the end of the uh, I don't know what you call it, like the tunnel area the end of the tunnel where the tunnel area meets the field that's what it looked like it's like a trough it's like a like a creek just with flowing running water. So the drainage system sucked. God. Like you you saw that when you saw dudes like a guy would like fall down breaking a pass and he'd hydroplane like 15 yards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that's probably what ended RG3's career earlier than it needed to. Like <laughs> the the thing I don't know. That, that just that set it over the top for me at FedEx was yeah. I looked around at one point during the delay and I counted within my line of vision three paint like the big paint buckets that were sitting out on press row collecting rainwater that was leaking through the roof the re leaking through the ceiling mm. that sounds about right yeah you know maybe with the new ownership group they've got in washington they will uh finally pony up whatever it takes to fix that place although it's probably unfixable at this point like the, the next step for the washington football commander one, skins yeah, yeah they've got to they've got to build something new like yeah. that that's all you can do at this point. And uh, even though that place isn't that old, it, it's still you got new ownership and you're trying to really start a new era of your franchise. A big part in doing that can be opening up a new place to play. And I think we'll get one of those within the next five years out there. I would say I hope so, but it's it's the Washington franchise. And as a Cowboys fan, I really don't give a rat's ass because I never plan on going out there ever again. So, yeah, that's fair. That's and by the way, yeah. like, it's it's got the worst press box angle to view a game from, too. Was it like Baylor's TV camera? That's uh, that's what you get up in the really? press box when you watch a game at Foster Pavilion and the camera angles on the moon. No, it's yeah. not that. Hmm. It's like eye level with the field, but you're in the end zone, so your depth perception completely sucks. Like you have no, you can't really perceive what's actually happening on the field. Like that was one that I had to go back and like watch the entire game over to really get a feel for what happened. Yeah. And unfortunately that was one of the worst games to ever watch. So the fact that you put yourself through that a couple of times is uh, admirable, but also questionable because that, that stunk. I both do it Maryland games. Don't have stunk. To, BK. Yeah. That's, I say the same thing. I mean, you and I both did that, right? I rewatch every Longhorn game three times in between Saturday and Monday before going on the air to do a show. Just so I, Half knew what I was talking about. It was rough. And then I did that in Houston with the Texans for a couple of years when they were Jeez. the worst team in the league. And it's like, why do I do this to myself? Like, no, this is not a job requirement. This is going above and beyond. But really, this is taking years off of my life. Hazard pay. Yeah, exactly. Hazard that was pay. trying to think well, of the toughest rewatches, too, for Texas. I'm sure you got a few that it's just like you knew going in to – Watch too that you're about to have a miserable time, and both Maryland games were pretty high up on my list for that. Fifty to seven against TCU was pretty bad. Oh yeah, uh, the shutout on Halloween in Ames was was rough. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. There weren't there weren't that many in the Tom Herman era. The the Herman era ones were the Charlie Strong era ones where it's like, why am I doing this to myself? The Herman era ones were, it was some of those losses where you knew there was like one big moment in the game where there was just that colossal screw up. And it's almost like trying to go back and watch a movie where you might have missed plot holes. And you're like, all right, what led up to 
said catastrophic moment where just all hell broke loose. And it was fun kind of trying to tie it together. And then you're like, all right, yeah, well, this explains the the suckage at the most inopportune time. Mm. Um, uh, just a couple more questions in the chat. Grant asks, how about FedEx Field or the Rat P Gym in Gerald? The Rat P Gym had charm. I'll say that. You, you, have you ever heard me talk about the Rat P Gym, BK? I feel like, I feel like I have. And Gerald used to have a gym that smelled like rat piss. Yeah. You walk in and it's just the smell of rat piss just hits you right in the face. Yeah. I mean, FedEx Field has that too, I'm sure. You know, it's it's yeah, open but air. again, I'd expect it from Gerald High School. I wouldn't expect <laughs> it from one of 32 franchises yeah, in the that NFL. Is, that is very and, fair. And Cooter, shout out to you, sir. Uh, great contributions as always. Um, FedEx Field or the Oakland Coliseum? Considering the Oakland Coliseum has been known, BK, in the bowels of it, no pun intended, to have literal feces flowing through that place, I think it takes the crown for the bigger dump. I have been to the Oakland Coliseum, and it is a ginormous dump. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. Now, it's I enjoyed it. I'm glad that I went uh, to actually experience what people had been talking about because I've heard for my entire life that that place was just an absolute landfill. Yeah, and I, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to make sure that I got to see things for myself, and it lived up to my expectations. Like I had incredibly high expectations of shit. And it lived up to <laughs> those expectations. So it smelled like feces. You talk about rats. There were rats running all around. It was opening day when I went. It was Rangers A's one oh time. So God. that's like it was, I saw it the best it's going to ever look. Because they that's like the only game of the year where the athletics get a crowd. So they, I'm <laughs> sure, had tried to spruce up the ballpark and make it look as presentable as possible. And it was still a total S hole, man. Dude, you awesome. didn't eat anything in that place, did you? Uh, oh, you know, I wanted to see what the rat shit tasted like. That was part of my, I mean, it, I guess if you wanted to eat like a hot dog or something, that's probably the, probably the furthest you could take it. Sure. Like nothing, like nothing with cheese, nothing that had a chance to sit out. Well, government cheese is government cheese, baby. I think I, I'm more of a nachos guy than a, than a hot dog guy. Uh, I do yeah. love the hot dog, but I just generally at the ballpark, I find myself siding with the nachos more. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I downed some nachos and, uh, yeah, I mean, I lived to tell the tale. I don't, I don't know what my bathroom situation was like that night, but I did live to tell the tale. Hellacious. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, dude, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned government cheese. Have you ever noticed that like the best Tex-Mex places you go to use like the cheap government cheese? And it's just something there's there's something about the way it tastes. I don't know what it is, but it's it's freaking amazing. Dude, I, I love that government cheese, man. Like people dunk on it all the time. And it's like, oh, you get those ballpark nachos, like, go get you some real case. That that's that's real cheese. That's the way it was meant to be. Yeah. That's how it's we're supposed like, to have it. Like I got uh and I look, I I love the Astros. I love going to games in Minute Maid, but yeah. You know, I just there was one game I went there. I just wanted some fries, and like, well, you can get these garlic truffle fries. I'm like, how about just fries, minus the hold the garlic, hold the truffles. Can you even get that fries? Can, like, I feel like you have to order like a burger with a side of fries or a chicken sandwich with a side of fries. I was trying, I was trying to just order. Like a, I just wanted a basket of French fries. Yeah, but I was told that that wasn't possible. I had to order it with all the little truffly stuff on it. Yeah, because that stuff is not made to order, believe it or not. They uh, they don't they don't start cooking that food at your local ballpark after you place your order, unfortunately. Yeah, dude, it's it's a roll of the dice, man. Yeah, I love ballpark food though. Two weeks till Major League Baseball comes back, but yeah, ballpark food. Like I I can't go to a game and not not eat something. Dude, like, you know what the you know what the best the best day to go to a ball game is. Dollar, dollar, dollar hot dog night. Oh. Well, who's uh oh someone's getting rid of dollar beer night. Or is it dollar That's... hot dog? No, Philly, it's dollar hot dog night. Philly, of course, it's Philadelphia. The, the Phillies Warner. are getting rid of dollar hot dog night because too many people were throwing the hot dogs on, on the field. <laughs> So I think they're scrapping the whole. I feel like I read that headline like a month ago. They tried to like quietly announce it in the heart of the off season, like ah, we'll just do this and no one's gonna know. But it it of course blew up and became a huge story. And 
Yeah, here it is. They are scrapping Dollar Hot Dog Night for unruly fan behavior. That that's the reason, not because they're losing money off of it, but because the fans can't control their wieners. All right. I hope the Phillies go zero in one sixty two. Then. Yeah, I mean, I did before this, but yes, now after this, agreed. Of course, leave it to Philly to ruin something as good as Dollar Hot Dog Night. Like Bill Burr was right about you people, and you do mean you people when in you your Harold Carmichael that. jerseys. Yeah, I mean, that's so the in place of dollar hot dog night, they're having a couple of buy one, get one where you can get two hot dogs for five bucks. That's their promotion. That's their pivot from dollar dogs. They're going two for five as if that is anywhere close to the same level of deal. How about you people just stop acting like savages and throwing wieners on the field? Yeah, I've never keep even your, keep your of, wieners to yourselves, and there say, won't be your, a problem. Keep your hands on your own wiener. That's all we need here. I've never even thought about that. Throwing no. like, a perfectly good dog and just throwing it on the field like that's against my religion too to throw any sort of money like that down the drain. <laughs> but but also, yeah, I mean it's a dollar dog. Like you, you try to eat as many as you can. Let's that's the point. Like, we got to the root of the problem. Let's be honest with BK. It's the fact that you took a perfectly good U.S. one dollar bill and basically discarded it like yesterday's trash. Yeah, this ain't a strip club here. I'm not paying the baseball players with the uh, crisp dollar bills. That's not my thing. No, thank you. I want to be. I want to. I want to make a just a. I'm way past the the age or the enjoyment of like going to these places, but I'd like to see frugal BK at the uh, gentleman's establishment. Oh man, what, yeah. What does that expedition look like? You won't see frugal BK at the gentleman's establishment. Yeah. That's that's what it looks like. I, I had a little bit of a run of strip clubs, but I was never. I was never much of a fan. Um, you realize pretty quick. I think if you're smart, this is how you in, in your early twenties. This is how you know you have hope because your early twenties is really when you're going to the to the script club. You're going to be rebellion with Pac Man Jones. Oh yeah. And when you, the quicker you realize the diminishing returns at the gentleman's establishment, I think that's when you kind of realize, all right, maybe there is hope for me. Yeah, I'm with you. I didn't have the game or the money. Or the clout to like take those girls home on the reg. I don't no, think got, anybody anybody really does. You know? Yeah, there are some. At least people have stories. Who knows if those stories are fabricated or not? But yeah, I wouldn't spend in the money, and I wasn't well known, and I'm still not well known to the point where it's like, oh, I walk in there and all the girls want to leave and, with me. You know, every everybody's bar conquest or script club story. It's like a Reddit thread. Yeah, like, I'm. I'm 95% sure of what I'm being told right now or exposed to is bull crap, but it's enjoyable. Yeah. I'm going to enjoy it. I, I, you're right. And I'd, uh, that's well said. I'd rather just go to the bar and I got a better chance of bringing somebody home and spending less money if I just go to a bar. Well, we know about your escapades on Dirty Six back in the day. Oh, man. Yeah. It's I a wish. Tough legend, PK. I wish uh, I wish I was still going to Dirty Six as often as I as I used to, but nobody will go with me at my age. It's it's the saddest thing. But here's here's what I found out too, because I, I went and did a guest lecture at Texas State. I missed a Thursday show. Like oh yeah, I remember you talking about this that. Point. Yeah, yeah. When you realize, like, you're dude, you're the old f now. Like on a college campus, I, I, the 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 classroom I lectured in was a classroom. At, at old Maine, where all that's where the school of journalism is at texas state up on the hill uh i had several classes in that classroom where i guess lectured and i'm like yeah it was 15 years the last time i was in here like i'm i'm the creepy old f on campus now yeah that's uh i was on campus a couple weeks ago trying to spread the word about TSU. We were doing some tabling and getting some students to try to subscribe in exchange for like a raffle that we were doing. And yeah. it, I, one thing happened that made me feel young. There was like another student organization. They were like going around interviewing students. It was in February and they're like, how do you, they were asking questions about how you think UT does with Black History Month. And they come up to me and they're like, hey, can we talk to you for a few minutes for uh, this thing we're doing? I'm like, yeah, sure, of course. And they're like, uh, oh, you're a UT student, right? And I was like, I was in 2012. And they're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I, I, that's when I started college. So I wanted to make them feel really shitty for coming up to me. And, and they just lost all interest in, in talking to me. Yeah. After that. I was like, yeah, hey, if you, you know, if you want my thoughts on uh, how UT did with black history month, 10 years ago, sure. I, I got you. And they're like, no, nah, that's okay. Have a good day. Oh man. Hey, uh, two questions. Is Trey still doing man? It, did his, uh, run? On, oh, there he is. I'm glad Trey's here. That you're, uh, your march on the Capitol yesterday was successful. Then <laughs> we want to come. We want to come. We. I've, I've been chanting it all day in my house. My uh, family has been looking at me strange. Have you guys seen like? I, I, we were joking about it yesterday, but apparently there are there are some folks really up in arms about the hub getting shut down in the Lone Star State. Yeah, are they, I'm are they actually marking on the cap- capital? Because if so, I'll go back down there and do some man on the street shit. It might get to that point, Trey. Like I was seeing some stuff on the Twitter machine. I'm like, oh yeah, like we joked about it yesterday. Like, oh yeah, the hub went down and my life went on. Like, you know, it's no big deal. But there were some people like, wow, there sounds like there were some weekends ruined by yeah. this by this Bullshit. action coming down. Cost me like 20 minutes. I had to learn how to use a VPN yesterday. I, I had only heard of those things. I had to download some app on my computer and connect to some <laughs> random IP address. I mean, I had to jump through a million hoops just to watch my nightly videos. I thought he was going to say for a sec, Jeff, that he was forced to use imagination, but no, forced to learn how to use a VPN. Well, I thought he was going to. I thought he was. There was going to be an X hamster reference, but you know, it's <laughs> how the VPN work out for you, BK. Or- it worked out well. I was uh, getting close to getting in my car to drive to DW Adult Video, but thankfully I didn't have to. That's never. That is never the answer. In the year, in the year of our Lord twenty and twenty four, that should never be the answer. Why do those places still exist? I don't. That Trey, that needs to be some some trailing research. <laughs> like, what are the margins at one of those businesses? Oh, well, the margins are really good, and I'm assuming that these sorts of businesses are often being used for money laundering purposes, too. I have no evidence to back that up, but I would assume gotta be. there's something else going on there, because there's no way that they stay open otherwise. With these occasional pervs coming in to get their rocks off in a theater where others have gotten their rocks off, and yeah, they sell these things, too, but it's available for free now. Why would you pay for it anymore? Like people don't do either honestly, do either of you guys have number one own a Blu-ray or DVD player or two have one that's hooked up where you could use it right now if you wanted to? No. I don't. Yeah. I've got an Xbox 360, which I think plays DVDs, but I, it's, I couldn't even tell you if it does or not. That's how long it's been since it, I've it's not hooked up. So like okay. yeah, to, the second question is a no. So we're all in the same boat. Like I I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know where to go to buy a DVD player. Like I look at Craigslist yeah. or Facebook Marketplace. I wouldn't know if like does Target or Walmart still sell those things? I don't. Dude, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think I think they do. They sell okay. them, and they're really cheap now too because there's just no demand anymore. You should be paying me to buy one of those things because they a still DVD. sell. They actually still sell DVDs at. I don't know about Walmart because I try really hard not to go into that cesspool of a store, but Target does still sell. They have the bins of DVDs and they're available for really cheap. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, I need I need to go to Best Buy for something. Uh, yeah, last week, and I I took a lap around the store. It's like it's been, it had probably been lost like five six years since I've been in a Best Buy, and I'm like, how do these places stay open? Best Buy has done a really good job of adapting, Jeff, so they don't have nearly as big a music section now because they just don't need it, so they sell more home appliances now, but I ask myself I that, noticed same, that I ask myself that same question every time I go in there. It's not a ton. It's usually for something broadcast-related, but like even the broadcast stuff has gotten, I won't say sketchy, it's just like uh, secondary to a lot of the other things that they sell in that place now. It's like home security systems and appliances is yeah. what Best Buy is dealing in these days. Still have televisions, of course, but you're better off going through audiovisual consultations for something like that. Of course. Why would you go to a big box store when Tom McKay can hook you up? Actually, it's what sucks about my setup now is you can't see my TV from AV consultation. You can see BK's, though, over his shoulder. There you go. Two of them. 
Yeah, the only thing Tom McKay doesn't do is sell washing machines. So next time I need a washing machine and a TV in the same trip, then I'll go to Best Buy. But otherwise, I'm out on that deal. Uh, BK, in my incoherent rambling about spring football starting next week, was there anything that piqued your interest before I get out of here? Yeah, no, I mean, I thought it was great. Like your, your position change conversation, I think, is an interesting one. Like right tackle matters a lot. And I think so many Texas fans are just assuming that this offensive line is going to be better in 24 than it was in 23. And it very easily could be. You got four guys back. Yeah. You got a first round pick at Kelvin Banks and everybody should get better year over year. Cause you actually feel great about the coach and the guy who's developing them right now, but they, they've got to figure out right tackle and whether that involves moving Hayden Connor or it's Cam Williams or it's Neto or it's, I, I don't know who it's going to be, but like just not having that could be, could derail this offensive line to the point where, okay, this team might not be as good as we all want it to be if they can't figure out who that fifth starting offensive lineman is going to be. For sure. Yeah. Jeff, Trey, Jeff, any, any, Jeff, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Jeff, who's the young guy who came in at the semester, the true freshman who came in at the semester from California? Who's really Brandon Baker. Guys? Yeah, so keep an eye on him as yeah. well as a possibility at right tackle too. I'll tell you what, man. I, I know Jordan I talked about it yesterday, and it's like they're, they're preparing Trevor Goosby basically to be – kind of walk in starting left tackle when banks leaves mm. if if that he's one that i'm really interested to get an eye on when we get on the practice field tuesday if trevor gooseby really is like 305 310 pounds that they might have to just say dude f it he might just be your right tackle in 2024 because mm. he's I don't that even... i mean he's an uber athlete just uh. not, he's 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 got the ability to be special I, I had to, and part of this was me not being on the beat during National Signing Day last year, but I had to like look up who Trevor Gooseby was when you and Jordan were talking about him. I'm like, I don't even remember who this dude is. And he's the three star, like, a, I guess a bit of an afterthought on the recruiting trail, but apparently, yeah, he's, he's turning some heads down there. Committed to TCU for a minute. Uh, six, seven kid was a basketball player. Like, go find some of his Twitter stuff where he's, like, you know, reverse dunking basketballs at 280 pounds or whatever. It wasn't even, like, 260 in high school. Hey, but the fact that his uncle, his great uncle, actually, is Austin native Dick Night Train Lane, the Hall of Famer. Wow. And Trevor gooseby has got a shot. Yes, he does. Yes. Is, it, is it possible to close line opposing defensive linemen? Uh, at this point, Trey, I think that's frowned upon. So. Damn it. Yeah, just frowned upon, not a penalty. <laughs> just frowned upon. Gentlemen, I uh, I got to get rolling down the road. I'm taking my daughter. BK, actually, I'm going to the outskirts of Houston today. There you uh, go. Katie Mills Mall, which I guess this is what malls are used for now. They've got the whole Jurassic World exhibit thing set up at Katie Mills Mall. My daughter's going through a phase where she's obsessed with dinosaurs. So going to Katie to to jurassic world have malls turned into pop-up museums now because if so cool good use of that space of no uh i don't know i mean i feel at this point like on the random time i have to go to bar like barton creek mall like if the escalator works i feel like i should go buy a lottery ticket because <laughs> <laughs> things yeah, are the, going, the, things the, are going the well that day the trip to Katy, by the way, and I only know this because my brothers live in Katy. So whenever we go to Houston, we're thank God going to Katy is yeah. so much easier than even having to go into Central Houston, much less yeah. the East Side of Houston. Yeah, it's you, you barely call it Houston, but thank God I'm. If I can, if I can make a trip to Houston without getting inside Beltway Eight, then again, I should probably go buy a lottery ticket because <laughs> something was in my for, in my good fortune that day. Yep. Very nice. We'll enjoy your trip. Safe travels, brother. And we'll, uh, we'll see you on Monday. You guys have a good weekend. Later, Jeff. You too, Jeff. All right. There he goes, Jeff. How it's only an hour. Now it's time for the award-winning midday with Trey and BK How about this comment from Jason target Best Buy and Walmart all have DVD players under a hundred bucks, a hundred bucks. I didn't think these would cost more than $20 nowadays. Are people actually paying that much for DVD players? Probably not. They probably have a supply that really just stays there, barely moving, and so they're not having to replenish it necessarily. But the option does exist Yeah, if you good, want one. Good to know. 
And I was uh, not kidding about my VPN usage. Are you familiar with that technology? Yeah, because the Brave browser, which is a browser that's risen up in popularity, comes in with a built-in VPN. So theoretically, if I was a sicko like you people and wanted to watch porn on my computer, I could still do so, no problem, which isn't the case with Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and all those others that don't have the built-in VPN. Mm, yeah, I had to download some other app and use a VPN, and it's it's a whole process now, but good job, government. Way to go. Now, the kids need to learn this stuff, Trey. The whole point of this law that just got passed in the state of Texas is to prevent kids from being able to stumble upon these adult film sites because it's not good for them. They got to learn how to do stuff. This yeah. is how I learned. Yeah, the birds and the bees conversation isn't going to do it. You got to watch and see how it's done before you get it done, you know? Yeah. Kids are so smart with technology, they're going to figure it out no problem. Who this really hurts is the middle-aged creeps who are just completely technologically illiterate. Creeps? Yeah. I'd argue you're the creep for not watching this stuff. I am a big imagination guy. Yeah. That's that's an impressive skill. I will give you credit for that. I, I don't think I've ever even tried to imagine something. Like it's just having the technology at my disposal has always been so easy. Or it's like I got my computer or my phone to look something up. There we go. We're in business. I've never even thought about just unplugging, going off the grid when it comes to trying to master my own domain. We are visual creatures. But it is a combination also of things that have actually happened and sometimes fantasizing about things that could. Yeah, it's a good idea. I'm going to try that this weekend. Good luck with that. Try it with your left hand, too. That'll really spice it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sit on it for a while so it falls asleep, <laughs> and then I'll just imagine it's somebody else doing just, it. Just make sure you uh, lube that elbow joint up real good before you do, because otherwise there will be chase, chafing. Thank you very much. Oh, man. How you doing today? I, like Some sports we can get into, some NFL free agency, Texas baseball host Washington this weekend. They, they should sweep. If they don't at least win the series. It will be disappointing because Washington's not very good. And we also have some football losses to avenge against those losers. Uh, basketball, we're waiting for selection Sunday. On Sunday, I saw a bracketology from Joe Lenardi today that has Texas as a nine seed in mm -hmm. UConn's region which, hello, um, Texas football we could talk about. What's, we didn't pre-show prep today, so I'm, I'm sending it your way to decide what we get into to kind of open up on a Friday. To be completely honest, the thing that's catching my eye right now that I guess is more worth at least a mention in a small conversation is Aaron Donald retiring. What a huge piece of news. He's only 32. Uh, seems like he's got a bunch more good years left in front of him with how productive he still is, but he's choosing to walk away at a time where he's maybe going to have a little bit more in the way of physical mobility down the road. I haven't seen the specific reasons. If he's giving a specific reason, there's something medical or otherwise, but uh, it's certainly not the first time we've seen an all-time NFL great choose to walk away at the pinnacle of his career to... Detroit Lions fall into that category, of course, with Calvin Johnson and Barry Sanders. Jim Brown did it for the Cleveland Browns back in the day. But I don't know if there's a ton of examples of guys who play on the inside in the trenches making this sort of move. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That was a bombshell that dropped about an hour ago. And, you know, Aaron Donald, right after the Rams won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, as we just lost Trey. Oh, as we've got Trey back. That was weird. That was strange. I don't know. I'm, I'm at home today. This It maybe only happened once over the previous four days, and now I'm at home on good Wi-Fi, and I'm dropping out with the fog. That was, that was bizarre. Yeah, you sounded perfect and looked perfect. Well, eh, you never do, but uh, it was you fine. Said it. Nope, you said it. It's true now. It's true. Dump it. Ah, shit. We don't have a dump button on this <laughs> shit. Um, but yeah, like after they won the Super Bowl what, three years ago, there were rumors that Aaron Donald was going to retire. Like He yeah. kind of spitballed that, and most people, myself included, are like, nah, he's just looking for a new contract. He's trying to use this as leverage, and then if he gets a new deal, he's going to come back. Well, he got a new deal, and he came back. But maybe this isn't the first time Aaron Donald had thought about retiring. Maybe he was serious a couple of years ago, or at least he was considering hanging them up and ended up obviously playing for a couple of more years. But 
yeah, he released a, a video and a pretty long statement on his Twitter account. We're not going to read the whole thing, but he, he didn't give you a whole lot in terms of what's next. He just talked about the next chapter of his life and does mention his family, getting to spend more time with his wife and his kids. And uh, you would assume that that has a lot to do with this decision. Like you said, Aaron Donald wants to make sure that he's as healthy as he could possibly be to spend the next few, hopefully decades with, uh, with his family. So um, yeah, it's crazy. Cause this guy, I mean, I, still one of the best defensive players in football, like last year, I, I don't know if he was the best, but he's still top five, top 10 at the worst defensive player in the league this past season. And you're right. He's now next in line of those first ballot hall of famers who you always wonder what if, like uh, what if they played for another few seasons Aaron Donald is going to walk into the Hall of Fame on the first ballot, but you'll wonder if he went after it for a few more years, what else could he have accomplished? I forget if the pro football writers do what the baseball writers do with guys who should be unanimous and a couple of jackasses just decide to be cute and say, no, I'm not going to put you on the very first time. He should be a unanimous Hall of Famer, though. And I'm assuming he will be, especially when you consider some of these simple stats that show the level of greatness. One of three defensive players to win three defensive MVP awards in history, joining LT and J.J. Watt, who will also be a first ballot Hall of Famer when it comes to that. He is also one of two defensive players since the 1970 merger to earn a Hear that or not, that was a phone call coming in. Holy shit, I'm getting a computer back on Monday, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so uh, he has uh, one of uh, two defensive players in NFL history with 10 seasons and a Pro Bowl selection in each of those first 10 seasons. LT, the other guy, and, uh, excuse me, uh, Barry Sanders is the other guy there. And uh, just, just lists like that, there are only a handful of dudes who are considered all-time greats at their respective position. And Aaron Don Donald... Uh, matches that and then some. The most dominant interior in, uh, defensive lineman in the history of the game. Ten years. He was a pro bowler all ten of those years, as you mentioned. He was a first-team all-pro in eight of those seasons. You might have said that when you cut out. If you did, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's ridiculous. I mean, he, he's the best defensive tackle in the history of the NFL. And you can make an argument that he is the best defensive player in the history of the league. But, yeah, I mean, what this guy accomplished in a decade is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, and a huge part of that Rams Super Bowl winning team a couple of years ago. So it's good for him that he was able to hoist that Lombardi trophy so he got that big team accomplishment. But, uh, yeah, just an all-time great player. And as soon as he entered the league, I mean, it's, it's amazing that he fell as far as he did in the draft, and he didn't fall that far. But his college production at Pitt was absolutely insane. And the only reason like he wasn't the first overall pick in his draft was because he was considered undersized, right? Like defensive tackles, and he's like six feet, 285 at the combine. You're not used to seeing interior defensive linemen look like that. And, well, turned out that did not matter at all. My computer starts playing random noise. And he fell to pick 13. Like there are 12 teams who chose ahead of – uh, the Rams that year who wish they could have that one back. They, uh, yeah, he was a beast at Pitt in college and obviously even better in the NFL. So big loss for the Rams who, you know, they had a great year last year. They kind of bounced back. They made it to the playoffs. They nearly upset the lions in the wild card round. People thought the Rams were maybe going to be a, a factor again in what feels like a pretty wide open NFC and they could still be decent, but obviously they're losing a, a huge part of, of that defense with AD hanging them up. Yep. Yeah. And uh, some other news from the NFL. How about some wide receivers going from one place to another? Not sure what's going to happen with Justin Fields, whether it's Justin Fields or Caleb Williams starting the season as the Bears starting quarterback. They've got another really good wide receiver. Yeah, he's on the backside of his career, but he's got that old man game, baby. Keenan Allen, <laughs> a Chicago Bear now. To go along with DJ Moore, that's a hell of a one-two punch. And uh, the Chargers are completely reloading at wide receiver this offseason with Mike Williams also being cut. Rumors are that uh, he is a strong candidate to join Josh Allen in Buffalo. Uh, boy, they uh, just made Justin Herbert's job a little bit more difficult, at least in the near term, getting rid of uh, two of his favorite targets. I realize Mike Williams is a guy who had a hard time staying healthy, 
But when he was out there, it looked like he was finally starting to turn into sort of the player uh, that they thought he would be when they drafted him out of college. Yeah, I mean, both of those guys really good, but really injury prone. And yeah. this is cap saving moves like the Chargers had to make some tough decisions this offseason. They decided to keep Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, right? Like they restructured both of their contracts to keep him around, but they cut Mike Williams and they traded Keenan Allen for nothing. Uh, yeah. Fourth round pick, great deal for the Bears and yeah, I think Allen still has a, a good amount left in the tank, too. And you're right, from a Chargers standpoint, and get to the Bears in a second, they have four receivers under contract. It's Quentin Johnston, who looked like a huge bust in his first year in the league. Yeah, Josh Palmer, who's solid, but he's like a number three at best. Yeah. yeah. Darius Davis, another TCU guy, and Simi Fahoko, former Cowboys draft pick. Those are their receivers right now. Now the Chargers have the fifth pick. So, you know, everyone's like, all right, well, there, there goes Malik Neighbors or there goes Roma Dunze and somehow some way if Marvin Harrison Jr. is there, like the Chargers will take a receiver there, but they need more than just one right now. So, yeah, it's, it's not what you're trying to do. I mean, Justin Herbert's already established, but still you're trying to help out your quarterback as much as you possibly can and, and letting go of his two top receivers without an obvious contingency plan doesn't feel like the smartest thing ever. So, that's weird. And then for the Bears, man, I mean, they've had a pretty good offseason. Now, yeah. of course, this offseason all hinges on what they do at quarterback and whether or not they get the decision right. And it feels like Fields is gone and Caleb Williams is going to be their try there. But I'll give them credit. Like DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, that's a damn good one, too. That's a top five, one, two wide receiver duo in football. They brought in DeAndre Swift. They've got Rojo, who looked pretty capable. Last year in his first year in the league, Cole Komet is an above average tight end. Like there are some skill position players now for the Chicago Bears on that offense. So now the big decision is, and it's almost a never ending one. Hell, I was just talking to our guy Tom McKay on the phone about this in between shows today. It's like, what do the Bears do? Do they stick with Justin Fields and then draft like Marvin Harrison Jr.? Like trade down a little bit, then draft Marvin. So you've got him, DJ, and Keenan Allen together with Justin Fields That'd or do you sick. yeah or do sick. you obviously trade Fields uh and then just draft Caleb Williams and, and hope that he's the guy like it's a monumental decision obviously jobs are on the line in Chicago the Bears have to get this one right uh but yeah that's the big thing it's like do you keep adding talent around Justin Fields and hope that he can figure it out or do you give up on the former first round pick and say, now nah, we're drafting somebody and we feel like we have enough around him right now for him to be successful. Even if you want to go Caleb Williams long-term, it's not the end of the world allowing Justin Fields to start the season. If anything, you're going to build that trade value back up for when you trade him during the year or that next off season to hand the reins over to Caleb Williams. The sad reality, if you're a Bears fan right now, is whatever intrinsic value Justin Fields had going into free agency has gone down pretty significantly now because there aren't a ton of teams that have that question at quarterback where they necessarily want to spend the sort of draft capital that the Bears are looking for in a deal with Justin Fields. The Falcons got Kirk Cousins. The Pittsburgh Steelers have a bizarre plan in place at quarterback too. Uh, even a team like the Seattle Seahawks, it uh, looks like there's some more clarity with what they are doing right now going out and getting Sam Howell from the Washington commies and I guess is it about to no Drew Locke signed with who Drew Locke just signed with somebody he's signed with the Giants so it's going to be Geno Smith Sam Howell in Seattle and so there's just not a whole lot of teams out there right now looking for a quarterback so they either overplayed their hand or were a little bit too patient or were asking for a little bit too much and I, I feel like at this point they are kind of stuck with Justin Fields, if you want to consider that a stuck situation, having a stacked quarterback room like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. You bring up good points, but I, I think before free agency, the Bears were done. They had already dug their own grave because, like, everybody knows you're trying to get rid of a guy. The, the, the value's just not yeah. going to be that high, right? Yeah. Like, and, and that makes sense in theory. It's like, all right, keep Fields, you know, and if he plays well, you could trade him for more than what you could get right now, but – that's just not really how it works in the NFL. And what happens if Trey, they try that and Fields plays great? Like Caleb Williams is a used car at that point. The value of Caleb Williams before he gets drafted is so much higher than after he gets drafted. It's like driving a car off the lot. Boom. Just like that, it depreciates, loses half of its value in the blink of an eye. 
Like that's almost what Caleb Williams is. Like if you try that and Fields plays well and Caleb Williams doesn't start, then people are going to be like, is Caleb Williams even good? Like what's, he's not better than Justin Fields, who's been very hit or miss in three years in the league. So yeah, it almost feels like, all right, from a business standpoint, keeping Justin Fields makes the most sense because you can't get a lot in a trade for him right now. But uh, I guess, you know, I have a hard time thinking that's actually what's going to happen. So it's weird though, Bears fans and, I'm sure you keep up with some of these from your time in Chicago drink up. Uh, like it feels like the majority of bears fans want to keep Justin Fields. Yeah. Like bears they, fans have come around on fields. I agree with that. Just from people that I follow on Twitter and there's still some criticism for sure, but it's calmed down significantly over the last year and a half. Now I'm telling you people, I'm not just crazy here. This is not just fantasy football bias. I saw Justin Fields do some really positive things this last season. It has me believing that he can be a guy that you can at least roll with and try and figure it out and get the right pieces around him and get him in the right system to help him uh, achieve uh, winning levels of success in the NFL. We saw yeah. signs of it last year when he finally got at least one decent option with DJ Moore. The thumb injury derailed him, and there were some other weird things going on with that offensive staff too. Uh, but if, if and when he does end up somewhere outside of Chicago, because that is – the ultimate play here for the bears. I agree with you on that. That's what they're going to do. Eventually fascinated to see where he goes. I thought that there was uh there was a lot of potential for fun and wins with the Atlanta Falcons, but they decided to take that known commodity with Kirk Cousins. So what is that next situation that he might find himself in? We'll just have to wait and see. I mean, if the bears make another trade for the number one overall pick, they could fill up their entire 53 man roster with all the shit they've gotten from the last two years. Number one, overall picks. I mean, they got so much from Carolina for Bryce young and Caleb Williams is an even higher touted prospect coming out of college than Bryce young was. He's so not? it's no, he is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Caleb, yeah. Caleb Williams is oh, higher. touted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I miss, misheard you there. That's all right. Yeah. So like they could get what they got last year and then some potentially, yeah. but it doesn't feel like they're, going to do that so it's a fun which story team, which team in the top because right now it's the commies it's the patriots who selects for the cardinals yes so they're probably not going to go quarterback between those two teams and maybe somebody else who's let's say in the top six or seven who's looking for a quarterback as well what gives the bears the best chance not only swap first round picks but also get that team's first round pick next year and it's still going to be a really good draft pick Man, like with Carolina I, last year, for instance, obviously yeah. him being at the top of the draft for that reason right now. Yeah, Carolina was nine last year, and they moved all the way up to one to get Bryce. So that was, you know, obviously the the higher up you're moving, the more you have to pay. I'll tell you what, I know you asked me top five or six, but Minnesota made a trade today with the Texans to get the Texans' first round pick. So Minnesota mm -hmm. now has 11 and 23. If you are Chicago and you're willing to move down and trade within the division Two scary things. But if you're willing to move down to 11, you're going to get 11. You're going to get 23. You're going to get a first next year. And then some. so that's yeah. three first round picks right there that I think you would get if, you know, cause I think Minnesota made that trade with Houston to try to move up into the top three. I don't know if it was to move to number one to get Caleb, but I, I think they want Daniels may or Caleb and if you're willing, once again, to make that intra-division trade and move down that far, scary, out of the top 10, uh, then that's that's where you get your massive, massive haul right there. Yeah, that'd be a hell of a haul there. I'm looking at Jordan Addison's stats his last year in college at USC. Caleb Williams was his quarterback. Uh, 59 catches, 875 yards, eight touchdowns. Obviously, he's the number two wide receiver there with Justin Jeff Jefferson being the guy. And Justin Jefferson is going to make even average quarterbacks look a little bit better. So a guy with the potential of Caleb Williams. It's intriguing. I'm um, guessing there will be some growing pain, some lumps that he'll have to go through in year one for Minnesota. So, yeah, maybe the Bears look at that and think that they will be getting another top 10 pick next year just based on what Minnesota's 2024 season would look like under that yeah. scenario. Yeah, I think they'd have to give up that much to to move that high. So, um, yeah, it'd be a heist for Chicago, and it's it's one of those things where it's like y'all just did this and it worked. Why not yeah. do it again? You you could really change your fortunes if uh, you hit gold one more time. But always scary, always scary when uh, you've got a chance to draft a franchise changing quarterback and you give up 
on that chance, right? Like it's that's not a swing and a miss. There's a chance Caleb Williams sucks. And the attitude, I am worried about the attitude. He is not a yeah. sure thing for me because of what's up here. The arm talent, you can't question it. But what's up here, that personality, that mindset, you can ask some questions about it with him. Uh, but to not even swing, if you trade the pick, you're not even swinging on a quarterback. And if if one of those three guys turns out to be great, you're always going to have that, ah, shit, what if we just stuck and and picked at one instead of just picked up all these other draft picks while we're still trying to figure out who our quarterback is. What do you not like about the attitude? Caleb Williams? Yeah. I just don't I don't think he was a great teammate. I mean, I some of the the nail painting stuff he did in the Pac-12 championship game against Utah a couple of years ago. It's just childish. It's immature. What was the like, nail painting stuff? I don't even remember that story. He, he wrote F U C K U T A H on his nails before the Pac-12 <laughs> championship game and then proceeded to get his ass kicked. Uh, he just, he feels like, uh, he felt like at times a me before we type of player. And look, that that can change. Maybe that stuff is overblown. Uh, him not participating in the combine, it kind of annoyed some people and he's only giving his medical records to like one or two teams, just certain things like that. That's mm. just annoying. Uh, and it's worthy of questioning. Uh, it, I, I think he obviously has a chance to fix that, and that stuff could be overblown, and he could be a special talent at the next level. But uh, I don't think he's a sure thing. Like I, I felt better about Burrow coming out of college than I did Caleb Williams. Like Trevor Lawrence, I felt better. Like uh, thinking of some of the other guys who have been kind of held in that regard in terms of how they're graded as a prospect, I had less of those types of questions with guys like that than I did with uh, Caleb Williams that I have right now. Are we sure there wasn't a comma on the thumb of the hand that housed the F-U-C-K, F-U-C-K comma Utah? Like he knew that they were about to take a serious beat down. He's like, fuck, Utah? Can you ease <laughs> up on us, please? Utah again? You already beat us once this season. Now we got to play you again. Or maybe it was a message to the folks of Utah. Maybe he just hates the Mormon religion. And he's yeah. telling them they need to have sex. Like, don't wait till marriage. Just fuck, Utah. All right, just do that. <laughs> Fuck. I mean, you fuck is such a great word. It's so versatile. Oh, it is. Maybe that's what it was. I didn't think about that. Maybe there was uh, more than what met the eye. Utah. The eye. Oh, yeah. Maybe Utah goes first. Utah. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my God. We got to go here on vacation again. Fuck, mom. I want to go to Utah. This place sucks. Oh, God. All right. It will be fun to track, obviously, as the NFL offseason continues and uh, I showed uh, I showed Bucky this picture earlier today. Let me see if I can pull it up. I thought I had it ready clearly when I started talking. But while all that is going on across the league and all of these other teams are making moves to improve their roster, here's what the Cowboys EVP and Director of Player Personnel Stephen Jones was doing yesterday. He's hanging out with Kid Rock promoting some professional bull riding event coming to AT&T Stadium in May. So okay. there you go, Cowboys fans. Congrats. That's what your front office is doing right now. Yeah. Lots of attempts to get bull riding more professional than it has been in the last couple of years. Like you have team bull riding now. The Austin franchise has a team of guys. The gamblers, or right? Yeah, the Austin Gamblers. I talked yeah. to a couple of those dudes. They're really cool dudes. That fucking maniacs, of course, getting on that thousand pound creature that's trying to buck it off and end it in that person's life. But uh, yeah, it's it's fun to go to. It's just not something that's ever really top of mind for me. I like watching would, it in highlight form, I guess, more than watching it live. Would you ever ride a bull? Fuck no. No chance. No, dude. That's I mean that's that's asking for death or it's asking for serious injury. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It's, I have like, and it's like, it's much more of a risk than like something like skydiving for me. Yeah. Would you go skydiving? I would. I'm not like going out of my way to skydive. Like I'll never be the guy who's like, we should do this. But like, if I'm with a group of people and they all want to go, I'll be like, yeah, sure. Fine. Let's do it. But it's not like bucket list. I have to jump out of a perfectly operational plane that that feels unnecessary. <laughs> and then yeah like there's no there's no injury with skydiving right like if something goes wrong it's game over with bull riding yeah you, you can get stepped on by a bull or speared by a bull even worse and you live but you got to live with 
the pain and consequence of that. That that would probably suck worse than death. I mean, you could fall off onto your head. You can break a bone. The bull can step on. I mean, there's so many different yeah. things. Like one of the questions that I'm sure these guys get asked all the time when they do interviews. I'm shameless. I'll ask this question because I'm genuinely interested. What is your worst injury? Some of the shit that these guys put them th- themselves through. It's gruesome. Yeah. It's not only painful, like is long lasting. There's a huge recovery time too. You're some random fucking jamoke who thinks it's funny to get on the back of a bull, like a member of Jackass, and see how long you can hold on for. Well, you're going to be dealing with some long term consequences, most likely. I'm scared of the mechanical bull at the bars on Sixth Street. No chance I'm getting on a real one. Maybe that should be a bet payoff. There you go. A real one or a mechanical one? Mechanical, because that is more controlled. Yeah, no, that that's not a harsh enough. Those are easy. Are they? Well, I don't know about easy. Like, I'm not going to stay on there for a minute. But you, if, when you fall, you fall onto like an inflatable bounce house. Did you have a mechanical bull era on Dirty Sixth back during your college days? Nah, I think I w- have done it a couple of times. But calling it an era would be uh, would be a big time stretch. <laughs> I think last time I did it was at Joe Cook's birthday, like after college, maybe a couple of years after school. And he was, he went on there a couple of times. He was, he was pretty I, lit. I did not peg Joe Cook for a big mechanical bull guy, but I love <laughs> to learn it. I'm going to have guess to ask him about that the next time I speak with him. My guess is he might not remember it. Number one. And number two is my <laughs> guess is that's the last time he's uh, done something like that. So, right. Yeah, I, I thought about the bull thing. Like I've all for a while I said yes. Yeah, I'd I'd get on a real bull. And then I like I went to a couple of rodeos in person and just saw how massive those animals were. And I'm like, nah, I'm good on that. What about mutton busting? What about yeah. you and I were to ride sheep and see who <laughs> wins? Uh neither of us are winning because the sheep's gonna die when either of us <laughs> sit on them. <laughs> That shit is so funny, though. I like Houston rodeo is going on right now. So is the yeah. Austin rodeo. But the two years I lived in Houston, I went to the rodeo a bunch, and that's that's the last event that they do at the rodeo right before the concert starts. So like I, I try to get there early enough to see some of the other stuff because I I'm entertained by it. Uh, but the mutton busting, like you basically have to be there to catch the concert, and it's so funny. Yeah, watching those kids ride those sheep, and then they they fall, and some of them start crying. It's and they show them on the giant screens at NRG. Ah, it's it's good, good bit there. But yeah, it's all like kids who are six or younger. Even the fat kids, I'm like, oh god, I feel for this sheep. The fat mm-hmm. kids are weighing like 70, 80 pounds. We're uh, we're twice that. So those sheep's have no shot. You just gotta you stay on the. You just gotta stay on the back legs. Just look a little bit more aggy than you're probably comfortable doing. Other otherwise, you're like leaned leaned forward like a jockey think that would work you, you think they'd be able to stay up and move yeah the problem is just is, is the back bend if you're in the middle of the back that thing is totally screwed it's going to look like a bad cartoon but if you stay more on the <sighs> hips again you're going to have to go a little bit more aggy than you're probably comfortable with but i bet you could stay on and the sheep would be able to withstand your weight how do you how do you know all this i've maybe mutton busted a time or two in my life <laughs> Ew. It sounds like recent. It sounds like this is a story from last weekend here. I've maybe busted mutton once or twice. I'm not sure what that means. Just use your imagination. I, I don't have one of those. Let me go to the hub. Ah, shit, I can't! Abbott! Come on, man. I don't even know if this is his fault, but he's getting blamed today for it. It's probably not. It d- doesn't Abbott want that option just to try and feel anything down there? No, oh, man. That's a rough one. Yeah. That, that's a, I immediately regretted saying that. I think it's a sports radio host, Dan Patrick, who is at the top of the decision here. That's not surprising. I bet that dude's into some sick shit. Total conjecture by me. I have nothing to prove that, but uh, he strikes me as the type that's into some weird shit. Mm, the VPN guy, I'm sure. I am sure. All right, some quick... Sp- oh, yeah, nobody else can watch porn. Oh, God, so great. Is that what he sounds like? I think so. Which Dan Patrick? The former sports center host. Yeah, okay, course. yeah. <laughs> I, just, I, was like, I feel like I've listened to that guy before, and I didn't, I didn't catch that sound, but 
That's uh, must have been listening on the wrong station or something. I don't know. All right, some sponsor shout outs here. Shout out to AV Consultations. We gave Tom some love a little bit earlier. 255-8678, the phone number to call to get the home TV setup of your dreams. Also now, a word from our great friends over at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous Hill Country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed. Also, some love to uh, Altstadt beer, the best beer that you can find in the world. If you are hoping to drink beer this weekend, you, there's only one choice. That is Altstadt beer. It's easy to find wherever you buy your six packs all throughout the state of Texas. If you're going to your favorite bars, watering holes, restaurants, wherever, make sure you're getting that Altstadt beer as well. Of course, whatever you have planned this weekend, whether you're watching hoops or golf or going to South by or hitting the town with friends, with family, by yourself, whatever, make sure. You drink responsibly. Make sure you plan a sober ride home. But of course, the good times are made better with Altstadt beer. No impurities, no regrets. And Trey, if you're not into the beer, maybe you're more of a canned cocktail kind of guy. No better option than Big Hat Spirits for those, right? Cocktail, that's right. The cocktail in the can wasn't invented by Big Hat Spirits, but they have perfected it with their cocktails in a can. Honoring legends in the process, people who show up on the sides of their cans, people like Shiny Ribs, how about Quan Cosby, Jack Ingram, Daryl K. Royal, Gary P. Nunn, and a whole lot more. You need to go grab your Big Hat Spirits cocktail in a can at a place near you. How do you find that and all the great flavors they have that's high in real alcohol, real kombucha, no added sugars, low in other bullshit too? By going to their website, BigHatSpirits.com. Top of the website there, you will see... Proud sponsor of the Texas Heritage Songwriters Association. Scroll just below that, and you get that map of Central Texas with big hat icons all over the map. Click the icon closest to you, and you will find the spot that is selling those big hat spirits, the cocktail in a can. Yes, indeed. All right, Trey, random sports-related question. Uh, ooh, quick update from Texas baseball. Because of the threat of inclement weather in Austin tonight, they are moving up the start of tonight's series opener against Washington. So it was scheduled to begin at 7 o'clock. They moved it up an hour. So first pitch at UFCU Dish Falk Field will be at 6 o'clock tonight between Texas and Washington. Uh, Bucky, the weather guesser, said it was not going to rain tonight. So um, that's not a good omen for his prediction. Well, he is squarely in the category with all the other guessers now, just guessing his way through this world. He did uh, He did say it was going to rain today, and he was right on that, and he was puffing his chest out a lot this morning uh, because he finally got a prediction right because he had missed his last three. He's been in the slump of all slumps, but I did specifically ask, is it going to rain tonight? Is it going to rain tomorrow? And he said, nope, Sunday night, the next time to look for rain here in Austin. So... Buck might have found himself back into the proverbial doghouse once again. Yeah, he got too far out over his skis. He got cocky, and now he got humble. That's how these things typically work. That's how it goes. I'd like to ask you a question, Trey, that uh, TS Unfiltered just tweeted out within the last couple of hours, and it's getting uh, lots of buzz and lots of reaction from Longhorn fans, but also Longhorn haters everywhere. Please do. Who are the only schools that you recognize as true rivals of UT? School, schools. If, if you were asked that question, who do you recognize as a true rival for the University of Texas? What would you answer? So I'm thinking about this twofold. I'm thinking about this in terms of the most profound rivals in those schools that were no longer going to be playing that we'd better treat like rivals the next time we play them, especially in football. So the biggest rivals are Oklahoma one, Texas A&M two, Arkansas is somewhere after that. Texas tech is on that list. Yes. Texas tech is on that list. I think in the future, 
we will have to consider Baylor a part of that list too. And again, there's levels to these things. Oklahoma State is a maybe, probably not though. And then I think about potential future future rivalries. Now, Texas is likely going to end up in a pod with Oklahoma, Arkansas, and A&M. So those will be the three obvious ones. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what other games become rivalries for Texas and the SEC versus it being this blue blood program going up against this blue blood program. Now, Alabama and Texas do have a little bit of a recent history, so I could see some other things happening and it being a back and forth affair to where people do get more fired up about that beyond the potential top five or top 10 matchup reasons. Uh, right now, that's that's probably the list. It's Oklahoma, then A&M, and a couple of other schools around this state. Arkansas, who you will be playing regularly once again, will move ahead of the Texas Techs and the Baylor. But Oklahoma and A&M are the two biggest. Okay, so those are the true rivals. You would just say two, or would you say all of those other teams? I think all those other ones are true rivals. There's just different levels to rivalry. Okay. Yeah, I mean, some of the reaction, you know, it's been all over the place, right? A lot of people are just saying, we have won, and that's Oklahoma. They are the one true rival of the University of Texas. That's a trap, because if you don't, rec- if you don't respect certain rivalries, you will, they will jump up and get you over and over again. That happened with A&M and Texas Tech back in the late 90s and early 2000s. A&M is like, they're not our fucking rivals. They're these morons out in West Texas. We don't give a shit about them other than we play them. And Tech fans lived and breathed for that game 24-7, 365. Yeah. I feel like Texas did that with Texas Tech and still beat them all the time, but that's fair. They, they, that hostility has started to direct itself towards Texas much more than it had, let's say, more than five to ten years ago. Did they like Texas and Lubbock? No, and I know this from the year and a half that I spent time there. The, the animosity was much more directed towards Texas A and M. Like there was mm. a, there was a, a shared love, or I don't know if you call it a shared respect, but like Tech and Texas people have, have always done a better job of getting along than Tech and A and M people have. But that has started to turn. Yeah, yeah Chris Beer definitely a big part of that. Sure. Yeah, OU has been a prominent answer, and then OU and A and M, probably the second most popular answer. And then, yeah, Arkansas has been kind of the third that I've seen thrown around the most. Obviously, that's a rivalry that will reignite with the move to the SEC. Uh, I tend to agree with you. Like, I, there are levels to this. I mean, Oklahoma, I think, is the biggest rival with AM a close second. And then I think there's a gap before you get to number three and so on and so forth. But I consider most of those schools that you brought up a rival. I don't really consider Bay- Baylor a rival. Like, if you ask Baylor fans who they hate the most, Texas might be number one. It's either Texas or TCU. Yeah. So they definitely hold the matchup in a higher regard than Texas fans do. But, I mean, I would throw Texas Tech in there as a rival for sure. So those are are probably my top three because it's going to take me a while to really understand the hatred for Arkansas. I talk about this all the time. Like, I know I'm supposed to hate Arkansas from back in the day. And we were conference foes. And I don't like Arkansas at all, believe me. And the last couple of times Texas has played Arky and football have not gone well for us at all. So that's enough of a reason to hate them, even regardless of the long history. But I think it's going to take folks, my generation and younger, a while to like grow that same disdain for Arkansas that the older guard of Texas fans have. Like right now, I consider Texas Tech way more of a rival than Arkansas, but people over the age of 40, 50 might be like, I'm crazy for saying that. That's yeah. that's how I feel like 30 and under probably think right now. Rivalry requires bad blood. Bad blood requires playing. Once you get to that point, it is very difficult to shake those feelings. Now, yes, younger fans don't have as much of a memory for it, but enough older Texas fans are still around, and that rivalry isn't 50-plus years ago to where uh, people will warn you. Your elders will warn you. You need to respect that. You need to understand that even if you don't get it, uh, people in the Ozarks, in Arkansas, and in and around Fayetteville, their kids have been taught to hate fucking Texas, even though these two teams don't play all that much. It's why you mm-hmm. saw such hostilities there when uh, Texas went in, what was that, Steve Sarkeesian's first year, and got the brakes beat off of them. And if Texas isn't careful, that same thing can happen again. I mean, they play in Fayetteville next year. Now I think Texas is going to be 
markedly better as a roster and Sam Pittman may be a lame duck coach, but Sam Pittman had his team fighting hard the first couple of years. Last year may have just been an aberration and that will be a great litmus test for the Razorbacks team and also their fans to know whether Pittman can be the guy. So yeah. that's more pressure and uh, more of a stage for Arkansas to really step up and show that they are a, a true on uh, foe for this Longhorn football team earlier in their SEC days. I think uh, Arkansas does like fucking Texas. I get what you meant there, but I think they do enjoy effing Texas. Over. Yeah, but te- Texas is uh, Texas is the name of a cousin, so it's, it's <laughs> figuratively yes, but literally also their cousin named Texas. That's well done, right there. All right, we'll take your thoughts. The code of text line five one two 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 nine three two eight. Someone texting Alabama as a rival. I don't. I don't think we're there yet. It's got potential because you do have the recent history and you have some weird things that have happened in these games. And the Alabama Saban dynasty starts with that win over Texas in the Rose Bowl. And it was a hard fought game in Austin two seasons ago. And this year, Texas beat Alabama like they hadn't been beat at home and in, uh, in the Nick Saban era going all the way back to the start of this century so yeah there, there is some potential but if those two teams don't play every year it's much more hard it's, it's much more difficult to spike uh to uh, spark a rivalry like that texas is able to do so with nebraska but there were it was a weird set of circumstances with nebraska where like nebraska was dominant and somehow texas kept beating them and then after nebraska wasn't very good anymore check texas just started kicking the shit out of them year after year of course you had that 2009 big 12 title game too and by the end With Garrett Gilbert going in and beating a uh, top-ranked Nebraska team with a dog shit Texas squad, uh, that that second year after the or that first year after the national championship game, uh, Nebraska people who loved everybody or at least respected everybody wanted nothing more to do with uh, any Texas sports or their fans. It's a great point. One more text to get into. Rivalry isn't about getting along or not. Tech and Baylor haven't beaten Texas enough to be a rivalry. I disagree with that. Like in the recent past, they have t- Baylor, well, especially. Look at look at Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Look at the difference between wins in that series. You're Great telling call. me Bedlam's not a rivalry? That's Great that's call. a joke. That's a joke. Uh, but hey, to each his own. You have your own opinion, but uh, I disagree with that one. Thank you for texting in, Kevin from Altstat. Texts in asking if we're doing a bracket contest, and yes, we are. I'll tweet the link out today, and we'll uh, mention that a hell of a lot more on Monday once the bracket comes out Sunday night. Congrats to uh, our guy, Cre- our, our guy Kevin. Excuse me on the Altstat gi- uh, gig. Love that dude. Great to uh, know that he's a part of the Altstat family now. They got a good one with Kevin Clark. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. All right. Speaking of good ones, our guy Cooter's watching, and you know, Pest Wranglers is a pretty good one as well. You want to go live or recorded today, Trey? Can we go recorded, please? I will get my computer back on Monday and uh, not have to go off the top of my head on these things. Sponsor. <laughs> Hey, it's Steve from Pest Wranglers, and I don't know of a single mosquito that owns a home with a backyard, but they sure like to hang out in your yard and make you miserable. Pest Wranglers can fix that for you. Our mosquito treatments are designed to kill adult mosquitoes as well as keep mosquito larvae from developing for up to three weeks. Use us all summer or just once before that big party. No contract, no hassles, no blood-sucking mosquitoes. Check out our reviews and see what others are saying about Pest Wranglers. Pest Wranglers, effective, reliable, affordable. Online at PestWranglers.com. Where are we at in society today? That's right. It is time for that daily look at stories that show we as a people are headed in the wrong direction. Very occasionally, I will bring you a story that provides a sense of optimism that has us all saying to ourselves, hey, maybe we as a people are starting to figure something out. I don't know what today is, so I'm just going to have to explain things to you. BK, last night I went and watched the premiere of a new movie that's going to be out in the next month or so called Civil War. It is written and directed by Alex Garland, the mind behind 28 Days Later. He also made Ex Machina a decade ago, and this is his latest feature film about the U.S. being at Civil War with itself. Well, prior to this movie, and then after the movie, I was talking to a fellow... Journalist, media person, I don't know what you call us at this point. Uh, somebody who was covering the premiere, essentially, who also got a chance to uh, to watch the movie itself. He is an entertainment and travel writer, and I'm me. And so we were talking about things beforehand and getting into a little bit of a political conversation because 
he tends to lean more progressive to these things, and I'm a political bastard. Well, uh, at one point, after the movie ends, we have a conversation about uh, our interpretation of things and why certain things happened or why certain things were shown or not shown. Uh, we got a little bit deeper in terms of just how close this country is to a civil war. I made a bet with a former roommate in Oregon almost, actually it would have been 15 years ago now, that I, I bet him a dollar that the U.S. would be at civil war by 2050. And so uh, I feel like we're, I feel like I'm going to win that dollar bet when it's all said and done. But I was, I was asking him whether he thinks that uh, we are closer or further away from these things. And he's worried that we're dangerously close. And he admits to me that, uh, that he is a gay man who is from a uh, small town in Ohio. And whenever he goes back home now, he sees the vitriol. He sees how concerning it is. And he sees how close-minded people are. And so we had a, a much deeper discussion about all of this. Again, me as a political bastard who doesn't have a team. I just try and make observations on each side. And uh, we discussed just whether things are better now for people overall versus where they were 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And it's my belief that any, even though these things aren't linear and they're certainly not perfect, that overall we are heading in a better direction than we were even in the recent past. And his statement was, is that things are worse off than they were 10 years ago. So I have a question for you and the people now. And unfortunately, I can't see these comments, so you'll maybe have to share some of these with me. Do you think we are better off as a society right now as it pertains to supporting gay people? That is supporting people who like the opposite sex. Or are we worse off as a result of some of the extremes being represented within the media and also by certain politicians as well who do have some uh, negative LGBTQ rhetoric that gets said and played over and over again on various corporate news outlets. Well, hasn't gay marriage been legalized within the last 10 years? It has. And that's, that's a massive step. I mean, we're, we're so far from perfect and fully accepting, but I, I don't know how you could possibly say it's worse when 10 years ago at this time you couldn't legally spend the rest of your life with somebody if you were gay so that that in a nutshell right there feels like a, a pretty big step no it does and that's part of the conversation that we had but i also admitted to him that one of the things that i or the thing that i do for a living is i am a broadcaster for a sports media outlet essentially which is what texas sports unfilter is and i'm like look we talk sports and we just get into random guy shit he's like well the world that you live in is the world that is maybe most guilty of it right now. I'm like, you know, people might surprise you. Like, we have our lines, but like, generally speaking, I don't see a whole lot of like, negativity or hatefulness or bigotry directed towards uh, people who are attracted to those of the same sex. And so he challenged me, and that's what I'm doing right now. And asking you and others, do you have that big of an issue with gay people? Is it that big of a problem for you that you're like, fuck the gays? Because my belief and opinion oh. that I stated to him is, is that's, that's bullshit. Like you are, you are pigeonholing people into one group based on a certain political ideology or based on certain basic likes that you are also accusing the other side of with words like snowflake. I'm like, and that's one of the big issues right now is that we're not coming together to talk about these things. And rather than doing so, we're just choosing to label the other side something that allows us to disengage from the conversation versus having those sometimes difficult chats. And that's not to say that everybody can have those sorts of conversations, but it's also important that those of us who can do. And so I said, look, I know that there's some jack wagons who listen to sports media or only watch football and only watch sports, but there's jack wagons within every group of people. Yeah. I'm not even saying that there's good and bad people. There are people, we're all humans, and we all do and say and think good and bad things at times. That doesn't necessarily make someone inherently evil, though. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not trying to, you know, F any gay people. Uh, you did ask me that, so, but I, I still am cool with them. I just want that for the record. And hey, well, my... sounds a little bit homophobic to me if I'm being. Right now. <laughs> uh, my father's gay. What are you talking about? <laughs> His father, uh, father was gay. Well, I don't yeah, know how in the world is I'm, this happening? I'm cool with everyone, man. Like I, I will take shots. I do it on this show. I don't really have to say this to you. I'll take shots at any group. I'll take shots at my own group. I'll take shots at other groups. But do I really care? No, do your thing. Now, if you go around trying to ruin my life, 
then we're going to have an issue. But if you're just wanting to be gay, okay, cool. Love that for you. If it makes you happy, then do it. I don't care. I do what makes yeah. me happy. You do what makes you happy. That's really all I care about. What would it be yeah. a better place if people were just happy and they also focused on themselves being happy instead of what other people have going on all the time? Not worrying as much about others. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, look, I understand being concerned because you do see some negative shit written or sometimes said, or maybe you deal with it directly. That's awful. That sucks. And I hate that. And on behalf of humanity, you know, maybe there is an apology that should be offered up, but that's not me necessarily. That's uh, that's that person. And you shouldn't assume that everybody else who is associated with that person is that as well versus that person saying or doing something that's really ugly and completely unacceptable. I buy that. That's well said. Yeah. That's well said. So we're having a civil war. That's the bet. Oh, yeah. Civil War by 2050. Anybody wants to take that dollar bet with me, I'm happy to take your dollar by the time 2050 gets here because it'll probably happen by shit. Uh, Ex Machina came out 10 years ago, and it does seem like we're to a point now where really rich guys who live in isolation are being killed by their uh, by their sentient robots. So uh, I'm guessing that uh, it may be happening in the next 10 to 15 years as we bring... Austin's greatest weather guesser aboard for one to three today. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa, I, I'm, I'm the greatest at something. That's a good job. And that's a good call because that is true. The guesser was right on the money on today's weather report, doing just fine. Unlike others who are trying to take my place. There's always somebody trying to take your spot, you know, and it's just not working out for that person right now. Who's TV. trying to take your spot? One of BK's favorites, DD. Yeah, one of our listeners who correctly forecasted the rain that we had last week when the Bucks said it wasn't going to rain. So Ooh. I had given her the throne because she was batting a thousand, one for one. And then she no showed this week. She went on vacation. Hey, I try to tell her weatherers do not go on vacation. They don't get spring break. They're here for the people all the time, like I am. Shit, the their, profession, their profession is a vacation. All you're doing is watching the models of others and making your predictions. Or in your case, you're, you're feeling your bones. Oh, my bones were hurting last night as the thunder and lightning came. <laughs> Man, while Didi was on the beach drinking Mai Tais somewhere, not guessing, <laughs> telling people it was going to rain yesterday. I hope you enjoyed that day that I gave you yesterday when I said it wouldn't rain and it was nice out. That it was hey. somewhat somewhat enjoyable, but also ungodly hum uh, humid too. It was like do, I don't do humidity. I don't do humidity. I don't stop the rain. I just let you know when it's coming. I'm going to ask you this again. I'm going to give you a shot of redemption here, Buck. Uh -oh. Here we uh -oh. go. Is it going to rain tonight in Austin? You're going to be just fine tonight, and you can go watch your baseball game tomorrow. <laughs> oh, dude. You oh. team. Right, hey, hey, this is a test. You versus the University of Texas. Because we'll put that out. UT moved the baseball game up an hour because they're worried about rain tonight. So it's supposed it's to start at seven. Them. They moved it to six because they're saying it's going to rain. So now you're they're going just, up against freaking Jay Hartzell and C. Troy Kimmel. Come on. I got them. I got all of them. All right. Oh man. You know who's gonna be right too? Bucky's going to be right. I'm root rooting for Bucky to be right here. They're not going to do that. Have, hey, have a nice game tonight. Should be fun. And tomorrow. You're not going to miss any baseball. No rain tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a problem. You're incorrect about that one. What? <laughs> tomorrow night? Somebody asked me about tomorrow night. Tomorrow Please day. <laughs> you can't pick nights. You have to do the whole day. You can't just say nights. You need to do the whole day. Come on now. Okay. It's going, it, you're going to have maybe some drizzle tomorrow afternoon, but you're going to see that baseball game's not getting canceled tomorrow night. Mm. I think All it's right. an afternoon guy, though. Oh, really? I think so. Mm. I can't I think... give you everything. I'm still here. Didi's still hiding. Oh, Although she did get in touch with us today. She never told us where she's been hiding out at after her week forecast for yesterday. Oh, it'll rain on Thursday. I said, no, it's going to rain Friday. Did you, get that, did you get that thunder and lightning last night? Zay was champ underneath the covers last night. I don't know. Something's going on with champ, which you might have to help me with because he's afraid of the grass now. 
in our apartment complex and his paws are starting to burn and he's licking he them all the shit. That's what happened. He no, I don't grass. think that's it. No, they've sprayed chemicals or something on that grass. Be careful about taking them in that grass. It's, the paws are sensitive. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Good look it out. Cause yeah. he's, he's not trying to go in any type of grass right now. Hey, go but... change him up. Tell me you want AstroTurf out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call the city and tell them at your apartment complex to get AstroTurf instead of... You want the real AstroTurf, yeah. not this fake turf. You want the real thick stuff so when the dog shit on it, when you squirt it, it just pops in the air. No, my dog's not trying to tear its ACL, but... Oh, did you... Hey, by the way, did you, see that, did you see that video that BK showed this morning of the lady falling in between? No, that is it. hilarious. Let's see it. That is the best. Look. Oh! <laughs> You know what you get on. Where was that? Look at hey, look at these two guys helping her. Hey guys. <laughs> How wrong is that? Oh god. Oh, I have that god. feeling too. when I go to oh, god. I got that feeling when I go to fish camp that I'll fall between the boat and the dock in between that space and my head will get lodged in like that'll just be my feet will be dangling. They didn't even they touched that lady's hand and didn't do anything. Plus that woman, look at her I left step. Tell what that is. How about this lady's oh. left step tray? Doc Trey, look at the lady's left foot. You've got to be stable on one of them. You can't have the left foot fall <sighs> in. You can't do that. One of them has to be the secure foot. Her left foot's supposed to be the secure foot, and then she you step. I don't yeah, know what she duck on the wall. She here. probably broke she, she, she leg. She may have hit her face on the edge there, too. Yeah, that's down. that's the blow. You see that noggin. Oh no, I thought she hit her. I know she hit her back on the back of that thing. Did she get the noggin hit? Oh no, they grabbed her and pulled her back. It was just her back. She's just got a bad back like me now for the rest of her days, which aren't many, obviously. Uh, come that's on. She's already moving pretty slowly before then. That's, I told that's BK, I said the cruise went on. BK that said one. that cruise is over with. I said, oh no, that cruise went on with or without her. She became the anchor. <laughs> Well, the oh, cruise yeah, no, went she, on, but every, every, everyone else who went on that, everyone who's with her in that group could no longer aboard that. Oh, yeah, they, they could. To, they, if they, they had to leave Granny behind. No. I mean, come on. I'm going on a cruise. I'm going on a cruise this summer. If my mom does that, hey, mama, look. <laughs> We're hey, moving on. <laughs> yo, ma hey, mama, I'm sorry. I love you. But you got to be a little bit more coordinated than that. You are a caller now. You got to be more coordinated than that. We're going on that cruise with her. We're going on that cruise. Wow. That's a seven, eight day cruise. Come wow. on now. Wow. My wife and I work our ass off for the money that we get. We're going on that cruise. You may be in the hospital, yeah, but we're going on that decision. cruise. That's my dad's job. He's the one that has to go back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got to go back. You, you, didn't, go you, back. Didn't, you didn't make that promise oh, uh, in goodness. front of a bunch of people. And getting married, your pops did. Cece that's did. Right. So that's his responsibility. Yeah, if wow. Jesse's the one who takes that spill, then you're the one that doesn't get to go on that cruise. Uh oh. Uh oh. Another business decision being made here. Another business I don't decision. know. I think it would be selfish on her to not want me to have fun and go on the cruise. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, come on. Like, she knows. She knows that I need that. You know what I'm saying? That's just, she got to be more coordinated. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That was a bad step by her. That wasn't a, that was a, that thing had, you had to step out there to get on. You saw that it was a little higher. Lady, make a real life step. <laughs> like, she, <laughs> like, she jumped, like she jumped into the portal right there. She's like jumped in the hole. I mean, you don't jump in the hole. She never stepped. Oh my God. I guess that's what happens. You mean? She, she thought she was going to get carried. Look, she sticks her hands out. And wow. the guy, she's like, ah, yeah. oh, the guys will just carry me in there. And they that place is gonna get sued because of that, just that little bit of space that that lady's head fit in. They're gonna get sued for all that stuff. That's not going away easy. You know, Pops is over there going, Okay, honey, you sacrifice, I'm gonna sue them for you. You know that, right? That's wrong. Trust fall. <laughs> you know what? You can't do that. My fault. Oh, that's <laughs> That's even dumber because that guy sees it coming and he still can't get out of the way. Hey, it's coming right at you. <laughs> These are the dumbest falls. My fall school cannot help the dumb. Okay. Mm. If you're dumb, you're just going to fall in a bad way. That guy right there could see that coming from 30 yards away, Trey, straight at him. 
He doesn't make any move, and he doesn't he doesn't even try to jump. He just lets his legs go out from under. What a fool! That's right. All right, fellas, we'll be, we'll bid y'all adieu. Trey will be back with Jeff this afternoon, but uh, I will see you guys. Right, hey, I'll see I'll see y'all Sunday for Crown and Anchor Sunday afternoon. Yep, we'll be there. Well, we, saw, we just saw the anchor right there. That lady's the anchor. Well, so. uh, see you guys later. See you, battle, great show. Ah, uh, no Chip Brown today, but Zay is here. I'm Zay Collier, and we got one of my favorite people in the world, the great legendary, legendary radio host, legendary Longhorn football coach, Bucky Gobble in the building. Buck, thanks for joining me today, filling in for Chip. I really appreciate it, my man. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me for a couple hours hanging out with you. Yeah, man. How you been? Last time I saw you, saw you. Obviously, I listened to the show with you and BK, but last time I saw you and we talked, you almost got me killed along with Brad and Trey to that homeless Flavor Flav looking son of a bee in New Orleans. <laughs> you wanted to be the nice guy and go give the homeless. You need some t-shirts, some man. T-shirts, yeah. yeah. That, was, <laughs> that trip was a trip in the, in, you know, staying at the, staying at the uh, plantation that we were at. <laughs> I mean, the mansion. So... Trey's talking about civil wars. We were right there, brother. We were in it. We were, li we were living it for three or four days. You, you and I thought we were going to see the ghost of our ancestors standing at the plantation. I never want to do that again. I don't. I don't want to be that, living in a place that's older than me. That's kind of scary. Yeah, I was. I was a place. And, and I stayed there a lot by myself too. I was waiting to hear things knocking around, running through the halls, people, ghosts, and stuff. That was not. That wasn't all that cool. Yeah. But we made it, we made it through, but boy, oh boy, that the the day we were leaving was something special, man. I I just thought I was doing some people some favors. I didn't want to throw the shirts away. I said, hell, they're homeless. They can use these shirts. Till the one guy said, Hey, where's my shirt? Let me come, let me let me come at you from a half mile away to get a t-shirt. God. Yo, that was a tough looking brother, too. Like that that dude, he I didn't see nothing. I had my back because I was moving. As fast and as I was I watching, we put it out on film on our Twitter, the Texas Sports Unfiltered Twitter, and I was watching and filming from afar. And then BK came along. I was like, "What the hell is he doing?" And I was like, "Yo, I just have a feeling these New Orleans folk they different, they different." So I just making sure Buck is all right. And he yeah, was well, I thought him. you were good. I thought you were good. We all turned our back, and once we got into the car, my man must have been on a dead sprint <laughs> to catch up. Or a t-shirt. <laughs> he must have thought I had a crack pipe or something. I mean, oh. he just he banged <laughs> in the back of the car, which I never saw him. I never even turned around because I thought you guys were just making stuff up. No. Oh, did you hear it? Did you hear the banging on the door? Dude, I thought it was the palm branches from the tree we were underneath. Falling. Oh, no. Thank goodness Trey flooring it because, yeah, man, if we were just sitting there parked, that dude, I don't know. Again, he was a crackhead, so how much would he really done? But you never know. He could have pulled out that switchblade or any type of thing. You just never know. You can't trust these dudes, which. We had luggage. We would have beat that dude down with luggage. That's what would happen to him. And throw him out of nothing. You didn't even hear it. You wouldn't have gotten out the car anything. I pushed him, kicked him right out of a moving vehicle, right oh, back out to the highway where he came from. Oh, that was that God. was something else. But yeah, I'm doing good, man. I got some um uh, got some stuff I gotta get doing. I gotta go get a surgery in Tampa. They won't do the surgery here in Austin. My specialist is too afraid to get it done. So I've got to get a that thyroid that I had taken out of my neck a couple of years ago. I had the plumber do the work, so now I got to go to the real people in Tampa. So I got to go there, waiting to hear from the doctor when I'm going to take off for a day and and go there and get this done because I got to have it done, man. Too much calcium being built up in my in my body. Other than that, everything else is good. Life is good. Grandkids are good. My kids are good. You know, just moving on, get into the SEC, brother. Yep. Yeah. Watch this game, basketball team. Just yeah. I mean, they're okay one week. They're no okay the next week. They go game to game. Say it's 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 difficult watching Rodney's group right now because I don't know what to expect. I expect Aceman to throw up a bunch of shots. I don't. I, I mean, sometimes he's going to score a lot of points. Sometimes he's just going to throw up a bunch of shots. But some of the other guys, I I, I get what I see out of my Tyrese Hunter has a great game. Three days later, the guy's a no show. 
And so I, from this point on, I just don't know what to expect. It's a game-to-game -game deal with them. I wish it wasn't that way, that there could be some consistency from guys that should be consistent, but it's not. Yeah. yeah it's it's, it's not right now. So I'm I'm hoping that they can I, – I, I, BK, BK showed the bracket they could possibly be in, you know, going into the NCAA tournament. So hopefully getting plenty of rest after getting beat by Case – be, being beat by K State, they'll get plenty of rest, which I know one guy, Dylan DeSue, could use it. The rest yeah, of those, he definitely use it. Uh, the other night, when uh, when four guys had 10 points total, some of the guys that had been playing pretty well, that was disappointing after coming off a nice victory. You know, Tyrese Hunter, after having a career night, then three days later, not only did he drag himself down, he drug about three other guys down with him who didn't do it <laughs> in the next game. And that's, yeah. uh, and he doesn't surprise me about his performance because anytime you can get over ten with him and some assists and a pretty good defense, that's okay. But to show up and get three, I'm like, wow, come on, guy. Yeah, and he didn't score any points from the field. Like all those three points were free throws. He went zero for seven from you know field goals and 0 for 3 from the three-point line. And, yeah, it's pretty frustrating because if you're Rodney Terry, you just don't really know where to go because you don't know exactly what you're going to get out of everybody. Well, you never you saw know? any other young players. You never ever saw any of these young guys, getting, you know, during the course of the season because you're struggling a bunch of games. They never got an opportunity to play. They never got in, in games where some of these young guys that, that were recruited played as freshmen. They never got a chance to play. Yeah, and Chris Johnson is probably one of those guys that stick out the most that you're talking about, one of the yeah. freshmen that came in. Uh, he was the Kansas transfer, and it's interesting. When Arterio Morris, who was on the team last year, when he went to right. Kansas, Chris Johnson kind of saw the writing on the wall. It was like, okay, I'm definitely not going to get any playing time under Bill Self here, so – Let's see what Texas is about. Like TJ Ford was his AAU coach and he had mm -hmm. a good relationship with him. So coming to the 40 acres, you know, Coach Terry tried to put him in early when Dylan DeSue was out and you were trying to see, you know, who wanted those roles and who maybe you could rely on to where Zirico Yema's not in and Chris Johnson's also not in. He tried it with both of them. And Chris Johnson, he's just not there yet. You know, he's just too immature, not experienced enough. I think he needs to get more of a college body and get in the lab and realize, hey, even though you're a big time four star, this is another level and you got to sure. really be locked in to your game and also just, you know, kind of adapting to college life. Like you're an 18 right. year old, you just got out of high school. Now you're on the 40 acres, you know, there's that tail going around and sororities, you walking down on the dragons stuff. Like it, things could be distracting. Not everybody could, you know, again, come in like TJ Ford and just get the job done at jump. Like sometimes well, it mean, takes I, time. So yeah, it's not just here. It's just every place as a freshman, you come in, things start to change a little differently for you. the yeah. season a little bit longer. You get a little bit more tired. You got to study. But, man, those guys needed more chances because this group that he has right now, I mean, Shedrick started to really develop as an, a little bit of an offensive player towards the end of the season. That's why I was disappointed even in him in that Kansas State game. I'm like, these are your these are your opportunities to prepare for the tournament, guy. Give me some offense. Don't come up empty on me after you guys play a good game a couple of days before that. You can't then come up empty, empty this late in the season. You're doing some good things. Don't all of a sudden come up empty now. I know the game. I know they wanted to win. I heard Ronnie Terry see how they, you know, they're, they're you know, he, he made it. So there's bigger things that we have in the future for us right now. Well, the big thing is to win that game the other night against K-State, not have them beat your ass because you want to go yeah. in into the tournament on a high note, not just playing. Okay. Who's going to show up basketball, but knowing that everybody's going to show up still doesn't mean you're going to win. But everybody's going to show up when you got three or four guys out of your starting five or your bench that don't play, that don't do anything. That's not good. You know, even Brock Cunningham yeah. didn't do anything the other night. I'm thinking, come on, dude, at least give me three or four points and some good defense. Right. You guys are like sleepwalking. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I don't know what to expect. Now, if they play in a team like Nebraska, Nebraska's not a bad team out of the Big Ten right now. They're playing. No, Nebraska's okay. got that Asian Steph Curry that's a lefty. Oh, yeah. He has range. He is yes. good. Yeah, they could definitely beat Texas. And, you know, I've been 
kind of a part of the whole narrative about looking too far ahead and seeing sure. that, okay, what who would be that number one seed they would have to play because they're most likely going to be an eight or nine seed going this, into the tournament. You better not look past that first round. Like if you no. have to play an FAU or uh, Michigan State or like you just said, Nebraska, all three of those teams could get your ass this year. So oh, Rodney yeah. Perry, his preparation has to be grade A this time of the year. And, yeah, it's on the players, but sometimes our team makes some moves or lack thereof that you're just wondering, all right, man, like you need to realize your own tank's going to adjust to what you're doing. You're up by 10 at halftime. They're going to yeah. come out doing something different to negate what you've been doing all game. So are you going to be prepared for that and be ready to adjust him and his coaching staff? And he didn't well, do I was that expecting the them to win by 20. When they were up 10, I was expecting them to crank it up in the second half and get going. And they just, they came out at halftime. And I'm like, really? Yeah, you're gonna make this a dog fight. Not only are you gonna make it a dog fight, you're gonna lose the fight. Yeah, yeah, not this yeah. team, not this team. No, and you know, missing a lot of leadership on this team right now. You know, guys yeah. are in this stuff, so we'll see. Like I said, if if they're in that bracket with UConn and Nebraska, they're I don't care if everybody's healthy, they're not beating UConn. No, that's not happening. If if they're all even if they're playing well, they're not beating UConn. That group has so much depth on it right now. And they're playing their best ball right now going through the Big East. Yeah, and I just saw Purdue. They just beat Michigan State by 5, 67 to 62. One of their best players, their point guard, Braden um, Thomas. What's his name? Yeah, Braden Thomas. He just got hurt. I saw him hurt. Was his Braden, leg? Braden Smith. Excuse me, Braden Smith. Yeah. Leg? Leg yeah, injury. hurt his leg. Yo, that, that's, the, that's what Coach Terry's talking about, like, when, you know, you've got bigger plans because – the last thing you need is an injury, especially for Dylan DeSue. It seems like every time he goes down, Longhorn fans gas for breath. And you know, I did game, last week when he was in the game late in the game with about five minutes to go. I was like, "Take him out! Why? Why, why is he even in, in the game? He Take took him that out, little, coach. He took that funny step, and I was like, "Why is that guy even in, in the game this time uh, of the game? You're winning comfortably. They're not going to come back on you. He does senior night. He's already done enough." Go, yeah. sit, go sit down and watch the game. Watch the rest of the guys. He took that step, and I just took a deep breath and went, this is not going to be good for our team. If that guy goes down late in the game, when the game is over with, because it's senior night, and you're, you're just letting him get out there and roll, uh-uh, that's not good. How Have you had any of those moments as a coach where y'all were up by a lot, but you're trying to get this guy a certain amount of yards and stats and stuff, and they might have gotten injured because of it? No, well, I did that in the beginning of the season. I did that when I had my starting running back returning kickoffs at Boston College, Troy, Troy Stratford, who was the rookie of the year for the Dolphins when he got drafted. I thought it was cool because I, I I coached punt returners and kickoff returners, and I had Kelvin Martin, and then I had Troy Stratford. And I put Troy Stratford in that game, and he got lit up on the opening <laughs> kickoff. I missed like four games. And that was my starting run. I mean, he got lit up. This guy went and tried to dive over a pile, and they caught him in midair. And I was like, oh, I was on the side going, oh, he'll bounce up. He laid there, ribs and everything. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> and then, of course, there was Priest Holmes that wanted to play in one more series in the spring game. Remember? He tore up his knee. Oh, my gosh. That was on you? Well, it wasn't on me. It was. Okay. We're playing know, Matt? We're playing Mac of it? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, Coach. Oh, no. He wants to play another series. I'm like, really? Okay, it's your team. Gone. Got hurt and missed the next season with oh a knee. God. So no, no. I I don't I don't I don't like playing starters. That's why when actually when Xavier Worthy was returning punts, I've I was always against that. I'm like, no, dude, don't do that. He's too valuable to be back there. Find some freshman that has a specialty that can run and fly and catch. Let them catch it. Although yeah. Xavier Worthy got through clean this year and had some nice punt returns. He did. He was the best in the nation. Uh, yeah. But I, you're probably talking about 2022. Yeah, I mean, no. Where they had, uh, time. I don't want that. I don't want my starter receiver or my starting running back or my starting quarterback punt returning. I don't care if he's the best in the world. I'm not yeah. putting him back there. I'll find somebody else. Somebody else needs to make the club, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's your job, that's your job as a coach. Get him, get somebody else back there. 
And that, like, you know, X breaking that record at the combine, whichever team drafts him, they're going to put him back there with the you tape. That so? he put on. Oh, hell yeah. Yes. Xavier Ooh. Worthy's going to be a punt returner for the rest of his career. Absolutely. And if that dude is your starter at wide receiver, they're not going to do it. I don't, I, don't, I don't think he could be a one, though. Like, your team's not going to be very good. No offense to Xavier Worthy, but at this moment, if he's your number one guy, you're not in a good spot. That's why it's so interesting to see. You see the Chiefs, they picked up Hollywood Brown on a one-year lucky yeah. million deal. That was a solid get, but now – Going into the draft before that, you were thinking of a Texas wide receiver, which they could still do, but yes. you know, I, it probably would be Adonai Mitchell over Xavier Wordy because Hollywood Brown and Xavier kind of have a similar say, yeah. yeah, you know, so I, yeah, I think Xavier Wordy, I think he'll be a really good number two guy and a really you think good. He's going to start out as a punt returner for a team. Oh, yeah, you got to use that speed. Because, again, he showed that he was really good at it this year. Like he, he caught all the guys. Miss. Yeah, if Keaton Crawford, and I don't know which game it was, didn't hold one time, I wish him the yeah, he best. Right. Nevada, he would have had two. But, yeah, Xavier Wordy, he was terrific when it came to returning punts this year. Uh, who do you think coming into the 2024 season, now Zay Worthy's gone with the roster – that they have bringing in, obviously picking up Isaiah Bond from Alabama, and we yep. know his speed and how he was utilized for saving this past year. But who do you think could be back there? I mean, John yeah, I mean, Tate. Yeah, I, I was hoping it would have been him this year. I wish he would have had a, enough, getting enough reps and doing that. You know, they'd have found some off weeks to get him better, get him on the jugs gun, get him catching punts and doing stuff like that, so that he would be going into this year with some experience. That guy doesn't have very much experience. I mean, he got in a few games, you know, every once in a while, you know, he caught, I think he had one touchdown and some balls thrown at him, but it's just, it wasn't enough that he shouldn't have got more playing time last year. But Sark only uses like his four or five guys. He doesn't, he doesn't do a lot of substituting at that wide receiver position. I got it. It works for him. But I mean, I, I, I just always believe in, if you've got a guy that's got incredible speed and incredible talent, you find a way to get him going somehow, just in case somebody is not ready, or even into the next year. I mean, maybe that's his specialty. I don't know what this kid. I don't. I keep hearing about how great this kid is. I I heard. I think Jordan say on 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 the show with Jeff one time that he believes that Cook is as good as a receiver coming out of high school and now as a kid from uh, Lake Travis was. And I'm like, yeah, Wilson. Like really. He was good coming out of the solo. I'll give him that. I mean, I'm a little biased. Garrett Wilson being a Central Texas kid. He was the best but, I've ever seen in, in the high school level, period. Yeah. The wide yeah. receiver. And maybe yeah, some yeah. of the best I've seen in college. And may end up being the, the best we'll see in the pros. So he that's a that's a long bar to be with right there. If you think sure. that guy's setting the bar, he does set the bar for me, Garrett Wilson, when it comes to wide receivers in high school and college. I mean, he, did he not play as a freshman? I know he played from the sophomore year on at Ohio State. He played some as a freshman. Yeah, he played a lot as a freshman. And uh, all they do is have receivers at Ohio State. They got nothing but NFL players at that position. Yeah, that's all they do. They were stacked that year. They got to the college football playoff. But, I mean, he only played three years. That was it. Like, <laughs> like He was gone. He didn't need that senior year. And Maybe this kid will be too, but I just don't I, – I didn't see him get enough time to do much. And this year it's got to be I that that position for this team is I know they're bringing guys in the kid from Houston's got all kinds of you know experience kid from Alabama I liked the way he played later in the season once their quarterback got going maybe that's your punt returner Matthew kid Golden or Isaiah Bond Isaiah Bond. Bond maybe Bond's your guy maybe he goes back there and returns punts because he's got nice hands he does yeah. he really he catches the ball pretty well and having to catch from that dude who was throwing it last year in Alabama. I, I presume he can catch some, you know, not so accurate balls that move around and stuff. So, I, and plus he's a veteran now. He's, you know, he's got, he's played in a good league. He's played for a few years now. He, you know, became kind of a little bit of a star later on for Alabama. So I got I need somebody I can trust back there. You know, right. I still, I, it took me a while to trust Xavier Worthy. I didn't know if the ball was going to bounce into his hands, bounce off of his helmet, but he did a great job last year. So, yeah, I want to say his only muff was against Baylor. 
he had a muff fumble that game, but overall, yeah. Xavier Wordy was solid. And that's the comparison that they give to John T. Cook. They call him a miniature Zay. Like, if you were asking what when they were asking all of those combine guys like Byron Murphy and mm-hmm. JT Sanders, et cetera, who at Texas now is going to have a breakout year, a lot of them were saying John T. Cook from DeSoto. So, well, it'll be interesting because he needs to have one. Yeah. Yeah, but going back to your original point with Sark and how he just uses guys and doesn't rotate very much, I think he should more. Like, I think, you know, I get it. You have the guys that you trust, and especially last year, like Jordan Whittington, solid season. Adam sure. I. Mitchell, terrific. Xavier Worthy, et cetera. Go down the list. JT Sanders, you know, you go down the list. But, again, if you have guys – that get some reps, which they weren't blowing everybody out. You go back no, to a lot, of close games. Yeah, a lot of close games that shouldn't have been closed. That would have went either way. I mean, if it wasn't for, you know, Baron Sorrell getting in on my man, that's now at Ohio state playing against Kansas state, Will Howard and, you know, John Tay cook and making that stop against Houston, who knows what, how this season would have went, but yeah. You can't put those guys in because Sark doesn't trust them. And it's like, why? Like, Casey Kane got so many reps in 2022. You didn't use them at all last year. Like, he couldn't, he couldn't like get that much worse. I get Adonai Mitchell's good, but no reps at all. I don't know who any of those players are. I don't know who's <laughs> coming back. I'm going to say, tell you, that's how they didn't play that much at all. So I don't uh, know what they have coming back. So they're going to have to see a lot. You're going to have to really convince me in the spring. That this group is going to be as good. Sure. Now, the right, veterans, let, let me, let me, I'll break it down. To, I'll break down the receivers that veterans you've back. seen before. The guys that come from other schools, I've seen them play. Right. Okay. So the ones that are coming from other schools that are getting all the hype, we talked about already. Sure. Sam Bond coming from Alabama. You mentioned Matthew Golden coming from yes. U of H. Both of them are expected to have big seasons for Steve Sarkeesian. Silas Bolden is coming in on a grad transfer, the Oregon State kid. He's yeah, real he's tall. Looks like yeah, he's coming in. He's like, yeah, he's coming in in the summer. He'll be. I've there. seen him play before at Oregon State. Yes. Yeah, he was not bad. Not bad at all. He could fly. Yeah, yeah, he could fly. And then the players that were on the team last year that are coming back: Ryan Niblett. No, 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 no thing about him. DeAndre Moore. Who's that? <laughs> but you know, John Tay Cook. Yeah, so th- those are the guys coming back, and then they got the freshmen coming in. Ryan Wingo, all hype freshman out of St. Louis. That's fine for me because I like the five star hype. You like the five star hype? Oh, that's a grown man already, and he yeah. looks like a grown man. He's a big old dude. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I like I've that. So, I'm, uh, expectations are he's really, really good. Right, right. And then they got Aaron Butler, who was coming is coming in late from California. They said in the hundred, he's like a 10-6 guy, like 10-7 guy, so he could fly. And Freddie DuBose and then Park, Parker Livingstone, white boy, country boy, about 6-3. He could get up there, but I don't know. I have I've never been seen Shipley, so I have that's that's it. So I don't know about these, I don't know about these cats. They don't play. They've been around here, but you don't see them. You don't see them in a series, even watching them run down the field. It's just, just, I mean, I can't go. I mean, I know the coaches see them. The players see them. They talk about them, that they can do this or do that. But I watch those games when, 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 when times get tough right there. You need guys that have been playing and have got a little bit, but they'll get their spring. That's what spring is for. Yeah. You know, they're, they're young guys. They're just only going to be sophomores in college. So my expectations – if you got a four or five star on you, you're ready to play college football. For sure. You know, that's that's if you're and and if what the hell they give you a scholarship for to come to Texas for? So I say about Ryan Niblett, they gave him a scholarship for some reason. They didn't yeah. give him a scholarship so he could drop balls, but I mean I just didn't see enough of them. But it happens, you know. Once again, I mean it's not like I've never seen that. Even when I was coaching, guys had been on the bench, and then you watch them at practice, and you say that's the next guy right there. You know, you had to do that. You don't get very many Ricky Williams or Priest Holmes that come in and all of a sudden just take off immediately. It takes yeah. them some time. It just it just does. And I, I guess these other guys that they talk about will get on there and we'll see. Or they won't get on the field. Yeah. You won't, they, yeah, you'll find out by spring because you don't have much time in the fall. You've got to have your guys by the by the fall at those certain positions. This end, 
this isn't like a linebacker that, you know what, he got a little bit better, he got a little bit better, and he's ready to get out there. These are guys you throw the ball at, so they can't catch it in the face mask. They got to catch it with their hands and go. We already know what we have when it comes to that running back room. There's about three or four of them ready to go. You know, we've seen that. We saw when a guy went down how they stepped up, how their game stepped up, which means if they're starters and second-team guys, they are ready to go. That's a room with a, with a solid football coach who played in the NFL that's ready to go. And Chris Jackson, one of the biggest deals that they got last year for Sark is the fact that he hired that guy. That was a big hire. Yeah, I think that goes underrated. That's a good point, Buck, because go look at what the Jags did this year opposed to the year yeah. they had Chris Jackson. Like Calvin Ridley's gone. He, he's off to Tennessee now. Like Calvin right. Ridley said, yo, Jacksonville ain't for me. This Trevor Lawrence guy, I don't think he's it, which the Jags feel the same way because they wouldn't have went out and got Mac Jones if they were for sure on Trevor Lawrence. Like that's – I could see that being the QB swap and Trevor Lawrence struggles early in this year. But, yeah, Chris Jackson, I think he's done a hell of a job. And you can tell with these guys wanting to play you turn those guys into real pros. Right, exactly. And then going to that running back room that you're mentioning, I mean, C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue, like both of those guys, they have a lot of support for one another. Like one of the things I saw on Twitter, you know, talking about, hey, can Stark have 2,000-yard backs this year? Sure. Jaden Blue retweeted it like, yo, C.J., let's go, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I love that. Like those guys aren't trying to, you know – go over one another on oh, who's no. a starter and who's not. Like, they both want to see each other succeed because it's for the, you know, leathers in front of the jersey, not the ones on the back. So I'm, I'm I'm excited about the running back room. I'm excited about this season coming up. I want to ask you, kind of going back to just the guys that haven't been playing as much that we haven't seen during your time as a coach, how difficult was it? to keep those guys that aren't playing bought in. I mean, obviously the transfer portal wasn't what it was. You couldn't just leave. You knew you'd have to sit out a year. But now things are obviously different. Guys are leaving by the drop of a hat. How difficult was it for you? And how difficult do you think it is now to keep guys sane and locked in and wanting to stay and, you know, buy into the process? Well, I always had guys that had – something to do in the game, in the particular games, every game. I mean, it wasn't much, but I mean, I counted, I, I mean, I could count on the third string running back to just go run an option route. If it was third and five, people would see a guy come in. The opposing team would see the guy come in and go, you mean they're taking the starter out for that guy? Well, that guy worked with me for weeks on end during the, you know, during the summertime and spring about running certain routes against certain people, just one-on-one little deal. Give me five yards, catch it, and fall down. You don't. If you give me a first down, you don't have to run. If I see you trying to take off and get an extra yards and you fumble, you'll never do this again. So my deal was give me a certain amount of yardage for a first down. You ran a certain route. You did it. You went down. You came out. You got your job done. Well, guess what? You get to do that again next week. <laughs> I don't, I don't well, I mean, I mean, I could lean on. I could lean on a Ricky or a Priest or a Sean Mitchell to do something, but that four-string running back who works as hard as everybody else, I gave him one thing to do. I mean, that that's that was his job. Teams knew, oh, here comes here comes this four-string dude. Here's what he does. He's not going to carry the ball. He's not going to rush in there for to try to get the first down, fourth and one, you know, because I didn't bring in the fat guys on defense to do any of that stuff. But I said, here you go. You have been, you know how to run these routes. You and I have gone over this over and over again. I don't care who, if they can put their best cornerback on you, fine, but they're not going to do that. They're going to put some goofy linebacker that weighs 225 back in the day, 230. They're all big dudes. I said, just shake and bake this guy, go inside or outside, sit in the spot, catch the ball and fall down. I said, that's it. That's not, you know, your girlfriend's going to love you. Your parents going to be in the stands. They know you're going down. You're going down there to do that for the team. I mean, on the third down. And guys would look like, well, Ricky, those guys look like, well, you know I can do that. I'm going to beat that guy. I'm like, you do enough. Let this guy have his Let this guy have his flowers that he's going to go in four times a game and do that and get that done for me 90% of the time. He's going to feel like he's part of, the, part of the team. It's not a big deal because if his ass catches and runs and fumbles, he'll I'll be <laughs> with somebody else. Yeah. So, I mean, those guys were always a part of it with me. And it wasn't anything that was big. It was just – Little small things. A fullback would go in 
if Ricky decided to play halfback, I would have a guy to play the fullback position. And I would, I said, this is, we're running this play. This is your play. You got that guy. You got to go in there with your face planted in his chest. You may get rejected, but that's your play for the day. You need to understand that. You don't have any other plays. You don't have, you don't got four or five of them. You may know them all. You may say to me, coach, I can do this. And so I can look at you and say, no, you can't. No, you can't do that. You're not, you can't do that this year or, and you can't do it next year, but see these, these one or two plays I have for you. This is what you do. And everybody loves you. Your parents love you. They come to me after the game. Coach, thanks for getting him in. I'm like, well, hell yeah. He's a part of the team. But can you, can you give him the ball? No, I can't give him the ball. No, I won't give him the ball. So don't come to me after the game saying, do you think he can carry once? Because I'll say, no, he can't carry zero times. That's it. Wow, man. You a con artist, man. That ain't no way I'm buying that. Once a game, that's it? Then I'm good next week? Come on, man. Ain't no – what kind of players do you have? Sometimes the guy's got three or four plays on third down, third and fourth, and when okay. we knew we were going to throw it. And they, like I said, they knew it too. They couldn't stop it. I started that. I started that stuff off when I was at Boston College. A kid named Kenny Bell, who went and played for the Denver Broncos for years, a kickoff returner, punt returner. Kenny Bell made it in the NFL. That's what he was. He was my guy who jumped over the pile at the goal line, jumped over like Priest Holmes used to do. That was his only. That was his only deal. And again, that's how I got in the games. I said, "Oh, oh, it's third and one. Kenny, you want to get in there?" I said, "I know what you need to do, right?" He goes, I'll get over the top of him, coach. Good. Because <laughs> then after the next play, come on out. Come on out, Kenny. Come on, stand beside me. Fourth and one, you know, I said, that's it. Let's go do it. And he was the originator of that third and four, third and five out of the backfield where they couldn't cover him mm-hmm. because sometimes he'd go right on by them and catch a pass. But, dude, I just told him, I said, don't you ever fumble that ball. If you do what we're, you're supposed to do and you decide I need to do a little extra to show me something – and you put that ball in the ground and they get it, I said, you got a whole lot of trouble because your mom and dad are going to come to me the next four games and say, he doesn't do that anymore? I'm like, no, he fumbled. He doesn't get to go in there and do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, until his time came. And then Kenny Bell became a a full-time player along with Troy Stratford. I mean, and I mean, I had three guys, I had three guys at Boston College that nobody wanted. They made it, nobody wanted them out of high school. All three of them played in the NFL. Troy Stratford's Steve Strahan played for the Raiders, and uh, Kenny Bell played for the Denver Broncos. They all three made it in the NFL four years or more and got their, their pensions and everything else. And some of them just did limited stuff. One kid, Steve Strahan, who played for the Raiders, he couldn't. Ca- he only carried the ball in his left hand. That's it. He would, he would run to the right side and carry the ball in his left hand. And I said, is that your dominant hand? He goes, I'm really comfortable this way. I said, that's fine. Don't fumble it. Showing it to people on the inside. He never had a fumble in his career. Wow. So I said, that if you feel comfortable that way, I don't give a shit what you look like running to the right side with the ball in your in your left hand because it looks goofy instead of protecting it on the outside. Like, like your boy Tiki? Yeah. I, said, I, don't have any of those, I don't have any of those hang-ups. I said, if you feel more comfortable with it in your left hand and you'll protect it better, protect it. That's all. Just don't put it on the ground. Because the minute you fumble, will be the last carry you have with that. Right. Yeah. No, man, I, I, I made guys, they all felt like they were a part of the group. Like I said, that one kid was a four string tailback, slow little white kid, slow, slow, but could shake a guy up one on one and catch the ball, made every catch low, high, sort of like A.D. Mitchell. Anywhere the ball went, he was going to catch it for a first down. It, people would be in, how is that guy getting in the football game on third down? I said, because I know if I know he'll get open, I know he'll catch it, and I know he better fall down after the first down. And Matt, Matt used to go, he used to say, he said, he said, does he have to fall down? I'm like, yeah, coach. He got you your first down. I don't want him. I don't, I said, if if it's all clear, fall down. Got the yeah. first down. Move first the down. <laughs> yeah, keep that oh, clock running. Keep that yeah. clock running. Don't you dare try to shake somebody up and show them what you got. Just to show everybody, oh, I should be playing more. I said, don't you dare do that. Yeah. (laughs) That's the the way it works out, man. Guys want to, they want to know that they're a part of it. And that's why I said for Cook, I'm thinking, man, give that guy some more time last year. Let him go in there and just, I don't care if he goes down and blocks. You know what I'm saying? A.D. Mitchell could block. Let him go in that spot, in that that slot, and let him be the blocker downfield. 
Hell, you let you let the damn tight end with a peg leg one time be the main blocker and got got your running back blown up. Let that guy let the other kid come in there and do that. It's yeah. but everybody has a role. I mean, everybody has a role, even in in if you got a loaded backfield of four or five guys, and this team has a loaded backfield. They got three or four guys that can play, plus guys coming in now. You know, they're going to have a freshman in there, a running back. That guy's need to see a little bit of time, too. Find out what they're all made of, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be anything. It doesn't have to be a big role. But, look, I don't know what he is. I I know he's fast. That's all I know. I don't know if he can shake guys up, catch and run down the field, you know, know, catch it at 10 and give you a 30-yard run. I, I don't know if he can do that. I never saw him do it. Never got a chance. Yeah. I mean, we're not, everybody's banking what he did at DeSoto, which he put up some really good numbers. I mean, they were a state championship team, and he was the guy that led the way from, for them, and so did Trey Weisner, who's also on this Texas roster. Both of those guys led it up in high school. But, but there yeah, you got to prove it. There has to be a time where he can prove it at this level. When does that come? He had some moments. He called a long ball. I forgot who it was. Yeah, one over his shoulder. Yeah. yeah, one over his shoulder. And he had another one during Arch Manning's little drive against Texas Tech. Which, Those are a long time in between where he could have been in at some times. I don't care. A five-yard hitch, throw it to him, you know? Let him kind of hitch and see if he can shake guys and go. We found that out from Jaden Blue in a hurry. If you give him an opportunity, he can make things happen. I mean, yeah. he was just that good. He set out a whole – you know, he didn't even play his senior year in high school, but once he got to the college level and you could see what he had, you knew he was going to be pretty good. You knew he could make people miss, and he had a little bit more strength than people thought he had. Yeah, when you hear Tashar Choice compare Jaden Blue to Jameer Gibbs, who Tashar yeah. Choice coached at Georgia Tech before he went on to Alabama, that's saying something. That, that, that's so saying stuff. Tashar Choice ain't no dummy. You know, Shard Choice ain't going to talk out of the side of his lip for no reason. Right. Like, he's a credible guy. And, yeah, you see that with just the explosive ability that Jaden Blue has. He has that home run ability every time he touches the rock. The fumbling worries you. Like, it is, he's fumbled a couple of times this year, the main one in the Sugar Bowl, that you're like, okay, you got to get that taken care of coming into the 2024 season because – C.J. Baxter is good, but those two together, Thunder and Lightning, yes. like that's going to be tough for these SEC teams to stop. And, yeah. again, both of those guys, they got their head on straight. They're thinking about team first. Like, hey, that's what you need. And you mentioned those freshmen that came in, Jared Gibson and Christian Clark. Right. Our choice, another comparison, you compare Christian Clark, who's also from Arizona, to B. John Robinson. Which, okay. yo, let's, hey, <laughs> you want to put that pressure on that young brother? Then sure, I'm with it. If I, I love me some comparisons. And he compared Jared Gibson to Roshan Johnson, who Jared Gibson, if you've seen him, he has pictures out with Bijan Robinson. They work out together as of late. That dude is college football ready. Hell, he's NFL wow. body ready. You know what I'm saying? So if he could pick up on – the offense, and let's not sleep on Trey Wisner or Savion Red, but if he could pick up on this Sarkeesian offense, then who knows? Like that, we saw Jonathan Brooks go down last year. God forbid anybody else go down, but this is football. You just never know. Next guy has to be ready, has to be prepared. And I think just not only the running back room, but every single position group, you got a lot of depth that you need going to a, the best conference in the nation. Yeah, out of the 10 or 11 guys that I had that played in the NFL from Boston College to Illinois to, to Texas, I never, I hadn't, I, I didn't coach a fumbler. A, a fumble guys, guys fumbled, couldn't play. I mean, I, in high school, if they fumbled in high school, I didn't recruit them. I just, I just wouldn't recruit them. If they right. put it on the ground in high school, I don't bring them here to, to make me have them walk around campus and that kind of shit with another. <laughs> <in the morning. laughs> like Omar Epps in the program. <laughs> I'm like, I don't do that. I'm not doing that. I just, I mean, I've I've been around guys. I've been around guys who had had fumbling game. Ricky didn't have many. Priest didn't have. I just didn't. I didn't. I wasn't around fumbles. There was a couple of years where we led the the nation in fumbles lost. Now it would hit the ground, but I've never seen guys get on a ball like the guys who were in, in my group that I've ever had. That that ball went on the ground, dude. They were going in there. They were going to bite your nuts off in order to get that ball back because they knew what was coming. Because Magovic would say, Magovic would always say to me, he goes. You're going to get him back in the game, right? And I'm like, no, he fumbled the ball. He'll fumble again. I was like, 
No, if he fumbled once, that dude's going to come back in here five. So I'm not giving him a second chance in this game to have him fumble again. No, no. He, I, and just I just didn't recruit those guys. I mean, there were, yeah. there were some really great backs that were in the state of Florida that I had an opportunity. But in, in high school, they were one hand in it. Ball was going on the ground. Oh, yeah, like, flashy Florida boys. I'm like, dude, you're not. I'm not coming here to teach you how to hold on. Do you know how to hold on to a football? That's that's you. You can't play here. You'll fumble the ball. You'll cost me my job. You can't yeah. do it. You cost us all. People be talking about, oh, that guy can't teach guys how to hold on to the ball. No, that's 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 our ball. That ain't that ain't your ball to give to somebody else. That's our ball. So I never I never had a problem with fumblers. They knew better. And I, yeah. I just didn't I just didn't recruit him. I didn't recruit a kid out of high school that had a bunch of fumbles. I don't care how good he was. It just never happened. I mean, I'd look at some other guy who just maybe had a little less speed, but knew how to took care of, took care of the ball, would take a big hit, bounce right up, but but held on to the football. You know, guys, guys in high school, they fumbled and coaches go, oh, no, he's got great speed. I don't give a shit about his speed if he can't hold on to the football. Yeah. And Priest and Ricky, Sean Mitchell was fast as hell. But he didn't put it on the ground very much because he knew he was in a spot. I can't afford to be a fumbler with these two guys playing here ever. Right. You know, Gerard Douglas that played when ended up going to Baylor. I mean, that that guy was really, really good. But there was something that I didn't like about him. And so I went after him. But and I kind of slowed down. I let Baylor have him. I took Ricky instead. Yeah, oh, yeah, good, good decision there. Yeah, great decision there. Good grief, man. Going back to um, your recruiting days, because you mentioned that sometimes you were going after guys that were afterthoughts to others. And, you know, I think of Rodney Terry first, because I think, you know, he might have to go a Kelvin Sampson route, where Kelvin Sampson, you look at all his big men and guys like Jamal Shedd, like those are junkyard dogs that yes. came – you know, guys that you could develop. Like you knew those guys probably weren't going to get much NBA draft attention, but they're going to be hard nosed guys and they would fit that college, you know, college type of game. How did you find those guys that, again, people just kind of, uh, he's not big enough or he's not strong enough? Like what were things that you looked I, at? I just never had a, I never had a problem, big enough problem because Troy Strapp was, Strapp was about five, seven, five, eight. You know, Sean Mitchell was, you know, five ten, but that dude weighed about in the, in college. That was a dude was about 160, 65, 170 pounds. But that dude could absolutely fly. That was big. When I first got to Texas, they had, you know, Butch had not. They had monster guys, big old big grown men, like Earl Campbell looking dude. I never I never had players like that at Illinois. But I mean Howard Griffith, Howard was nothing but about five nine, but he was two fifteen, you know, kind of square body guy. I like the tough guys. You know, they had to have a certain amount of speed. I wouldn't, I wasn't looking for four, six running backs. You know, yeah. I, in those days, four or five was good enough. And it depends yeah. on how you ran with your pads on. Certain guys can run faster with their pads off. And I watched Emmett Smith in, and when he was in high school in Florida. And then I got a chance to see him in college at Florida when we played against him at Illinois. Dude, he came down the sideline. They used to tell me, well, you know, he's not that fast. I saw him go down the sideline. In a bowl game against us at Illinois, I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> He's got angles on him, and they couldn't touch him. And in high school, it was the same way. That guy ran like four, five, eight, four, six, one, but then nobody ever caught him. Yeah. You know, you know, you could see in the NFL every once in a while he got caught, but not many times did he get caught once he had a head of steam on. I mean, I I didn't mind, and I didn't mind little guys, big guys. I, I've had big running backs. I haven't had a I haven't had a lot of big running backs. I mean, Ricky was big. Ricky was two and two twenty out of high school, but I also got a chance to see him play linebacker. He would have made. A, he would have been an All American at linebacker. Yeah, you always say that, man. That's he crazy to me. And he wanted to. He wanted to play both ways when he came. I had to talk him out of that deal, and that was hard to do because he was, a, you know, he was a state champion wrestler in San in California. That guy could wrestle, you know. But at linebacker. Can you imagine that guy hitting a running back, playing linebacker, getting a full head of steam, no. and, and, and linemen trying to get on him? He would go through guy. He would go through high school line uh, run, uh, linemen, offensive linemen weighing 205, 190 in high school. Ricky would run right through that guy and hit the running back, and just helmets would fly off and stuff. And he would jump up, then go play offense. He was a devastating linebacker. Yeah, he was. He was, he was like Dat Win, but weighed more. And when he got to Texas. He used to love to play against AM because he used to like to run into that win. 
he would go out of his way for a collision with Doug Green. I'm like, why are you doing that? You can run right around him. He goes, I don't know. He seems like he wants to be a tough guy at like 207 or something like that. Yo, that win was tough. <laughs> that that Asian brother was tough, man. That dude he was, was never tough. tough against Ricky. He just, Ricky said, I'm going out of my way to have a collision with that guy. I'm like, man, you're going to hurt that kid. I said, yeah. you know, he's not going to shy away from the contact. He knows he's going to go bone on bone. He goes, I'm going to win every battle against him. He'd go through the line, and there would be a hole wide open, and he could shake him and go. He would lower his shoulder on that guy and hit him so hard and drive him backwards. When he could have gone 30, he was going like six hearts to six the hard way. <laughs> like, why are you doing this? And he did it for like two years in a row. I'm like, why are you doing this to that kid? I can't, you know you're going to hurt him one of these times. But that win, you know what? He was always there for the collision. Yeah. You know, he always thought he was going to come out. He never won a collision against Ricky. Oh, never. he was a hard ass, man. I, I give he, him that. He was a hard ass. He went to the Cowboys and was just throwing his little 108 pounds, you know, <laughs> 208. I'm like, what are you doing in there? He's playing like at a safety's weight, you know, playing linebacker. Oh, man. Well, the pads at a and his pads were huge. Oh, yeah. Remember, he had, didn't he have a collar, too? Didn't he play with, like, he a might have. I think he had. Yeah, I think he had the neck roll and the whole mask. line. Yeah, so he was a little bigger. bigger. He'd, he'd make a beeline right to him. Where is, where's that, where is he? I'm going to not outrun anywhere. There he is. I'll go sideways just to run into that dude. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he was a better. I loved him. I mean, he was he was one of the best as a competitor that we played against. And he was, and he was always up for the challenge, and it was not much of a challenge for him. He just wasn't. But I've had big guys, and but I've never had them like Ricky. I mean, at two twenty some, because there was there was times when Ricky, when they weighed him at two fifteen, and that dude was two forty five. I'm like, dude, what? Hey, hold on, they were lying about the weight. That dude was that dude would have like eight pizzas one night, and come back, you look at him, you go. You are not 215 with these pads on. Somebody is lying. It was with the pads on, that dude was 245, 250 at times. He was round shouldered. I mean, he was big at times. Big old thighs, big old pads he wore. He didn't wear those sleek pads. He wore those big pads, you know, with the rib cage thing and everything yeah. else. He hit yeah. the truck. Wow, that's ridiculous, man. The hardest work I've ever seen, though. That guy so worked what, hard. The best so ones were the uh, hardest workers. Yeah, absolutely. So was Makovich on board for Ricky playing both ways? Or yeah, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I didn't, I'm like, no, that guy can't. No, no, you're not hurting that guy playing. No, you get you'll get him 999 990 yards in his freshman year, but he ain't playing no defense. He wanted to be the kicker. How'd you hey. convince him and Makovich? How'd you, how'd hey. you convince Ricky? Dude wanted to be the kickoff returner. He was back there one time returning kickoffs at practice. And he fumbled a kickoff return, and he hit him and bounced off. And my friend Bobby Jack Wright started screaming at him at practice, and Ricky never spoke to him again. That's right. He never spoke to him again. To this day? No. He hated him because he embarrassed him in front of the team because he screamed at him, get his ass out of there. I was like, Ricky, just move over to the side a little bit. That ball hit him in the chest pad, bounced off. He yelled at him. Ricky never forgave him for that. One thing. That was it. Insane. No, man, Richie, Ricky was sensitive. He was one of those sensitive guys, except for I would just come up beside him and say stuff like, yeah, nice cut there, OJ. I mean, I would whisper. <laughs> to him here. Hey, that's a nice cut there, Juice. Don't you think you should have made the go the other way? Oh, no, you could yeah. say little stuff, but you couldn't You couldn't say stuff out loud to embarrass him. Mm -hmm. He was he was oversensitive about that stuff. Sean Mitchell, you could say anything to those guys. You say anything to priests because priests never paid attention to you anyway. Right. He just did. He just priests just did stuff his way. Yeah. And I had some really good running backs. I mean, you know, when I got here, Phil Brown was here. Adrian Adrian Walker was here. I mean, these are really really good. Those guys were good players. I mean, when I first came to Texas, when I when I left Illinois, I I, I looked around and I I looked at players, and I used to go, so this is. This is the Texas group, the group on offense and defensive lines and stuff. I just like, wow. I said they must have they must have blown their loads in high school because when they got to the college level, it was like someone were like, what, really? Yeah. I mean, that was the that was that was the difference for me. I, I was expecting a lot more when I first came here. Then things started getting better. 
recruiting started getting better. They started getting bigger, starting to get a little bit tougher. But they weren't all that tough when I first got here. I had some pl- I had some tough players. On the offense and defensive line, not so much. Yeah. Not so much. Now, you know, and then and then we started winning those games and started getting players. You know, they were, they were, it was a it became a physical group. You know, we ran finesse offense, which people thought was finesse offense. But when you start coming downhill running counter plays and and having guys pulling, kicking guys out, that was not finesse football. That was hardcore downhill running. Yeah. That our offense was made about. We had finesse throwing because people thought all we did was throw, but man, we ran a lot of we ran a lot of running plays. Yeah, Dan Neal, one of the best pulling guards oh, of all time. Absolutely. Blake, Blake Brockemeyer, some of those guys. Yeah. Those were some hardcore dudes, man. And they were cheap shot artists. They were mean. <laughs> Dan was a cheap shot artist, really? Dude, if you were if you were on your side, he wouldn't just like bypass you. He would lower the boom on you if you weren't if you weren't on balance. That guy went out of his way to hit you. He knew how to get leverage. He's a short little dude that got great leverage from being a wrestler. He was fabulous. He was yeah. fabulous to watch. Nobody ran that counterplay like that guy. He knew how to cut that corner and come around there and look for linebackers. He was awesome. Yeah. You know, I, I just never got a chance to coach Butch Hadnot. I just got had, had him for a year. I wish I would have been able to coach that guy when he first came on the scene because he was just a brute. He was a brute. You know, he had seen a lot of Earl Campbell film where he thought he could run over guys instead of around them. So he made his living trying to run. That's hard to do. That's yeah. hard to do as a running back, make your living and running people over when there was time where you could have run around them. You know, Ricky ran around over a lot, a lot of guys. And Ricky was also very smart on the sidelines. I taught him, dude, you don't need to take another hit. That's it. You can go ahead and crawl on out of bounds. If you, you give me 20 yards, just run over to me. Say hello to me on the sideline. There's no reason for you to lower your shoulder on anybody. Yeah, thank you for saying that, like, as a coach, because I see people all the time, fans, people watching social media of running backs going out of bounds at times instead of trying to get the extra no. two or three yards and no. deliver the boom, but just add more, you know, hurt no. to their bodies. Like that's no, if, you, if, you were, if you stayed in bounds to keep the clock running late in the game, that's all right. But if we're in the middle of a game, first, second quarter or something, and you ran for 15 yards and you wanted to slide on the sideline and not take that extra hit by those two guys coming out of secondary late, that was fine with me. I never said, hey, dip your shoulder down and give me three more yards. I'm like, hell no, get out of bounds. Protect yourself. <laughs> you know, and I never had a guy who got horse collared and brought down because we, 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 I was teaching them how when that guy grabbed the back of your jersey just to go limp, go limp, let your body, don't fight that feeling. They grab your shirt. If they grab your shirt, they're going to jump on the back of your legs. That's what they do. That's what defenders do. So yeah. we're doing drills where you do that and then just go limp and go down. Protect the ball, go down. But don't be trying to fight some guy because the next thing he's going to do is try to get them legs, jump on them legs and tear that knee up. So, oh, yeah. You see that you know. all the time. You see yeah. that all the time. They're trying and then to guys it. try to fight that deal where they got a guy on your collar. Hell no. Go down. You know, no. I wasn't – I mean – I used to make fun of Franco Harris the latter part of his career when he'd run out of bounds. But that dude was running out of bounds after a three-yard run. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Franco in his latter years was running out of bounds after five-yard runs. So I'm like, come on, man. Come Give on, he's a legend. Steelers yeah. legend. He had a lot of wear and tear on that body. Yes, he did. That was late in his career. You're right, he did. And a five-yard run meant a lot to him at that time. With them young legs, about 15, getting out. No, you don't need to go down the sideline and have some guy knock you out, knock you into the bench. That was crazy. I'm like, just go ahead and take that side that side step, come over to me. I'll say, hey, good run. I'm not going to yell at you for not lowering your shoulder down. Yep. Let you the give me a first down. down. I don't need any more than a first down. Don't mean you got a first down already, right? That's right. That's right. Love Chip it. is out today. Bucky Gobble in the building. I'm Zay Carr. You're here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Buck, Aaron Donald is turning in the cleats, man. One of the greatest to ever do it. Probably the greatest interior lineman to ever put on the pads. Three-time defensive player of the year. Eight-time first-team All-Pro. Was a pro bowler in all ten seasons that he played. 2014 Rookie of the Year and Super Bowl champion. Where does Aaron Donald for you rank on just all-time greats playing defense? When it comes to defense, all around defense, probably top five. Defensive yeah. lineman, probably top three. I, I I used to love Bruce Smith. 
and Bruce Smith played defense for the Buffalo Bills. Yeah. That dude was a killer now. I mean, he, he reminds me a lot of Bruce Smith in the way Bruce Smith uh, even could have been even better than he was. But Aaron Donald, that, I saw that this morning, but I never saw I never saw that he was retiring. So he has given it given it up, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's giving it up. That's I mean, good. that's good. It's about that. It's that time where he's still got, you know, his body's still in really good shape. He keeps himself in good shape. I mean, there's nothing else for him to do. He's won a Super Bowl. What else does he need to do? Yeah, that's true. I mean, he yeah. and JJ Watt, those guys get out while you can get out. You've done a lot. There's not a lot more you can do. You know, you play for years and years and years. But yeah, he, JJ Watt, Bruce Smith, you know, Reggie White, guys like that. Time to go. Go on, Absolutely. have some fun in your life. Yeah, that guy didn't want to go through another damn football season. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because yes, he has years left. Like Aaron Donald playing in year eleven is still better than ninety five percent of the league sure. at that spot. Like besides Christian Jones and you know my man from New the Giants, I forget his name. Aaron Donald still top tier. So. In the NFC, it's it's wide open to me. After San Fran, who do you got as one of the best teams? Like you're looking at quarterbacks. Matt Stafford might be the best quarterback in the NFC. Are we counting Dak well, Prescott? Are we counting Jalen Hurts? Are we counting Kirk Cousins? I don't think so. Matt Stafford's the only one that's won a Super Bowl out of that crew. And then you got Brock Purdy in San <laughs> Fran. So. You're right, Aaron Donald, you know, he's done enough. That's a Hall of Famer. Like, they're already getting his jacket sized oh, up for, sure. for him. But <laughs> this this uh, uh, Rams team coming up, like, they have as good a chance as anybody, you know? Oh, so you got, you got the quarterback, and you've got that young wide receiver that came out as a rookie, had all those catches last year for him. Okay. <clears throat> this, it, it'll still be a pretty good team. Uh, yeah. I, I think with the NFC right now, for me, it's – that that move of Philadelphia getting Saquon Barkley because I don't expect Jalen Hurts. I think he played a lot hurt last year with his with his knee. I mean, he's not going to have to run as much anymore because he's going to turn it and hand it off with that offensive line, you know, with Saquon Barkley. And Saquon Barkley is going to try to prove an awful lot. He's back home in Pennsylvania. He's right from the Lehigh Valley. He's a he's a forty five minutes to an hour away from home. That guy is going to be different this year. It's not going to so be like. Did. It's not going to be like that Giants offensive line that he'd been running behind. Well, they just hired Kellen Moore. That's their offensive coordinator now, Sirianni. And, you know, wow. that, that I thought that their other offensive coordinator that Super Bowl season going to the Colts to be the head coach. Hurt him. him. Yeah, I thought it hurt him a lot. And, yeah, Jalen Hurts, he shouldn't – he can't keep running the way he does. Like, he can't no. keep doing that. And Saquon, that's a big get, but – does Fletcher Cox, that means a lot. Does Jason Kelsey retiring? Like, they've still lost guys that were a big part of that locker room that completely imploded this last year. Like, that locker room was just completely toxic. You know, yeah, they so had all types of problems toward the end of the season. And then Jalen Hurts, he just does some things. I was talking to Jeff Barker, CBS Austin, yesterday. He was on the show. He just does things that, like, give you just unauthentic you know, like, come on, Jalen Hurts. You can't be this happy-go-lucky positive every time they ask you a question. Like, you're saying all the right things, but you're He's not – He's got to have some downtime. He has to have some yeah. – Yeah, yeah, it's just there, there's some things you're like, dude, it sounds like you're reading an Instagram quote. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, Kenny Pickett just got traded to the Philadelphia Eagles. Like, yeah, he's back up. <laughs> you know, he's a backup for the rest of his career. No, I actually see Jalen Hurts have another nice year. He's got his receivers back. You know, he'll be – this run game deal is going to make a really big difference. Like you say, Zay, he's, he's not going to have to take off as much. And I think he played hurt. I think he played hurt with that knee. Yeah. Just never healed up. They expected a lot from him. And he wants to run. He wants to do some things. Somebody's just going to have to settle him down. And, you know, and we know how accurate he can be. We've seen him throw the ball. We've seen him get to the Super Bowl. That guy's going to be – don't worry about him. He's going to be just fine. Now, on the other hand, if Dak Prescott – I mean, I don't know what's going on with that group in Dallas. That, that This is a group who, who's done nothing in free agency right now. They, they're they Jerry still sleeping. He's still in his winter hibernation, and they need to come out and do some things. I think they're going to they're going to work through the draft. Somehow, some way, they believe that they can work 
things out through the draft. They've done nothing since this, this free agent period. They haven't they haven't made a blockbuster move. And that circus is all about making blockbuster moves. And when they don't do anything and they say they're all in, and they do nothing. That scares me with them. Yeah, I mean, you can't put all your eggs in the basket with Deuce Vaughn. I like Deuce. He's Central Texas native. Kansas State career was good, but he can't be your bell cow running I back. thought they should have got either Saquon or Derrick Henry. To yeah. If they wanted to run the ball, that's what you're going to show me. If you're just taking Derrick Henry and not let him get away, and you want to run the ball and then not put that much pressure on Dak Prescott, who had a fantastic year, by the way, last year. Yeah, Dak was good. I was good. I I do not think Dak deserves the heat that he gets. You know, I thought he was really solid. It's not his fault that that defense was completely trash against Green Bay. Yes, Dak threw a pick six. He didn't help any, but that defense, they weren't ready to play that game. They knew that their defensive coordinator was taking the job this upcoming season, which he did. He's at the commanders now, head coaching spot. So there was just too much going on, you know, behind the scenes that were distractions. And then you got what Dalton Schultz said about the zoo that's going yeah. on, you know, like, like, you know, it's just a circus. It's a circus in Dallas. So if you're Saquon or if you're Derek Henry, why do you want to be a part of that? Cause both of those guys have been to teams are on teams now that are way closer than the Cowboys were, or at least have been in the last five years. You got uh, Ravens going to the AFC championship game. You got Philly going to a super bowl. So People are starting to really buy yeah. into this Dak Prescott narrative of he can't win the big game, which I do think a part is unfair. But with the circus that you got with Jerry Jones going on, like I don't want to be a part of that if I'm a big time. Yeah, player. well, nobody wants to be a part of it. But if you're a professional and they're paying you checks, go do your business. That 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 shouldn't hold you up from when it's game time and you got to make a tackle or be in the right spot. You have to do those things. You got your surroundings. You got to be able to adapt to your surroundings. You know it's a zoo. You know when you get there as a player, this is this is what it's about. It's not about us. It's about Jerry. But you're you're good enough on the field to win 12 games for the last three years. Then you're good enough to win playoff games. That's on you. You know what the circ. You know what the circus is. That's that guy right there who pays the checks. But he's still paying the checks. So go do your job. I mean that that whole thing about. You know, Dalton Schultz saying it's a, it's not like that everywhere. Well, no, it's not like that everywhere. It's probably not like that anywhere that's like in, in with the Dallas Cowboys. That is a zoo. But you need to understand that zoo pays you to be a football player. And you can't come up against Green Bay and say, you know, because of the culture, I can't make this tackle today. <laughs> what kind of shit is that? You get a paycheck, make the tackle. Hey, hey because of this culture, I'm going to throw an interception. And it's going to be all right. No, it's not all right. But as a, if you're a roster player, when you see your owner basically influencing the circus, you think that it's okay. So you start doing out of character stuff like Michael Parsons. He's always talking this podcast. He's always talking, saying stuff on um, his opinion of what happened the previous week. And not only that with the Cowboys, he's talking about everybody. Like, yes, I get we're in a podcast world, new media and stuff, but. Draymond Green, in a way, deserves it. He's won four championships. I, I let Draymond Green say what he has to say, and he's flat out crazy, so it makes sense. Michael Parsons, you individually have done a lot, but as a team, you haven't done nothing, bro. No. So sometimes when you say things, it's like, dude, maybe you should just keep quiet right now. But Jerry, no. he's on the radio every week. And you're right. You do need to come in and do your job. But not yes. everybody's like Dion and Michael Irvin to where yes. they were partying and stuff, but still coming in at like 5 a.m. doing extreme workouts and shit. Like yes. it's CD Lamb's mama hadn't played a down for the yeah. Cowboys, but she's talking like she's a part and part of the ownership of that. Man, just do your business. Tell your family this is my job. You guys gotta get out of my business. Don't if you want to talk to other people within the family, that's fine. But don't get out there on social media because. You're affecting my job. That's what that's just what I do for a living. Love you, mom, but you ain't got to be saying what what they don't do for my son. That son, he ain't 15 years old anymore. This guy makes millions of dollars, had a great season, and now you're talking. What else can they do for your son? There's right. nothing else they can do. They, he can't get 20 more catches. He's got enough. He's doing his job. But you don't have to talk about. Let the team guide the team. Let the let. I mean, Micah Parsons. I, I I think he's a great player. I think he talks too much. Like he gets on his podcast and all that stuff. And when other people's brothers and sisters start 
involving themselves in your business. I'm like, damn. They're all like that. Like Dax brothers, they're always talking. You know what I'm saying? Like you just mentioned CD's mama, which she's definitely out of line for what she said about Dak. And yeah, Michael Parsons too. Like they all do it because they think that's the norm. Like, because Jerry's doing it. Like if Jerry was upstairs, we'd be like, hey, we're going with a New England Patriots mindset. We're not saying nothing. Our head coach is saying one word answers when he's on the podium, like Belichick used to do. And hey, we're just going to go out of they have good they, they have good enough players despite the culture. Do you know what I'm saying? If they can win 12 games a year despite the culture, they have good enough players that need to just look at themselves in that locker room and say, hey, we can't let Green Bay walk up and down the field. On, you know, they had a, a, a chance to get the running back from Green Bay, and they let that pass up. They should have taken it. I'm like, why wouldn't you take that dude? That oh, your Vikings got him. He's from, he's from Texas. Why don't you – what are you guys doing? Sleeping? Take that guy. Get him on your team. He's destroyed you. Yeah. And he's from Aaron, your home state. Yo, Aaron Jones, he must have said something about somebody's mama when he was busting the Cowboys' ass in that playoff game. He must have been talking, talking shit. shit. <laughs> yeah. He's he must have said something back. out of pocket. He's the first running back you should have talked to. Yeah. When it was time for him to, to go. You're right. He must have said something that somebody went back and said, we don't ever want this guy on the team. <laughs> we don't want him. His mom uh, – He's talking about our moms and stuff. Because that guy would have been the first guy. If I'm the running back coach, he's the first. I'd have gone up to Jerry. I said, that dude, if he's a free agent, that's the first guy we need to make a phone call to. He's from Texas. He's kill us every time he steps on the field. Let's bring him with us. Because we don't want to play. We don't want to play somewhere else against him. He's probably talking about Jerry's new daughter that's trying to get that money. (laughs) Circus, man. Dude, sometimes you can't let the culture – you can't let the culture bring you down, you know? I what? Mean, what what, what dad, culture? Because your dad was a crackhead doesn't mean you have to be a crackhead. Amen. I mean, you got to – sometimes you got to beat the culture, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what? what's the problem then, in your opinion? Like what – because obviously they're not doing anything in free agency. They're betting on the draft. I'm hearing Jonathan Brooks name a ton with the need in the running back room, and I – like that for Jonathan Brooks because he'll be close to home, Hallettsville kid. But also, I don't want Jonathan Brooks to be caught up in that, that dude is environment. No, that guy, you don't know what you're getting with him right now coming off a knee. Well, does he play later in the year? Because they're talking about him being ready for, for the beginning of training camp. I'm not taking that chance with him. I think he's too good of a football player to do that. I'm letting his knee really, really heal up the way it should heal up, not rushing him to play. And, and practices in the, in, in the at fall camp, there's not a chance. I don't, you know, this is the NFL. You think they hit in college? He's not going to be able to shake and bake some of those guys like he did in college. Coming off a knee with a reconstructed knee, uh, uh-uh. uh, that's not. Now I know there's there's other picks I can get. The latter part that I can get him, great. I don't know. I I got I, the, the Cowboys need some other stuff in that second round to take a guy with a knee. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, if he's around, in the, if he's around in the third or the fourth, yeah. But I'm not wasting my second. I'm not. I'm not meaning it's wasted because it's him. I'm just saying I need a guy who's coming in to play as my second round pick, because you know they're not taking him in the first round. They're, I mean, yeah. he's a second round guy. He's still a. By the way, he's still a running back, even if he's healthy. I mean, there's not Gibbs and Bijan Robinsons out there like last year. You're not gonna see two guys at that position go in the first round. They'll be going. They'll go be going in second and third. So. For him coming off a knee, I wish he'd still be around in the third. I don't know if he'll be there, but I, that's a route where I'd be looking at him. My second round pick can be on a guy who I'm not going to see. There's a possibility of me not seeing any anything from him for the whole year coming off a knee because those some of those guys just don't come back the right way. I mean, they already all they have to do is look at Michael Gallup and look at that dude how he's coming off in a knee and he and he's not getting it that often. He's making cuts, but. A guy at running back is getting it a lot. You're turning around and handing him off and expecting him to make moves. Michael Gallup's out there in open space and still dragging his leg around, you know? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. That's a good point, you know. If Jonathan Brooks, I mean, Cowboys, that'd be a lot to put on him because Cowboys window, it's closing, but it's still barely open. I mean, again, the NFC is that weak that they could make a Super Bowl run if they just get over the hump and all the pieces fit where they may. But 
Yeah, they got guys getting over the offensive line. They got guys, you know, I know Smith when he's playing, and he's playing at 100%. There's, there's not many guys better than that guy, even at his age. But I'm not expecting him. I'm expecting him to miss five games next year. I'm always expecting him to miss five or more games because someone's going to come up with a hip flexor or a thigh or something. He's just old. He's got a lot of wear and tear on his body. So, so when he's healthy, he's good. But, shit, I need somebody who's going to give me 11, 12 games, you know. I, I just don't – certain guys, I just don't expect that from – then they have to do some of the offensive line. They got to do something to stop the run, you know. Yeah, Bander, you know, Banderesh. BK believes he's going to retire. That he's the next guy out of here that's going to retire because of his neck and his back and stuff. That he can't because he's always going to have that that neck, you know, that weak neck. So think of him. You're, you're getting, you know, the kid from UT, and he's coming off a knee at the linebacker position. Mm-hmm. They better find some real linebackers to play. Yeah, they just signed Eric Kendricks, who played with the Chargers this past year and played with the Vikings a few years ago. Paul good player. Was a great player. Yeah, he, he had some good years where he was a top 10 linebacker in the league, uh, probably a guy who made a Pro Bowl a couple of seasons. But now I think he's at the end of his career and right. being elite. And I think the Chargers just let him go. Like, I don't think the Cowboys really have to do anything to go after him. So that that's at least some leadership. And I think I'd take Eric Kendricks over Van Der Esch at this point, especially. Yeah, well, they Hulk. missed Van Der Esch last year. They missed that guy yeah. when he was hurt. You know, he was starting to get around. He's a physical guy. But once again, playing that position with a bad neck, mm, yeah. that, that's a tough sled for him because I know he's going to get hurt. Well, your boy Mozzie Smith, their first round pick, interior lineman from Michigan, is losing too much weight. Like he can't can't even be over three hundred pounds. They keep saying he's like in the two nineties and he's lighting the ass and he ain't taking cheaters. Like taking cheaters on your team. Leave that Michigan group alone. Quit drafting guys from Michigan. Those cheaters. Now they just they just signed Lewis to a one year deal back there in the secondary. They needed him. They need they needed that security blanket because he can play a couple different positions. But that's just a one year deal. And I thought he started to get pretty good, you know, in the secondary. He's not great, but in a pinch for a couple games, he can do, he'll do. They're going to get Diggs back, you know. They'll get they'll get him back. So, but quit taking these guys out of Michigan, please. Yeah, what do you mean? I, I don't get that. What are you talking about? Aiden Hutchinson's a dog, it, edge rusher for the Lions. He's he play for the Cowboys. They didn't get him. I don't want they plus they know where the plays are going. They cheat. Oh my gosh. Hey, that's a national championship for Jim Hardball, who's now in Los Angeles, man. I I'd do a little sign stealing too if the horse could get them one. Nothing really happened. You know what I'm saying? And nothing's gonna happen to them for a while either. Yeah, ain't nothing gonna happen. If you have to do that, Steve Sarkeesian and allow, you know. <laughs> Allow AJ Milwe or Pete Kukowski to coach Jeff Banks for four games for a national championship. I think Longhorn fans will take that. Steve Sarkeesian ain't messing with his money. He makes too much money now. He ain't having none of it. His coach is staying at home. He may not even go recruiting. There is going to be none of that. There's not going to be any of that hanky panky with that guy's money. His wife's not going to let you mess with that money at all. That's true. That, you're not messing with that money. There's not going to be any chances of him doing anything. You know, slippery and creepy. He's gonna be checking everybody's NIL papers. He's gonna be checking them himself. He'll bring in the paperwork right in front of him. I want to know where every bit of that money is going right now because he's making too much right now. Or no, he's not. He's making what he deserves to be making. Hey, and he's gonna mess with it. Hey, like I told Chip. Okay, sorry, you might deserve this. It's win or bust this year. If you don't win a national championship, it's a bust season. At this point, this whole you made a college football playoff last year. Your quarterback's coming back. You're getting paid national championship money. I expect you to win the whole thing this year. The whole thing. You I get don't. paid too much. I don't. If I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll get into the playoffs with those four teams. But I'm not. I'm not thinking this is a. Well, they'll win the national championship. That that loss of those guys at wide receiver. I don't care how good the guys that are coming in. I don't care if they played – hey, they played at Houston. Let's not forget that. Dude played at Houston, okay? What, what does that mean? It, it means 
He played at Houston. That's what oh, it means. Come on. No, come no. On. That, that wide you receiver. just talked about Puka Nakua with the um, with the Rams. He was at BYU. He was one of the best wide receivers. Oh, in the yeah. NFL. oh you can give me some BYU guys. I expect them to be good against Texas. <laughs> I mean, I expect them to come to Texas and be good if they're BYU guys. But Houston, come on now. I just want – and the kid from Alabama, well, he just started to get good toward the latter part of the season. He wasn't knocking it out of the park in the beginning of the season. Jalen Milrow was throwing balls into the stand. And then all of a sudden now this kid is catching 31-yard passes, fourth in a million uh, against, you know, against teams. It wasn't like he was doing that all year long. So I know these are nice gets, but you just lost a lot at the wide receiver position at Texas. You're losing first or second-round draft picks in the NFL. So that's that's those are big losses. They have to do a lot offensively now, I believe. The great thing about them is – that line returns for their third year together. For sure. That is big. I think it's I'm not I'm not I don't think you take a back seat to anybody in the run game. Even in the SEC, you're going to see some some big strong dudes on defense, but your offensive line in 3 years together, how good should they be? Yeah, the only loss. You're not going to get a fourth. You're not going to get a fourth out of that tackle. That guy's going out the door. Oh no, Kelvin Banks, he's gone, but Christian Jones, he'll he'll be in the draft this year. You got to replace yeah. him. With, probably going to be Cameron Williams to do that. So, yeah, they have a pretty experienced offensive line. That's what you need. But, hey, I'm, I guess I'm on that Kool-Aid then because I think you're you're on I'm on that Kool-Aid. There might be a little yak in there too because I, I, that contract is mucking me up, Buck. That, I is. see that money, and I saw what Nick Saban was m- making before he retired, and it's like, Sark, your r- record besides this past season – Ain't that good, bro, going back to Southern Cal and Washington for you to get this money. And if it wasn't for Saban retiring, I don't think he would have gotten that much because he he wasn't necessarily flirting. But if you're his agent, you're flirting with that Alabama gig. Oh, dude, somebody talked to them. You know, somebody somebody talked to them like, hey, CDC, Alabama's calling. We're going to take their call unless if you give us that ching ching and it worked. And, and, and maybe I should think more lines of just not the wide receivers, but they're losing two NFL defensive linemen. You're losing two guys that are going – they're getting drafted in the first round or the second round early. One of them is. One of them going in the first round, maybe in the teens. So well, those dudes are hard to replace. You know, I know you talk about some of the other guys that are back, but those guys, they 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 were just backups, and they play like backups, and that's what they're supposed to be. Now they're supposed to be starters. They should play like starters. But they're not going to be as good as those guys. They're just not. Not those two. You don't replace those guys in a year with just guys who were just okay backups. That Sweat and Murphy, those are that's hard to replace. Two of them, you lose one, okay, but you lose two of those guys. I, so <laughs> I feel you. Alfred Collins, his stats were underratedly good last year for the snaps that he played. Like he he did play backup snaps because T Sweat and Byron Murphy. Sure. But but Bo Davis and Pete Kwiatkowski, they were rotating guys. And Alfred Collins coming back for that fifth year, will he finally make that jump like we saw with Trevondre Sweat and Byron Murphy? That's to be determined. Yeah. I do think they have a chance. That's why new offensive or excuse me, defensive line coach Kenny Baker coming in, he has a lot of pressure put on him. Like, talk about a lot for a 37-year-old dude coming from the Dolphins and before that, Western Kentucky and stuff. Like, yo, you got a ton of pressure on you because if you're not – if your defense line isn't that good, and I expect Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke on the edge, along with, you know, throw Anthony Hill down there at times. Let's see what Colin Simmons could do. They brought that kid from UTSA in, uh, Trey, Trey Moore. I think he could yeah. be pretty good. Like, I, I think they could be solid as a whole. But, yeah, Trevondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, which this dude Byron Murphy, he shouted out um, Aaron Donald on retiring, and then he said, I'm next. He put that out on his Instagram, which so this was a comparison. Bold. That is a little bold, but that hey, that's the comparisons he's getting for a lot of these scouts and stuff when it comes to the body type and you know just what you've seen in college, like Byron Murphy. It's bold, but hey, you have to have some confidence in yourself, and he definitely doesn't lack that. But yeah, by the way, yeah. this this SEC is tougher than the Big Twelve, and for yeah. for, for for this group 
to me, it's it, it will be over the next couple of years. I, I, I want to see how they progress over the next three years. You know, I you know, with with the, the college football playoffs being expanded, yeah, the SEC is going to get three teams in probably. They're going to get theirs. You know what I'm saying? They're going to find a way to get theirs. Can you be one of those teams would be great for me. But in, but a natty, I'm not I'm not thinking of that next year. I think there's still um, some things that they have to do. They're recruiting. They're going to have the same guys that the Bamas and the Georgias are getting on the defensive line. I think Sark now is going to get those guys. He's going to be in the house. He's in the household of a guys from Alabama before, getting players from Alabama to come to Texas. But now you're actually in the SEC. I think they're recruiting. They'll get the best of the best in Texas. But now they can go to the Atlanta area where Georgia goes, and they don't have to go very far, Georgia. I think now you're going to see Texas in those homes of kids that want to play defense and play on the defensive line. That's what I'm going to see. But I don't think – I think just such a transition from Big 12 to SEC in one year. And, yeah, you got your quarterback coming back. Yes, I talk about the offensive line, you know, coming back for the third year in a row. I don't, like I said, I don't think they take a back seat to the run game. I don't care who it is they're running against. These guys in this offensive line – and these running backs ought to be able to run over guys and through guys. And Sark will, you know, he'll find some plays that he has to do in the passing game. But I just don't know on that defensive line to lose those two dudes that, that you got a bunch, a couple backups that play to the level of what they played at. I mean, I know who you're thinking of. I don't know. I don't think that guy plays to that level. I've been waiting. We all been waiting. I don't think that's Alfred hard. Collins. That's just hard for me to imagine that guy turning it into hey. that. You know, because – that and and the, and the rotations they did, I've always said this about Sweat, you never saw that guy tap out and say, I need to be out. Then they rotate him and it's smart to do, but that guy never wanted out of a game. That dude wanted to play every down. I mean, he was an animal. The run game, the pass game, he's running guys down sideline to sideline, and you never see him begging with his hands, you know, on his thigh pads going, please get me out of here. And it was hot as hell last year, but he just wanted to play. Now, they did a good job of rotating and bringing in the other guy. But that guy, when he came in as a rotator, he was okay. He wasn't devastating. Even when he had some fresh air standing on the sideline, he didn't come in there and devastate anybody. You're not going to tell me that guy was devastating as a pass rusher. He was better than he was before, and that wasn't saying much. Yeah. I don't have that kind of faith. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice or three times, shame on me. <laughs> Fool me four or five years, shame on me then. Yo, man. I'm, just gonna wait and see. I'm not going to say he's not all that. I'm just going to wait and see. Because as long as he's got the body to do it, he should, going into this time, he should be able to do it. So I'm hoping that works out. The I'm measurements just, are through the roof. Like we're six, oh. five, the body type, like Alfred Collins, like GMs, they are, you know, foaming at the mouth. For Dude, he had that come out of high school. He walked off the high school bus looking like that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but you, you know, you can't be the ten man. You got to have a heart, and you got to, you got to get there and want to be the guy that's not coming out of the game. You want to be the guy that, you know, rips somebody's head, helmet off their head and throw it up in the stands. You got to have that kind of passion. This is the year that it's going to put be put on him to do it. And it does it matter when it happens? Everybody would have loved to have seen it happen before, but if it happens. It's great going into the SEC with that guy if it happens this year. It is. Yeah. But my expectations, it's going to be very, very much the same guy. Maybe a little bit better, but you need a lot bit, lot, bit, lot bit better now going into the SEC. So that's why I give it – give me two or three years as you go on. But with the next team going in there, you're going to have that opportunity because you're Texas if you win a bunch of games. But boy, this the schedule is awesome. Having Florida come here and Georgia come in here, week in, week out, this is going to be wonderful for this football team and for this football program and for the fans. Yeah, I can't wait. In every sport, it's going to be popular. I know. Like, Dude, I'm, so waiting, popular. I'm waiting for Zay. I'm waiting for June because that's when Sark does all that great recruiting. Mm -hmm. I'm. Just, I mean, people are sitting around talking about the football season and spring ball in two days. Recruiting is a season for Sark. What he does in the month of June. It's like I'm waiting for June to see who are these guys that he just rip off from, for somebody that thought they had a chance in getting. They said, nope, we're going to Texas. Nice. He doesn't lose many in June. Yo. He gets the best guys in June. And that's the, that's the time when I was used to getting ready to go on vacation. I wasn't recruiting nobody's ass in June. Well, nobody in football was doing that. And he's made 
he's made something special out of that, he and his staff. So that's the next big day for me is June. That whole month is going to be interesting. Yeah, Steve Sarkeesian's had some really good flips. If you count Ant Hill coming from and them oh, yeah. or, you know, Colton Vosick going from Oklahoma to Texas. You go back from Xavier Worthy, Michigan to Texas. Like he's had some really good flips. And the city of Austin speaks for itself. The fact that sure. the culture has completely changed. Like you could believe in what Sark's doing. You know, sure. like it's obvious. You see it from the development standpoint. You see it from the rest of the coaching staff and how they just interact with their players and their position groups. And now you're playing in guys in the NFL, which that's one of the biggest deals. Like you want to see guys play on that next level and have a chance to get drafted and be something in the professional ranks. And this year, more than anything, like Texas showed out in the combine from Xavier yes. Murphy, JT Sanders, Adonai Mitchell, Byron Murphy, Travondre Sweat, which brings me to this question, but because you mentioned Travondre Sweat's motor on how he didn't want to come out of games. And I think that is going to hurt him in the draft because you could say, oh, he was interchanging with guys. So him at 366, we haven't seen him be an every down guy. But do you I think believe he's going to go? I believe he's going to go into camp at, at 340 something. I know that's going to be hard for him because I don't even know how the hell he showed up at the combine at 366 because everybody told him he needed to lose, lose weight. That dude just couldn't lose weight. He's just going to be a big man forever, and they're going to have to find him every week. They're going to put a, a weight limit on him, and you know he's going to get on a scale once a week, and they're going to go to his page. He's going to take his check, write it out, and hand it over to the team because they that's what they do. They I mean, they, he can't come in there weighing. You know, if he weighed 366 when he left here, that dude was playing at 375. <laughs> you know he wasn't playing in no 360. Some guy's playing 375, 380. They just didn't want to say that. Because everybody's saying how he's got to lose weight. That guy moved pretty good. But the NFL people, they – you belong to them now. They pay you real checks. And when they want you at a certain weight and you can't get there, you pay them back. No. And they're going to look at you and they're going to say, yeah, you played pretty good in the pros that way. But I need you for about eight more downs during the course of a game. So we need you at this weight. Don't tell me what you can do at, at – at 375, 380, here's where we want you, or you write us a check. That's a part of our deal. And that dude is going to be doing this once a week because he ain't coming down but so far. He'd maybe like to be at 340 – at three. Um, I keep saying 340-something. He'd like to be at 350-something. <laughs> that, that that's going to be hard on him. Sometimes it's just hard on a big man, you know? How is it hard? What do you mean? Stop eating – all the junk. Stop eating all the grease. You don't have to eat that extra slice of bacon that's there. You don't you have, have to have eat that to. extra three slices of pizza. Yes, you do. A big man has to eat. Uh, but he can eat clean. Like, he can eat a lot of things clean, like fish and, you know, just unseasoned. Give me another pound of fish. Stuff. Screw that. Give me another three slices of pizza with anchovies and, and some pepperoni. Give me some. Here, okay, throw some mushrooms on that. Pepperoni. Oh, man. He needs to you see how good Trey Elling looks where he can jump up and spike the ball when he plays volleyball. He needs to eat clean like Ronald. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And he can Ronald get to that. Bad, Ronald got a bad hit from digging in the sand or whatever it is. No. I mean, they're gonna tell him, hey, here's what we want you to show up at camp. We want you to show up at 352. That guy's gonna look at them and just start <laughs> laughing. He said, I'm showing up at 360. Okay, I may lose two pounds. I'll throw, I'll show up at 364 and I'll be laughing at y'all. I'm not showing up at 350. What are you crazy? It's a long, hot summer. I got to get to Popeyes. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> oh, Popeyes? No, man. Ain't no way. Ain't no way he should be eating not that showing right up now. To salad bar. The guy's Dude, showing up at Popeyes. My man, Rondre Sweat, listen to me, bro. You have a long time after football to eat what you want. I still wouldn't recommend it because you're thinking about living long as long time. as possible, yes. you know, having those arteries clogged and shit. But I can't – come on, man. Like, he could be great. I don't want – we had Casey Hampton on on Monday. Casey was saying the same thing. He was like, yeah, I was the best at 315, 320. 
And it was like I was a little slow and a little flat footed at 350, but that was towards the end of the He's at 350. I was around here when, when Casey was here, so I saw him play at 350. Hell, I never he was thought 350 he was when he played. I know he's he was. Any, I know he's anything but 350. <laughs> I saw his little round belly, but he can move, man. You talking about a guy in a short area that could move and strong and 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 just get under and get leverage on you. Wow, was he good? Yeah, he was. He said awesome. that. He said that he was in like the three tens when he was at Texas. Shit, that guy was seventeen pizzas better than that, and that's what Sweat's gonna be. I'm gonna meet him at Popeyes on before the games and stuff. That guy is gonna. Come that on, guy ain't man. losing any weight. That guy's gonna pay about three hundred thousand dollars in fines during the course of the year. They ain't gonna even tell you, but he's gonna have a little box, a little drop box at the office here. He's going to get on the scale, and then he's going to drop a check in the drop box and still play good. You know, uh, he's still going to play good. I need him to get drafted by a place where the food's not, you know, the focal point of the city. Or he needs like, to go to Seattle where he's eating a bunch of seafood. Yeah, something like that where, you know, they take pride in eating clean. Because one of the worst things that could have happened to Zion Williamson was get drafted in New Orleans. Oh my that, 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 that was bad. That was, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, if you're trying to drop that weight. Eats everything, tables, chairs. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad move for him. So I, I want Trevondre Sweat. Like, it, it needs to be a lot easier. He doesn't need to be – I mean, Kansas City would sound good just because of the franchise and they take care of him, but he don't need to be around all that barbecue and stuff. Like, Austin – of course he's not going to lose any weight in Austin. You kidding me? No. Look at the sponsors that we have on here. Cover threes, things like that, like Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Like, those places are amazing. If so, you go there every day, which they probably have some great health choices, but, hey, you can go pick out at both of those spots. That dude isn't – he's not going to training table looking for health choices. He's going to training table on that canvas looking for meat, beef. He's looking for ribs. He's looking for sauces. He ain't looking for salads on campus. He, he's got all – that training table, they got all kinds of great choices. His choices aren't what they they shove out there to him. His choices are stuff that he goes like slams it on the plate. No, slamming it down. Man. No. I can't have that for my man T-Sweat. He's too good. He's too talented to get hit by weight problems, man. He, he, has, to, he has to fix something. Yeah, his bank account's going to fix it. I'll tell you. When they when that when it's one price one week and it's the next break if you're two weeks over no it, you'll see they don't play that mess hell they find you for your socks being pulled down and, or pulled up and stuff you know how it is in the NFL yep. they try to get their money back somehow from you they ain't not getting it all but they, if they got a chance to get some of it you go late for a meeting like one minute and see what that's like you know twenty thousand dollar fine thirty thousand dollars yeah it hurts for a meeting. You get late. Yeah, man, they find you for everything. Well, I mean, I understand that, but don't you get some grace? Like, okay, one time, that's a warning. Yeah, your that's name is time. Tom Brady. Tom Brady and Aaron Donald get that grace time. Them other dudes just coming to the league, they don't get none of that. No, they're paying. They're paying back a lot early. Yeah. You, if you get good, then you probably get a little grace. Yeah. Unless you're with Tom Coughlin, you can get no grace, period. Ask Michael Strahan what that was like when he was with Tom Coughlin. He's like, damn. He said, I had to be five minutes before the meeting starts sitting in my seat. He said, if I came on time, I felt like I was late. But, yeah, I mean, they get their money back. They don't play. Man. All right, but let me tonight. Ask, let me ask you about – yeah, let me ask you about the, the NBA real quick. Oh, Warriors yeah, go gonna make it, the Warriors going to make it? Oh! It's going to be tough. I mean, they're sitting at the 10th spot right now. They're in the play-in, and if the playoffs or playing started today, they would face the Lakers, which that's a coin flip. You know, you never know who's going to win that game. But Nixon, Brunson, they're making it? Oh, yeah, they're making it. They're making it. That is a very, very solid ball club. Well, that's a pain in the ass group they could be. They're fun to watch, man. They're fun to watch. Jalen Brunson, he had another 40-point game last night, and – He's so good. Like I, the Mavs, Mark Cuban. It's a big reason why he sold this team because he knew, hey, I got this wrong. I already traded Tyson Chandler after we won the championship, yep. and 
He thought that bringing in Kyrie, which Kyrie's had an underrated season, average of 25 points per game, but yeah. Kyrie's an injury-prone guy, and plus he could be a head case depending on the weather and how he feels at the moment. You just never know. He's unpredictable. I don't yeah. think he's going to be like that anymore because I think he's tarnished his name a little bit too much. I think Kyrie's going to be on this best behavior here on out. But Jalen Brunson, at this point of his career, with how young he is, he hasn't even entered his prime yet while Kyrie's in his 30s. So for the long right. run, he should have went with Brunson for a pretty good deal at that moment for what yeah. he was. Like he would have been overachieving if he would have been given the Mavs what he's given the Knicks now. So Yeah, because the Knicks, they're going to have to pay him a whole lot of money. And they'll have yeah. a whole lot of money for him. He is yeah. a to watch. Right. So, you know, Josh Hart, those Villanova guys, DiVincenzo. The problem is their coach is Tom Thibodeau, who Tom Thibodeau is. He's still, trying to, play de- he's still trying to play defense. Yeah, but he's known for playing his guys like 42 minutes a game, 45 minutes a game. Like it's just it, it's not it's not good for the longevity of the season. You got to be able to balance stuff out. Like Jalen Brunson will get 40 something. Hart will get 40 something. And he used to do that with his Timberwolves teams or with Derrick Rose and those Chicago Bulls teams, which a lot of people blame him for the reason Derrick Rose got injured in the first place. Cause he was logging in too many minutes when the Bulls already were a number one seed and already made the playoffs. But that's Thibodeau. That's his way or the highway. And we'll see if that affects the Knicks. But, yeah, they're fun to watch. They're sitting at that fourth spot right now. And, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll see what happens in the playoffs. Like, if it started today, they would play Orlando, which, hey, shout out to the Magic. Paolo Bencaro, Franz Wagner, they got some really good pieces over there. They also play a fun brand of basketball. So, yeah, the NBA's NBA's going tonight. At the Moody Center, the Spurs are in town playing the defending champs, Denver Nuggets. That's probably going to be an ugly game, but Austin fans are going to get to see the San Antonio Spurs and Victor. It's the home of the Big 12 Women's Championship. That's right. Oh, That's right. Big Schaefer and the ladies got it done. Big Schaefer. God bless. God bless. (laughs) Sometimes he's as corny as corny can be. But he's consistent with his corniness. He just gets it done, man. He gets after them. They'll win a game. And I'm thinking, Coach, they won the game. You're on them. They won the game. You know, you realize you can't win it. Yeah, they can't win them all. But relax. They may have played back, but relax. But you know what? He's consistent with the way he goes. And that's fine. I mean, that's – I was telling people, that's all you can ask from a coach or a player or anybody. Just be consistent. If you you think they play like shit, they play like shit. But when they're they're good – Every once in a while, you got to say, hey, nice job. Yeah. You know? And, hey, we didn't play that good, but we won. That's all right. You can say that every once in a while. Hey, but we won. We right. won the game. But, man, yeah. sometimes during the season when they were – when they won some tough games and he was on them, I'm like, damn, coach. Did you forget yeah. that game? They did win that game? Yeah. Like, it's – if you're a male coach in women's basketball, it takes a lot to win me over because, hey, we as men, we already take enough jobs from women and stuff and don't give them opportunities here and there. So you better be good. You know, Gino yeah. Ariema, you earn my respect. Vic Schaefer, you earn my respect. Like the way that those ladies respond to that yes. tough criticism, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like he, he does a great job of balancing being hard on those ladies and then, like, tearing up and, like, showing his emotional oh, Yeah, he'll show there. it to them, yeah. He'll show it to them, yeah. And then you saw Rory Harmon having her arm around him and stuff like that, and her head on his shoulder. Like, they love the guy. He yeah, because I can imagine him. some of the things he says to the media are different than what he says to the ladies in the locker room. Yeah. He, he'll tell them how that was a great win. We needed that win. We didn't play that good. But when he gets to the media, he's like, I need to get the money back. To see, to see. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't give no money back. We we embarrassed the university. You, you better keep that money while you can keep it. Oh, not giving him that money, man. Yeah, I mean, he's different, yeah. he's different, but he's consistent. I, I like the way he coaches. When he, I like the consistency in him. I do. I think they're, and I think they got a chance to go some places too this year. Now, they don't want to be facing my girl down there in LSU. What you mean? Yeah, that's right. Her hot-headed ass. She got problems, man. 
What? She, she got issues. Come on. She was talking she about issues. What do you mean was, issues? Because she was talking about, oh, I wish old Cardozo, the girl that pushed Johnson, the big girl from South Carolina, why didn't she go do that to Angel Reese? Push really the button to old size. Like, what? What does that mean? What is, she, what is she trying to say there? It sounds like a guard. Like, she used to play guard in college. She was an ankle biter. Because she doesn't, she like, she's like, pick on somebody your own size. Flage Johnson just elbowed the girl. Oh, big girl, Cadozo. She was coming to protect her teammate. Like, it wasn't Knocking like she just went up and knocked ground. her out. She's trying to take her out, man. Don't talk about Kim Mulkey not knowing what she's doing. You know, she knows exactly what's going on. Oh, I'm not liking her fashion style lately, though. It's been oh, bad. Man. She's, she's got out. Yeah. She's got to pull back a little bit. I'm like, what's that's not that's not enough. I need more feathers. I need more of that. That's the last thing we need is more Kim Mulkey fashion. No, he and, and the, like I said, as more as as much as Don Staley can put on the mean look, I said, you better not mess around with Kim Mulkey because it'll be on. She'll be missing toes. Kim Mulkey go right down there and take them toes off. Don Staley's got a mean face. You know, she can put on a mean face. Oh, yeah. She's tough. She's tough. Both of them were point guards back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Don Mulkey. Staley said the right things. Kim Mulkey, come on. Have some class, Kim. She will go switchblade on you, Kim Mulkey. Yeah. You know she's that. A she's a thug. <laughs> switchblade she's a thug. On you. She's a thug. All right. We're about to wrap this up but before that we gotta give a shout out to the sponsors relax back top oh, gun yeah. big hat spirits cover three olipop apple leasing bet us woods ac and conditioning 7-eleven syntax tickets brain vault audio visual consultations top that's right, Salt Traders, All Stat Brewery. And I usually do Covert B Cave Bug, but you could probably do it a lot better yeah, than I, I can. Tell the people about them. 42 wonderful acres out there, seven di different brands of, of cars and trucks. They've been doing it since 1909. They are absolute folks, the very best. And nobody beats a Covert deal. Not now, not ever. Not ever. Moonshine, right. Patrick, Martin Grill, I'm loving that. I'm going to go, I'm going to probably try to get over to Jack Allen's and get some. Hey, it's Friday, fish night. Oh, geez. You know, I have not had any during this lentil season. I have not had any catfish. I haven't gone to the – I have not gone – I have not had catfish. I've what's been wrong eating, with you? Been, well, what's wrong with me is filet of fish sandwich. What's wrong with you? What do you mean oh, what's wrong gross, with me? Man. Fresh she needs to not be on fish. That doesn't make any sense. That's the nastiest thing I've know. ever heard of in my life. I, I've never thought of that before. I've never <laughs> – when I when I taste that wonderful fresh cod from Maine that they bring in, and BK said, "Yeah, Maine or that's where it's from, <laughs> Maine or Maine or." Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I bite into that fillet of fish with that tartar sauce, that is a little weird with the cheese. A little that throws me off just a bit. But I jam down the fries as many fries as I do in a bite. I just shove it all in my mouth at one time. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give me a fillet of fish sandwich tonight. Oh come on, man! Yeah, come forget on. all that. Yeah. I saw. I met your lovely wife for the first time at Brad Kellner's birthday party the other day. I get why you be hot and stuff. It makes sense now. I get why you be hot and stuff. It makes <laughs> sense. Mom, yeah. like, what the fuck? Gotta hide the ice cream flow. What's but? Yeah, she don't play. She look like no. she don't play. So no. You know what? Now that you said that, I'm gonna go down there and demand I get some of. Her her birthday cake from like three weeks ago that's been in the freezer. She gave me a freezing cake. I'm going, I'm demanding that I get some of that cake tonight. What kind of cake is it? It's delicious, man. It's a, it's a wonderful cake made by Christy over at Cakes Rocks. Ah. And that thing's been sitting in the freezer since her birthday. It was on the 17th of February. You yeah. know what it is? Damn near April now. That cake's got to come out. BK telling me to thaw that cake out and take it to the homeless or watch them grab at that cake and just shove it in. <laughs> don't like, take it to the homeless. If you're luck, don't take it to the homeless. Thaw that thing out and enjoy it later on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm going to do, Zay. I'm going to do that. How's everybody? How's your family? Your wife doing good? Champ's doing good? Yeah. Uh, everybody's good. CC yeah. ready for the mullet open? 
Yeah, he's got to get his back right. He might have to have surgery. But oh no, uh, tell him that's the last stop on the bus stop is to have see, surgery, that, and that's where he's at. They're telling them to do different things before he has to go that route. So I think yeah. he's doing physical therapy every day or yeah. however. Everything they save, don't let them get the knife on it. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, I know he wants to play with Chip. Him and him. Him and Chip are partners in the mullet open, so yep. that's going to be fun. But, yeah, we got to get my pops back right. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. That is the last on the stop. When they start digging in there with the knife, like I said, they got to go through the, They got to go through here, here my vocal cords for this other surgery. And when the doctor says it's risky here and she says she don't want to do it, I'm like, Doc, that's fine. Then you don't do it. If you think it's risky, I don't want you in there. I'll yeah. go to Florida. I'll go down to Tampa. Let PK said you're gonna let Florida man do your neck. <laughs> <laughs> but I gotta get it done. He said, Florida man's gonna be the one doing your uh, neck. Yes. It's said, a weird coincidence that Florida allows something that Texas doesn't. I yeah. take that with a grain of salt, but hey, I trust you. You got family in Florida, they probably know some good people. You'll make the right decision. I'm not trusting my daughter to tell me who to go to. I'm trusting my wife. The boss is telling me who to go see. She had oh, the yeah. same deal. She had the same exact deal. We're not even from the same kinfolk. You know what I mean? I don't know how you just have the same deal as your husband. Y'all didn't that come is from odd. Isn't that odd? Yeah. Same exact thing. And it's, mine's is worse. But she went down there immediately. She didn't trust anybody here. Got it done the right way. I trusted some dude who was the plumber to do mine. And now I got to go back down there. <laughs> Now I got the specialist who's here saying, oh, I'm a little worried about that. I'm like, great. I better go somewhere else then if you're a little worried and you're supposed to be a special. That's supposed to be your specialty. Crazy world, Zay, eh? but it's still working. Still working yeah, for me. That's all you could say, man. Absolutely. Just happy to have it going on, brother. Absolutely. Let's get to the right call segment while we got one minute. Um Since you're here, Buck, and you were okay. around when this movie came out, Godfather was released. 52 mm -hmm. years ago. Are you one of those that says Godfather 2 is better than Godfather 1? Or where are you at with the Godfather? I'm one. One has always been the best for me. Yeah. Yeah, man. The original is it. I like I like sequels, and they've had like eight sequels and stuff, but this the one was the best. Really was. Absolutely. But 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 they've all been pretty good. You know, until they got to the latter part of it when Don Corleone and and Michael had Michael's kid and his kid's kid and all that other kind of crap. Nah, the original for me is is good enough. It really is. Yeah, the original is a classic. Having my man find the horse head in the bed and stuff yeah, like that. Just iconic scenes. Like that scream, that's a different kind of scream. I, I probably would have reacted the same way because, hey, man, that horse was around six figures, I think. Oh, yeah. And that time, too. Jones, man, that was the thoroughbred, whatever they call it. And yeah, he found that thing dead. And that kind of set the tone for the whole movie. I kind of set the tone in a way. But let's bring on the fellas. Trans hey, look, there's my doctors back again. And Barker's in the house. What's going on? Just What's hanging out with Zay for two hours. That's what I did yesterday. Nonsense. Huh? <laughs> That's what I did yesterday with Zay. Yeah. Trey, how are you doing, my friend? All right. It'll probably take till Sunday to get totally caught back up on sleep, but uh, you make sacrifices this time of year. I'm sleeping in tomorrow till 7. That's sleeping in is relative to the individual, and that is sleeping in for you. Yeah, it is. BK was like, you call sleeping in till 7, sleeping in? I'm like, yep. That's it. Cause, yes, because my old ass is generally moving around at 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm ready to go. That's, that's just a way of life for the olds. Well, olds don't stay in bed. Huh? Yeah, if you, if you have kids also, it's a way of life. Sleeping in yeah. at 7 o'clock for me too because I'm normally up 6.15, 6.30 on school days. Are you feeling good? How's your health? Everything good? Eh, it is what it is. Oh, see, look at that. Acting all old already. It's supposed to be my doctor. I'm going to Florida to have this surgery done here, man. Going to mm. Tampa. Be careful about going and getting surgeries in Florida. Florida man doing the surgery, you think that's that's questionable? I don't know. I feel like for every A plus doctor out there, but every doctor who got A plus in medical school, there are those uh, C minus guys who 
to uh, reside in Florida. made it through, and I'm guessing there's a larger percentage of C minus doctors in Florida oh. than there are elsewhere. Oh God! In America, all right, boys, listen. Have a great America. weekend, y'all. All be safe. See you on Monday. See you guys. Have a good weekend. Later. Uh oh, Bucky's gonna be in this room until BK, <laughs> if BK is behind the scenes right now, can take him out because I'm having to do this. On my phone for one more day, along with Jeff Barker here on the 3 to 5 show. And, yep, we're going to be dealing with Bucky. You know what? I think I can do it. Can you? I think I can do it. Let's see. Stand by. Boom! Bang! So, last week, I uh, I upgraded the privileges a little bit to play a couple videos when I was on with Joe Cook while you were out doing South by stuff. And look at me now. Well, get ready because you get to stop the stream at the end of today's show too. Oh man, well that that I'm that I'm not sure I know how to do, but you know what? Yeah, you just click you just click in broadcast, and then it asks if you're sure. You click on that, and we'll do that at five o'clock. But that's two hours away. Yeah. How you doing today? Good. How are you doing, brother? I am all right. I didn't have anything to do downtown today, so it was nice to just really kick back and enjoy a little bit of family time this morning. And only have to worry about YouTube shows today. I've got a couple more things for South by Southwest tomorrow, but the festival is essentially winding down now. I was hoping that you would still be like somewhere with your aviators on, like like instead of where is Waldo, where is Trey? Just trying to figure out where where in the world downtown Austin is Trey right now. Yeah, I thought about finding a homeless encampment today and just broadcasting from next to the homeless encampment so that you could see uh hobo shitting in buckets behind me but just well, like... i mean all you have to do in austin is just walk outside and you get that so you yeah, know i don't think well, we need to i don't think we need to help facilitate that for the people it also felt way too ambitious i've been going non-stop pretty much since last friday with a couple of small breaks in between so i was like you know what screw it i'm not even not even gonna make that effort it'll be nice to just get to sit in the comfort of my relax the back chair in the home office and talk to you without any other distractions around. I bet you're looking forward to a nice little weekend. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple more things to do tomorrow. I'm interviewing a musician at Soho House and then one more red carpet that Anne Hathaway is a part of. It's the closing night film that she is starring in in a sort of Mrs. Robinson sort of role where she's the, she's not old, she's in her 30s, but she's dating a younger guy. So Anne needs to brace herself because she's going to enter that pantheon along with, who was it? Anne Bancroft as Mrs. Robinson. And then Diane Lane did a movie a few years ago where she hooked up with a younger dude. So Anne Hathaway's in that category now. This completes the trifecta. And she's, she's going to be in many a young man's fantasy for the foreseeable future. Assuming yes. that this movie is somewhat popular. Is that just her setting up the next phase? Setting up the next decade, two decades of, of acting? Perhaps it is. Perhaps it is. So I just realized that my phone may be running out of battery here shortly, so I'm going to have to figure out how to log into StreamYard from my wife's computer while I am doing that. It's been a big day for wide receivers, Jeff, going from one team to another. Uh, Hollywood Brown signs a one-year deal with the Chiefs. So they have another speedster that Pat Mahomes can throw the football to now and a guy who is more established than anybody else on that roster in terms of wide receivers. And then Keenan Allen, I like this move a lot for the Bears, ends up going to Chicago, refuses to take a pay cut with the Chargers. He is now a Chicago Bear. And man, Chicago has maybe been as active as anybody in free agency so far this offseason. They are looking to make a major upgrade and be a player for a division crown next year in that NFC Central and perhaps push for a Super Bowl run too before it's all said and done. Whether or not it is Caleb Williams or Justin Fields who is the starting quarterback for them next season. Yeah, it's starting to make you think with the Bears that they 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 think they're ready to win now. They feel good enough about that roster right now that with the moves that they've made, going out and getting DeAndre Swift, going out and um, well, they already got DJ Moore. Yeah, now getting Keenan Allen. And I think those are two really good complimentary receivers for whoever's playing quarterback because you have you know the big body uh possession throw it up to him red zone type threat i mean really all around receiver in keenan allen but a little bit of your biggie uh, bigger bodied receiver 
And then you got DJ Moore, who showed what he could do last year. You know, also an all-around receiver, but a little bit smaller guy with more of a uh, more of a speed element to his game. So yeah, those are two really good complementary pieces for, as we said, whoever's going to play quarterback for them, and um, says a lot about what they think of the roster right now. Uh, that they're they're going all in and trying to trying to win this thing right now. And I'm I'm really curious to see what they do. I think we're all assuming that they're going to go get Caleb Williams, but I don't know. Like may, maybe uh. <laughs> Maybe they're going to give it another go with Justin Fields and just try to build this roster up around him. But I think with what's happened already and some of the conversation and chatter around that right now, it feels hard to envision uh, that happening again. And and then you you mentioned Hollywood Brown going to the Chiefs on a one year deal. You know what does that mean for all these rumors about them potentially taking Xavier Worthy with the last pick in the first round? Like they, they- could still do that because it's only a one year deal, and you you know you can never have too much speed. They've already got yeah. Travis Kelsey and, you know, what what he brings to the table at tight end as a pass catcher. And then Rasheed Rice, what he showed this year. But, uh, yeah, you wouldn't think it would totally talk them out of going and getting Xavier Worthy with that first-round pick. Uh, but you just never know. You never know. But they do have a need for weapons on the outside. They were able to win in spite of – Uh, A lack of weapons on the outside. Travis Kelsey getting a year older, too. I do wonder if for some reason mm, Brock Bowers is not going to fall to them at the end of the first round. But I could could foresee them maybe going after a tight end with that second or third round pick. It's why Jatavian Sanders is squarely on the table. He is a, a guy who could definitely carry the mantle for what Travis Kelsey has given them over the last decade now. That would be fun to see in that offense. But I think we saw it last year when the the Chiefs struggled. I mean, the obvious was just all the drops that they had for so long, but they just weren't getting as many chunk plays as they normally do. There weren't as many of those big plays down the field, even some of the ones that, you know, when they lost Tyreek Hill that they were getting initially, but that was, that was, I think probably the most glaring thing for that offense moving forward. I mean, to still be able to go out and work around all that and win a Super Bowl is pretty insane and scary for the rest of the league to say, well, and now what happens when they start to figure that out at receiver and go get some cheaper options like a Hollywood Brown, a guy that they don't need to catch 90 to 100 passes. Yeah. You know, have a couple of big plays, a seven, eight touchdown season. Um, however many plays of, you know, that, that you would like to see from him of over 25 yards. And we know Xavier Worthy can, you know, is more than capable of, coming up with those big chunk plays too, whether it's, you know, a, just a deep ball down the field or even, you know, the screen pass we saw his freshman year against Oklahoma on the first play from scrimmage that he took 75 yards to the house. The one in the big 12 championship game where they were backed up and, you know, he caught a little, I don't know if it was like an out pattern or something. And he just turned that up, almost took it to the house, but got caught at the last second. So yeah, they're probably just looking for more plays like that. And um, obviously Hollywood Brown can, provide that in the near future. And then, you know, maybe Xavier Worthy is a long-term option right there. But I love what you said about Jatavion Sanders. I don't know if he's quite the, you know, physical tight end that Travis Kelsey is, but I think he brings some other things to the table with a little bit more speed, maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, just straight up lateral quickness. So, All right. I'm I'm making a switch real quick, Jeff. I was wondering why I saw a, double tray right there double tray is uh, always a bad thing and now you get a single tray because i'm going to be on the wife's laptop for the rest of today but the good news is i can end the stream at five o'clock the bad news is is this week of fucked up technical shit because i broke my computer will continue for one more day but i uh, went out and had to buy a new computer so it'll be functional by monday that's never cheap no, it was not cheap. And so the family needed a new computer, just generally speaking. And so this. Uh oh. Did the uh, laptop go out on you there, Trey? Well, while you get that, while you get that figured out, my friend, we'll go through some of the headlines from around the sports world right now. Steelers trading Kenny Pickett to the Eagles is an interesting move right there. Yeah. Hours after Russell Wilson officially signs his contract with the Steelers, they trade 
2022 first round pick Kenny Pickett to the Eagles. So an obvious move that that right there they're deciding to go all in on on Russell Wilson. You there, Trey? All right. Well, again, while Trey figures that out, we'll go through go through some of these headlines. We just mentioned it right there. Russell Wilson signed his contract the other day. The Steelers now go out and trade Kenny Pickett to the Eagles. Uh, as we just mentioned a second ago, a true sign that they are they are going to be all in on that Russell Wilson experiment, and the Steelers will receive a 2024 third round pick, two 2025 seventh round picks in exchange for Pickett and a 2024 fourth round pick. So um, ESPN saying the value similar to what the Washington Commanders got from the Seattle Seahawks in exchange for Sam Howell, who was uh, obviously selected in the fifth round two years ago. See what else is going on too while we uh, wait for Trey to work out his technical issues. Panthers, uh, Michael C says the Panthers signing safety Jordan Fuller per Ian Rappaport. Interesting move there. Also, uh, hit me up in the comments with any questions so we can uh, get through this technical issue here until we're able to get Trey back or maybe get get BK on here for a second. Uh, Longhorn fans out there too, not sure if you saw the uh, Denver Broncos with Sean Payton essentially becoming uh, basically an extension of North Austin and the 40 Acres with all the guys that they signed. Uh, signed Malcolm Roach the other day. Saw they signed Brandon Jones, who started his career with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, signed Lil Jordan Humphrey to a contract. They've obviously already got safety PJ Locke on the roster there. So um, interesting move, uh, interesting move from the Broncos to go after that many former Longhorns there. And uh, Roach is an interesting one too because he started his career back in his back in his home state of Louisiana, where he was uh, an undrafted rookie coming out of Texas. Sean Payton gives him his chance. Uh, and I heard him talking about that yesterday, uh, just about how cool that was to get to play there and then reunite with Sean Payton and continue continue his career over there. Yeah. Roy says, burnt orange crush in Denver. Absolutely, Roy. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's quite a few Longhorns, basically – all from the same era on the same exact team. I mean, we've seen a bunch of different guys from the same school go play at go play at different places or go play at the same place in the pros, but across different years where maybe they weren't teammates uh, for for very long in the pros. But uh, some cowboy news as well. Let's see if we can pull this up right here. Cowboys release Leighton Vander Esch and Michael Gallup. I don't think the uh, Vander Esch move was was super surprising because I think there were some rumors out there that he was he was maybe getting ready to retire. Twenty eight years old, uh, dealt with a number of injuries over his his six years with the Cowboys. Uh, obviously had that neck issue that that last season was giving him a bunch of trouble. And I think the uh, Michael Gallup news maybe not all that surprising either. Um, it says the the Gallup decision opened up nine and a half million dollars in cap space this season. Um, but he will count for 8.7 million against that against that salary cap, and uh, yeah, I think that that was one that the Cowboys were were really high on. He had a couple of good seasons early on, and then just never never fully developed into you know maybe that cusp of star receiver that they thought they were going to get a tier two, tier three type of guy. Uh, last season, only 34 catches, 418 yards, two touchdowns. So. Um, yeah, that opens up a spot right there for the Cowboys to go get go get another number two to 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 CD Lamb there as well. And then um obviously a bunch of the moves. Uh let's see what uh Lucas says here. They were tired of waiting. <laughs> they were tired of tired of waiting for uh what Jerry Jones meant by all in. Yeah, we haven't exactly seen that from the Cowboys so far. Trey, we got you back. Let's see. Uh, wait. Trey, 
Trying to oh, add Trey back to the stage. There statue. I am. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you back. Very sorry, dude. About the no, it's all good. It would work, but of course it doesn't because she never updates it. So it uh, it runs very slowly. And this week of technical hell continues. So this happens sometimes. You, you're in broadcasting. You know, sometimes when it rains, it pours. And it is completely pouring on my ability to do technical shit correctly this week. I'll say I'll say this, though. When that when that happens to me in a broadcast, I only have to talk for like two minutes. Maybe maybe a minute top. So, <laughs> yeah, you just filibustered well, for a good five minutes. Oh, there. my Kudos God. You on I, that one. Yeah, I don't even know what I just said, but thankfully I had some people in the comments helping me out with some of the some of the NFL news of the day. It turns well, into also a little been... bit of that Will. It turns into that a little bit of that Will Ferrell bit from old school, where he takes the stage and he rattles off something that sounds really <laughs> smart about some issue. I don't even remember what the issue w- was. And at the end, like after he wins the debate, they're like, "Oh, that's so awesome!" He's like, "What happened? I blacked out." Like when you go into that <laughs> mode. It just turns into a bit of a blackout where you, you were just talking and thankfully you did have the help of the YouTube commenters. But yeah, my apologies and hopefully that's it. The phone is plugged in now and the phone had worked up to this point. The problem was the battery life. The battery life should no longer be an issue. So here we are. Hey, all good. I've, I've done that to you before when the uh, neighborhood spectrum outage hits, hits the great city of Hutto, Texas. That's right. But hey, we get, I mean, we could keep going on some of these headlines. I was just going through some of the different ones here. The Cowboys releasing Leighton Vander Esch and Michael Gallup. Yeah, um, I heard you say not a surprise. It's not a surprise. Vander Esch is apparently a uh, physical designation, so he hasn't been able to pass a physical. So they're releasing him as a result of that. And well, and I, I, Gallup, I saw something a couple of days ago that he was basically probably for that reason just going to retire. Yeah. Not surprising. The guy has been dealing with injury questions since the beginning. Had that neck injury early on that he was able to rebound from. And really erratic play, too, I want to say three years into his career. So he's put together a nice career with the boys. And now that comes to an end, which I think increases the impetus for them to continue addressing the middle of that defense, both in free agency, getting Kendricks like they did yesterday, and now through the draft as well. They're going to be looking hard at interior defensive linemen and inside linebackers too coming up at the end of next month. And with Michael Gallup, man, there was a point that he was Dak Prescott's safety valve. And then unfortunately he suffered that knee injury. And as you said, just hasn't been able to recapture that magic in a bottle since then. Dallas felt confident he could, confident enough that they foolishly traded away Amari Cooper a couple of years ago, and Amari has remained very productive for the Cleveland Browns. It was a huge ripoff deal that they got at the expense of the Cowboys. And Dallas, while they do have C.D. Lamb, hasn't really been able to uh, to figure out that number two wide receiver position just yet. So considering how deep the wide receiver class is in this season's NFL draft, perhaps that is an area where they're looking to grab a guy in round two or three. Maybe even round two, but I feel like Huh? maybe they don't have more pressing needs than that. There are a lot of really talented wide receivers that have that number one wideout potential. Uh, maybe they look at it as a sort of Jamar Chase, T. Higgins situation, and they want to get another dominant guy on the outside to help Dak out. Yeah, Gallup is one of those guys looking at it right now where, where I go, it's wild how long he's been there. Like, he was there six yeah. seasons. And you mentioned that form in, in 2019 where he had the you know, 1,107 yards, six touchdowns, 66 receptions, but never really came that close to that again. I mean, he had the next year in 2020, 59 catches, 843 yards, five touchdowns. So a solid year. I mean, that that's a good two-year stretch, especially from a guy in his second and third year who you took in the third round of the draft. But the yeah. next two years after that never went over, never, never went over 500 yards. You know, something, something in the 400s every year after that. And then you mentioned the, the Kendricks move too. I I thought that was a good, good move for uh, to kind of transition the rest of the guys into the Mike Zimmer defense. He spent quite a few years in, in Minnesota running Zimmer's defense and those two clearly have a great relationship. So, you know, when you're bringing in a new defensive coordinator after Dan Quinn uh, has had a decent amount of success while he was there and then moves on to go become a head coach, uh, nice to have somebody in there who 
who you can immediately just trust to to call the offense or to, excuse me to call the defense. And he was good last year in L.A. I mean, had a pretty good season. I think he was. was just he okay, I was. I wasn't all that familiar with what he did in L.A. last year. So that's that's encouraging. Yeah, and I think he was just another cap casualty guy. Where I want to say he signed a two year deal, and then they just said probably not worth it to keep you on that production at that deal, which you see a lot in free agency. And every year I think we do this where we, we almost overdo the free agency a little bit, maybe just because there's not that much else to talk about right now. I mean, we still have five weeks, I think until we hit the draft. So Mm -hmm. can't even really start talking about that too much right now, but building your team through free agency is, (laughs) Is, is not the smartest thing. I mean, I've seen the Raiders blow it with that a number of times where they overspend for guys in free agency to cover up not hitting on their higher draft picks. Yeah. You know, for 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 the Max Crosby contract that – or, you know, draft pick that the Raiders made a couple of years ago that turned into a guy well worth the long-term lucrative extension they gave him, there's a million – Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to throw the name out there again, but you know, Henry Ruggs. Damon Arnett, like guys like that where, you know, you end up starting to reach in free agency when you don't hit on guys like that. And then you pay a guy that's good, great money. So you're, you're paying, you know, you're paying for great, but then you're getting good or slightly above average in return. So that's why I'm always a little cautious to not overreact too much on the the free agent signings. But I do think for the Cowboys specifically, that's, that's a good one to get him on the relatively cheap for a low risk one year deal. To, to help implement the Zim defense. Man, the Chargers are going through a bloodletting right now. It started with Brandon Staley at the end of last season, and it's just continued, and it's a bit of a head-scratcher because you feel like getting rid of one of Justin Herbert's most important targets, that's acceptable. Some guys do have to move on. So when they got rid of Mike Williams, it's like, man, he's productive, but he's also had problems with injuries throughout his time with the chargers, but to get rid of both Mike Williams and now Keenan Allen, who is going to Chicago is a really interesting scenario for a guy who is at a pretty critical point in his development as the quarterback for this football team. You've got Quentin Johnston on that roster. Now the former TCU wide out, who was very disappointing in year one and a handful of guys who feel like, threes or fours in this league at wide receiver. Like that's a realistic season for like the Josh Palmers of the world. So they also might be looking at this deep wide receiver class and believe that they can find somebody special in those first couple of rounds to help make up for a lack of guys like Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Yeah. You would like to think that the upgrade in coaching from Brandon Staley to Jim Harbaugh is going to help Herbert quite a bit. But then when you get rid of two guys like that, it it makes sense from a cap standpoint to probably move on from one of those guys because I I would like – I mean, I would imagine they were already expensive as is. And then when you talk about two of them in there, I think Allen was due some sort of roster bonus if he stayed on the roster going into – I think it might have been next week or the new league year, OTA, something like that. So that one made sense. Ship him off. But, yeah, then to release Mike Williams too I thought was – was was interesting. It's definitely not gonna in the immediate term help the learning curve for for Justin Herbert and in Jim Harbaugh's offense. So yeah, we'll see. Maybe they maybe they go out and and get get a big time receiver early in the draft. Although they don't, you know, I, I gotta see where they pick, but they should have they should have their pick of one of the top three receivers from from where they're they'll be picking. Did you see the Kenny Pickett news? I did. I did. I rambled about that for a minute while I was uh, Will Ferrell blacking out. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so Kenny Pickett apparently unhappy that Russell Wilson had been given assurances that he would be the Steelers' starting quarterback in signing that one-year deal, which apparently happened officially today. So he asked out altogether. And there were people that are flipping out at Kenny Pickett saying they handled that unprofessionally. I don't fault him for that at all. Russell Wilson was better with the – Broncos last year but this is a guy who seems like he's on the decline right now so to just hand them that job it obviously shows a lack of faith in Kenny Pickett which I guess isn't all that surprising but 
they've been paying Kenny Pickett lip service for the last month or so now and saying that he is their guy and they have full faith in him as their starting quarterback. But as is always the case, and I know a lot of people consider this a cliche, but I, I think it's very relevant. So it's not a cliche. Actions speak louder than words. And as soon as they go out and get Russell Wilson to create a competition, but they're telling him you are going to be our team starting quarterback. Uh, they're going back on their word to Kenny Pickett. Not that they owe him anything. They've given him plenty of chances up to this point to prove himself to this team starting quarterback. But I also don't fault Kenny Pickett for wanting to hit reset and start someplace else. If he is going to be the obvious backup quarterback, have it in a situation where it's no doubter, like going to Philadelphia and backing up Jalen Hurts versus bringing in um, a guy who might be a bit washed right now who is trying to prove it to the rest of the league that he still has what it takes to be a starter in this league. They Mitch trubisky his ass real quick. Yeah. I mean, they and, – and look, I have no issue, like you said, with Kenny Pickett voicing his frustration with that after – you know, it's a great way of putting it. It's just lip service basically is what they paid him and – you're, you're the guy we're going to build around you. And even, I mean, we talked about this a couple weeks ago when the GM came out and said before they made the Wilson move that they were ready to move, you know, they're ready to build around Pickett. So I do understand his frustration, but at the end of the day, dude did not exactly help himself out when he got his opportunities. No. I mean, no, I got his stats up right here. He played 25 games over the last two years, 4,447 yards. I mean, Trey, that's what, a good quarterback does in one season in 16 huh. or 17 games. He had, I mean, 13 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. That's right. 13 and 13. Like that's the epitome of average over the span of two years. And I know he was a younger guy still trying to develop, but you can tell pretty early. You can tell pretty early on with these guys. I feel like it's pretty fair nowadays with, you know, especially the amount of college football that he played and with how good the Steelers roster is, especially on the defensive side. And they do have weapons on offense too, to work with, you know, it, it may not, it may not be the, the best supporting cast in all of football, but I would say it's top half the league with the two running backs. They have a decent offensive line. They have Pickens, uh, De uh, Deontay, Deontay Johnson's a pretty good receiver. So you know, he's he's got himself to blame in this as well. And I think the Steelers just decided to say, based on all of that, all of those uh, things I just said about their roster, you know what? We're we're taking a total flip of the coin if we give it back to Kenny Pickett for a third season. And in a way, we're flipping the coin with Russell Wilson, but I think it's lower lower risk, maybe lower reward. I, I mean, I, I don't even know if I look at it as a lower reward. I definitely think it's lower risk than throwing Kenny Pickett out there. I mean, Russell Wilson was terrible that first season with Denver, but there was a lot of shit going on there. Yeah. Like I don't, I expect him to look a lot more like he looked last year, which is a serviceable quarterback for a good team. He was not on a good team last year. You disagree. Yeah, I don't know if Pittsburgh's going to be a good team or not. They obviously have a defense that's good, especially when T.J. Watt is in there, but they are going through their own sort of offensive makeover, which does include getting rid of Deontay Johnson, who has been their most consistent receiver these last few years. They do still have George Pickens. They've got a couple of talented running backs. I would argue Jalen Warren deserves more of the carries than Najee Harris. And we'll see what they do in the draft. If they try and find some more weapons to put around Russell Wilson, or maybe they take a chance with a quarterback who can sit for a year and develop behind Russell Wilson, then he gets to take the reins for that 2025 season. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they could do that. I mean, if I were them with that roster, I would go, I'd go get as many weapons as you possibly can to put around Russ. And even if it's a fool's errand with everybody else that's in the AFC – and not just AFC in their division too. I mean, the teams that they have to play twice a year, <laughs> I mean, that is, that is going to be gnarly. So um, yeah, if you think you got the team to make a run for it, then go, go put as many weapons around him as you can, or go beef up the offensive line. Speaking of former Steelers quarterbacks, did you see where Mason Rudolph ended up? I did not see that. Tennessee Titans. Oh, 
So it's going to be a Will Levis, Mason Rudolph, Malik Henry competition. I'm not sure if Malik Henry is still a part of that roster. But, yeah, Will Levis and Mason oh, Rudolph will be vying for stabs to get to throw the football to, amongst other guys, Calvin Ridley. So Calvin Ridley, you have DeAndre Hopkins there still. You're obviously hitting reset at running back with former Dallas Cowboy Tony Pollard taking over starters carries in that backfield with Derrick Henry moving on now to the Baltimore Ravens. Tennessee going to be very new look less next season, including on the sidelines with Mike Vrabel no longer there. Mike Vrabel has taken on a special assistant role with the Cleveland Browns this year, which bodes very well for Kevin Stefanski and that staff to have a mind like Mike Vrabel helping them formulate a defensive game plan. Not that the defense was the problem for them this last year. The defense was really good. It was the offense, especially with Deshaun Watson's uncertain status up to a point and him being out for the year, that proved to be problematic, even with Joe Flacco turning back the clock and uh, shocking the world with uh, how decent he was. Uh, he did come plummeting back down to earth, too, uh, in that playoff game against the Houston Texans. Hey, and he got himself a little deal with with the Colts out of that. Flacco's a Colt now? I hadn't seen yep. that. Okay. One-year deal, one deal with the Colts. And then my guy Jameis Winston going to Cleveland to back up, back up to Sean Watson. Uh, look, that's a better backup than the other guys that they had playing games before Joe Flacco came in. Yeah. James Winston is a roller coaster ride as a human being and also as a quarterback, too, as that 30 30 season can attest to. Yeah, we're just going to get more ridiculous moments and speeches and Twitter clips from Jameis Winston. So him, that's eating, just... it, him eating W's. Oh, yeah. That's just, that's just great content for everybody. It is. Yes, it is. Anything else in the way of free agency that is piquing your interest right now? No. Um, yeah, I mean, no. I mean, I think the – well, maybe the, the Ravens going out and getting Derrick Henry I think is a clear, clear sign that, you know, I don't know if it's an admission of fault for how they how they called that game in the AFC Championship – uh, against against the Chiefs, but I definitely think it's them realizing, like, hey, we need to actually, you know, like run the ball, like not have Lamar Jackson be our leading rusher every single season, because throughout the course of potentially twenty games, if you make the Super Bowl, that's that's just not a feasible way to continue to win. And um, you know, by beefing up the running game there, literally with Derrick Henry. Now you get a guy who you can who you can rely on and you can just hand, hand it to and play ground and pound and then also play the spread it out speed game uh, with with Lamar Jackson and the passing game and everything everything that they're able to do there because they did show improvements in the passing game in the regular season Zay Flowers is probably the first really electric receiver that that they've had in a long time so yeah, yeah I would say that that might have been the other one that that stood out that we didn't get to talk about the other day it was Derrick Henry signing his deal with the Ravens so Derrick Henry turned 30 a little bit earlier this year. And the question becomes for Derrick Henry, who obviously is a physical freak, can he regain that productivity from a few years ago? Because it did seem like we were seeing a sort of decline in his final year with the Titans. And that begs the question of what running backs have been able to sustain a sort of success in or beyond that age 30 season. Any guesses on the running back with the most total rushing yards after turning 30 in NFL history? Because the list is longer than I thought it would be. Marcus and Allen? It is uh, filled with uh, guys from every era of football, pretty much. Marcus Allen? Marcus Allen is a good guess. I do not see him on this list at all. So going all the way down to 1,007 yards. Um, Jerome Marcus Bettis. Allen did not make the cut as a 30-year-old. The bus? Jerome Bettis. I do not see Jerome Bettis on this list. Man. 
gosh. I don't know. Give me give me a couple of names, and then maybe it'll spark some others. All right, number one. We'll go ahead and give you number one and number two because both guys cracked 1,600 yards in their age 31 season. Oh, wait, wait. Edger and James? No, and Edger and James also not on this list. Yeah. Shocking. I would assume one of those three guys would be on this list, but they're not. I know. I guess Ed, I guess they did the Colts did bounce edge and then he went to the Cardinals for a little bit, but yeah, he didn't play too much longer after that. So the top two guys on this list from statmuse.com. One Jim is a New Brown? York Jet or was a New York Jet. The other is a former New York Giant. Curtis Martin. Oh, gosh. Had almost 1,700 yards in 2004, which is his age 31 season. 1,697 yards and 12 rushing touchdowns. 4.6 yards per carry. Added another 245 yards through the air. Tiki Barber, in his age 31 season in 2006, had 1,662 yards, five I touchdowns, got, and nearly 500 yards receiving. I got I got a couple more guesses. Let's hear it. LT? LaDainian Tomlinson. Not on this list. This is just impressive now. How long is that list? The list is... Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Oh, my gosh. 24, 25. 25 guys deep. Wow. And there's actually somebody who makes this list from last season. This shocked me. I didn't realize this dude was this old. Ooh. Miami Dolphin Raheem Mostert. Oh. Cracked 1,000 yards in his age 31 season last year. Just got over. Got 1,012 yards with 18 touchdowns, which is bananas. We got a good one here from Michael. Adrian Peterson. Congratulations, Michael. Adrian Peterson did make the list oh, in 2018 stuck. with the Washington Commies. 1,042 yards in his age 33 season. That's the only time he made the list, though, which is a little bit surprising. I would have assumed we, we got him a couple of times. Yeah, it feels like maybe it's just because I recently – entered my 30s where now i'm going like oh that's not that old but then when you think about it if most of these guys get drafted when they're 21 22 years old yeah like they're basically going on a decade almost a decade in the league when they would be having this breakout season that you're you're talking to, talking about all right yeah. I'm, I'm clearly just trash at this game today and i'm usually all right at trivia guessing stuff like that Hit, hit, yeah, hit, so, me with, just hit, hit me with the rest of the top 10. So Curtis Martin, Tiki Barber, Walter Payton, Thomas oh. Jones, Walter, I'm sorry, John Riggins, who not only oh. had 1,347 yards in his age 34 season in 1983, but also had 24 freaking touchdowns. Talk about a fantasy football beast. Yeah, got to give a ding, ding, ding to Rodney and Cooter there for, for getting there that. There you go. Well done. Uh, and then after Riggins, you have Walter Payton again, Tony Dorsett, Ricky Waters in 2000 with Seattle. There's a blast from the past. James Brooks in 1989 with Seattle, or I'm sorry, with Cincinnati. Riggins again in 1984. Good Lord. So when the guy's age, in his age 35 season, he rushes for more than 1,200 yards and another 14 touchdowns. <laughs> Talk about a different NFL era, man. Not that Riggins wasn't tough, but good Lord. Emmett Smith actually did it for a second time. He did it in um, – right, this is the first time I'm mentioning it. He did it twice, 2000 and 2001 with the Dallas Cowboys, his age 31 and 32 seasons. Yeah, it's not surprising. No, it's not. Actually, that uh, I guess it's not surprising because he was really good at knowing when to go out of bounds. And he also had those holes that you could drive a Mack truck through <laughs> with those 1990s Dallas Cowboys offensive lines. I know it pisses Cowboys fans off to hear that. I'm sorry, Cowboys fans. It's true. And it's also true that if Barry Sanders had been in that offense, he would have gone even crazier stats wise than Emmett Smith did. What a rush for 3000. 
Maybe if, maybe not that, but we would have seen multiple 2,000-yard efforts season to season. The Barry Sanders documentary that, that came out not too long ago is very well done and reminded me as somebody who didn't really watch him play live at all, like how freaking good that dude is. Oh, yeah. You were a little bit young for him, weren't you? Yeah, and the highlights, man. Like I'd seen highlights before because my dad was a huge fan well, still is a huge fan of, of running backs, but definitely when I was a kid, like, and I started playing football, he would always, uh, he would always say, Oh, wait, pull up the, you know, Jim Brown, pull up Walter Payton, pull up, uh, Barry Sanders. Those, those were probably like the three that he would rip off immediately. Hmm. Yeah. Barry was sick. He really was. His ability to, to pivot the spin move was, just but then, a, it broke a lot of ankles the and never lose, had, never lose speed line speed he would get this gallop going and as soon as he hit that gear nobody was catching him yeah and he also had really good patience and vision too i mean people talk about him stretching a lot of runs to the outside i mean part of that was by necessity he was playing on some mediocre to shitty detroit lion football teams whose offensive lines weren't all that good so he was and that was a matter of survival for him oh and i think with with Barry from what I've watched and a lot of the all time greats that are, you know, have more of that style as opposed to a bruising style. It's the ability to make a quick cut like that and then barely lose any speed at all mm -hmm. and just continue going. And I'm not, I'm not making this comparison to the guys top end speed, but Bijan has a little bit of that, the way he gets in and out of cuts really quickly and doesn't really slow down. Like, like Bijan may not have the top end speed, but the acceleration, like he, he makes that cut and then boom, like on a dime, he's back, you know, may not have the, the total track speed to like, like run past everybody, but just the way he weaves in and out. And I'm always, I'm always careful to do that. Cause then I know some, I know the olds are going to, are going to jump all over me. Bucky might hop back on here and, and, crush me for for a comp like that but i'm sure bucky's a Bijan guy nah Bijan is really good just like barry sanders was at figuring out how to get to the open space and even though they're slightly different in terms of their running style like i feel like he's maybe a little bit more ladanian tomlinson and just thinking about how he runs than barry sanders that comparison isn't completely off base because they can do a lot with a the tiniest bit of room and make the defenders look foolish at the same time Barry was so low to the ground, too. This is an area where there is a difference in their game. Bijan's a little bit taller than Barry was. But Barry would have these moments, and sometimes photographers would catch him mid-cut, where it's like watching the uh, the, the Moto uh, GP out at Coda, those motorcycles <laughs> going around the track, how sometimes – in the curves, the motorcycle and the guy riding the motorcycle were mere inches off the ground. That's how it looked with Barry Sanders making cuts sometimes and how almost parallel to the ground his body was as he was going from one direction to the other. It's freakish. The MotoGP comparison is actually really good because that's crazy when those dudes make a quick turn like that but barely slow down and their elbow is like that much from scraping the ground and basically just ripping up their jacket. It makes me nervous to watch. Every time I see it, I'm just like, oh man, this feels like it's going to, if it, if it doesn't go like it needs to, it's going to end very poorly for this person. <laughs> Do you ever go out to Dakota for those races? I, I actually, for the show, I, I talked to Denny Hamlin the other day about oh, that's cool. Yeah. They, they're, uh, they're ramping up for NASCAR. No, I've only been out for, one concert, I believe. A 311 show. There may have been a second concert there, too. No, I think it was just a 311 show. That's the only time I've been out to that racetrack. I'm not a NASCAR guy at all, or really an F1 F1 fan either. But the atmosphere and just the vibes out there for a big race are, are pretty fun. Uh, yeah, I've heard great things for both NASCAR and for the, uh, the F1. Those obviously happened six months apart. The NASCAR thing is weird timing for me, though, because I'm always coming off a of South by. And even though I've tried to help with promotion in years past, I'm just like, I, I don't I don't need to be around people for a month or more. Maybe I've gotten my fill. 
over that week of South by downtown and like racing isn't necessarily my thing either. So unless I'm in like a really comfortable setting, like a suite, let's say, or something where it's indoors and I have access to air conditioning and yeah, I can go outside if I want to, too. The motivation is just not there because I just don't want to deal with crowds. Yeah. With us, it's always March madness. I mean, oh this, yeah. I forgot. You about know, that. this that year it's the first for sure. Yeah. It's the first weekend of the tournament. So I have Wait, pretty sure. NASCAR next weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's oh next shit. Week. I didn't realize it was that quickly. For some reason I thought it was another, another weekend. Wow. Yep. Hmm. The, um, the grand marshals this year, did you see who that is? No. It is Giancarlo Esposito, who played Gus in Breaking Bad. Oh, Rodney Terry's brother. Rodney Terry's brother. And then, ah, shoot. Of course, my internet on this computer. Why why is this computer such a piece of shit? Wife, got to do a better job of keeping it updated. Um, I can't see who the other person was. He's got some sort of upcoming project. I want to say it's with either AMC or FX. It's another pretty notable name. I'm gonna try and get Giancarlo Esposito on the uh, the radio show and the podcast, and maybe Texas Sports Unfiltered Airways before it's all said and done next week. You gonna ask him if if he knows who his doppelganger is in the sports world? Oh, 100. percent That's maybe how I'm gonna start with him, <laughs> and I'm gonna have a picture ready to pull up too, just to show him that I'm not just BSing him. I mean, it's it's the glasses too. I mean, they, yeah, they do look alike, but the glasses just make it perfect. If we find out that... <laughs> yeah, if we were even... to find out that there was a meth lab underneath the Moody Center, <laughs> that would be a pretty big surprise. I'm just going to put that out there right now. I that would, that would not be very characteristic of the type of person that Rodney Terry is. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, uh, I would call that highly unlikely. <laughs> yeah. It's a very sturdy limb you just went out on there and saying that that's not going to turn out to be the case. <laughs> I agree with you, by the way. I'm not saying I'm, there's not even a 1% chance that there is a meth lab under the Moody Center right now. Definitely a sturdier limb there than the limb I went out on saying that, that Rodney Terry could lead these Longhorns deep in the tournament. Oh, you no longer feel good about that? No, I, I still do. I mean, look, I, I'm all in. They're they're going to, I think they're going to win a game. So, okay. And, and guess what? Even if they don't, wouldn't be the first time I've been wrong. I know. That's that's the funny thing about doing this for long enough. You're like, I'm going to throw my opinion out there. It's what I have to do. And if I'm wrong, well, I'll say, oh, I was wrong. Oh, yeah. shucks. O- occasionally, I'll, something will come up and I'll have an opinion. Or even if it's just n- nothing that was on the air, but just something around the office. And somebody that's not in sports, but that I had this conversation with will come up and, you know, kind of pull the like, oh, well, like, what happened? And I'm like, yeah, I was wrong. I'm an idiot. Like, what do you, what do you want me to say? Like, I'm, I'm literally paid to cover sports and have opinions like every day of the year. Some of them are going to be wrong. You know? Yeah. I always love the people that are like, how dare you say that? That's, that's not your place to say something like that. Actually, it's the world of sports. And so it kind of is. And on top of that, I'm allowed to say what I want to opinion wise. I'm going to try and not be too malicious or flagrant or offensive to people when doing so, but that's the gig. Well, and, I'm sorry and, if yeah. that bothers you, but fucking get over yourself. Yeah, and part of the job, especially in, in my position, is, yeah, it's telling the stories and the news of the team and, like, you know, bringing the, some of the conversations and sound bites that we get to the table and bringing, bringing those to viewers. But it's also based on that access and exposure, giving you, or if it's anybody else in this business too, my take and my perception of a given team's ability or what they can do long-term. And speaking of that, uh, Zay and I had a great conversation yesterday about what we think the long-term future of this program looks like under Rodney Terry. Uh, Just the direction of it, because I think we all pretty much agree that, you know, while I do think that this team has the talent. I think they have two of the best players in college basketball. So that to me always gives you a chance. And they have one at guard who's done it before. And then another in the post and Dylan DeSue, who uh, as long as he's healthy, you have those two guys. 
and you get hot, like I'm not saying they'll, they'll win the national championship, but they could make another run to the second weekend. Uh, but it's more likely than not, it looks like, that they won't be going into this offseason with the momentum of an Elite Eight and the you know feel-good vibes of you know the Rodney Terry intro press conference when they remove the interim tag. So he's really going to get his chance to put his stamp on this team, put his stamp on this program, and build it. And I guess the question to you, what Zay and I talked about is, you know, do you trust him to do that? Do you think that this team will be better next year? I don't know. They're losing <laughs> a lot of productivity off of this year's team. They lost a lot of productivity after last off of last year's team. Terry was dealt a bit of a blow when both of his highly touted recruits decided not to go someplace else to play college ball, but to try and play professionally. Like that sucked for him and his ability to build a roster that had some depth, that had a balance of veterans and young guys. And one of those young guys was probably going to be one of the stars of the team was likely going to fill that third scorer role. And instead you had to patchwork it together. And it's, it's been a pretty inconsistent formula all season long. So at most next year, you're going to have, I don't know, does Dylan Mitchell come back at this point? He should. He should He should go pro. He shouldn't go play in the NBA. That's just, he's going to be out at basketball or playing in Europe within a couple of years if he does that. I just don't think he's going to get drafted. I, like, he's not going to get drafted. You're right about that. Tyrese Hunter could come back. Does Tyrese want to come back for another year? Or is he maybe going to try his hand at another school? Or is he just going to try and play professionally overseas? Yeah. Max Aismas is gone. Dylan DeSue is gone. Uh, Caden Shedrick, I feel like he's gone too. I feel like he's a senior right now. I mean, they, they are really devoid of returning guys on next year's roster. And this is already a roster that only goes seven or eight deep. But Caden didn't do senior day. So that's one that I got to look into a little bit more. Okay. All right. Because that might mean that that he, he can come back for another year. And again, not that that's what you're building all your hopes and dreams around. No, but, but he's a, he, he is a solid guy down low. Plays yeah. good defense and is a reliable off, option on offense too. So that's at least something, but that's only one thing. Yeah, and I think what, what Texas fans need to remember is, you know, it's not a guarantee that Texas will get these guys, but there will be some guys that pull a Max Aismas and – hit the portal you know they may not be top 15 on the scoring list when they when they leave their school but they might be really good players and you know you hope that you can get a few of those guys and and you also hope that you have the entire offseason of most of those guys healthy and the non-conference slate to really build that chemistry because one thing that I think people are leaving out a lot is that Dylan DeSue didn't come back until basically a couple days before they played their first big 12 game. And I think one of his first games was against LSU again, an sec team, not a great team this year, but still an sec caliber team. They get that win in Houston. Um, believe that was DeSue's first game back and then conference play. Like they hit the ground running right after that and had that rough start and then finally figured it out. But that definitely hurt them that they weren't able to get things going early in the season with him. And I mean, even when I went to go shoot preseason practice back in October, when they, when they tipped off that well before they were going to play a game, he was over there on the bike. Like he wasn't going through the drills or, you know, the half court offense with them. So that changes then when you just, it, it helps obviously, but it does change things when you throw that guy in uh, at the last second. So yeah, I think a lot of, there was a lot of chaos that Rodney Terry was working around that he won't use yeah. as an excuse that, didn't help this team gel. And of course now it's make or break on whether or not they can put together consistent performances because we see performances once every couple games from this team where you go that performance on a neutral site, if the other team doesn't play their best could at least compete and sometimes beat any given team in the country. Yeah, you know, the biggest question that I had about Rodney Terry when he was made the official head coach at Texas was how is he going to be able to build this roster offseason after offseason? That is the most important quality for a college basketball coach, 
more important than the X's and O's, in my opinion, or maybe on that same level. I, you can't diminish X's and O's. 100%. Uh, no, you you have can't to be win games against other really competition if you're routinely getting out coached. But if you don't have the roster and the understanding of how to fill not just the usual gaps that are created when a guy runs out of eligibility with as much player movement as is happening right now, if you don't understand how to use the transfer portal and also high school recruiting – as a tool, which was Chris Beard's greatest quality, then you're not going to be long for that job. And even for a guy like Rodney Terry, who his time as a head coach elsewhere with Fresno State and UTEP was a mixed bag, there were some good years. His last three years at Fresno, he won more than 20 games, made it to one NCAA tournament, but at UTEP, he just wasn't very good. He was average at best with that first year being really bad as he was trying to uh, to rebuild that roster. He has shown an acumen as an X's and O's coach that if he has the right guys in there, I think he'll be okay. But can he sell prospective Longhorns that this is the place for them? And does he have the vision to know the types of guys that are going to fit in his system like he needs to on both ends of the court? I think that it's still very debatable as to whether he has that skill, whether he possesses that trait to do a good enough job with roster building that he will be successful here long term. And mind you, I am not saying that Rodney Terry is short for the job or that he should be fired. You know, some people feel that way. Some people will yell that from the rooftops even after Texas wins a big basketball game. But it's the question that I think is – has the most pressing answer for Rodney Terms' long-term future in Austin. Trey, as we approach the 4 o'clock hour, it needs to be honesty hour sometimes. Uh-oh. And honesty hour with this Texas basketball program is that what you're seeing this year as they head into the tournament, this is really what this program is. Mm. A perennial team that makes the tournament, but not a powerhouse, high seed, we're a one, two, three seed every single year. I mean, that is what this that is what this program is. I know they had great stretches, you know, well before I was even around with Tom Penders in the 90s. I think they made an elite eight in there. And then Barnes comes in and he does a good job. You know, he gets them to the first final four in the modern day. And they have some great teams after that. But they also had a lot of teams that never got out of the first weekend of the tournament. For as many good players as they had. You know, there was a lot of second round losses to USC with KD that season. So, you know, when Rodney Terry took this team to the Elite Eight last year, let's all remind ourselves too that while we get fired up and people want to take take the bait and take the easy route with with Rodney Terry and criticize him, which some some of it's valid, and just remember that he snapped a 15 year drought of Texas making it to the Elite Eight. I think of Texas even making it to the second weekend. Like I think even getting to the sweet 16 snapped that 15 year drought. So what's happening this year, guys, it's about on par with what this program's always been. It really mm -hmm. is, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not lying. You can go to Wikipedia, go to Wikipedia, Texas men's basketball season by season wiki, Google it. It brings up how they ended every season and what their record was. Like find okay, me let's, one, let's just find go, me let's one just stretch where they were playing for the national championship. Do you have a calculator on you out of curiosity? Uh, I can on my phone. All right. I'm going to give you some numbers here. All right. Five plus six plus six plus one plus three plus eight plus two plus four, plus two, plus seven, plus eight, plus four, plus 11, plus seven, plus 11, plus six, plus 10, plus three, plus six, plus two, divided by 20. So it's 112. 5.6. So they've averaged between a five and a six seed in the 2000s. Is that constantly finishing as a top four seed? It's not. But it's also not 
finding yourself in the, the recent past would suggest otherwise, although I know they were a two seed last year and they were a three seed in what was Shaka Smart's final season, which was a, a, an embarrassing first round exit. This team has seen some positive times in terms of being more of a top team in college basketball. This is just a, a weird transition year for Rodney Terry right now, though. And if they can at least win that first round game and find a way, maybe they can play that A plus game that we've seen at times against good competition this year, make it into weekend two. This is an overachieving season for Rodney Terry. And I think that's very encouraging for the future and what he's going to be able to sell other guys on. Hey, we were playing uh, as a little bit of a lame duck this year because of some things that were outside of our control, but we'd love you to come in and help solidify this roster and help us make another deep run in this tournament next season and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way that they finish this season, I mean, even just winning one game, I think that goes a long way in saying like, to your point, Trey, come here to Texas and help us get over that hump. Like, yeah, we are Texas. The brand carries a lot of weight. You're going to make a little NIL money. Like we're like, Texas is a successful basketball program. Like me saying that is not saying that, you know, they're like, they're hot garbage or they're terrible. It's just pointing out that they're not a blue blood. They don't compete for the conference championship year in and year out. And they don't, and I say compete because it's probably unfair to hold them to the standard of, oh, they don't even, you know, they, they haven't won it enough because well, Kansas won what, like 14 in a row at one point mm-hmm. and no one was touching them until Scott Drew got Baylor to national championship levels a couple years ago. So I'm not going to hold that against them, but they were never even really consistently knocking on the door. Mm. So, yeah, I, I think even Rodney Terry now can can still use a little bit of last season. Like, even if they lose in the first round, hey, look at everything we went through, you know, the DeSue stuff, the Holland and Johnson decommits, Shedrick not really being healthy, you know, I mean, he, you don't want to go too far down that because then, you know, some if you get to like Dylan Mitchell and Tyrese Hunter, then people might say, well, that, that might be on you for not developing them. <laughs> but I think he has a way to spin this positively and and make a very compelling case for why a recruit would, would want to come to Texas. You know, I actually think there's a silver lining in Texas losing to Kansas State a couple of days ago. I know we all wanted to see this team get some positive momentum going and maybe not win the Big 12 championship, but yeah. make it to the semifinals at least. I would. I wanted to see him win one game. That's what I wanted to see. Yeah. But, I, but I'm also not freaking out because they lost to Kansas State. Here's why it's not the end of the world. Because a guy who's dealing with a bulky knee, like Dylan DeSue probably is, playing – two straight days where it's win or go home in a sense. And I know that the season continues after the big 12 tournament for Texas and a lot of other teams, but for him to get a week off now to really rest that body is enormous for Texas chances of winning even one game because if Dylan DeSue is a shell of himself, I don't care what else is happening. You're not going to be even decent competition out there. You just you're to a point now where you can't rely on outside of Ace Miss anybody else to step up with any sort of consistency. I was reluctant to sing the praises of Tyrese Hunter to you after the Oklahoma game on Saturday. I think I even said as much because I've been the president of the Tyrese Hunter fan club for two seasons now, saying the guy just needs the ball in his hands a little bit more. He's more comfortable in that capacity as a scorer, as a playmaker, as a defender. It does affect his defensive skills. We saw him go out there and just lay a stinker against Kansas State, unfortunately. So that's it for me. Like, Tyrese Hunter is consistent in their first-round game. That is huge for Texas winning that game. I'm not going to hold my breath that it's going to happen a second straight game, though, because for two years now we've seen that not happen. I can't stop thinking about the decisions ahead of Tyrese Hunter and, and Dylan Mitchell after you brought it up a second ago. Because that is, man, and you know what? There's uh, there's other things behind the scenes. Like these guys are never going to be completely honest about how they feel, and that that's not me saying that I think one or both of them are potentially unhappy. It's just saying that, look, like they haven't lived up to expectations and this season, and they both are smart, perceptive guys that are 
driven to be the best basketball players they can. They understand that too. As much as they say, you know, Tyrese the other night said, my confidence never wavers after the Oklahoma game. Well, maybe I believe that. It's like, well, dude, you're, you can say that, but like your productivity wavers. Yeah. And that's an issue. Like, okay, if you're still confident, that's great. I'm happy that you don't lose your confidence. I, I think that is, you know, the, the goldfish mindset is important, especially this time of year. You know, when you lose against Kansas State in the first round of the or the opening game of the Big 12 tournament to not let that kill the momentum. The short the short memory is important, but I would love to be in those conversations when they happen, whenever the season ends for Texas and and just hear, you know, what Rodney Terry's not even pitches, but just what he thinks they should do, because they may have something in their mind that they believe they should do, or their people, you know, their, their support system around them thinks they should do. But I wonder if Rodney Terry's <laughs> going to beg Tyrese to come back or if he's going to tell Dylan to just go pro or, you know, I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall for those conversations. So speaking of Rodney Terry and his doppelganger, Giancarlo Esposito, Giancarlo is going to be the grand marshal for the NASCAR Cup Series race at Coda on Sunday, March 24th. The other name that I couldn't think of, Jeff, you may not be familiar with this guy because he's more from my era than anything else. Skeet Ulrich or Skeet Ulrich. Does that name ring a bell? No, maybe if I saw the face. He was in the original Scream. He starred in the CW Series Riverside, I guess. Well, he is going to lead the field to the green flag at Circuit of the Americas as the honorary pace car driver. And Giancarlo and Skeet are starring in the new crime thriller Parish, which premieres on AMC on March 31st. Well, you better get that interview then. Yeah, I, I guess I got to go through NASCAR Media Relations, NASCAR at Coda Media Relations. I see the, <laughs> the email right there. So I'm going to try and get both these guys on. Go for it. We'll see. Yeah. Hey, what's the worst they could say? No? Worst they can say is no. That's right. Oh, we have some breaking NFL news with regards to a former Raider who has found e- a new home. Even more? Try Jimmy G, Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh. You know where he'll be serving as backup next year. The Try the Eric LA Carr. Rams. Okay. They've turned a couple careers around. A la yes, Baker Mayfield. I feel better about Jimmy Garoppolo as, as the starting quarterback if I'm a Rams fan than I did Carson Wentz. Hey, you know what? This is great news for for Jimmy Garoppolo as well. He, you know, he doesn't he didn't have to fly porn stars out now. He just lives in the home of the porn industry. He can buy a home in Van Nuys if he wants to. Yeah, I think the facility's in Thousand Oaks, which is over there in the San Fernando Valley. Is that near Van Nuys? Pretty close. Okay. I had an internship in Van Nuys back in the day with the reality TV company. Wait, is it Van Nuys and not Van Nice? Am I am I putting it's, one too many in in there? A little bit, yeah. It's it, it's Van Nuys. Van Nuys, yeah. There's some weird pronunciations in that part of the country, and I say that ironically, coming from Texas, I guess. Yeah. See, I think the same thing about Texas, where you pronounce the Spanish word like it's English. Yeah, except for like Lano, it's like, folks, that's Yano. I don't know what you're talking about. That is a Spanish word there. Yano, wouldn't De- not Lano. Wouldn't wouldn't Del wouldn't Del Valle be Del Valle? Oh, good call. I've lived here forever. <laughs> I've never thought about that. You're absolutely right, though. It's definitely not Manshack. It's, it's definitely not Manchaca. It's definitely not Guadalupe. Guadalupe. It's burn it, dern it, learn it. Yeah, there are all sorts of Texas pronunciations for things. I pronounced La Jolla La Jolla for way too long. An embarrassing amount of time. Well, that's what it would be if it was in Texas. Well, that's what it would be if it's a fucking surfer bro pronouncing or making up that word and pronouncing it. La Jolla, bro. I don't know. It Even in Spanish, you could say it in, in the surfer bro voice like, La Jolla, bro? La Jolla? <laughs> we actually were talking about this in the studio because our one of our anchors has, she has California ties too, and we're talking about how the accent 
it's not really an accent, but it's just sometimes the way you pronounce things, it, it comes out sometimes with like dragging words out, not totally to, to the, the Valley girl, but, but like, like San Juan Capistrano, like, you know, you, you hit it like, yeah, like a little bit at the end when like the SNL skit, the Californians is spot on. I mean, it's obviously exaggerated for comedic reasons, but there's, yeah, there's... it was not fun being a blonde haired guy named Trey during that stretch of SNL. <laughs> I heard about that shit all the time. I've still never seen a sketch. You haven't Crap. seen that sketch? Huh? You you haven't seen that? No. Oh my gosh. It's it's spectacular. Well, I live it. It's my life, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could be in that. Crap. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, too good, too good. Uh, how about Aaron Don Donald retiring? I guess it's not a huge surprise because that uh, that conversation happened after they won the Super Bowl a few years ago. But man, that dude was productive up to the end and decided to hang him up before I guess he really started on that downturn. Can't blame the dude. He's accomplished things in 10 years in this league that very few have, making 10 Pro Bowls in that time, winning three defensive MVP awards which only a couple of other guys have done and he leaves the game as one of the all-time best to do it from that interior defensive line position I was thinking about this earlier when I was in the car and I heard the the headline that, that he was retiring can you think of a better way to go out like you said he goes out on top before he starts falling off and there's inevitably some sort of standoff or awkward conversation where you go, Hey man, we need you to restructure or we're going to have to cut you. And he leaves instead. I don't say at the peak of his game, but definitely still on the back end of his prime. And he made the pro bowl. He played exactly 10 years, made the pro bowl in every season, eight time, all pro like, and, and again, we like real football fans know that all pro is really really what means something even more than the Pro Bowl. I mean, the, the, no the doubt. Pro Bowl, no the Pro doubt. Bowl st it's still an honor. It still means something. But you can sneak into the Pro Bowl based on guys backing out as the sixth best player at your position. All Pro is the truest form of no one needs to show up to Hawaii or Vegas or wherever the hell they're doing the Pro Bowl to be to be a Pro Bowler. So he did that. He did that eight times as an All Pro, three-time Defensive Player of the Year, and got his Super Bowl. And not not surprising, considering you mentioned that he did he did kind of hint at maybe wanting to retire after they won the Super Bowl, but it was probably a little bit too early then. So instead, he goes out, thirty two years old, made a ton of money, first ballot Hall of Famer. There will never be a conversation or any inkling of God. You remember Aaron Donald at the end there? Woo! Great great ten years to start his career, but. I mean, dude couldn't shed a block if his life depended on it. Like, there'll never be any talk like that. It'll always just be Aaron Donald was, you know, one of the, I mean, I, I hate throwing these lists out without, you know, going through it all in my head. Top five talent as a, as a defensive player. And you added, you add in the productivity over that decade. I mean, that's one of the most dominant decades for a defensive player in the history of the game. Yeah. I thought, Last year might be it for Sean McVay with the Rams. It's now feeling like this year may be the last year for him. I get it that the offense got going again and Stafford turned out to be healthier than everybody thought he would be, but to, to lose a guy like Aaron Donald in the middle of that defense makes it so much more difficult for everybody else. Sometimes I wonder if coaches with Sean McVay's resume and reputation right now, if – it doesn't make more sense at some point if you think you don't have a championship roster and you're going to have to rebuild all over again. He knows that even if they have a bad season this year and he decides to leave, he can go do TV. I oh, mean, the yeah. only the only person that people are, you know, network executives are clamoring for more in a booth is Tom Brady, and we're going to get that this season. Yeah. So from a coaching standpoint, Sean McVay would have an instant job as a studio analyst doing games, Whatever he wanted to do in media, the job is his. He could go do that for a year or two and then wait it out, almost like Sean Payton did, and then decide, hey, 
this is where I want to go. I mean, kind of like what Harbaugh did, even though he wasn't in media while he was waiting out, you know, the NFL landscape. And then Harbaugh gets his national championship. The timing's right. He has nothing else to prove over there. He's losing a bunch of guys at Michigan. He would have to rebuild it there. And then he goes, all right, perfect time to come back to the NFL. So sometimes I wonder if instead of like, unless you just have an absolute affinity and love for the franchise that you're with, like whatever developed with Belichick while he was there for, you know, more than two decades, unless you have that, like go almost reset the clock or re- reset your reset your options instead of saying, ah, hey, we got to get rid of Stafford at some point. And again, Sean McVay's a player's coach. And I know he's hard on guys, but he's a player's coach at heart. And now you don't have to have that conversation with Matt Stafford in two years. <laughs> you can go be an analyst in the booth and then pick your job from there. Yeah, and you can cherry pick a really good situation yes. too. Yeah, Sean McVay's – He's obviously got the uh, the beautiful Eastern European wife who I think had their first baby recently too. So you can be a little bit more of a family man for a couple of years. Reset. Just be able to enjoy life a little bit versus the god-awful grind that is being an NFL coach. For Look, it's not as bad as the college gig because of the recruiting element at college now. But like that's five to six months where if you're doing it right, you have no life. And the off season gets there and there's still things to do, obviously, but I mean, you're working 80 to hundred hour weeks from game to game. Yeah, that sounds, <laughs> sounds miserable, but they do, but they do make a lot of money to do it. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a cost for everything too. Like you said, I, he's hinted a little bit at that too, about the family portion that you talked about, about wanting to, wanting to be, you know, more, more available to be a dad, be a husband. And, yeah. and I think now as we've sort of evolved as a male species in a way to where you can be a little bit more open about, um, and I'm not saying in terms of just being a good dad or something, but you can be a little bit more open about, Hey, like this is burning me out. Like not everything has to just be like, Oh, I'm Mr. Ultimate, you know, blue collar punch in punch out, whatever it takes. Like if you if you're a guy with Sean McVay's resume, you can take a step back and say, hey, like the work life balance is is something that matters. Yeah, it does. It's it's nice that we're at a point now where being a good dad is not just an excuse to get out of work. It's like, no, I I like I am prioritizing what's most important. Do I love my job? Yeah, but I love being a dad way more. No doubt. No doubt. Did you see the uh, college football uh, playoff committee conferences in Notre Dame? <laughs> I love how the headlines written like that. Agree, agree to a new deal. So essentially we're all but locked into 14 team playoffs starting in 2026. That's still TBD. You read the details of that article and it's like, yeah, we've agreed, but the SEC and Big Ten are going to have a huge say-so on what that final framework looks like. And there's a good chance that they're going to be getting more from the college football playoff than the other schools. Will that happen? Maybe. It's a six-year deal, so it starts in 2026, runs through the very early years in the 2030s, but it's, it's it's not set just yet. There are conferences and some of those lesser conferences that are really being held hostage right now. And I think this is a terrible deal, even from the SEC and Big Ten's perspective with regards to how much money Notre Dame gets from the college football playoff contract. They essentially get an even amount as compared to the ACC and Big 12 schools and what would end up being more on a per school basis than the SEC and Big Ten too? The fact that AC that Notre Dame continues to somehow survive as an independent is ludicrous to me. Whenever the Big Ten and SEC do make that ultimately ultimate move, Notre Dame's going to have to pick. You're going to have to pick a conference, guys. I'm sorry. I know you love being this independent, but that's not the way forward here. You don't you don't get to keep to uh, keep getting to uh, to kind of do your own thing as everybody else is having to come together in some sort of partnership to help college football evolve. Yeah, and what have they done recently? I know they've gone to a couple playoffs. I'm not saying they've been they've been non-existent. They have gone to a few playoffs. They've been a good football program, but they've been nowhere near a dominant enough program 
yeah. to be calling shots. And I'm not – I'm a – historian of the game someone who loves the history loves the tradition the pageantry pageantry just as much as the next guy but Notre Dame has not done enough recently to to be sitting here calling shots and saying no if all these other conferences get their champion in like we get something too like why it it makes it makes no sense to me and I'm I'm here for Notre Dame maintaining their place in modern college football Emphasis on the modern part. And yeah. What does that look like in the modern era? We're, we don't. We're not just going to hand you something because you're you're Notre Dame and because of what Newt Rockney did a hundred years ago for your program. Like, congratulations. You know, like you're not sitting around handing out auto bids to USC because John McKay had a nice stretch yeah. with the Trojans. Like Texas isn't sitting around getting bids handed to them because of what Daryl Royal did. You know. Like, I respect Notre Dame and their history, but at the end of the day, like, they need to sit down at the negotiation table and 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 be realistic and say, hey, if you if you want to be an independent, well, great, you can still do that, but it's going to be at the risk of potentially giving up what would have been an automatic bid had you been in a conference and won that conference or a buy. You know, maybe it's maybe not even the automatic bid as much because maybe they would be ranked high enough with their schedule to be in the top remaining nine teams after the conference champions. But then they would be losing out on whatever incentives come from playing in that conference championship game and winning that conference championship game. Because I think right now that's that to me is the biggest thing that they have to sort through is they have to find a way to keep the conference championship games relevant and to make them actually mean something. And that's that's easier said than done. See, when the Big Ten and SEC break off, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, even if it's in the early 2030s, I'm still choosing to believe that that's not going to be the case when it's all said and done. I think you'll see conference championship games go away. And when the SEC and Big Ten break away, they're going to tell Notre Dame, you have a decision to make right now. You can either be in this tier of college football which even if we're not stating it overtly is going to be the top level of college football, or you can compete with what's left of the ACC, the big 12 and all these other conferences for that second tier championship. And if Notre Dame wants to maintain their independence that much, then that's the decision that they'll make. They won't be. And I think that would actually be a better decision for them too, believe it or not, because of some of the constraints that they have to deal with, with regards to the type of kids that they're able to recruit, because you're having to meet a sort of GPA minimum or intellectual medium to get into Notre Dame. That's not the case of a lot of other schools. Well, then so evolve you with that shit. championship again, albeit on a different level from what the big 10 and sec are offering each year. Yeah. To me, then, then evolve and start letting make a couple of exceptions. Like, like you got to make a concession somewhere, some somewhere along the way. You can't just say, oh, because we have to let these people into Notre Dame with a certain GPA <sighs> that that we now come to the negotiating table with 135 other FBS programs. And mm, this is what we want. Do it like what? Like, I don't know. Evolve, evolve or die, like evolve or be less relevant. Like evolve or die may be a little dramatic. Like Notre Dame will always have a place in college football, but evolve or lose some of your relevance in the sport. Like that, everyone <laughs> evolve or hang out with the ACC and Big Twelve. Right, right. You know, you know what? Or or evolve and do what you're doing now, and maybe somehow sneak into the college football playoff off a of reputation, and then show that you had no freaking business in hell being there to begin with. And do yeah, what you do every time you go to the ACC playoff and get absolutely under... smacked. Say that again. I said, or do what you do every time. Go to the playoff and get absolutely smacked and waste everyone's time. That's why I wonder at what point do some of these secondary conferences, the ACC, the Big 12, and the G5 schools just say, you know what? At some point it doesn't make sense. Are we holding on for dear life because of what the structure for college football has been? Yeah. But the SEC and Big 10 already have this huge financial advantage in terms of the TV deal and how much each of their schools is getting annually as a result. 
they're about to get even more of a financial advantage versus the are, are based on the amount of guaranteed money that these conferences are getting versus us in this next ESPN deal. Like this is enough. We're putting ourselves too far behind the eight ball here. We have these TV deals that go into the next decade. Let's let them go do our, their own thing. We're going to do our own thing too. And we are going to remain competitive. And we are also going to remain on good enough terms that we can figure out uh, some sort of relegation system or something else that allows a sort of team swap based on how well or poorly teams are doing at these different levels year to year. Like at some point, and by the way, we've already seen a version of this because I think you and I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I definitely discussed it with BK. Like it was being thrown out that the Big Ten and SEC were going to get three guaranteed teams <laughs> in the playoff each year per conference. See, but and those are conferences that can go ACC, in and we're gonna swing get two. it. What's that? Those are conferences that can go in and swing it. Like they have some, like, I'm not saying that was right what they're asking for, but they have the leverage. They have the negotiating power versus a Notre Dame just walking in and everyone being like, what? You're, you're absolutely right about that. But no, Notre Dame has given, given those assurances now that if they're a top whatever team, they get in, even if technically they end up on the outside looking in if the highest ranked G5 champion is beyond 12 or 14 or whatever that number is like Notre Dame would still get in and it would be the 13th team that gets kicked out, let's say. Um, but there were people that spoke up after the guaranteed playoff spot bit came out, which I wonder who put that out, whether that was the big 10 sec side or somebody from the other side and said, no, this is bullshit. These guys already have this advantage. We're not giving them more guarantees now. If you're good enough, if you're top 14 worthy, then you'll get in. You've already got this competitive advantage with how much money you, that you're bringing in through that TV deal. We're not giving you another leg up here. And so I could ultimately see some of these other conferences that are being held hostage by the Big Ten and the SEC because they do have the most say-so. They are in that greatest position of power saying, no, this is it. This is enough. You guys go do your own thing. You're, you're going to be a sort of intermediary between college football and the NFL, and we're going to be more of a truer version of college football. Notre Dame, which side do you want to be on? And Notre Dame's going to say, well, we want to remain independent, but we also want to compete with the top dogs. And you and I are going to say, no, Notre Dame, you don't get to do that anymore. you got to make a choice one way or the other. Notre Dame's going to say, I'll fight you. Have you seen our mascot? We put our dukes up like we're in the early 1900s, and we'll kick your butt despite the fact that we're short and uh, – <laughs> We uh, we had to move from our native land because of a potato famine created by the uh, by, by the British. We didn't think to maybe try and fish in the waters all around our island. We decided to come here instead, and here we are, all these years later, fighting for our college football lives. We need to clip that bit right there. <laughs> <laughs> but that needs to be like the opening to our Monday shows. It's just like us just yelling about Notre Dame. <laughs> Yell, yell, arguing, arguing about Brock Purdy, yelling at Notre Dame, and yelling, yelling at uh, some of the uh, the Larry David esque uh, injustices in the world. Uh, no, but I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying, and, and maybe my solution here with Notre Dame is just this is what we're gonna do. We're just because they're so great, and no one else even deserves to be like in their presence. Like I shouldn't even be able to breathe in their presence, Trey. Like anywhere near that stadium. Although I have twice. Great atmosphere. I will say that. Mm. It's the last nice thing I'm going to say. USA, USC games or Texas games or two, or one, some combination of the two? Two USC games. I was actually at the Bush Push game. Oh, wow. That was – I I still stand by outside of USC, Texas at the Rose Bowl because I did I did go to that with my parents, which was pretty awesome. Uh, went as a USC fan at the time, though. But the Bush Push game – I mean, the USC, Texas, like that will never be touched. Just like what both those schools mean to me now at, at this point in my life, even before Texas meant what it means to me, and where that game is in the pantheon of college football, like that's like maybe something will top it one day. Like never say never, but that's that's number one. One one B is the Bush push game, just because of like how good those SC teams were. I mean, it's a a game and a play that have yeah. that you know that, that has a name after it literally yeah and and like because of your liberty play that boise state oklahoma play and because of how shitty notre dame fans treated us the entire time oh there notre was, dame fans being shitty to y'all 
they were that before that fourth and eight, there were people I'm trying to think of how old I was at the time. 11, maybe there were Notre Dame fans behind us. Like they were chirping at my stepdad the entire game. Mm -hmm. They were looking at me going, "Mm," you know, like stuff like that, which I would probably think was funny if like any other fan base did it besides Notre Dame, maybe UCLA. And it was the fourth and eight where Matt Leinart hit Dwayne Jarrett down the sideline, got him inside the 20 and set up a couple plays before the, the Bush push. And I remember like looking back at that dude and I didn't say anything. And, and they'd been like chirping the entire game, which is part of the fun of it, but they took it a little too far with some of the language and stuff they were saying. And after, after USC won, I just turned around and just flipped the dude off. And my As an 11 year old. Yeah. My mom was just like mortified, but then also like, well, we put him in this environment. So <laughs> yeah. Good for <laughs> kind you, of, by the way. Kind of have well nobody to blame. Yeah. Kind of have nobody to blame, but ourselves. But anyway, well, well timed ass- bird there by you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, even as an 11 year old, I was smart enough to know, like, especially in enemy territory, maybe I should wait before we win to run my mouth like a sloppy MF. Unlike those dudes <laughs> behind me. But the smart ass comment I was going to make about Notre Dame was that I think that they should just play themselves 12 game schedule against themselves. They can call themselves the whatever champion they want. Every game's a rivalry game. Every game's the biggest game. You know, they can play themselves in the championship game just because no one's good enough, even to even to just wear a uniform next to them. Well, they can't do that, unfortunately, because according to the. Uh, the inner workings of Catholic law playing with yourself is a sin, Jeff. <laughs> oh. Well, you teed that one up for me. Oh, really man. That, that feels like uh, there's no good way to segue to something else. But, hey, maybe we could uh, scream at the clouds about Nick Saban screaming at the clouds on Capitol Hill. Ooh, I missed this. What did he say? I don't even know, honestly. But he was just up there talking about talk about nil and and all that he was on he was up there with ted cruz but you know he's ted cruz and nick saban yeah my god and he's just been going a bad joke and he's just been going on his his whole like post-retirement tour about like part of the reason he got out is just because all these guys care about is how much money they're going to make and he was so disappointed in how they acted at the end of that loss in the Rose bowl to, to Michigan. And, you know, he's just kind of going on and on about, about how disappointed he is and all that in the direction of college football. And, and that part of it's not surprising, but you know, it's, yeah, some, but, some but the sanctimoniousness kind of, and making yes. it seem like they weren't doing some of that beforehand is fucking bullshit. That, and you know and, that he's coming across sounding like a little bit of a crybaby on his way out. That, that surprises me because Nick Saban, he obviously has gotten upset on the sidelines and he rips the headphones off and he's not afraid to yell at a dude. He's, he's coming across like a little bit of a bitch right now, Jeff. And I, I love Nick Saban. I'm a huge Nick Saban fan. So it is a little disappointing to see him this early on kind of just like unload. Like I thought I would, usually I would like something like that and I'd be like, Oh, coach retires and just unloads all the tea, just dumps it all out. But in this case, it's sort of like, yeah, dude, like NIL is part of the game. Like transfer portal is part of the game. Guys are going to come to you and exit meetings every year, whether they're leaving or not. And, and they're going to ask you about playing time. Like, you know what? That's been happening. I never did it on that level, but I went on a couple recruiting visits and I asked questions like, where do you see me fitting into your program? Where do you see the develop or where do you see my development? What position do you think I would play? Like based on my talent and what you see on tape and what you have now, when do you reasonably think that I could expect to see playing time if I come play here? And they're never guarantees, but you know, those are conversations that have been had for a while, whether you're at a recruiting visit to Occidental college, like I was on asking those questions or you're a potential top five draft pick, you know, five-star recruit going into your sophomore year asking, yeah, what, what's the NIL package look like? What is, what is the, you know, what does the depth chart look like? You, you would be almost reckless and naive if you weren't asking those questions. 
as a player. Now, again, there's a tasteful, just like anything else, there's a tasteful and professional way to have that conversation. But I agree that Nick Saban is, is not coming across the best as he, you know, like, dude, a, a mere months after retirement, like, being on Capitol Hill with Ted Cruz, like I don't even care what he said. Even just that picture, that two shot of them is 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 just weird. Like, what are we doing? It's like, what are we, what are we really? Nick fixing? Saban is essentially admitting that the job is starting to get too hard, so he just didn't want to do it anymore. But the other funny reality about that is that even though this was a down year for Alabama, they still did a good job of developing and getting it together and making it back to the college football playoff. So he would have put himself in position for more championships. He just realized that the work isn't worth it anymore. It is such a grind. It's exhaustive. Just talking specifically about the ego management and the roster management that you're not just doing during off seasons, you're having to do it during the season at this point to varying degrees. And I realize that when things are going well, you're you're not going to have as much chirping or as much guy much of guys looking around. But yeah, you make a great point that that is just that's a part of things right now. And by the way, those hard conversations are two way conversations too. You as a head coach at this point can be like, look, you've had this deal up to this point, or we've we've had this agreement in place. We think you may be better served trying to go someplace else. We just don't see it working out for you here. We've got these guys coming in, and so your path to playing time has become much more difficult. And as our friend Kevin Dunn is texting me right now, Nick Saban is not able to maneuver the way that he used to. And some might call it cheating. It was uh, definitely against the rules. He wasn't the only one doing it, but uh, they were able to do it the best. And they had an intricate system in place, according to a lot of people behind the scenes. That has essentially been busted because other programs are now able to do that legally, and they can do so legally with more resources than what Alabama has. Oh, that's a great that's a great point from Kevin. I mean, it's all about control, and he lost all control. Like they couldn't control the game and work around the way that they were before. That's a no, that's a that's a great point. And I also think too that him going on and on and on about the lack of resiliency in these players and all they care about is the NIL. That's all they ask about. And, you know, th these kids have no resolve or resilience anymore. It's just, it's a bad look. It's, it's painting, painting with broad strokes, making generalizations. Yeah. And to be honest, it's a slap in the face to a lot of the players across all of college sports that do things the right way and, and are resilient and, all the things that a lot of these guys that he's recruited in the places that he's gone to get players, you know, the shit those kids have been through in their lives, yeah. you know, the circumstances that they were born into completely out of their control. And now they're trying to elevate their situations. And there's obviously going to be some people that don't use NIL for good. There's going to be people that it, whatever it is in life that, that leverage things for the wrong reasons. But a lot of these kids are leveraging NIL to help their families before they go pro or maybe they don't go pro. And now they're able to at least make a little bit of money, you know, work towards that college degree. You would hope they get it. And they're now they're able to do all of that before maybe going to the NFL and it, and it doesn't work out, or they're able to learn about the real world and a lot of these things and, you know, a bad business deal and a crooked agent or shit taxes, man. <laughs> Yeah, they're definitely getting a tax lesson. Yeah, they're getting a tax lesson. And, and guess what? While they're making money right now in college, better that they get that now before they go sign an NFL contract. And so, I'm by sure the way, the resilience thing is bullshit. You can just look at the programs, the other programs that made the college football playoff this year. Texas is a very resilient group. Michigan obviously wins that first championship in forever. Those are two of the richest programs in college football. Washington which is a program that doesn't have as much in the way of resources. That was a re resilient bunch that had to hang in there and win games throughout the course of the year that it felt like they could have lost those games. His freaking so quarterback. You know, those two things can operate independently of one another. These guys wanting to finally get theirs and make sure that they're not getting screwed or squeezed by anybody else, but also still working hard at the craft that brought them there to begin with to be resilient. And it's up to the coach to help create that resilience too, by the way. You put your guys through hard stuff during practices and off-season workouts and conditioning programs and whatnot so that they learn how to deal with the bad and, and get refocused to accomplish greatness. 
his quarterback, Jalen Milrow, was one of the best examples of resilience in college football this past season. Great call. And and again, if he wants to paint with broad strokes on that, well, then I'll, I'll pick out a single example. Because I'm sure the response back to that would be, oh, well, there's some kids that, you know. Well, no, you can't just paint all these kids like, oh, no, like no one's resilient anymore. Like, no, no one knows how to grind it out. Or maybe they can grind it out. Or there's ways that they can be realistic with themselves about their situations and go somewhere else, play somewhere else. Like, sure, the, gra- the grass isn't always greener, but, you know, whether it was, a, to use an Alabama-Texas example, a Jai Hall comes to Texas, didn't work out at Alabama, it doesn't work out at Texas. Sure, you can say the grass isn't always greener, but that's more about, likely more about the person. I mean, I want to be careful a little bit, but, you know, when those things continually just don't work out for guys that are that talented, doesn't mean he's a bad person, but just may mean he's not cut out for big time college football for whatever reason. And that's not, it's not, it didn't not work out because he transferred. <laughs> so there's, there's just so much. Yeah. You, you, you said it well when you said just, it's very sanctimonious. Yeah. Davo's got some of that that's been going on and well, and look at know, him right now. Yeah. I was about to say, it's no shock that Clemson is, uh, starting to teeter just a little bit because Dabo refuses to adapt and not to say the Clemson program is dying, but they're uh, getting closer to mediocrity because he's not willing to play that game, a game that Clemson has also been playing this entire time too. They've just been doing so under the table. And so now that Dabo is, is having to make things a little bit more official, all of a sudden he's got a big problem with it. Meaning, meanwhile, he's making, uh, tens of millions of dollars a year coaching that program. They're spending insane money on fucking laser tag parks and lazy rivers within their football offices. But these guys don't deserve a little bit more. I mean, it's absurd. <laughs> right, right. We can build some of the most ridiculous, unnecessary crap in a football facility. But you know, God, God forbid a guy do a Jeep commercial in Clemson and make 50 grand this year. <laughs> Your football facilities are a fucking amusement park, but these guys just need to focus on being student athletes. Gotcha, Dabo. Why don't you go take a nap with your mom uh, in the bedroom? Oh, this is this is why we love college football, though. Oh, it is. There's Look, so many great football, things about it. College football, and this, you know, it's hard to say college football did a good job of this, but college football has been at the forefront of the offseason conversation these last few years now because of expansion and conference realignment because of the college football playoff because of NIL and the transfer portal. Like these are all interesting things to talk about. And it's important that we have these conversations so we can understand how to best advance, how to move forward with all of these things and make the necessary adjustments that we do to ensure more of a level playing field than currently exists. Like that's part of the problem here. That's why like if the SEC and big 10 choose to, remain a part of the overall college football landscape in terms of everybody competing for the same championship at the end of the year. That is currently the case. Like we need to figure out a way that we are either implementing a salary cap or doing more in the way of rev sharing to where the the dollars even out a little bit. Like that's my biggest argument for the SEC and big 10 doing their own thing is this is stupid. It doesn't make sense for these other programs. I don't like how having, that much more of a competitive advantage versus what already exists with the resources that these schools have to commit themselves to the top facilities and the top stadiums and making sure that their guys are not just adequately nourished, but they have the the best food on hand and, and the best training tools. Like even within some of these conferences, you have to wonder what Vanderbilt and Kentucky and South Carolina are willing to commit to commit versus a, a Georgia or an Alabama or an LSU or an A&M or a Texas, but they at least have the same amount coming in based on that next TV deal. Whereas ACC schools, big 12 schools, you get down into the G fives. It's like, it's like a three to four to five X difference in how much each of these schools are getting just based on the TV money, not even counting what they're bringing in through donations and the collectives and things like that. Yeah, it'll be it'll be fascinating to see see where all this goes moving forward. But at least from an on the field standpoint, like and I don't know if it's just because Texas is better now, but 
I think this is some of the best a college football product on the field's been in a while. I thought the playoff was the most competitive that it's been in a while outside of really outside of the national championship game, getting away from Washington at the end. Like, yeah. And that was a close game going into the fourth quarter. No, you're right. Look, if that had been Florida state yep. who may have been more deserving based on the body of work, but the committee did their job and make sure it was the four best teams. Uh, Cause Florida state was minus their starting quarterback. They were not one of the four best teams anymore. And you would have seen at least one blowout there. But they were subjective in how they went about selecting that, and they got the four best teams. And the result is uh, two and a two and three fourths really good football games. Yeah, they they would have they would have gotten Notre Dame if Florida Florida State was in there, except they would have had a valid excuse instead of being you know saying we're fully healthy and have no business being on this damn field. <laughs> but what 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 did we say, Trey? Florida State lost so that America could win. Yep. Florida had to take another fat L so that the rest of us could enjoy some better college football in the most impactful, meaningful, significant games of the season. So and now Florida State is working really and now Florida State is working really hard to exit the ACC to help revolutionize college football even more. Yeah. I don't blame them. If they find a way out of that contract, Clemson's gonna try and leave, North Carolina's gonna try and leave, Miami's gonna try and leave. By the way, I interviewed Luther Campbell, you familiar with Luther Campbell, Uncle Luke? Oh, yeah. Former head of Two Live Crew, big Miami fan. Interviewed him for a documentary that he's a part of at South By, that premiered at South By a few days ago. And I asked him about how the direction college football is headed and whether Miami belongs in that top tier, if it is the SEC and Big Ten breaking away. Unsurprisingly, he's like, hell yeah, Miami belongs. But uh, Uncle Luke is a sort of, godfather of nil he's in that sunny vaquero category he was one of the first that was really making a lot of those things happen or at least doing so overtly enough that people realize that 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 shit was going down yeah we know that there's enough money around that program if they decide to you know pull it all together that that miami could there's enough money around the miami program to compete in the nil world (laughs) yeah it's not even uncle luke that's doing that anymore i forget the guy oh gosh he's responsible for a couple of businesses, he was money whipping players at other schools to get them to come to the U for a few years. That may have slowed up by now, but yeah, Miami do- does also have some coin to work with. You're right. No doubt. No doubt. Well, we got about 10 minutes left. Any big weekend plans or just catching up on, on life from post South by a little bit of catching up on life for sure. I will be interested Kevin is texting saying there's no money in the Miami program. That's interesting. Um, I will be, I'm covering a couple more things tomorrow and then Sunday is just get back on track. Things have been so chaotic over the last week plus that typically I do the grocery store run on Sunday morning and that really gets us as a family ready for the week to ensure that we're not going out to eat too much, eating meals from home, eating healthier meals too. So yeah, I'm, just really looking forward to getting back to that because I haven't been eating like complete shit. I've actually been eating less of anything and just eating a really big meal for dinner. But to uh, to get back to more of that routine, to maybe get out there and play some beach volleyball as things are warming up and it's easier to play in the morning or I guess the conditions allow you to play in the morning and not freeze your ass off. Getting into a gym routine and then getting back into a regular routine of Broadcasting from the home studio from 12 to 1 and 3 to 5, Monday through Friday. How about you? Any big weekend plans? Well, as soon as we hang up here, I'll be I'll be at the Spurs game at the Moody Center. Oh, is that this weekend? Yeah, I've been getting the emails for that, but they've been getting ignored. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty cool what they do. I mean, I know San Antonio fans probably don't like it. Because it takes two home games away from San Antonio, and there's always the little, you know, thought in the back of their mind that – uh Austin is the, you know, you versus the guy she told you not to worry about situation. Well, it's true. Austin is better than you, San Antonio. I mean, they ended up getting the MLS expansion franchise over San Antonio. (laughs) Oh, I didn't realize that that, there was some jockeying going on for that. Well, uh, San Antonio wanted an MLS team because they have a pretty popular USL team, but they wanted an MLS team. And then obviously, you know, when, when Columbus Crew stayed in Columbus, MLS gave give Precourt the expansion franchise to put here in Austin. 
But uh, yeah, no, I'll be I'll be down there for that. that. That'll be fun. I mean, tonight's a great matchup. Like, not only do you get Wemby, but you get the Joker. I mean, they're playing the like last year when they did this, they played some. I think they played the Blazers and Dame Lillard didn't play, and then they played um, Minnesota maybe. And like Anthony Edwards, that was cool getting to see him. But man, they really, um, you know, th- those those games were kind of forgettable on the court. It was more the novelty of this is the first time they're doing this I thirty five series and bringing NBA basketball to the Moody Center. But this year, like again, like I said, not only do you have Wemby, but you have Wemby versus Joker tonight. Both of them are playing. No load management tonight, and then on Sunday they they play the Nets. So I'll be busy with that stuff, and then selection Sunday. Well, I probably won't. Yeah, I probably won't go to the Spurs game that night because I'll be at the men's and women's selection show parties. Man, San Antonio fans got hosed losing out on a Denver game. Yeah, I know, and that's what I mean. Like they, they. Well, I mean, I'm I'm hearing in the comments somebody somebody said wrong. I don't know. I'm wrong about a lot of shit. So you gotta you gotta be specific. Uh oh. But but yeah, what I would was, be mad if I was just... wrong about what we can we say? Oh yeah, you're right. I was wrong about that. I don't know if I if I was a San Antonio season ticket holder, uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be thrilled about that. I think they're going to come to San Antonio one time in a couple weeks because since it's Western Conference, Western Conference they play four times. You got to go bottom of the barrel here in Austin. I'm sorry. No offense to the Austin Spurs fans who are going to the game tonight. You're you're going to go to that game regardless because it's in Austin. That needs to be a dog shit matchup. Well, the Spurs are upholding their end because they're not very good, but. But they're interesting, at least with too. Wemby. What's that? They're at least interesting with Wemby. No, yeah, I mean, that, that is the reason why you're going to see San Antonio. It's not to watch them win games. So just put a, another bad opponent out there. But even – I was surprised last year. Like, I just had no idea what to expect of the crowd. I knew some people would show up. They put 16,000 in the Moody Center for those games last year. So did they, they use the top part of the arena then? Yeah, they broke an attendance record hmm. for the Moody Center. I didn't realize that building could fit 16,000. Yeah. It was just, just over 16,000 was the attendance. Do they ever go, do they ever allow that upper bowl to be filled for Texas games? I've, I don't think I've ever seen it done for a Texas game. I wonder why that be, would be. If you have the ability to do so, why don't you do it? I think they probably just, it's just an all or nothing kind of thing. Like just keep, keep the advantage, keep the home court advantage the way it is. Don't even let any, don't open it up for any risk that, you know, they might, you know, not fill it. Okie dokie. Yeah. Oh, oh, here we go. All right. San Antonio fans aren't going to miss a 140 to 90 NBA game signed SA native from Longhorn Bear. <laughs> Does that mean the Nuggets are going to win 140 to 90? I assume so. Yeah. Yeah, but you're still getting to see one of the best players in the league play in person. Yeah, you still get to see Wemby and Joker go at it. True. I mean, that's that's what I want to see tonight. That's that's my matchup. Austin better than San Antonio. I've spent extended time in both, and in my opinion, wait, San Antonio is better? They just said Austin was better. I just felt better there, but last work has me here. Yeah. To each their own, Rodney. Hey, thank you for sharing. Go where the money's at. You go where the money's at, right, Nick Saban? I was. Oh no, no! If you go where the money's at, that means you're not going to be. You're not going to be adaptive. You're not going to be resilient. You're yeah, not and I possess the grit that's necessary to be successful in life and win championships and whatnot. I've I've said uh, I've, I've said before that Nick Saban was the single greatest investment in the history of the University of Alabama. And I'm sure plenty of people have said that before, but it is a little rich to to hear him talk about that and then look at what he was making the last 10 years, 15 years that he was at Alabama <laughs> and be like, oh, man, you're you know, a couple of your guys can't can't make a little bit of money. And look, if they're not worth anything, then they, they won't make any money. But I was, you, you said KD texted you that there's there's not a lot of money around. Miami program or in the Miami program, I guess I just assumed that with their history and the money that flies around that, that city and that school that, that they would, they would be able to be competitive in that world. It is a little bit surprising, by the way, Kevin just texted, uh, show's really good today. You're hilarious. Great stuff. Wanted me to pass that along to you. So good job. And we've KD. we've, We've had a good time. Hopefully he liked my, uh, 
well, both of our Notre Dame rants. Oh, he didn't like that at all. But is he, he a also, Notre Dame guy? He was. Oh yeah, yeah his <laughs> dad is an alum. Oh man, and that's his number two team. Oh, after the Longhorns. But hey, that's okay. Kevin and yeah. I have disagreeable conversations all the time. He knows. He knows that you're a USC guy too, and he can take it in stride. He actually wants to get you on the show that he and I do from, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we'll maybe have to set that up in the not too distant future. Yeah, holler. I mean, that would, that'd be that might be a good place for me to debut my Brock Purdy shirt. Maybe if I can ever get my shit together enough to get this shirt to you. Yeah, we do. I really we do don't need to go have some lunch. In the mail. I want to meet you and grab a coffee or a meal or something. Yeah. You said there's a coffee shop in Elgin, right? No, uh, um, we're in Hutto. I'm in Hutto, excuse me. Yeah. There's a coffee shop in Hutto, though, that you like to go to. Yeah, pretty good one. Let's do that next week. Okay. Maybe on Monday or something. Let's do that. I'm in. Is that too far for you? No. <laughs> People no, are probably like, these guys closing by, the shows and making Goodstock plans. open on Mondays and Tuesdays. You need to go by Goodstock also. I can do that later, though. No, I they can are it's open. not too far. I've got all the time in the world in the morning, so it's, it's really can, not we that can do, We could do Tuesday. Goodstock is open Tuesdays. They changed it. They did? Yeah, because I actually went there on a Tuesday one time. Cause we hey, let's let's do this little summer moon. We'll go over to Goodstock after and load up on whatever we need. Cool. I mean, that's how I found out. Is I went Jasmine and I went on a Tuesday to Summer Moon, and I'm the same way. I'm like usually I have time Monday Tuesday, especially in the mornings. So I was like, oh, I'll go over to Goodstock, and then I forgot they were they were usually closed Monday Tuesday for a while, and then they happen to be open Tuesday, and they even had a sign out that says like we're open Tuesdays again. All right, Perry from Goodstock is saying, ah, oh, shoot. I'm sorry, Perry. You just texted me. I could not see what that said. Uh, Perry said the coffee shop next door, which he agrees with you on. He said go Mondays, not Tuesdays, though. He said close Tuesdays. Let me double check oh. this now. Sorry, maybe I'm, I'm confusing the hell out of people now. I apologize for the misinformation there. We're, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm confused. I, I have limited use of this technology, which is frustrating because... I'm normally on top of this stuff. We're going to figure it out, though. We're going to figure it out. They're We've, closed Tuesday. Yes, Perry was right. Uh, what I read from Perry. So maybe they're back Perry. open Monday, then. Open Monday. So you and I are going to go Monday. Okay. We're going to meet for a late coffee on Monday because they're open 11 a.m. on Monday. So on Monday, before our Monday show, we're going to meet. We're going to grab coffee at 1030. Ooh, Perry says they have specials on Monday, too. So we're going to get some good meat deals on oh, Monday. Let's go. Yeah, After we're gonna you grab a coffee and I give you your Brock Purdy shirt finally. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna load up on caffeine, just be wired as hell when we come in to talk about the Longhorns draw in the NCAA tournament. Justine has been like, "Why do you have this shirt? <laughs> like, why is this shirt remaining downstairs?" I'm like, "Cause I need to get it to Jeff, <laughs> but I need to great. figure out a time to get it to Jeff, and it just has not been a good two week stretch to make that happen. But we're making it happen on Monday. Let's do it. I'm in." Oh, Perry's going to be there, too, so we get to say what's up to Perry while we're at it. Sweet. And with that, we are done with another edition of the 3 to 5 show. Jeff, always a good time. Thank you so much for the conversation. Yeah, man, this is awesome. We'll we'll do it again Monday, caffeinated and uh, swagged out in my Brock Purdy shirt. We will. Get ready to end the broadcast here. He is Jeff Barker. For everybody else here at Texas Sports Unfiltered, I am Trey Elling. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will be back on Monday at 8 a.m. with Bucky and BK. Make sure to check out the Wagner Wire on Sunday morning as well. Prior to that, in the meantime, have yourselves a great weekend and hook them.